Adventures of Sam Spade, Detective. Brought to you by Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic, the non-alcoholic hair tonic that contains lanolin. Wild Root Cream Oil, again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. Bernadine, anything wrong? You sound almost human. It's not Bernadine, Sam. It's me, Effie. F. But I'll tell Bernadine about your compliment. How are things? Well, uh, I've made out as best I could. I don't want to, don't want you to think that I begrudged you a vacation. After all, you have worked hard. You uh, did deserve it. Sam Spade, is that all you have to say to me? I'm not putting the blame on you. After all, it is a state law, so I can hardly accuse you of letting me down at a time when I needed you most. You might at least ask me if I had a good time. I'm sorry if your conscience bothered you. Oh, well, it didn't. I had a divine time, and I met all sorts of interesting people, mostly men. You don't say. What else? Well, it was this desert ranch, you know, with a lot of uh, buttes around. You uh, mentioned those. No, Sam. No, no, no. They're the result of erosion. Those outdoor types, they go to pieces. Sam, are you pulling my leg? Not over the phone, Effie, but stay where you are. I'll be right down to look at your snapshots. And when you have the time, I'll dictate my report on the missing news hawk caper. <laughs> Dashiell Hammett, America's leading detective fiction writer and creator of Sam Spade, the hard-boiled private eye, and William Spear, radio's outstanding producer-director of mystery and crime drama, join their talents to make your hair stand on end with the adventures of Sam Spade. Presented by the makers of Wild Root Cream Oil for the hair. Wild Root Cream Oil. That's the famous name to remember, men, next time you buy hair tonic. And look what Wild Root Cream Oil does for you. It grooms your hair neatly and naturally. Wild Root Cream Oil also relieves dryness and removes loose, ugly dandruff. Yes, men, Wild Root Cream Oil is your shortcut to really handsome hair. So be smart. First chance you get, get Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. And now, with Howard Duff starring as Spade, Wild Root brings to the air the greatest private detective of them all in the adventures of Sam Spade. of Canab on Virgin River. Canab, the Pearl of the West. Uh Uh-huh. And did I mention the buttes? Oh, well, they're very interesting. The uh, result of erosion. Yes. And it's authentic, too. Faye Hamlin's ranch. You uh, mean a working ranch? Yes. You see, that way you get into the spirit. Mm -hmm. My job was to feed the chickens. And that's how I met him. (sighs) One of the buttes? Oh, Sam, he's a very cultured gentleman. Culture smulcher. What's he do for a living? He, he, He cures stammering. You don't say. What's his name? Charlie Shank. Charlie Shank? He's the founder of the Shank Institute of Articulative Correction, which I should learn. Articulative Correction. Where is this institute? Oh, I have the address here. Um, General Delivery, Butte, Montana. Mm Mm-hmm. You're sure you didn't help him break parole, Effie? Oh, no, oh, no, no. We just went on long walks together. Where to? Oh, different points of interest. Like, uh, like Wolf Canyon... Figures. Uh huh. He invited me on this camping ship, a trip. Honorable, of course. Mm. But I couldn't go on account of my sunburn. Oh, oh. I had an awful, awful. Oh, I still got it, you see. Mm. And then, then he went back to Butte. He had to leave in such a hurry, you couldn't even say goodbye. Well. It was a pity, too, because an old friend he hadn't seen in years came looking for him just a few minutes later. With a warrant? No. No, he was an attendant in a nearby hospital. Mm. Mental? Oh, yes. Very intelligent. <coughs> he read me some of his poetry. Maybe you've heard it. Um, a loaf of bread. A jug of wine and thou. Oh, wait a minute. Isn't that the ruby out of Omer Cayenne that was written by a guy named Fitzgerald? Well, of course. That's his pen name. Quite a penman. Yes, but he's paid his debt to society. And the other time it was a bad beef. Oh, no. He told me all about yeah, it. Sure. He cried on my shoulder afterwards. Sweetheart, when you make a mistake, it's a beaut. Sam, nothing happened. Well, I'm glad he cured you of stammering, anyhow. <clears throat> Ready? Oh, yeah. I've got a brand Work, new you notebook. you know. Life goes on. I've got a brand new notebook, Sam. I'll just turn over a new leaf. Not a bad idea, dear. <laughs> uh, date uh, July 18 to Mr. Alex M. Youngblood. Uh, mm. 
Try that again. Mr. Alex M. Youngblood, P.O., Box 317, San Francisco, from Samuel Spade, license number 137596. Dear Mr. Youngblood, I need a vacation myself. You need Charlie Shank. <sighs> you sound tired, Sam. Fortunately, until I met you, my only experience with any of the men and women who make your newspaper run had been with one of your corner newsboys who shortchanged me two times within as many days. I have not read your rag since. But your name looked imposing, and so did the $300 check upon which you had written it. Per your instructions, promptly at 4 p.m. on the 15th inst, I mushed through the litter of your city room toward a door marked A.M. Youngblood, publisher, managing editor, and city editor. I wondered if you were ambitious, frugal, or three men. I did not know that you had good taste until I saw the trim, 20-ish, and toothsome secretary in your outer office. Hello. You're new here, aren't you? Uh, well, I'm not exactly here. I'm just here to see Mr. Youngblood. Oh. The name is Spade. Samuel Spade? Sam, except for my most intimate friends. <laughs> well, my advice to you, Sam, is to be the hasty retreat. He's in a foul mood. Oh? Uh, why? Is he blind or older than he feels? I refer, of course, to your spectacular charm, Miss... Uh, if I may call you, miss. Please, this is neither the time nor the place. My name is Phyllis Watson, and my phone number is in the directory, if you're really interested. I could be. Thank you. And if a man answers, tell him you're my French teacher. We. Oui. <laughs> you better go in now. If you're late to an appointment with him, you're through. Uh, do you have any more words of wisdom? No, but I hope you can do something to improve his state of mind. He's been awful lately. Good luck, Sam. Uh, thank you, Phyllis Watson. Come in, come in. Now, one minute past four. You must be Mr. Spade. That's right. You're almost late. Sit down, Spade. Cigar? Uh, no, thanks. Well, don't expect me to offer a drink. You aren't a drinker, I hope. You don't listen to the radio, do you? Well, you'll not drink in this office. Nothing here but a cooler filled with water from a clean, gurgling, laughing mountain stream. You sound like a reformed drunk, Mr. Youngblood. What's that? Well, it was a good many years ago. If you don't mind, I'll just paste up the weather report for my morning edition before we talk. Oh, you do that too, huh? Yes, obviously. And with good reasons. I remind myself that I was once a copy boy, and I find it a splendid way to, uh, at least once each day, to lower myself to the level of the working man. There we are. Very hot in Phoenix, I see. Mm-hmm. Uh, just what do you want a detective for, Mr. Youngblood? I was coming to that, Mr. Spade. Sorry. Now, uh... <clears throat> Well, first let me warn you that your assignment is a highly confidential one. They all are. In this case, a man's life may be at stake. Mm -hmm. The situation, my newspaper at my order and under my guidance has launched a campaign against crime. Not aimed at the petty criminal, but at the easy living leeches at the controls of the rackets. The hoods in bankers' clothing. The mansion house parasites who direct the pickpockets, the second story men, the housebreakers, who gamble away yeah, half a million uh, dollars a easy. year uh, and uh, pay income tax. Yeah, yeah, don't go to prison. Uh, yes, I and, understand, I understand. Uh, you're after the boys on the safer side of the fences. Uh, uh, nicely put, Spade, yes. Well, thank you. Well, the long and short of it is this. The author of the expose series, Ray McCulley, my top crime reporter, has been missing for two days. I want you to find him. What makes you think he's still alive? Good heavens, Spade. Why must you suggest that he isn't? Because if I were a mansion-housed parasite in danger of being unhoused by a newshawk, I'd see said newshawk standing in a cement block on the bottom of the bay. I will accept that only when no stone has been left unturned. Every straw and every haystack has been searched. Every... Uh, nook and cranny? Uh... Yes. Sounds as though you need at least one police force, Mr. Youngblood. Now, why don't no, you just... No, uh... no, no, no. Impossible. We've already had a brush with the police over the expose. I'll not be dictated to at this stage of the game. I started this investigation, and I'll finish it alone. Well, it's a pretty big order, Mr. Youngblood, but uh, times are tough. I'll see what I can do. Good. I hereby turn over to you all the resources and power of this, my newspaper. When one of my reporters is in trouble or danger, sir, I will spend every penny of my fortune, if necessary, to deliver aid and succor to his side. You then gave me Ray McCulley's expose stories to date. I saw why you, his family and friends, and his creditors could have been worried about him. They were hot. One followed a stolen car from the time of the heist through the alteration of the body color, tire brands, license number, 
motor serial number to the time it was shoved onto a used car lot. They named names all the way through. And another did the same to the firm of Otter, Badger, and Mole, furriers, and alleged manufacturers of coats from clouted pelts. Ray McCulley had dropped out of sight right after that story had been published. So I left your office hoping that I'd reach the address of Otter, Badger, and Mole before closing time. I did. The plushy showroom was occupied by a dozen attractive fur-bearing models, female, but wax. The live models, male, were wearing padded shoulders, pointed shoes, and coats tailored for underarm artillery. They would have looked more natural at Madame Tassad's waxworks, Bertram the burglar section. Hey, yo, hey, what'll it be? Something for a little woman? Uh, where do I find Mr. Otter? Are you the law? Uh, Leo sent me. He's in his office. Come on. Oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Don't crowd me. You say you want to see the boss? On business. Stop nudging me with a rod. In there, hey. Move. Okay, okay. Hey, your boss. Yes, Woody? Here's a Joe here to see you. Leo sent him. Well, nudge him in, Woody. No nudging, Woody. Well, well, well. So Leo's sending a man to see me. I wonder why. If you'll uh, comb this character here out of my hair, I'll try and tell you. Sit down, Woody. Mm. Thanks. You're new in town. Uh, yeah, that's why Leo sent me. A local muckraker named Ray McCulley interviewed you. He also interviewed Leo, but it didn't get printed yet. Uh, Leo wants to find him. So do I. How can I help? Well, uh, he walked out of here, went to his hotel, wrote the story, and mailed it in. That's the last anybody's seen of him. Uh, Leo was just sort of hoping that you'd already taken care of him. Not yet. That's all I wanted to know. Thanks. Just a moment. Yeah? Leo sending you out alone? Why not? That's a tough boy, that McCulley. He's got plenty of protection. That's what you need. What kind of protection? Go along with him, Woody. Who, me? You're Woody, aren't you? Now, look, uh, look, Mr. Otter. I don't want to look a gift horse in the mouth, but the way I see it, this is a, a lone wolf-type caper. Hey, what's the matter, hey? You think I'm too good for you? Well, Woody, I wouldn't say that. Good. It's settled, then. Take care of him, Woody, and don't mix it up with any of Leo's boys. If he's out to get that rat McCulley, he's our friend. <laughs> I was beginning to wonder who Leo was. I'd grabbed the name off a calendar on the wall, Leo's van and storage. I didn't know whether he was the Leo Mr. Otter didn't like, and I hoped I wouldn't find out. The best way I could think to keep from finding out was to shake Woody. On the way uptown, I walked him past four police stations. Crossing Market Street, I pushed him straight into the arms of a traffic cop who begged his pardon and let me off with a warning. At the Blue Bottle Bar and Grill, I gave Joe, the bartender, the Mickey Finn sign, but Woody liked it. He ordered another. Then he said he knew a place on Columbus where the drinks were even better. It was called Leo's Place. I wondered if that meant anything. Hey, you, oh, hey. Uh, who, me, huh? I want you a drink. Don't you like this joint? Yeah, ah, sure, it's fine. Uh, we're not getting anywhere, though. Well, you really take your work serious. Me, when I go gun for somebody, I go where I'm least likely to succeed. You live long here. Yeah. Uh, Woody, what do you know about this guy, uh, McCulley? You hear the puss. He says he's a rat. Yeah, but he said he's got plenty of protection. Who's furnishing it? Well, you see, there's a... Boy, oh boy. Look at what just walked in. I looked. What I saw was not disappointing. She was wearing a skin-tight black satin with a plunging neckline and a new look only in places where it didn't matter. But she still looked enough like your secretary, Phyllis Watson, to be out of place in Leo's place. She didn't stay there long. She made a beeline through the kitchen to the rear exit. I made a beeline right after her. Woody was breathing down my neck as I started up the rickety outside stairway at the back of the building. I uh, stopped the landing and turned around to face him. See you later, Woody. I didn't wait to see if he made it all the way to the bottom of the stairs. I was more interested in what was going on at the top. A door had opened and Phyllis stepped inside. The man who let her in looked like Ray McCulley. Who are you? Well, the name is Spade. I don't know that name. Your boss hired me to find you. Private Dick. Yeah. Can I uh, talk to you for a minute? Sure. Put your hands behind your neck and walk up slow. Okay. All right. Go inside. Oh, what's the matter? You're not acting glad to see me. This is the guy, fellas. Yes. Alex hired him this afternoon. There, you see. Now, uh, what do you want me to tell Youngblood? You're not going to tell anybody anything. Oh. It caught me right behind the ear. 
The last thing I saw was that plunging neckline as Phyllis rushed forward. I didn't know whether she was rushing to my rescue or to get in a few licks of her own. Five seconds later, I didn't care. As the design of the linoleum slammed up at me, I had just time to wonder why, of all the people who were looking for Ray McCulley, I had to find him. Then I was out, boing, maced for my pains. The makers of Wild Root Cream Oil are presenting the weekly Sunday adventure of Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective, Sam Spade. If you want the well-groomed look that helps you get ahead socially and on the job, listen. Recently, thousands of people from coast to coast who bought Wild Root Cream Oil for the first time were asked, how does Wild Root Cream Oil compare with the hair tonic you previously used? Better than four out of five who replied said they preferred Wild Root Cream Oil. And no wonder. Wild Root Cream Oil grooms the hair neatly and naturally, relieves annoying dryness, and removes loose dandruff. What's more, non-alcoholic Wild Root Cream Oil is the only leading hair tonic that contains soothing lanolin. So ask for Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. By the way, smart girls use Wild Root Cream Oil, too. And mothers say it's grand for training children's hair. And now, back to the missing Newshawk caper. Tonight's adventure with Sam Spade. I was lying on the floor in a room with nothing in it but a sink, an army cot, a square of dirty linoleum, and a body. I staggered to my feet, ran some cold water over my head, and took a closer look. It was Ray McCulley. He was a very dead, crusading reporter. He'd been stabbed clean through with a long-bladed kitchen knife that set on the handle property of Leo's place. I went through his pockets. And his wallet, a press card, a police card, union card, and ten genuine, crisp, new thousand-dollar bills. That gave me a line on the killer. He was crazy. So was I. I left it on him, too. Folded up in his vest pocket, I found two newspaper clippings, one from the Chronicle and one from your paper, both weather reports for the same date. It was very hot in Phoenix, according to both papers. But according to your weather report, the temperature in Needles, California, was 135 degrees. That needled me. So did the slip of paper I found on his shoe. The number nine and a date had been stamped on it with a rubber stamp. The date was the same as that of the weather reports. I turned it over. It said, Ruthie's Booth, Manson Bowling Alley. Don't tell me. Let me guess. You're the cigar type. Corona's a panatelli. Uh, thanks. I'm just shopping. Oh. Uh, I got a nice line of notions. So have I. Uh, no, I mean the dolls, the Hollywood dolls. You know, for the bed, only a dollar plus tax. Very reasonable. Say, what's on your mind? Uh, Leo sent me. Oh. Are you going to collect the slips hereafter? Well, uh, not tonight. You see, I'm uh, sort of a troubleshooter. Leo's uh, checking up on some of the numbers that didn't come out right. Listen, I'll tell him to his face. I don't want any part of those wrong numbers. They're scary. Nuts. Who bought this one? Let me see. Oh, last Thursday. Oh, number nine. How can I forget? He put $500. And honest, if he's been around once, he's been around a hundred times to see if it paid off. Did it? What's his name? Mr. Spinelli. He buys a slip every day. And if you ask me, he's learned a system. Because he's been winning, you know. Dimes and then a dollar and then five dollars. And then when he come in with 500 on number nine, until he dropped dead. Did it win? Where does he live? <gasps> it did. Wait, I'll look on the sheet. Hey, somebody else was in just this afternoon. Give me that address. Hurry up, will well, you? It's right around the corner on Manson, 810. Say, maybe that's his system, 8 and 1. Don't that add up to 9? Hey, what's the matter? Where are you going in such a run? Please, come back later. Tomorrow... Next week. Are you Mrs. Spinelli? Yes, please. I had so much trouble. Is your husband home? Oh, my poor man. They take him away. He's dead. Oh, I'm sorry. How did it happen? 
Who are you? I'm a detective. Maybe I can help you. May I come in? All right. Come on. It took quite a while to gain her confidence, and after that it took still quite a while to piece together the grief-stricken grumble of words that poured out of her. When I got it down in the form of a statement, I asked her to read it over. Item. Statement by Mrs. Arturo Spinelli. All the time he played those numbers. I told him they're just a bunch of gangsters. They don't let you win. Then he met this man, Macaulay, a writer for the newspaper. My husband says this man shows him how to win. He wins and wins. Then he goes to bank and takes out all our savings. I begged to him not to do it. But no, no, he was greedy. And this Macaulay poisoned his mind. Sure, he won. He brought the money home in his hand. Ten thousand dollars. I don't want it. I'm scared. I took it while he was sleeping with wine and gave it to the men. I tell him all I want is the five hundred. He tried to tell me we do good. We help catch the big gangsters. I say we don't want to do so good we get murdered in our beds. So he says, okay. But if I change mine, here is address. I don't change my mind. Because already my husband, he is dead. As home. Stand. No, I don't change my mind. She signed it, and I left her alone with her grief. I wasn't working for you anymore, Mr. Youngblood. You hired me to find your reporter, and I had. And I wished I hadn't. The rest of it I did for myself. You weren't in your office when I got there, but Phyllis was. I found her behind the city desk in the act of dropping tomorrow morning's weather report into the slot. I grabbed it out of her hand. What? Oh, it's you. Where's your boss? At home, I guess. We'll talk in his office. Come on. Sam, uh, I can explain how I have. You're going to be... explain plenty before I'm finished with you. Sit down. Oh, you... I don't have to be so rough. What's the matter with you? Plenty. I'm stupid. I was stupid to take this job, and I was stupid to play it cagey with you. I should have beaten the story out of you before the trouble started. It's a little late in the day now, but not too late to send you up for McCulley's murder. Oh, you're insane. Ray McCulley was... I'm the only one who ever tried to help and you. And I'm the only one who can place you in that room, not ten minutes before the murder. I told you I can explain Stop why... trying to save your own skin. Spinelli was only one of a half million poor dumb yucks that lose their nickels and dimes and dollars every day in the policy racket. Only he had the bad luck to win. There won't be any more lucky dead people like him if I have to make a patsy out of you to stop it. It won't stop it. Nothing will. Ray talked big and brave like you. Now he's dead. Yeah, with 10,000 bucks dirty money in his wallet. I won't let you say things like that. Ray was an honest reporter, too honest. He thought young blood meant what he said about that cleanup campaign. Yeah, he did. He wanted to run this town by himself, clean up his competition. When Ray started collecting material on the numbers racket, he still thought young blood was on the level. But that was before he stumbled onto the thing about the weather reports. Yeah, yeah, that was a new one. The old Dutch Schultz mob used to add up the stock market quotations. If they cheated, they knew their customers weren't good enough at arithmetic to prove it. But who knows how hot it is in Phoenix unless they live there. I don't know what you're talking about. Listen, that's how the number game works, sweetheart. The suckers pick a number from one to ten, see? The operators tally up the slips, and the least popular for that day has to win. The weather report doesn't have to pass through the copy desk, and with young blood pasting it up with a few strategic corrections, it was easy to make their winners look as if they were on the level. But of course, you had no way of knowing that. You only watched them do it day after day. You know, I couldn't understand why he did those things. It it seemed silly falsifying a weather report, but it didn't seem as if it could do any harm. What did you meet McCulley for? To get your cut of the ten grand Spinelli was killed for? How dare you? I went there to warn him about you. Who killed him? I don't know. You're lying. All right, I'm lying. But I can prove that Ray was on the level. I've got the proof right here. The whole story he wrote on the numbers racket, even naming Youngblood as the head of it, his own publisher. I went there to get it. I was going to take it to another newspaper. Why didn't you? I can't tell you that. You don't have to. Mrs. Spinelli was confused, grief crazed. She had to put the blame on somebody, and when she did, she got her revenge the only way she thought she could. She may have been right about that, but she killed the wrong man. Why didn't you tell me you knew who killed Ray? I wanted to give you a chance to tell me yourself. 
I'm glad you didn't. And that, Mr. Youngblood, is the crop. I'm sure you appreciate the fact that I gave the double scoop to your paper. Like uh, Mrs. Spinelli, I have my own ideas of vengeance. Besides, it may up your circulation a little, and you can certainly use a little extra money for your defense. Uh, by the way, who's Leo? Uh, period, end of report. But Sam... Yes, Evie? I thought Mrs. Spinelli killed Ray McCulley. The vacation helped. You're absolutely correct. Mrs. Spinelli killed Mr. McCulley, if you'll pardon the expression. Well, why did she kill her husband? I was wrong. The vacation didn't help. You mean she didn't? She killed McCulley to avenge the murder of her husband. You mean Mr. McCulley killed Mr. Spinelli? Effie, stop. I'll go mad. Oh, you need a vacation, Sam. Look, type that up. The clatter of the keys may stimulate you to further cerebral activity. I beg your pardon, Sam? Brain work. Now, shoot. Oh, brain work. Oh, you know best. Tonight, men, or first thing tomorrow, get Wild Root Cream Oil and see what wonders it does for your hair. Notice how easy it is to apply. Notice what a neat, natural job it does of grooming your hair. Notice, too, how effectively Wild Root Cream Oil relieves annoying dryness and removes loose, ugly dandruff. No getting around it. Once you try it, you'll never be without it. So tonight, or first thing tomorrow, call at your drug or toilet goods counter for Wild Root Cream Oil. Get the big economy bottle and the handy new tube that's easy to pack when you travel. Also, ask your barber for a professional application of Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. Well, here it is, Sam. And you were absolutely right. The typing cleared my mind. It's all clear now except for one thing. Well, let's clear that up right away. Why did Mrs. Spinelli kill her husband? She did not kill her husband. Oh, I'm sorry. I meant, why did Mr. McCulley kill Mr. Spinelli? Kelly did not kill Spinelli. Who's Kelly? McCulley. McCulley's real name was Kelly? Now, let's start all over again. Disregard everything we said up until now. Make your mind a complete blank. All right, Sam. In the first place, McCulley did not kill Spinelli. That's what I said. It was his wife, wasn't it? Now, wasn't it, Sam? Oh, stop teasing me. Sam, why do you look at me like that? Effie, Mr. Spinelli was killed by one of the policy racket hoods to get back the ten grand he won on the numbers game. Then how did the money get into Kelly's pocket? McCulley's. Why do you insist on using his alias, Sam? Effie, Effie, that was a tip of the sung. I I mean, look, Mrs. Spinelli took it to him because she was afraid her husband might be killed for it. Then why didn't they take the money when they killed him? Because Mrs. Spinelli had already taken it. Then she did kill him. Go home, Effie. All right, Sam. I'm sorry I'm so irritable to you, but I, I thought it's... Well, it's been so long since oh, I've no, been here, you know, there, Sam. Angel, and I... Angel, you're just tired. Vacations have a habit of doing that to you. After a week or two in the office, you'll be all rested up again. I'll take it You easy. act as though you thought my mind were affected. Come here. Come Sam, here. now don't. My sunburn. Yeah. Oh, it hurts. <clears throat> it's nice to have you back. You look good, too. All tanned and healthy. You're... It's great. I think my nose is peeling. Well, don't pick at it. (laughs) I won't. (laughs) Good night, Sam. Good night, sweetheart. The Adventures of Sam Spade, Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective, are produced and directed by William Spear. Sam Spade is played by Howard Duff. Lorene Tuttle is Effie. The Adventures of Sam Spade are written for radio by Bob Tallman and Gil Dowd, with musical direction by Lud Gluskin. Gil Dowd directed tonight's broadcast in William Spears' absence. Join us again next Sunday for another adventure with Sam Spade, brought to you by Wild Root Cream Oil. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. This is Dick Joy reminding you to... Get Wild Root Cream Oil, Charlie. It keeps your hair in trim. You see, it's non-alcoholic, Charlie. It's made with soothing lanolin. You better get Wild Root Cream Oil, Charlie. Start using it today. You'll find that you will have a tough time, Charlie. Keeping all the gals away. Hiya, Baldy. Get Wild Root right away. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.
National Broadcasting Company presents Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Everything will be right there. Okay, okay, just let me get a robe on. Coming, coming. Yes. Yes. Yes, there's nothing like stepping out of a nice warm shower into a nice hot murder. The only thing in sight was the body of a man lying on his face. I didn't have to get any closer to see that he was very dead. Then I heard someone running down the front steps and out of the street, so still being the kind of guy who's always interested in seeing what a killer looks like, I went down the stairs and out into the street. I landed on the sidewalk just as the sedan pulled away from the curb and dove into a hole in the traffic. I only had time to see that there were two people in it. Didn't even get a chance at the license. Well, a white terry cloth robe can be a little conspicuous at 11 o'clock in the morning on East 51st Street, right off Madison... So I shuffled back up the stairs, put in a call for Lieutenant Walter Levinson, 5th Precinct, Homicide. But it seems as if I was a little late. A neighbor on the way to the... uh, Well, a neighbor on the way down the hall had stumbled on the dead one in front of my doorway. Now, generally, a body in front of my door would be left alone to sober up. But this one seemed to be bleeding, so just as a precaution, the neighbor had called the police. All I could do was just stand around and wait for them. Know it, Otis. Wouldn't you know it? Finally got to be right in his own building. Yeah, Lieutenant. And she said it was right in front of his own door. That's around this corner. Uh, what'd you say the name of the woman was who turned in the alarm? Uh, Myrtle Tibbles. The apartment next to his. That's right, Otis. And she's a big snoop. Huh? I heard that. What's that? Myrtle Tibbles. Now listen, Rick. And if you've got any questions, officer... Ask me no questions, I'll tell oh, you... Oh, no. shut up. Otis, go question her. Me? Yes, you. Go ahead. I Lady, I know everything you're going to say. And a lot more. Oh, then come in, Captain. Hey, did you hear that, Lieutenant? Get in there, Sergeant. And question the big snoo- uh, lady. Uh, yes, sir. Snoo, eh? Well, Rick. Well, Rick. What kind of a bit is that? I suppose you're going to tell me you had nothing to do with this killing. Walt, I was in taking a shower when this gentleman decided to get himself shot in front of my door. I was singing, too. Would you like to hear what I was... No, thank... Hey, wait a minute. If you were in taking a shower, how did you know he was getting himself shot? He rang the doorbell first. Oh, sure. He wanted to let you know there was going to be a murder. Listen, blubbermouth, I was taking a shower. I stopped taking a shower. The doorbell rang. I went to the door. I opened the door. Dead man. I ran down into the street after the killers. What about the shots? I didn't hear any. Must have used a silencer. Well, you say you ran after the killers. Was there more than one? Two. I don't know who pulled the real old trigger, but I chased two people down into the street. Did you recognize them? No, they didn't leave any calling cards. Ah, descriptions. Man and woman. Oh, now, that's helpful. License number? Too fast. Got lost in traffic. In other words, all you noticed about them was a little less than nothing. Mm. I'm surprised you didn't forget and leave your head hanging in the shower. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, now, by George, Lieutenant, that was a real dandy, that was. Oh, cut it out, Rick. Come on, let's take a look at the corpse. Well, have you forgotten? You just sent it in to question Myrtle Tibbles. Not Otis, I mean this one. You better be specific. I've known a lot of coroners to get pretty confused when Otis was covering a homicide. Mm, some kind of a messenger. Yeah, band on his cap says speed messenger service. Here's his receipt book. Only one entry, Richard Diamond, apartment E, 53 East 51st Street. Nothing else. Would you want any more? I'm honored. Now, what the devil could he have been delivering? The reason he got shot, probably. Uh, huh? Yeah, yeah Myrtle. Uh, oh, oh, Lieutenant. Yes, Sergeant. Uh, Go uh, ahead and ask him, Otis. Uh, <laughs> oh, no. Yeah, young love. Uh, Myrtle, uh, uh, Miss Tibbles wants to know if it's all right if I stay for lunch. Why, I think that would be real nice, Sergeant. How long do you think it will take? Uh, how long, Myrtle? Uh, not long. Well, that's fine. But before you sit down and start feeding that fat face of yours, what would you suggest we do about this body in the hall? Well, I'll tell you, Lieutenant. Otis. Uh, uh, yeah, Lieutenant. Get out here. Uh, coming, Lieutenant. Uh, thanks anyway, Myrtle. Uh, well, 
Where to, Lieutenant? Oh. Well, how, how about the speed messenger service? Right. Just as soon as the coroner and the boys get here and take over. Uh, you want to come along, Rick? Well, sure, sure. The dead man was trying to deliver something to me. I'd like to know what was important enough to get him shot. Sure, let's get going. Uh, Diamond, don't you think you ought to change that robe? Uh, Walt. Yeah, I know, but what are you going to do? Well, gee, I only made a suggestion. You don't have to get sore. Oh, we're not, Sergeant. He can wear the robe for all I care. I only... Well, thank you, Sergeant. I don't give a darn if he looks silly. Otis. Just because I make a suggestion... Sergeant. Yeah? Will you do me a favor? Well, sure, Lieutenant. Shut up! <laughs> So, while Walt tore Otis to pieces, I did a quick change. And when the car arrived, we climbed aboard the squad car and headed for the main office of Speed Messenger Service. While Walt was getting the address from headquarters and the car radio, Otis sneaked on the siren. So, in less than ten minutes, we pulled up in front of a building at 31st and West End Avenue and barged in. You on duty here, miss? Yeah. Trouble? What makes you think there's trouble? When a cop car pulls up in front and you two jump in here like a couple of bill collectors, it figures. Trouble, see? Ah, a woman's intuition. (laughs) Wonderful, simply wonderful. Tell me, dear, did your service send a messenger over to 53 East 51st Street, Apartment E? About an hour ago. Why? What was he supposed to deliver? I don't know. I don't remember that good, see? Oh, well, try. I don't get this. What's wrong anyway? Well, dearie, your messenger ain't anymore. Yeah, shot to death. What? Mm, now try to remember what it was. Oh, that... Mr. Cartwright! Hey, hey, Mr. Cartwright! Well, let her get Cartwright, Walt. Maybe he can tell us something. Yes, now what in the oh, world? Mr. Cartwright, Johnny, he's dead. He's... Yes. Those are police officers. See, they said he was shot to death. Now, now, just be calm. Let me get this straight. But I told you, see, it's Johnny. All right, all right. Now go in the back. Get a drink of water or something. <laughs> yes, sir, but I just can't believe it. I am Mr. Cartwright, gentlemen. Well, that's nice. Are you in charge here? I am the manager. Now, what is this about one of our messengers being dead? That's right. Do you have any idea what he was delivering to 53 East 51st this morning? Well, I... Why, no, but it it should be in our record book. You'll have to forgive Miss Ogilvy. She gets very emotional. Hmm, does she? Well, let's see the record book. Oh, it's right here. Uh, Here you are. Now, let's see... uh... Uh, there, it, it was the first delivery this morning, as you can see. Fifty-three... We'd uh, like to know just what he was delivering. Oh, well, I really couldn't say. I, I don't even remember what the item looked like. Well, who sent it? Uh, uh, yes, yes, that I can help you with. Uh, here it is. Uh, last name Clark, first name Paddy. Uh, in other words, a man named Paddy Clark. No. Yes, uh, odd first name, isn't it? Mean anything to you, Rick? Oh, something. It's a little vague. Name seems familiar, that's all. How about you? I don't get a thing from it. Any return address? Uh, no, uh, just his name with instructions to deliver it to a Mr. Diamond at this address. Well, uh, don't you remember whether it was a package or a crate of bananas? Oh, dear, we what? get so many things in here to be sent out. Uh, Lieutenant. Uh, yes, Otis, what do you want? Uh, 201 over on East 48. Thought you might like to know. You better take off, Walt. 201's your department. Fine, fine. Two homicides in one morning. I'll finish checking here and go over to my office. You can get in touch with me there. Okay. Come on, Otis. Let's go. Uh, uh, Lieutenant. Yeah, yeah. You can use the siren. My, you officers certainly are busy, aren't you? Yes, we officers sure are. Now, uh, how'd you like to trot out that girl again? Maybe she's calmed down a bit. Oh, certainly. Uh, certainly. Feel any better, Miss Ogilvy? Oh, yes, sir. Much better. Uh, this gentleman would like to ask you a few more questions. Oh, the good looking one? Oh, sure. Uh, if you're through with me, officer, I have some. Uh, you go, go right ahead. Go on. We'll get along all right alone. Only beautiful. Honest, dearie, I-, I can't help you a bit. I don't know nothing. Oh, sure you do. Weren't you here when this Patty Clark came in? Well, honest, I-, I don't remember, but. Gee, you got the most. But uh, you do remember what the messenger was supposed to deliver, don't you? Mm-hmm. Well, what was in it, I don't. It was just a thick envelope. Why, could... Listen, honey, I... Anything like it. unusual about the envelope? I wish I could remember for you, but I really can't. We deliver so many things every day, but let's talk about something else. Gee. <clears throat> well, after all, there was no reason in the world why she should remember one particular envelope, so... Making like a good cop for Walt's sake, I scribbled down her name and address. Then headed for my office at the corner of 51st and Broadway. I stopped in the lobby for my morning supply of cigarettes and was about to step in the elevator when a big fat hunch... That's right, hunch. 
grabbed me by the arm and turned me back into the direction of the tobacco shop. That's the place I've been stopping at every morning for the last six years. And it was run by a little guy with a twitch in his right eye. A little twitch and a last name, Clark. And a first name, Patty. Uh, Back for something else, Mr. Diamond? Yeah, yeah, Max. Uh, Where's Patty? Oh, he called up the other day and says he was going out of town for a couple of days or so. Oh, is that it? I missed him the last couple of mornings. Well, you know, he got three stands to look after. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Say, tell me, where's Patty live? You want to see him? Mm-hmm. Got a little business deal I want to talk over with him. Oh, sure. You know Patty, anything to make a buck. Here. Yes. Yes, this address. Uh, read it. Oh, fine, yeah. He got a phone? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's uh, Skylar... Oh, nine nine seven oh. There. Thanks, Max. One of these days, I may even buy a cigar from you. Funny how things like that can happen sometimes. The name of Paddy Clark had seemed familiar, but I couldn't place it. Only because I'd been doing business with him every day for six years and didn't think to look that close. I grabbed the elevator, went upstairs to my office, and put in a call to Mr. Clark. Yeah? Uh, Paddy? Who wants him? Oh, no. Rick. Hello, Walter. What's new? You know perfectly well what's new. What do you think I'm doing over here? Well, now, let me guess. Riddle homicide? You know that's why I come over here in the... Now, wait a minute. Yes, Lieutenant. How did you get this phone number? Patty Clark dead. The deadest. Now, how'd you get the number? I, uh, looked in the book. It's not in the book. It's a hall phone listed under the apartment name. I asked my Ouija board? Pow. Okay, okay, Groucho. Patty Clark owns a cigar store in my building. Well, why under the sun didn't you tell me that in the first place? You said you didn't know him. I said the name was vaguely familiar. All right. How was Patty killed? Shot. Coroner's on his way. Look, I'm not far from your office. I'll be over as soon as he gets here. Mm. I'll have a candle in the window. Bye. Mm-hmm. The happy people. Mm-hmm. Something wrong? Oh, no, 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 no. Come in. Just filling my lighter. Okay, Agnes is alone. Hello, Mr. Diamond. Well. And in came Agnes. And this was the type of girl easily recognized. About five feet five with more curves than the World Series. And the one thing that really set her apart from the rest, a great big 38, complete with silencer. Her boyfriend took out a cute little forty-five and leaned against the door while Aggie swayed over to my desk like a mull cobra. All right, Diamond. Let's have the envelope. Honey, honey, could you point that thing the other way? My skin is beginning to crawl out of my shirt. I want the envelope, Diamond. And if you refuse to give it to me, I really wouldn't mind killing you. You know, I I think I'd like to give it to you if I I knew what you were talking about. I hope we're not going to have to play games, Diamond. Well, uh, something like post office might not be so bad. I, I... Drill him, Aggie, and we'll search the place. He's got to have it somewhere. I'll handle this. I want the white envelope Patty Clark sent you this morning. And I thought you two got it after you killed the messenger boy. Now, I don't know what you're talking about. Seems to me I chased you into the street. Saw you climb into a car and take off. The guy in the white robe. So if you two knocked off the messenger boy, you must know I don't have the envelope. Too bad, but I didn't didn't even get to the door until after you'd shot him. We didn't shoot the messenger. What was in the envelope? You know what was in it. Go on, Aggie. Show him we ain't kidding. Oh, shut up. We didn't shoot the messenger, Diamond. But we are going to get the envelope. Where is it? Hey, a siren's pulling up out in front. Uh, Why didn't you search the messenger? You had a gun. You didn't have to worry about me if I showed at the door. Well, we got an envelope off him, all right. Empty. Hey, what are you doing, Paul? Taking a look out in the street. Hey. Police. Prowl car. Two guys coming in this building. Some of your friends, Diamond. You say the envelope was empty? What if they are some of his friends? What if they found Patty? I told you to shut up. Why'd you kill Patty? You knew he'd already sent the envelope. Knock him off, Agnes. Quiet. Hey, somebody getting out of the elevator. You keep your face shut, Diamond. Paul, get over behind the door. What are you going to do? Diamond, you stay right there at the desk. Say one wrong thing and you and a couple of more get dead. My, my. Hello, Rick. I got over here just Good night, see. Lieutenant. Good night. Good night. Oh, what you mean is good afternoon. Ooh. Believe me, Walt, I meant good night. <laughs> Good 
NBC is bringing you Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Yes, dear sweet little Agnes had slipped out from behind the door and let Walt have it right behind the ear. He went down like a 16-pound shot in an elevator shaft. Then Aggie and her playmates started backing off. They opened the door and Aggie Darlin pointed the business end of the silencer about halfway up my hand-painted tie. Whether or not she would have shot is anybody's guess. But along about that time, a very dear old friend stepped up behind her. Drop it, lady. The other cop. You can drop yours too, Sonny. Oh, Otis, bless your little pointed head. You fool. Why didn't you look first? Well, I, I forgot. Forgot? Okay, over against the wall. Keep your hands up high. Hey, how's the lieutenant? Oh, uh, oh, he'll come around. Walt. Mm-hmm. Oh, Walty. Mm-hmm. Which one let him have it? Agnes. The dame? The other one's named Paul. Come on, Walt. Oh. oh, come on, Walt. It's spring again. You know, birds and bees and all that sort of rot. Ah, that's a good boy. Now, now try and sit up. Oh, my head. What happened? What happened? <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Walt, you've been crowned queen of the fifth precinct. Who did it? No, no, no. Don't look at Otis. He's been reading his Tom Swift, Rived in the Nick. Look, there. Huh? Them? Them. And Otis saved the day. What did he do? Wander in without his collar and scare them to death? Agnes, uh, he, uh, she's the one with the sweater. Agnes crowned you. Look, uh, where did these two figure, huh? Oh, they're the pair who ran out of the building after the messenger was killed. Put the cuffs on them, Otis. Yes, sir. Okay, you put out your right and you put out your left. And I'll be in Sing Sing before you. And I'll be in... Th- to get him. Now bring him over here. Go on, lady. Okay. Keep your hands to yourself. Here's the artillery, Lieutenant. 38 Special with a silencer this 45 auto. Mm, silencer, that's enough to book him in itself. All right. You kill the messenger? No. How about Patty Clark? We don't know who you mean. They know. That's your story. Well, we'll take him down and book him. Happy now, Rick? No. I want to know who has the envelope and what's in it. Envelope? Yeah. The girl at the messenger service finally remembered. Come on, let's take these two down to headquarters. <laughs> Still not talking. Did you find anything in the files? Well, both have records. Guy's Paul Barrows, Agnes is his wife. One conviction apiece, May 1938, suspicion of passing counterfeit money. Uh-huh. Convicted, did time, parole. Oh, you got a fresh address on them? They've been living in Flatbush. Otis went over with some of the boys to check. Good. And here's some fancy news. Just yesterday, the FBI started watching all of Patty's cigar stores as possible fences for phony money. Yeah? Well, then it ties. Come on, I want to take a look at Patty Clark's room. There, beside a couple of bags he'd packed for the trip. Oh? Four slugs in the chest, no struggle. Anybody in the building hear the shots? No, and the 38 your little girlfriend had wore a silencer, remember? Hmm. When did the coroner say Patty was shot? About six this morning. What's that? Oh, a little address book. Patty must have used the speed messenger service more than once. Look, see here? Here's the address and phone number. Oh. Now, Walt, let's go over and take a look at Agnes and Paul Barra's place in Flatbush. See what Otis has found out. Oh, oh, hi, Lieutenant. Hello, Detective. Well, thanks, Otis. You drop your watch? Turn up anything? Uh, No, nothing much. What do you mean by nothing much? Well, nothing. That's what I was afraid of. Hey, is there an address book around here anywhere? Over by the phone. Why? Just getting my jollies, Otis. Love to look at new numbers. Now, see if Speed Messenger Service is listed. Yeah? Hmm. Yeah, right here on the back page. Paul. Well, yeah? Patty was killed at six this morning, huh? Right. Six this morning. You know, I wonder when he gave the Messenger Service that envelope. You know, the one addressed to me? Well, the place wouldn't have been open at six this morning, so it must have been sometime yesterday. That's right. And back in his room, his bags were all packed. Well, I think he wanted to make sure he'd be out of town before I got that envelope. I'm way ahead of you. Hello, Henderson? Levinson. Plan any plane or train reservations for Patty Clark? Well, if you didn't, I'll show you where I keep that bottle of lighter yes. fluid in my office. Uh, does that include me too, right. Diamond? There's only one bottle, Otis. Rick, Patty had tickets for a plane to California and then a boat to the Philippines. Well, I'll lay you even money that Agnes and that Paul character didn't knock off the messenger or Patty Clark. What? 
Hmm? All they wanted was that envelope. Envelope? Envelope? That's why they came after me, and Patty didn't have it. No? Then who has? Otis, stop sneaking up. Now, Rick, what about the counterfeiting angle? Otis, uh, Otis, go over and check on the speed messenger service. Hmm. See if anybody could have pilfered that envelope and put another in its place or something. And be sure to call me. Why don't we do that? On account of her going back to the precinct and talk to Agnes Barrows. Got them waiting outside. Good. And here's something you like. Ballistic says the 38 your Aggie was carrying is not the gun that killed Paddy Clark or the messenger. Swell. Okay, show them in. Hello, Aggie, darling. I'm sorry I didn't shoot a hole in your head. <laughs> Isn't she a doll? What do you want out of us? We ain't got nothing to say. Oh, uh, we'll see, we'll see. Now, we know that Paddy Clark was fencing counterfeit money for you two. Now, ain't that peachy. Mm-hmm. I, uh, Walt, get the phone. Yeah. Hello? Uh, Lieutenant, I'm down at the speed messenger service. Well, congratulations, Otis. We thought you'd get lost. Walt, let me talk to him. Sure. Otis? Yeah? Mr. Cartwright there where I can talk to him? He's right here. He isn't? Yeah. I mean, no. I mean, he's right here. Well, if Cartwright isn't there, put the girl on. Cartwright is here. He's standing right next to me. She isn't? She? No, he. Cartwright's a he. Can't you get anything straight? They've skipped? Huh? Whole place cleaned out? No, there's plenty of people... Oh, now, wait a minute. Hold the phone a second. They've skipped, Walt. I'll pull out a general. Skipped? Why, those dirty... Oh, shut up. Didn't you hear? Didn't you hear what he said? They skipped. How do you know? You're gonna take his word? Anderson, put out a general on Cartwright and his girlfriend. That dirty, no good, double crossing Cartwright. Look, kiddies, that guy's framed you two from the very first. Why don't you talk? The state will make it easier for you. Agnes? I don't know. I don't know. Sure, tell him. We've been getting the run around ever since he got Hello? us in this deal. Hello? Okay. Okay. Hey. Hold it, Otis. But, uh, I said hold it. Go on, Agnes. Well, I. I don't know whether Cartwright killed him or not, but. But Paul and me sure didn't. What about that envelope that Patty Clark sent to me? What was in it? Counterfeit dough. Some of the stuff we made with Cartwright. Why send it to me? Oh, because Patty got sore at Cartwright and wanted to blow the racket wide open. He was crazy to send it through the speed messenger service. Sure he was. Yeah, I think I get it now. When Cartwright found it out, he killed the messenger and had you two there just to make it look like you'd done it. Sure, the lousy. Uh, Otis. Hey, listen, how long can a guy hold Otis, for? Otis, Otis, Otis. You want to be a hero? Huh? How close is Cartwright standing to you at this minute? Uh, he's about a foot away. Well, just reach out oh. and slap the cuffs on him. Really? Yeah, and something else, Otis. What? You may use the siren all the way home. <laughs> Oh, Rick, it's nice to have you here with your face in one piece. Yeah, lucky, ain't I? <laughs> That's pretty. Why don't you sing it? Well, I... Oh, no. Mm, let me get it. It's got to be Walt. Yeah? Rick, I just wanted to let you know that Cartwright was behind the whole setup. Printed the stuff right down the basement of the speed messenger service. Rick? Uh, Harold Abernocker speaking. Owner of the largest hog ranch outside of Little Rock. You don't say. Sure, Dad. What's the matter? You need an ear horn or something? Rick, so help me if you don't stop this. My uh, name's Harold, bud. Harold. That's that. That's my name. Now, you just hang on and let you mash your molars with a missus. I don't want to mash my molars with a missus. I want to talk She talks to you. louder than I do. Used to call the hogs herself, you know. Lula Bell? Lula Bell. Howdy. <laughs> Having trouble with your hearing, huh? Now, Helen, listen. Calling me, Harold? No, no, friend. My name's Lulu Bell. Maybe you got the same trouble like my Uncle Zeke. Used to stick a plug of tobacco in his ear overnight and always forgot it. Oh, my God. Yeah, we thought he's plumb deep till I started calling the hogs and it shook the tobacco loose. Now, you just relax and I'll unplug you. Oh, this is ridiculous. Work for Uncle Zeke. Hold on to your teeth. Sweep! <laughs> Find any loose tobacco? <laughs> he hung up. <laughs> Give me the phone, yeah. Good old Walt. I'll drive him out of his mind. Fifth Precinct, Lieutenant Levinson. Walt? Oh, no. Now, you listen to oh, me. Don't get loud with me, Grouchy. I just called up to find out what happened on the case. Huh? Now, look, I just told well, you... If you don't want to tell me, okay, be a sorehead. I'm not going through that apple knocker routine again. What are you talking about? Lula Bell called Otis all the way in from a stake out in Flatbush. Look, I don't know what you're talking about. If you don't want to keep me in on the know, just forget it. Gosh... What's the matter now? Maybe, maybe I did have the wrong number. 
What a bunch of idiots. Okay, so you had the wrong number. What about the case? Oh, uh, yeah. Well, it, it seems that Cartwright yeah, was really the one behind the whole setup. Killed Patty Clark, Sam Farrell's We've got to stay with the happy people. Have your fun, live in the land of joy. Stay with the happy people. Face the sun, life is a Christmas toy. Down through the endless ages, tears have been contagious. And take it from me, that misery is looking around for company. So stay, stay, stay with the happy people. Don't wrinkle your brow, it's strictly out of style. Just stay with the people who love to wear a smile. Helen, is the boss still talking? Wait a minute, Arthur. really had blood in his hands. He's been cleaning yeah, up that counterfeit racket for years. Well, right, might as well sing another chorus. <laughs> We've got to stay with the happy people. Have your fun, live in the land of joy. Stay with the happy people. Face the sun, life is a Christmas toy. Down through the endless ages, tears have been contagious. And take it from me, that misery is looking around for company. So stay, stay, stay with the happy people. Don't wrinkle your brow, it's strictly out of style. Just stay, stay, stay with people who love, love, love to wear a smile. We arrived at, Otis says there must have been more than 100,000 in phony bills. We got the plates and everything. You don't say. Yeah, that just about ties it up. Well, Walt, I'm sure glad to have heard all that. Oh, uh, wait a minute. Uh, someone wants to say hello to you. Oh, yeah? Wow. Oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> you have just heard Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Lieutenant Levinson was played by Ed Begley. Also in the cast were Virginia Del Valle, Wilms Herbert, Lucille Meredith, Michael Ann Barrett, Carlton Young, and Frank Gerstle. Music was under the direction of Frank Worth. Tonight's show was written by Blake Edwards, and the entire production was under the direction of Jack Johnstone. Dick Powell currently may be seen in the motion picture version of the best-selling novel, Mrs. Mike. There's more thrill-packed listening for you throughout the week when NBC presents other great adventure mystery dramas. Nightbeat and Dangerous Assignment are two action-filled shows you'll want to make a steady date with every Monday night over most of these NBC stations. Yes, on Monday, travel the nightbeat of the Chicago Star with newsman Randy Stone. There's poignant adventure as Randy searches the city at night for an unusual and intriguing story. Also on Monday, join Brian Donlevy in Dangerous Assignment. As Steve Mitchell, soldier of fortune, Donlevy journeys to the corners of the earth in search of adventure, fortune, and fair play. Yes, now on Monday, hear two great adventure mystery programs, Night Beat and Dangerous Assignment, on NBC. This is Eddie King inviting you to be with us next Wednesday at this same time, when we will again bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Screen Guild Theater stars Ginger Rogers tomorrow night on NBC. Tired of the everyday grind? Ever dream of a life of romantic adventure? Want to get away from it all? We offer you... Escape. Escape, designed to free you from the four walls of today for a half hour of high adventure. You are high on the frozen.
frozen slopes of a great mountain, terrified and caught in a blizzard, while the thing for which you've been hunting has suddenly become the hunter. And if it finds you, then for you and your companions, there can be no escape. So listen now as Escape brings you Anthony Ellis' exciting story, The Abominable Snowman. first bit of luck was when we hired our Sherpa guide, Nasang. That was in Darjeeling. When I told Nasang what we were after, he hesitated for a moment. And then he said, The Saibs have not come to climb Shomolongma? Oh, no. We're a little late for that. It's already been done. The other two Saibs and myself are here for the reason I told you. Meto Kangmi? That's right. The Saibs always hire me to climb the mountain with them. But never this. Are you afraid of them? I have seen one. You've seen one? Yes, many of us have seen them. Uh, uh, Wait a minute. Alan. Yeah, what's that? I'm interviewing a Sherpa in here. He says he's seen one of the things. Hey. Where's Frank? Uh, Went out to get some tobacco. All right, come on in. I think this is our man. All right. Nasang? This is Mr. Ferris. Saab? Hello, Nasang. Nasang was telling me about what he'd seen. Go ahead, Nasang. It has a face that is evil. And when it saw me, it uttered a strange cry and bounded away. Sometimes leaping, sometimes running with great strides. It was dusk. And after a moment, I lost sight of it in the snow. Where were you? With the French expedition. It was at 19,000 feet. On Shomolungma. How far were you from it? Mm, 30 feet, uh, perhaps 35. You're sure it wasn't an ape? I am sure. There is no ape in Himalaya to make such a track. What about bears? This too I have been asked. But does a bear walk always upon its hind legs? Well, that's enough for me. Alan? Yeah, he'll do. But if you want the job, Nasang, you're hired. You are going to try to capture a yeti? Yes. It will be a difficult thing, but I will serve with you. Yeti, wild man, Netokangmi, abominable snowman. That's the name the natives had for the things, and... Alan Ferris, Frank Davis, and I were going to try to get one. We'd all done some climbing, but climbing was secondary here. Expeditions since the beginning of the 20th century had heard of the abominable snowman, observed their tracks, and one or two white men claimed to have seen them. Great ape, bear, monkey, wild men. We didn't know, but we were going to find out. Four weeks later, we were in the Rongbuk Valley for our interview at the monastery with the Lama. The journey from our base had been uneventful. The weather was good and our spirits were high. From the Lama's window, we could see the great peak of Everest in the distance. Why, gentlemen, do you desire to capture Metokangmi? Because, sir, we believe it will be an invaluable aid in our prehistoric research. That is, if these things are in any way human. And for this reason, then, you have formed the expedition? Yes. You are all familiar with climbing? Yes, we are. You would need to be. The Yeti move at high places, dangerous places, so my people tell me. Also, the monsoons are arriving in a short time. I understand that. Then do we have your permission to investigate in the valley and beyond? You have my permission. Oh, thank you. Appreciate it. There is one point, however. I must request that no wild animal or being in this valley be shot. Our religion does not allow it. We'll respect your wishes, sir. 
Now, may I ask you one more thing? Of course, my son. Do you believe in the existence of Metokangmi? I myself have never seen them, but I know that they live here, above the valley, on the goddess mother of the world. It is also true that at least five, and possibly more, inhabit the upper Rongbuk and its glaciers. Thank you. Do you have porters? Our guide, Nasang, is hiring them now. Yeah. I trust that he meets with good fortune. The old man, with great dignity, bowed slightly to us and we were dismissed. But I thought I saw the shadow of a smile on his lips as he turned away. And it wasn't long before I found out why. Nasang returned to us in our quarters and his face warned of bad news. Sir, I am unable to hire any porters. Well, why not? They know the purpose of the expedition. They will not go. Why? They are afraid. Of the snowmen? Yes. They live in peace with them. They wish no trouble. They are afraid. <sighs> well, all right. It'll be rough, but we can't waste time talking them into it. The monsoons will be coming in a couple of weeks. It's not the same as climbing, Everest. We'll travel light, just the four of us. Set up a base and start hunting. All right with you, fellows? Okay. Yeah, sure. Nasang? I will go with you. I am not afraid. Good. Well, let's take a look at the map. Now, we'll each carry a capacity load. And we should be able to make this point below the glacier in two days. That's 16,000 feet. Mm. And if our abominable snowmen are in the vicinity, we've got two weeks to find them. Uh, when do we start? Tomorrow. Good. Well, that's it. Um, Paul? Yes, Frank? Uh, one thing. What, what do the natives mean when they say they don't want any trouble with the things? Uh, superstition, probably. Oh, no, sir. It is not superstition. It is because the Yeti are cannibals. That is why the porters are afraid. The weather turned ugly the day we left the village. A cold Tibetan wind blew down from the west, and with our heavy packs it took us much longer than we'd thought to arrive at the point just below the Rangbuk Glacier. We set up our camp and made ourselves as comfortable as we could. The next morning wasn't so bad. There was a heavy overcast, a promise of snow, and the peak of Everest looming over us was shrouded in clouds. The four of us sat in the tent looking at our charts and drinking hot tea. I figured it'd be easiest if we started at the East Glacier. It's only about three miles from here, and with the weather as stinking as it is, we won't run too much of a risk. What do you think, Paul? Well, that sounds all right. What do you say we split up? <sighs> you and Nasung, Alan and me. We'll work up on either side of the ridge, here. And if we spot any tracks, fire two shots, hmm? Yeah, good enough. Now, the big thing, though, no matter what... Don't shoot at the thing if you do see it. Okay? Okay. All right. If we lose touch with each other, we'll meet back here at five. All right, let's get going. We'd left the base at six that morning, and the going was rough. Alan was pretty well shot by the time we got to the 17,000-foot mark. He was having a tough time breathing, and the wind had come up again. And with it, a fine, powdery snow that blinded and choked us. Hey, I, I gotta take five. All right. Here, yeah, move over here. It might cut some of the wind. Oh... Oh. oh, that's better. Oh, we might as well start back for the base. We couldn't see anything in this anyhow. You know, right now, I don't care whether we're doing that. Uh, this is good weather. Wait until the monsoon starts. No, no, not me. Oh, I'm cold. I've never been so cold in all my life. We 
we stayed in the half shelter of an overhang for ten minutes and the wind was quieter and the snow had let up. I noticed that the tracks we'd made coming into the shelter were gone now, but we didn't have any worry finding our way back. I figured that Frank and Nassang had met pretty much the same thing on their side of the ridge and we'd meet them at the base. So Alan and I picked ourselves up and started off. Boy, I, I thought I was in pretty good shape, but up here, boy, I'm nothing. Oh, Paul, I'm tired again. Uh, we'll just take it easy going down. You haven't got frostbite, have you? No, no, not yet, but... What? The left there. Yeah. They're, they're not our tracks, are they? Not unless you took your boots off on the way up. Must have just passed by. It must have seen us. Yeah. Come on. We were looking at a set of tracks newly made in the fresh snow. And they'd passed so close to our shelter that the thing must have known we were there. They weren't the tracks of a bear or an ape, but more like a splay-footed naked foot. The tracks of the abominable snowman. We will return to escape in just a moment, but first, 30 million school children make their way back to class this year. There are just 10 million too many for existing school facilities. Contact Better Schools to West 45th Street, New York 19, for information on ending this menace to America's educational standards. And now, back to Escape. We began to follow the tracks, and for a while, perhaps 150 yards, it was easy. And then the thing made a leftward traverse down a deep slope. We could see the prince clearly, angling with a sidestep, as sure-footed as a mountain goat, except that it was walking on two legs. This way, Paul. <laughs> Take it easy, Alan. It's get, getting steeper. Boy, that thing sure can climb. Hold up. Alan? I think they... Hold it! And he dropped out of sight over the lip of the crevasse. We weren't roped together. I got as close as I dared to the edge. The loose snow crumbled away from my outstretched body. And I looked down into the blue-black darkness below, falling away into nothingness. He was gone. Finished. All I could think of was the noise he'd made when he went over. Surprised, angry, then silence. The crevasse might have been 500 feet or 5,000. Snow started to fall again. Big flakes this time and wet. I stood up and across the gap 20 feet away I saw the tracks of the thing continuing on and away until they became lost in the blank whiteness of the glacier. It had jumped and landed still upright on the opposite side. I went back to the base. And an hour later, Frank and Nassang returned. I told them, and we were quiet for a long time. Then... Paul, are we going out again tomorrow? Why not? I just wanted to. We should go back. It is an omen. I tell you, he was going too fast. He didn't have a chance to see the crevasse. That's not an omen, it's bad sense. Meto Kangmi cannot be caught. We'll catch him. Uh, but there are only three of us. If we had a few more men... I tell you, the thing was so close that we'd, if we'd looked up at the right time, we'd have seen it. You think I'm going to give up now? Next time we'll get it. There was no chance to get Alan out. Huh? No. You think if we went back... We'd... Listen, you think I don't want to? He's gone. I tried, but he's gone. Okay, oh, okay. Wish that wind had let up. Maybe by morning. We'll try again tomorrow. It was cold that night. 
and somehow colder because Alan was gone. I heard Frank tossing around, and I knew he was thinking about a body broken and lonely, lost somewhere in a deep and dark place. In the morning, the three of us packed our gear, camera, food. It was a light pack. We started up again, this time to a crest above the ridge. It was tougher than it looked, and we weren't even halfway up before we had to rest. But as I looked to the west, I saw clouds boiling up. Not white, but somber, threatening. And below, the valley looked grim, ugly gray. And then the sun was gone. And we kept on going up. And then I had a strange feeling. It was nothing I could see, nothing I could hear, only a sensation of being watched, followed. Wait a minute. See something? No. I, I have felt it too, Saib. Something following us? Yes. It is Metukangmi. How do you know? It can be nothing else. At this site, there is nothing else that lives. Maybe it's curious. No, don't turn around, Frank. Listen. When we get up to the crest, you two flop down. Stay in sight of the slope here. What are you going to do? Move around the hump and watch. If it thinks we're all together, it may come close enough to give us a chance to get it. You better watch your step. It looks nasty. I will. Now, come on. It took us another 15 minutes to get up to the crest, and then Frank and Nassang hunched down to rest. They were in clear view of the slope we just descended. I moved back out of sight and made my way toward the hump, which backed a long shelf on the north side of the crest. In a couple of minutes, I lost sight of them and of the slope. The wind had increased and the clouds had spread now to become an iron gray canopy over the mountain. It was getting colder again. I don't think it took over five minutes to reach my lookout point. And when I did, I had a perfect view of the ground we'd covered. There was nothing there. The men were out of sight. And I waited. A minute, two. There was nothing. Until... It came, carried on the wind, a cry, and then shots. I scrambled back to where I'd left them. And when I got there, when I got there, Frank was lying on his back, and I couldn't look at what was left of his face. There were terrible deep rents in his clothing, and he was dead. The song lay huddled a few feet beyond, a gun in his hand. Son? Yeah. What is it? What? Metukang me. They came from behind us. Be, be, before I could draw the gun, it has killed. Then it sprang at me. It is strong, Saib, with the strength of ten men. All right. All right, can you sit up? My leg... It struck at me, my leg broken. I shot at it, but I missed. It jumped away and was gone. Okay. We'll have to figure out a way to get you down. We were four hours from camp, and with Nassang practically helpless, it could well be four days or never. I buried Frank where he was lying, then began to work down the slope. Nassang was in great pain. He half slid and crawled as best he could. That part of it wasn't too bad. Then we were at the bottom and there was a ledge to climb. It took well over two hours to do that. And we still had three miles of difficult terrain to cover. The stops became more frequent. Stop. Leave me here. Go back. No. My leg is frozen. There is no feeling anymore. I shall not live much longer. Don't be a fool. After a rest, you'll be able to go on. Soon the night comes. If we are both caught here, we both die. There will be snow, much snow. Leave me, sir. No, we're going back together. Please, let me sleep. Let me sleep here. I cannot go on. You've got to, Nassan. No, 
No more. The ridge is only about a half mile from there. It won't be too bad. No. No, let me stay. Nasan. Let me sleep. No. No, come on, Nasan. Come on, you're not going to sleep. Yes, sir. You'll sir. be all right. Behind you, sir. Uh, I turned, and for an instant I saw it outlined against the snow, crouching of medium height. It was covered with thick hair. The face was reddish and bare. A semi-human face. And it was not an ape. The thing made a tremendous leap and was gone, but I'd hit it. I knew I hit it. But the Kongmi, that was he. Did you kill it? No, I don't think so. Then it will be back. It has tasted blood. You must leave me. No, get up. Get up. Come on. Let's go. The song. I am very sorry, sir. Will you ask the lama to make a prayer for me? Sure. Sure I will, Nasang, but... Give my pay to my wife in their healing. I'm sorry, sir. I die. Nasang? Nasang? the darkness came, and with its shadows in the snow, every hillock mound became the thing, motionless, waiting. In my mind, I kept seeing it, its long arms, powerful, and the dreadful claws it must have possessed. I carried my gun in my gloved hand, but I knew that I couldn't fire it unless I was barehanded, and that meant my hand would freeze to the gun. And then suddenly, I felt myself slipping. <coughs> It was a short incline, but when I reached the bottom, the gun was gone. I'd lost it. I've got to find it. I've got to find it. And I saw a glint of metal in the snow ten feet away. And at the same time, above me at the top of the bank, the thing, it stood swaying a little, looking down at me. I moved slowly. Slowly inch my way toward the gun <laughs> and as I drew closer I kept my eyes looking up but it didn't move only stared down at me and I thought I saw its little eyes glittering and I thought if the gun's frozen now if it's frozen it doesn't fire and I was nearer to it near enough to take off my glove but that moment in which I'd have to bend to pick it up that's when it would leap down at me tear my throat out tear and I had the gun and I pulled the trigger. <laughs> and it lay there, strange and terrifying, its blood staining the snow. And it looked at me. Looked at me. Until the sound died away. It was dead, but the eyes kept on staring. <laughs> it must have been the shots that loosened the snow and ice on the ridge above. I heard the sound, and I ran, ran! Passed me and swept on down toward the valley, the thunder of it dying in the distance. And when I went back, there was nothing there. It was buried somewhere under tons of snow. I made my way back to the wrong book village. I don't remember how. I didn't remember anything for two weeks after. 
but I'm alive. And I'm not going back there again. That's all I know. Or want to know about the abominable snowmen. Escape has brought you The Abominable Snowman, written and directed by Anthony Ellis, starring William Conrad as Lane. Featured in the cast were Anthony Barrett, High Averback, Jack Crucian, and Edgar Barrier. The special music for Escape was composed and conducted by Leith Stevens. Next week... You are a passenger aboard a submarine making its last peaceful voyage across the sea. While unknown to you, the captain has a plan which, if it succeeds, will mean for you and the entire crew a fate from which there can be no escape. So listen next week when Escape will bring you Marion Mosner and Francis Rosenwald's exciting story, The Log. You're headed in the right direction. The station is right, the network is right too. Check all timepieces and then check your local radio schedule. Let's have no slip-ups. Everybody wants to hear the Jack Benny Show right from the beginning when it returns to CBS Radio tonight. This is Roy Rowan speaking. This is the CBS Radio Network. This episode from the life of Sherlock Holmes will be transmitted to our men and women overseas by shortwave and through the worldwide facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. Petri Wine brings you... Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce in the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes. The Petri family, the family that took time to bring you good wine... Invite you to listen to Dr. Watson tell us another exciting story about his good friend, that master detective, Sherlock Holmes. And I'd like to tell you something that maybe you already know. The fact that America's favorite wine is port wine. Did you know that? If you didn't, you'll know why port is the way out front favorite if you'll just sample some Petri California port. You just look at that Petri port and you know it's good. That wonderful, deep, rich red color. And Petri Port is so clear. Just hold it to the light and you can sort of see right through the glass. But what you want to know really about a wine is how does it taste. And I'll tell you something. I've never yet been able to find the adjective that'll do Petri Port justice. It's wonderful. Honest. You've just got to taste it for yourself and find out for yourself. You'll love that Petri Port in the evening after dinner when you're sitting around listening to the radio. And it's perfect to serve your friends when they come over. You can show them that Petri label, too. In fact, you can show it proudly. Because the name Petri is the proudest name in the history of American wines. (laughs) 
And now for our weekly doctor's visit. Let's see... Oh, no, no, Mr. Bartell, don't say let's see if he's expecting us. You know, I always expect you this time on Monday evenings, my boy. So draw up your usual chair and settle down. Thanks, Doctor. Ah, oh, that's it. Ah, all alone this evening, Doctor? Where are the puppies? Out on the patio. They had a most unfortunate encounter with a dead seal on the beach this afternoon. In consequence, they're a little, uh, malodorous, shall we say. <laughs> In that case, Doctor, perhaps we'd better change the subject. So, suppose I ask you about tonight's new Sherlock Holmes adventure. Well, my boy, as I told you last week, the story took place in the foul alleyways of Limehouse. It was there on a foggy December evening in 1890 that my story began. An old friend and patient of mine, Isa Whitney, had disappeared, and his distraught wife had come to me for help. Knowing the man to be the victim of the shocking habit of taking opium, I suspected that I might find him in one of the vile dens inhabited by the dregs of the waterfront. And so, Mr. Bartell, about five o'clock on that December evening, I began my search. After an hour of fruitless wanderings, I found myself in a vile alley called Upper Swandham Lane. I could hear the distant moans of the riverboats as I walked, eyes alert, and hand on the revolver in my coat pocket. Suddenly, I saw a steep flight of steps leading down to a black gap, like the mouth of a cave. I walked down them. The steps were worn hollow in the center by the ceaseless tread of stumbling feet. I reached the bottom. A door faced me, and above it, a frickling oil lamp winked warnings at me. I found the latch and lifted it. The door squeaked open protestingly. And I entered. There was a tinkle of Chinese wind bells as I walked towards a long, low room. A strange sight met my eyes. Through the gloom, thick and heavy with a brown opium smoke, I saw that the room was terraced with wooden berths, like the forecastle of an emigrant ship. Out of the shadows, there glimmered little red circles of light, now bright, now faint, as a burning poison waxed or waned in the metal pipes. Bodies lay in strange, fantastic poses. Bowed shoulders, bent knees, heads thrown back. The attendant came up to me with a pipe and beckoned me to an empty berth. I haven't come here to smoke your filthy drug. I'm looking for a friend, Mr. Isa Whitney. No, Mr. Whitney here. Well, I'm going to search the place. You must not disturb the place. I'm carrying a revolver, so you'd better not argue with me, my good man. Out of the way. I searched that filthy den, but found no trace of my missing friend. As I was leaving in despair, a long shaking hand reached out and plucked at my sleeve. I turned, and there sprawled in a berth was the wreckage of a man. His gaunt face yellow and twitching, his clothes filthy and ragged, and the pupil of his eyes like pinpoints. He spoke to me in a thin, quavering voice. For heaven's sake, get me out of here. Now, look here, my man. Don't say you won't help me, Governor. Ain't you got no heart? Please help me, Governor. Take me out of here. Strike me pink. I'm going to bomb you, I tell you. Oh, what must you expect if you indulge in this filthy habit? Take me out of here, Governor. I'll go straight this time. Cross me out, I will. Oh, very well. Come along with me. I suppose it's my duty to help you. Ah, oh, bless you, Governor. Here, you are. here, now, give me your arm. You cannot take him away. He owe me money. That's a bleeding lie. I paid him when I come in, I did. He cannot go with you, mister. You remember what I said about my revolver, you blackguard? If I have any more trouble with you, I'll, I'll fetch the police. Come along. He owe me money. He owe me money. Infernal scuttle owe me money. You tell him all proper, money. Governor. And I hope you didn't. Now, look here, my good man. I'll give you a square meal, some advice, and some medical attention. But the rest... Never mind I... the advice, Watson, but I'll take you up on that square meal. Holmes! Yes, I'm very glad to see you, old fellow. What brought you to that filthy den of iniquity? Oh, this is me. I want to find a friend. And I, an enemy. <laughs> Your disguise is wonderful. It completely fooled me. But I'm afraid the proprietor was beginning to penetrate it. That's why I staged the little rescue scene. Had I been recognized, my life wouldn't have been a w worth an hour's purchase. Well, how long had you been there? Why were you there? Come on, Holmes. Tell me all about it. With pleasure, old chap. But first, let's find a, a chop house. 
I want that square meal you promised me. An excellent meal, Watson. Yes, you're surprisingly good for such a shoddy-looking place. Well, Holmes, now perhaps you'll tell me what you were doing in that opium den. I've already told you my story. I'm shadowing a most unusual criminal. A man who haunts the opium dens. And yet I know that he himself is not an addict. Well, I don't see anything very criminal about that. He might be looking for a thrill, or perhaps he's one of those writer fellows or something. But this man pretends to be an addict. I've watched him closely. He fakes his smoking. And grease paint has enabled him to simulate the characteristic pallor of a drug victim. He even affects the typical mannerism of nose scratching. But it's his eyes that give him away. Well, the pupils are wide open, I suppose. Exactly, old fellow. Whereas... If he were really addicted to the drug, they would, as you know, be contracted. I myself always treat my eyes with a special, well, a special kind of drop on the occasion when, uh, well, I have to enter these dens. Well, why does a man haunt an opium den in order not to smoke? That, my dear Watson, is the problem that I intend to solve. Well, perhaps the fellow's a policeman or a private detective like yourself, Holmes. I've already checked on those possibilities. No, Watson, I believe there is only one answer. I believe the man is planning a murder. A murder? A tempting setting for a murder. Your victim is an addict, drugged and helpless. Your witnesses are in an equal state of befuddlement. The proprietor is anxious to cover up the crime because of the police. That you. Yes, sir. Now, the question is, who is the intended victim? That, my dear Watson, is why I've been shadowing this man. Unfortunately, he was not present in the den we just left, but I intend to continue my search. Holmes, uh, can, can I help you? My, my wife's away, you know. You know, it's... A long time since we were on a case together. I should be delighted, my dear chap. I've missed you sadly during the past few months. And I, you, Holmes. What's the next move? Back to Baker Street, old fellow. My disguise is wearing thin and I must contrive a new one. New disguise, eh? Well, which one shall it be, Watson? Well, how about the old flower seller? <laughs> I love that one. <laughs> well, it's... Pretty impressive, yes, right. Oh, no, 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 my dear fellow, no. Hardly appropriate for an opium den. In any case, the clothes are so wretchedly uncomfortable. Well, how about the music hall singer? Oh, that chap, yes. Oh, I don't want to be beside the seaside. Oh, I don't want to be beside the sea. I don't want to stroll along the prom, 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 where the brass band plays tiddly um. Oh, confound it. Who can that be? You weren't expecting anyone, were you? No. So this is just like the old days. The doorbell ringing, Mrs. Hudson toddling off, and... Bringing up some poor devil in trouble and... You say that rather wistfully, old fellow. Don't tell me that you repent of marriage. No, of course not, Holmes. Mary's a perfect darling and I couldn't be happier. Just the same. <laughs> it is rather fun to be back here again. Come in. Yes, Mrs. Hudson? Uh, it's a gentleman, sir. He gave me this card. Says he's very anxious to see you. Hmm. Wayne J. Layton. President, Layton Corporation, Chicago, United States. Ask him to come up, will you, Mrs. Hudson? Aye, sir. Well, it's quite the cold times to see you back here, Dr. Watson. That's just what I was saying myself, Mrs. Hudson. Hmm. Mr. Layton has scribbled a message on the back of his card. If a thousand pounds for a week's work interests you, you'll see me. A thousand pounds? Big fish, Watson. Very big fish. Uh, this way, sir. Uh, thank you. Oh. How do you do, Mr. Layton? I guess you're Sherlock Holmes. You guessed correctly, sir. Excuse me. Oh, Mrs. Hudson, just a moment, Mrs. Hudson. Aye, Mr. Holmes. Sit down, won't you, Mr. Layton? My name's Watson, Dr. Watson. I'm Sherlock Holmes' colleague. Uh, yes, I've, I've heard about you, too. Uh, like a cigar, Doctor? It's a good one. Sent me back three shillings. Oh, three shillings? Oh, thank you. That's very nice. You just put one. Oh, no, I think you did yourself. Oh, Splendid. And now, Mr. Layton, may I ask what brings you here? I'll talk fast and to the point. I'm a businessman. I like to do things in a business way. I have a chance to control the guano deposits at the Republic of San Pedro. Their minister will be in London tomorrow, and if it weren't for one thing, I know that I could swing the deal and get the concession. And what is that one thing, Mr. Layton? The deal is secret, see? I thought no one knew about it, but when I got here, I found out that my biggest business rival has gotten wind of what's going on. He's an Englishman. I've never met him, but uh, he's right here in London. Now, I'm not going to tell you his name, not until you give me your word that you'll work for me. Just what you wish me to do, Mr. Layton. Get this rival of mine and keep him out of circulation for a week. I don't care how you do it, and I won't ask. In a week's time, I'll give you the other half of this 500 pounds I brought with me. Oh, good, Scott. What kind uh, of Watson, detective give you... Watson, Mr. Layton his hat and gloves. That's it. Thanks, old fellow. Goodbye, sir. Uh, what are you doing, throwing me out? I can't think where you uh, gathered the impression that I indulged in kidnapping. 
Once again, goodbye, sir. And here, sir, you can take back your cigar. Well, if you don't want some easy money, I'll soon find someone else that does. This is the last you'll see of me, Mr. Holmes. Life is full of little consolations. Hmm. Some people seem to think that money can... Watson, buy... the game's afoot. Mr. Layton is the man I've been seeking. The man who pretends to be an opium smoker. Why, well, Blaze, did you let him get away? Here, I'll go after him. No, 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 no. Don't worry. I've already arranged for that. Oh, how? When I left the room just now to talk to Mrs. Hudson, I was intending to tell her to summon some of my band of street urchins. You know, the Baker Street Irregulars. When she informed me that half a dozen of them were in the kitchen at this very moment, partaking of one of her incomparable steak and kidney pies, the rest should be obvious. You left instructions for one of them to shadow Mr. Layton when he left her? Elementary, my dear Watson. Oh, don't tell me that Layton back again. No, I think not. I should say that at the moment he's just about to walk out of the front door. No, I think we shall have another visitor. And judging by the commotion, the income and the outgoing visitors know each other and are not on the best of terms. Well, it sounds to me as if they're having a fight. Here comes Mrs. Hudson to tell us about it. Come in, come in. Oh, Mr. Holmes, you've got another visitor. Uh, so I gathered. Mrs. Hudson, you gave my instructions to one of the boys? I did that, sir. Young Wiggins was going to follow the gentleman. Well, Mrs. Hudson, what was all that commotion about downstairs just now? Oh, it was the two gentlemen shouting at each other. Him that was leaving and the one that was waiting on the doorstep. And who is our new visitor, Mrs. Hudson? Here's his card, sir. Oh, thank you. Linton Chumley, 9 Belgrave Square. Well, ask him to come up, will you, Mrs. Hudson? Very well, Mr. Holmes. Oh, one thing more. Yes, sir. Uh, please instruct another of the Baker Street Irregulars to follow this Linton Chumley when he leaves here and report to me. All right, sir. Hmm. You're taking no chances, Holmes, eh? You're having this fellow shadowed, too. Leighton is a potential murderer. Of that, I'm convinced. This Mr. Chumley might possibly be his intended victim. While we're talking to him, Watson, old fellow, I want you to be sure to look at the condition of his eyes. Oh, I certainly will. Come in. Oh, good evening, Mr. Chumley. How are you, Mr. Sherlock Holmes? I am. This is my colleague, Dr. Watson. How do you do, sir? Uh, that was Wayne Layton that was just left here, uh, wasn't it? Uh, won't you sit down, sir? Uh, thank you. I don't want to sit down. All right, you needn't answer my question, but I know it was Leighton. I've never met him, but I've seen his picture in the newspapers. Oh, very well, then, sir. It was Wayne Leighton. Ah, I know why he came to you. He's, he's trying to have me put out of the way while he closes that deal on the San Pedro and Guana concession. Now, look here, Holmes. You've got to be on my side. Whatever fee he offered you to dispose of me, I'll double it if you'll take care of him for a few days. Oh, dear me, this is becoming monotonous. Watson? The hat and gloves? Thank you, old chap. That's right. Good night, Mr. Chumley. Uh, look here, Holmes. I'll, I'll treble his fee. I'll quadruple it. My dear Mr. Chumley, I have accepted no fee from Mr. Layton. I don't propose to accept one from you. Your hat and gloves, sir? Uh, that man is out to kill me, Holmes. Well, if you won't help me, I'll go to the police. That's an excellent idea, Mr. Chumley. Again, good night. Did you notice his eyes, Watson? Yes, the pupils were contracted. He's obviously an opium addict. And also a potential corpse. But what do we do now? Wait for the irregulars to report? No, you'll return home for your medical bag. I have a feeling that you'll need it before the night is out. Then come back here. If I've gone before you return, I'll send one of the irregulars to bring you to wherever I may be. Wait until you receive a message from me. On your way, old chap. There's work ahead of us. <laughs> Wiggins, you're certain that this is the place that Mr. Holmes told you to bring me to? Oh, yes, Dr. Watson. The corner of Swanham Line and Brixel Street, Mr. Holmes said. Yeah, well, this is the spot, all right. I don't see any sign of him. Hello? This old woman coming towards us. <laughs> so that's the disguise he chose. Oh, spare me a few coppers, will you, mister? <laughs> My feet are something awful, and I ain't had a bite of food all day. <laughs> no, you don't, Holmes. You... Can't fool me this time. As a matter of fact, your makeup isn't very convincing. You hardly look like a woman, and nobody's nose could be quite as red as that. Don't look like a woman, don't I? <laughs> My nose is too red, is it? I'll take that. Uh, no, steady, look at that. Mike, funny, but poor old woman has plighted me. Oh, I, I'm sorry, like madam. I, I didn't mean to insult you. <laughs> well, matey, she gave you a bit of work for all right, didn't she? Ah, box your ears. No mistake about it. You mind your own business. <laughs> and anyhow, why aren't you aboard your ship at this time of night? Because I'm not a sailor, Watson. It's Mr. Holmes. Great heavens, Holmes. I wish you, you wouldn't confuse me like this. I'd never have recognized you. My dear Watson, when you're able to recognize me, it will indeed be the beginning of the end. When your eagle eye penetrates my disguise, I shall realize that my retirement is imminent. But enough of this. 
See that house opposite? You mean the ramshackle place with the broken tiled roof? Yes, I gave the irregulars instructions to let me know at once if our two quarries ever enter the same house at the one time. They're inside there now. And I'm going in after them. Be careful, Holmes. I'd better come along with you. Can't I come too, Mr. Holmes? No, no, certainly not. Both keep watch outside. If I need any help, I'll smash one of the windows, and then you can come in after me. Wait here for me. I don't expect I'll be very long. I'll be here, Holmes. Don't worry about me. Just take good care of yourself. <laughs> It's one o'clock, Doctor. Yes, I know, Wiggins. He's been in there half an hour. I'm beginning to get worried. Start going off, No, no, sir. no, Wiggins. You know Mr. Holmes. When he gives orders, he likes some... There, they're signaling for help. Keep watching the house, Wiggins. I'll be out in five minutes. Go for the police. Right, sir, sir. All right, Holmes, all right. I'm coming. You have searched my house from basement to attic. Why do you not give up? I tell you again, there has been no one here tonight. But my friend came in here half an hour ago. I saw him. And before that, two other men are known to have come in here. Uh, if that is so, then where are they? Three men cannot vanish. That's just the point, you scoundrel. Out of the way. I'm going to search this hovel again. I'm not leaving here until I find Mr. Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> You'll hear the rest of Dr. Watson's story in just a second. And if you don't mind, I'll take that second to say just one word to the ladies. And that word is muscatel. Petri California muscatel. I want you women to know about it because Petri muscatel is one wine that practically every woman likes. Maybe because it's such a beautiful color, like pale gold. But I guess really because Petri Muscatel brings you the wonderful flavor of luscious, sun-ripened muscat grapes. And that's a flavor. Try Petri Muscatel after dinner, or any time as a change from Petri Port. Remember, if it's a Petri wine, you know it's a good wine. And now back to Dr. Watson and tonight's story, The Eyes of Mr. Layton. Well, what happened next, Doctor? When you searched the house for the second time, did you find any trace of Sherlock Holmes or the two rival businessmen? No, Mr. Bartell, I'm afraid I didn't. What did you do? I told Wiggins to report the matter to the nearest police station and then rattle back to Baker Street in a handsome cab as fast as I could. When I arrived at the old familiar doorstep, I wrenched at the bell in a frenzy of anxiety. Finally, the door opened, and there stood Mrs. Hudson. Dr. Watson, what is it, sir? Why, you're as white as a ghost. Mr. Holmes, is he here? I, sir, came in half an hour ago. He was dressed as a sailor and was half carrying some drunken friend of his. Oh, thank heavens he's safe. I'll go up. All right, sir. I want to know, Jeff. There you are. Holmes, I can't tell you how glad I am to see you. Who's that, uh, that lying on the sofa? Well, up with your back, Watson. Oh, I'm afraid the poor devil's done for. Great Scott, it's Wayne Layton, the American fella. With a knife wound between his ribs. See what you can do for him, will you? Right. This is extraordinary, Holmes. You said that Layton was a potential murderer. And now he's a victim himself. A bite a bit, eh, old chap? Yes, he's still breathing, but he, he hasn't a chance. I'll try him with an injection of strychnine. Holmes, how did you get his body out of the house? I, I searched the place from top to bottom, I... I found no trace of any of you. When I went in, I found the stabbing had already taken place. The proprietor then bribed me, or rather the broken-down cellar he took me for, to smuggle the body out through the secret stairway leading to the wards of the back of the house. Well, there's no trace of Chumley there? No, he must have left before me by the same exit. And then you smashed the window and bolted? Yes, I knew that I could count on you to hold the fort while I was getting the body away. Uh, mm -hmm. Let's uh, try to say something, Watson. I, yes, the injection's beginning to take effect. Uh, yes, Mr. Layton? What are you trying to say? Uh, Tell us, who stabbed you, uh, sir? Shh, shh, shh. Lips are moving. Man, do I. He's dead, Holmes. Yes, but he gave us the clue to the murderer's identity. How? And the word he mumbled just before he died. Well, sounded to me as if he said Mandalay. Precisely, old fellow. 
Never did a corpse give us a clearer instruction as to our next and final move. And that is? Back to Limehouse, Watson. Back to Limehouse. Ah, here we are. This must be the place. What's this? Another opium den? Yes, I knew that since Chumley refrained from smoking earlier on in the night... In order to keep his faculties alert for murder, that an enormous reaction would set in. He'd have to find a den at once, and beyond question, a different one from that in which the murder was committed. But how do you know that he's inside here? Well, just before you returned to Baker Street tonight, I had a message from one of my irregulars. He tracked him here after he escaped from the scene of the stabbing. That was a couple of hours ago. He might have slipped away again. No, Watson, tonight he came to drown his senses with a wretched drug. He'll be here. Come on. Second injection of caffeine should bring him round. He's heavily drugged, but I think it'll work. Surprising what a five-pound note will do, isn't it? Yes, the proprietor let us bring Chumley into his private room and he... Shh, shh, shh. Mm-hmm. Look, he, he's coming mm-hmm. too. Mm-hmm. Who, who, who are you? Who, what, what do you want? You remember me, sir? I'm Sherlock Holmes. Oh, uh, yes, yes, I, I remember you. You're in serious trouble, Mr. Chumley. Very serious trouble. Uh, trouble? What What trouble? Wayne Layton didn't die. Oh. He's badly wounded, but he's going to live. He's at Baker Street now. He wants to go to the police and give evidence. You, you've got to get me out of this, Holmes. I'll, I'll pay you anything. Uh, Ten thousand, twenty thousand. Why did you stab Layton? He, he was in my way. I wanted the San Pedro concession. I, I meant to kill him. But we can fix it up now, can't we, Holmes? We can fix it up yes, now. Yes, we can fix it beautifully, sir. As neat a murder confession as ever I listened to, Holmes. Exactly. Come along, Mr. Chumley. I think some night air will be good for you. We'll take you for a nice drive to Scotland Yard. <laughs> some kippers, gentlemen. You've both been up all night, and I'm sure you can do it. That's very thoughtful of you, Mrs. Hudson. Yes, indeed it is. Uh, what is Mrs. Watson going to say when she finds you've been out all night? Oh, don't you worry about that, Mrs. Hudson. She's very understanding. <laughs> it's lucky for you that she is. Well, I'll go and leave you to your breakfast. Holmes. Yes, dear fellow? There's only one thing that puzzles me about this case. Oh, what's that? When Leighton was dying, he muttered the word Mandalay. How did that give you the key to the murderer's identity? Oh, the dead American had never met Mr. Chumley, you remember, except when they bumped into each other in our hallway. Yes, he told us that he recognized him from the newspaper photographs. Being an American, he had no reason to know that the name Chumley is in no way pronounced the way it is spelt. Oh, Joe, I never thought of that. Chumley. That name spelt C-H-O-L, Chow, M-O-N, Mon, D-E-Dur, L-E-Y. Charles Mondeley. Mondeley. Precisely, old fellow. What you thought to be Mandalay was really Charles Mondeley, the name of the murderer. What an amazing case. You did a remarkable job, Holmes. <laughs> I'm, I'm beginning to be confoundedly sleepy. Why not sleep, old chap? Your old uh, room's all ready for you. Are you going to take a nap? Oh, dear me, no. Huh? I have much too busy a day ahead of me. Let me look at my engagement book. Uh, Baxter Square Murder. Mm-hmm. I put the police on the track. The Duchess of uh, Ferrers. I got her material. The princess who was about to run away from home. Good gracious me, let her run. The Pope's cameos. Ah, yes, yes. His holiness must not be kept waiting. Uh, can, uh, can I help you again, Holmes? Uh, Mary doesn't return <laughs> until tomorrow. Well, I thought you were sleepy, old fellow. Sleepy rubbish. I never felt more wide awake in my life. <laughs> That was a swell story, Doctor. I'm glad you enjoyed it. And it was really funny when you mistook that old lady for Holmes and she slapped your face. It wasn't very really funny at all. <laughs> ah, sure it was. Come on, admit it, Doctor. Well, she did look like Holmes in disguise, you know, and 
You would have made the same mistake that I did. Okay, okay. Her nose was ridiculously red, and she did look like a man. Uh, look, Doctor, forget I ever said anything. Hmm? I won't say another word. I I'll keep my mouth closed forever. Oh, come on, I wouldn't do that. Mr. Bartell? Mr. Bartell? Uh, won't you even open your mouth to uh, finish your wine? Your, your Petri wine? Okay, you win. You know I'll open my mouth for Petri wine any time. That Petri wine is always good wine. And for good reason, too. The Petri family has always owned and operated the Petri business. They've been making fine wines for three generations, since way back in the 1800s. That adds up to a lot of experience. Experience handed on down from father to son, from father to son. The Petri family really knows how to turn luscious California grapes into fragrant, delicious wine. And that's why, no matter what kind of wine you want... I'm sure you'll like it better if it's a Petri wine. Because Petri took time to bring you good wine. And now, Dr. Watson, what story are you going to tell us next week? Well, now, next week, Mr. Bartell, I'm going to tell you a most unusual adventure that Holmes and I had in the heart of the English countryside. It concerns a corpse, a missing revolver, and a beautiful girl who was frightened of her own shadow. <laughs> Tonight's Sherlock Holmes adventure is written by Dennis Green and Anthony Boucher and is based on an incident in the Sir Arthur Conan Doyle story, The Man with the Twisted Lip. Mr. Rathbone appears through the courtesy of Metro Goldwyn Mayer and Mr. Bruce through the courtesy of Universal Pictures, where they are now starring in the Sherlock Holmes series. The Petri Wine Company of San Francisco, California, invites you to tune in again next week, same time, same station. Oh, the Petri family took the time to bring you such good wine. So when you eat and when you cook, remember Petri wine. To make good food taste better, remember... Pet, pet, Petri wine. This is Harry Bartell saying good night for the Petri family. Sherlock Holmes comes to you from our Hollywood studios. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. National Broadcasting Company invites you by transcription to join the chase. There is always the hunter and the hunted, the pursuer and the pursued. It may be the voice of authority or a race with death and destruction, the most relentless of the hunters. There are times when laughter is heard as counterpoint and moments when sheer terror is the theme. Always there is the chase. And who joins the chase as remorselessly as the man with murder in his heart? I record these events in my diary as they occurred, as a purge to my conscience, perhaps. But when it all began so many months ago, no man felt less beholden to his conscience than Gilbert Fox. It was on a grey November day in London that I decided to murder Frank Pickett. The name wasn't even known to me that morning as I awoke, bathed and dressed as usual, before leaving for my shop on Savile Row. But at 8.45, as I joined my wife Lavinia for breakfast in our flat, Frank Pickett became the one man on earth I hated and despised enough to kill. Come 
morning, Lavinia. Good morning. Breakfast ready? I'm a bit late today. I'm sorry you didn't wake me earlier. Sit down, Gilbert. There's something I want to tell you. Oh. Will you pour me some tea, please? The tea can wait. Uh, what's the matter with you, Lavinia? Are you ill? No. You look upset. You'll find out why in just a moment if you let me speak. What's wrong, my dear? I'm leaving you. Oh, what? I'm leaving you, going away. I'm getting a divorce. Oh, there's no time of day for jokes, Lavinia. I'm not joking. I mean every word I say. When you return from work this afternoon, I shall be gone. But, but why? What have I done? Nothing. We've only been married three months, Lavinia. This is unbelievable, incredible. It can't be true. But it is. But I, I love you madly, Lavinia. You know that. I've always known. And you, you said once that you'd loved me. Well, I was wrong. Wrong? I don't want to be melodramatic about this, and I'll try to be honest with you. When I married you, I thought this was what I wanted. A West End flat, a husband who adored me and who provided me with a fairly decent existence. But I was mistaken. Were you? I want more than this, Gilbert. And most of all, I want romance. A love that... Oh, how can I explain? You'd never understand. No, no. Please go on. I'll make it brief and to the point. I've met another man. I'm crazy about him, and he's very rich. I'm going to marry him after I get my divorce from you. I see. You... You you wouldn't contest the divorce, would you? I I get it in America. Then he's an American? Yes. What's his name? Well, that's not important. I want to know his name. Gilbert, you're hurting my arm. (sighs) When are you leaving? In about an hour. And I won't see you again? No. You still won't tell me who the man is? Of course not. Very well, Lavinia. Goodbye. You're going? I'm uh, late for the shop, as it is. I'll, um, I'll only take my personal things. Everything else is yours, Gilbert. Everything else? What have I left? After you're gone. Gilbert. Goodbye, Lavinia. And good luck with your new romance. I'd always known, of course, that our love affair was one-sided. I loved my beautiful Lavinia with a passion that bordered on insanity. She was my life, my happiness, the very air I breathed. I had only dared to hope that she returned a small particle of that affection. And if she hadn't met this other man, I might have kept her with me forever. Oh, I knew I couldn't win her back, but I could do the next best thing to satisfy the sudden gnawing in my vitals. I could have the satisfaction of putting my rival in his grave. When I left our flat, I stepped outside and waited across the street. An hour later, Lavinia emerged, holding a suitcase, and hailed a cab. I waited until she stepped inside, hailed a second cab myself, and then followed her to a Strand Hotel. And I was only a few feet away from her when I heard her mention his name. Mr. Frank Pickett, please. Will you tell him Mrs. Fawkes is waiting in the lobby? For a moment, my blood rose and my mouth grew dry and hot. Without thinking clearly, I turned and left the lobby. And then I hailed another cab. There was a shop I knew, a rather disreputable place in the shabbiest section of Soho, where, according to rumour, a man might purchase a variety of things. Help you, Governor? Uh, Yes, if you will. I'm looking for a gun. A gun, Governor? A revolver, preferably a large calibre. It's against the law to sell firearms, Chappie. I uh, was sent here by a friend. He told me it was possible to buy almost anything from you. Yes, I... I guess it is. Providing you've got the funds, so to speak. I'll pay whatever you ask. Offer mo, Governor. Now, here's a beauty. Italian make. And guaranteed. Uh, guaranteed to what? 
To please, Governor. I don't know what you've got in mind, and I don't want to hear about it. But if it's workmanship you're looking for, this Beretta's your job. Um, how much? Fifty quid. Fifty? It would the ammo thrown in. That's an outrageous price. Then maybe you'd better buy your firearms from the police, Governor. No, wait. Wait, I, I'll take it. Uh, here. It's just about all the money I own. You're getting a bargain, Governor. No mistake about that. And happy hunting. <laughs> I returned immediately to Frank Pickett's hotel with a revolver heavy in my pocket. I had no plan in mind except to meet him face to face and blow the top of his skull clear off his rotten head. Yes, sir? What room is Mr. Frank Pickett in, please? Mr. Pickett? Just a moment, sir. Mr. Pickett has just checked out. He did? Where did he go? He left no forwarding address. But he must have... I, I believe he took the boat train to Southampton. He's taking the Queen to New York. The next train to Southampton was two hours later. And as I paced the station platform, my seething, unreasonable hatred was matched only by my sense of frustration at having missed him. But I vowed I'd find him. I swore I'd kill him if I had to chase him to the very ends of the earth. And it looked as if I'd be forced to do just that because the Queen was sailing out of the harbor as I finally reached the wharf. That was five years ago. And I lived those five years like a man sealed up in a cave. I worked, I ate, I slept mechanically. I did these things while I waited, waited for the chance to soothe my wounded pride. And while I waited, my mind grew more and more cunning. I saw how foolish my first impulse had been to meet him head on with a gun in my hand and a noose hanging over my head. There were other ways to skin this cat. And I studied them carefully. Miss? Yes? I'm looking for a book in the library catalog. Uh, perhaps you can help me. What is the title, please? Uh, the Most Famous Murder Trials in History. Let me see. Uh, that would be under M for murder. Here we are. The catalog number is 37X6. You'll find it on the last shelf over there, in the corner. Oh, uh, thank you. I'll find it. I pored over books on the art of murder in all its phases. I made criminology my passion and homicide my avocation. I read and reread countless volumes on the mistakes that had been made by murderers in the past. Only one thing was still unsettled in my mind, and that was the weapon. And on the day I discovered that, my quarry returned to England. Amiz? Yes, sir? I wish to renew this volume. Just one moment, sir. The use and effects of toxic poisons. Very well, sir. You can keep the book for another two weeks. Uh, thank Hello. you. Hello, Lavinia, this is Frank. Uh, I'm at the library, yeah. Oh, that was some information I needed. Yeah, I signed the sir, lease to the house. Sir, sir. can move Very in well. this week. Your card. Oh, oh yes. <laughs> yes, Lavinia. Thank you. Yeah. I settled everything with the agent, too. It's the house you wanted. <laughs> Number 17, Brighton Road. You, you can see it this afternoon, if you like. Uh, look, when you call the agent, just tell him you're Frank Pickett's wife. He was at an open pay telephone. A big man with a rather handsome face. He must have been about 45. It was an incredible coincidence, and yet somehow I always knew it would happen. I'd been notified of our divorce almost five years before, and I'd received Lavinia's final note saying they intended to live in America for good. But I knew I'd get my chance. I was sure of it. And now Pickett had fallen right into my hands like an overripe plum.
One week later, I appeared at 17 Brighton Road. It was a large house, ostentatious. He was evidently very rich. I watched the house from the outside for three full days, and late the fourth afternoon, my patience was rewarded. For the service door opened, and a housemaid stepped out, holding a poodle dog on a leash. I followed her across the street into a little park, where I saw her sit down on a bench and take out a cigarette. Now, I say, uh, may I offer you a light? Oh, and who may you be? Um, uh, Charles Brooks is my name. Never heard of you. But, uh, I've been watching you. You have? Uh, please, now, don't be alarmed. I, um, I live nearby, across the street. I've seen you come and go from the big brown house over there, and, uh, well, I've been anxious to know just who you are. You know, I, I think you're the most beautiful girl I've ever seen, uh, Miss... Uh, you're a queer one, you are. Please, may I sit down? Have a seat, Mr. Brooks. My name's Eliza. She was stupid and vain, and she suited my plans to perfection. I was careful when I met her, knowing that Lavinia could recognize me. But within a week, I knew as much about Pickett's daily routine as he knew himself. And I was finding Eliza a very helpful, if innocent, accomplice. I can spend the rest of the afternoon with you, Charlie. The missus is going away. Is she? Well. She's taken two weeks in Paris to do some shopping. She's the lucky one, all right. <sighs> Married to a man with a million quid. Some women are just born with a silver spoon. Um, when is uh, Mrs. Pickett leaving, Eliza? She's gone already, and a good thing, too. There was an awful row inside the house this afternoon. The master gave Edward the sack. Edward? You mean Mr. Pickett's valet? Yes. He's been taking one nip too many from the master's liquor closet. I'm glad he's gone. I never Has uh, Mr. Pickett employed anyone yet to take his place, Eliza? Not that I know of. Then will you put in a good word for me? You? Yes, yes, I'd like the job. But you told me you were a clerk, not a gentleman's gentleman, Charlie. I can do both, Eliza. And besides, I'll be closer to you. Is that why you want the job, Charlie? Of course. <laughs> Your sweet lovey. All right. I'll put in a word for you as soon as I go back. I'll tell Mr. Pickett you're my cousin. He likes me, I think. And it ought to clinch it for you, Charlie. You have no idea how much this means to me. Thank you. From the bottom of my heart. The next day, Eliza informed me that Pickett would grant me an interview. At last, I stood before him in his ornate drawing room face to face with the one man I despise most in all this world. My fingers itched to grasp his throat, and it was only with a desperate effort that I prevented myself from squeezing the life out of him then and there. Oh, yes, your name Brooks? Uh, yes, sir. Yes, Liza told me you were looking for a position as a valet. Uh, I am, sir. I've been a gentleman's gentleman for the past ten years. Mm -hmm. And I can say, sir, in all modesty, that my references are more than satisfactory. Ah? Uh, well, what are they? I have written references in my quarters, Mr. Pickett, from the Earl of Halstead, for whom I worked during the war. Oh, that's so. And before that time, I was employed by the Duke of Sandrews uh -huh. and the Marquis... Okay, well, that's all right. I'm convinced. What salary do you want, hmm? Uh, what salary do you offer, Mr. Pickett? Well, I'll give you $45... Uh... That's 15 pounds a week. Is that all right? You're bored, of course. That is eminently satisfactory, Mr. Pickett. When shall I start, sir? Now. Now. He said it so casually. And yet, if he knew, it was like a man who was inaugurating his own last rite. I had two weeks before Lavinia was to return. Two weeks before I could be recognized. But I was certain that Mr. Frank Pickett Esquire would never live to see the end of those two weeks. My plan was simple. In my years of research, I had discovered a toxic poison which was completely soluble in any liquid and it was also tasteless. Moreover, its effect was rapid. And in any medical examination that did not involve a complete post-mortem, the primary cause of death appeared to be acute heart failure. My only problem would be to get it into his food in some way. 
And there was always my stupid, ostrich-faced Eliza to unwittingly help me on that score. Evening, Eliza. Oh, it's you, Charlie. Um, is the master eating upstairs tonight? He's not feeling too well, and I'm taking this tray of food up to him. Now, out of my way, if you please. I'm in a hurry. No, Eliza, that's not very nice. Isn't it? Well, why are you being so short with me? Why? You're asking why? After the way you've been treating me? Since you got this job, you've been avoiding me like the plague. And I've got me pride, I'll have you know. Now, put down that tray. I, I, I want to talk to you. The master's waiting. Eliza, put it down. Well? Now then, look at me. I won't. Come along now. Turn that pretty face of yours and look into my eyes. Oh, Charlie. When you kiss me like that, Charlie, I could almost die. My dear, so could I. All right. Now, out of me way. The master's waiting for his dinner. Oh, yes, sir. Uh, bring it up to him, Eliza. And be careful with the tray. Don't drop it. It was while I kissed her that I managed to plant the poison, a soft white powder. And as I shook it over a small hamburger patty on one of the plates, I kept Eliza's mouth pressed to mine and her eyes averted. She returned about five minutes later, and her tray was empty. Everything all right, Eliza? How do you mean, Charlie? Is the master's appetite up to snuff? He's as hungry as an horse, he is. And he was grumpy with me, too, because I brought up his tray a little late. But now I've got more time for you, Charlie. I suppose I help you with those dishes. Oh, Charlie, how nice of you. It'll be just like... Just as if we were in our own own, won't it? Our own little love nest, so to speak. Uh, yes. I'll wash and you dry, Charlie. Right, huh? You know, Charlie, some people have more cheek, especially Americans. Oh, I'd say they're rather nice people on the whole, once you get to know them. Well, this one's as spoiled as they come, I can tell you that. Oh, why? Well, take that hamburger, for instance. Uh, the one you brought up to him tonight? Imagine him having that sent up, with the meat being so short here and rationed and all. Well, if Mr. Pickett enjoys a bit of hamburger now and then, you can't deny him. If he enjoyed it, I wouldn't talk. What do you mean? That hamburger I just brought up was for Mrs. Pickett's poodle dog. <laughs> Charlie, you dropped a plate. Excuse me, Eliza. I'll be back in just a moment. There's something important I just remembered upstairs. I raced up the staircase three at a time with my heart beating like a trip hammer and my head in a whirl. His dog! If his dog took that poison, he'd keel over inside of three minutes and the investigation would destroy any further chance I had to get at Pickett. As I reached the door, I had to command all my self-control to restrain myself from bursting in without knocking. But I pulled myself together at the last moment and kept my head. Come in. Excuse me, sir, but... Uh, and I, I wanted to know if there was anything you wished before you retired. Mm, no. No, nothing, thank you. Is the dinner satisfactory? Mm, good enough. What, what are you looking for? Sir? Why are you looking around the room in that silly way? Oh, I, I uh, missed your poodle, sir. I was wondering oh, if... Oh, he'll be around as soon as he gets hungry. That hamburger steak on the floor is for him. Uh, yes, I see it, sir. And uh, I see it hasn't been touched. Yeah. Hamburger for a dog. If I had my way... What are you doing? I'll find the poodle and give this to him, Mr. Pickett. Don't bother. Oh, don't bother at all, sir. Well, <laughs> what makes you so concerned about that ridiculous hound, Brooks? Oh, well, sir, I, um, I've always had a soft spot for animals, and I rather like him, if I may say so, sir. Well, there's no accounting for taste, is there? All right, feed him if you want it. It's all right with me. My luck stayed with me, and as I dumped the poison mess into the garbage, I breathed a sigh of relief. But now I had to wait for another opportunity to put an end to Pickett's career. And once again it came to me, through Eliza's innocent help. A 
A package was delivered on the following day from a confectioner's downtown. It was a chocolate assortment, and as I unwrapped the package, I realized that my second chance had come. What you doing, Charlie? Oh, oh I just uh, unwrapping this package. It arrived a few minutes ago. Oh, chocolate! Uh, yes. He's got a sweet tooth, that one. The chocolates are for Mr. Pickett? Naturally. I thought they uh, might have been for his wife. He likes to eat candy when he reads in bed, just before he turns in for the night. I do too, but I've got to keep an eye on my figure. And a lovely figure it is, Eliza. You think so? Decidedly. <laughs> you certainly talk like a top, you do. <laughs> but I like it, Charlie. You sound like a real gentleman. Um, what shall we do with these chocolates, Eliza? I'd like to sink my teeth in them, that's what. But the best thing to do is to leave them on the night table next to his bed. Well, I'll put them there myself. Is he uh, coming home for dinner this evening? No, he's dining out, he said. But I expect he'll be back pretty early. The mistress is coming home. She is? When? This evening. How do you know? She phoned this afternoon while you were gone. I heard him speak to her. She got tired of Paris, I guess. She'll be back by nine, she said. Nine? And it's seven now. Lavinia. Lavinia was coming back. There was no time for delicacies like poisoned chocolates now. I had to act, and to act fast. I stepped over to the liquor closet and opened the bar. The highball glasses caught my eye, so I slipped a heavy dose of the poison powder into the nearest glass and then closed the bar. And then I waited as the minutes ticked by for Frank Pickett to return and drink a toast to his own demise. Good evening, Mr. Pickett. Ah, oh, good evening, Brooks. Your coat, sir. Yeah. Would you like a drink, sir? Uh, no, I don't think so, thanks. Uh, a whiskey and soda, perhaps, sir? No, I don't. Well, well, all right, yeah, I think I could use one. I'll make it myself. Well, allow me, sir. Say when, sir. Oh, uh, that's enough, that's enough. Very good, sir. Oh, uh... Look, that, that must be Mrs. Pickett. Answer the door, Brooks, will you? The door, sir? Yeah. Why are you standing there like an idiot? Let my wife in. Uh, of course, Mr. Pickett. I stepped into the vestibule, my hands as cold as ice. Once Lavinia caught sight of me, the game was over. I placed my hand on the knob, turned it, and quickly stepped behind the door, out of sight as it opened. She marched in without giving me a single glance and went straight for the drawing room. But my Lavinia, my beautiful Lavinia, had completely changed. Well, I'm back. Say something. Yes, well, well, what do you want me to say? Nothing. All you've ever said as long as I've known you. You, uh, been drinking again. Well, what of it? You want a divorce because of that? <laughs> you wanted a divorce for a long, long time, haven't you? Well, try and get it, my precious American prize. Just try and get it. Lavinia, you know how... How unreasonable you can get when you're drinking. Oh, Lavinia. shut up. Tired of hearing that same old lie. All right. If you don't like the way I drink, divorce me. But first, you'll settle a million quid on me, loving spouse. One million and not a farthing less. Oh, sleepy. I'm going to bed. <laughs> As I looked at her and listened, something happened to me. I, I discovered I didn't hate Pickett any longer. I even started to feel sorry for him. And then I felt a sort of exaltation. I found myself indebted to Pickett for taking her off my hands. And then suddenly, suddenly I remembered the highball I'd given him, the poison drink. 
and I rushed into the room just as he was raising it to his lips. Mr. Pickett! What? You fool, are you crazy? You knocked that glass right out of my hand. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, sir. I, uh, I don't think I'm a very efficient gentleman's gentleman after all, and perhaps I'd better tender my resignation. Oh, you're just as crazy as my wife. Old darn world's crazy. It's all out of kilter. And I gotta put up with it all. I'm sorry, sir. At one time, I thought that only I was unlucky. But now I see how better off I really am. What are you talking about? Nothing, sir. Nothing of importance anymore. I think I'll pack my things and leave, Mr. Pickett. But first, let me mix you another whiskey and soda. One that I'm most certain you'll enjoy, sir. Much more than you would have. The last one. In the animal world, there is the hunter and the hunted. Hound and fox, hawk and sparrow, cat and mouse. We in the topmost species have also joined the hunt. But who is to judge precisely which of us are hounds or foxes as we enter the chase? The Chase was created and written for the National Broadcasting Company by Lawrence Cleave. Featured in today's cast was Ivor Francis, with Kathleen Cordell, June Peel, Stotts Cotsworth, and John Stanley. The Chase is directed and transcribed by Fred Way, Fred Collins speaking. Next week, greed and ambition become the driving forces when the sound of murder is heard on The Chase. Tonight, it's adventure with Counterspy, Dragnet, and Barry Craig on NBC. The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... I'm E.G. Marshall. It is established scientific fact, as we all know, that no two sets of fingerprints are alike. It is equally true that the markings on a bullet that's been fired are as distinctive as fingerprints. One gun, and one gun only, will leave those precise markings. No other. And so it seemed that Rocky Stark was lying. He had to be. When in his prison cell, he told his brother, Frank, I did not kill Johnny Mallory. Our mystery drama, Bulletproof, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by George Lothar and stars Mason Adams and Patricia Elliott. It almost goes without saying that what intrigues us about a mystery is finding the answer to it. Especially the kind I bring you now. Another of those riddles that seemingly defy solution. Yet the answer, the solution, had to be found if an innocent man, or in any case a man who claimed to be innocent, was to be saved from execution in the gas chamber of a certain western state where the death penalty had been restored. That man was Rocky Stark, who one night, not too long ago, found himself facing... But that's our story. Another cup of coffee before you go to work, hon? Uh-uh, Kim. If you're saying no because you don't think we can afford well, it... Well, can we? Now, oh, come on, Rocky. You're in one of your down moods again. Now, things aren't all that bad with us. Sure. Sure. Living, if you can call it that, in one room in a condemned tenement. Me with a crummy night watchman job that pays peanuts. 
No future, no sign even of future. And you, you, you can say things aren't all that bad. We've got each other. In fact, you in prison two years and all... Well, to me, it's everything, Rocky. Oh, Kim, baby, don't, don't get me wrong. Those two years behind bars, taking the rap for that creep partner of mine, Manny Ravel, I thought of you all day. I dreamed of you all night. Oh, Rocky. And all the time, I'm thinking when I get out, everything will come up roses again. Manny owes me, I'm thinking. Manny will pay off. It'll be like old times, you and me living in style the way you ought to live. Instead of a pig star like this. Oh, Rocky, huh? Well, what happens? What happens? I go to see him at the Golden Calf. Manny, I'm out. And what does he say? I'm afraid you are, he says. Out. O-U-T. And then he really lays it on me. He's got a new partner. Two-bit coffee and crullers punk Johnny Mallory. Rocky, sweetheart, forget it. What's the sense of going over it again and again? Because I can't forget it. I thought we were running a legit night spot. And all the time, behind my back, man, he's got a loan shark operation going. He comes to me, kid. Kid, he says, I'm a, I'm a three-time loser. You take the bath for me, and I'll make it up to you. <laughs> sure, I took the bath, all right, and I'm still drowning. Oh, it. honey. And you, on. along with me, Kim, that is the hell of it. That's what drives me crazy, alone in that, in that warehouse all night, thinking what you deserve to have and what you've got, thinking that if you hadn't been fool enough to marry me... I married you. Because I love you. Things are going to work out. They're working out already. You've got a job. And you were afraid you never would. An ex con You've got it. And it's a step towards something better. A Frank promised you it would be. Don't get me wrong, Kim. I've got a lot of respect for my brother, Frank. He's gone far. City councilman and only 33. Two years younger than me. But he can't work miracles. Frank got you the job, didn't he? He got you the permit to carry a gun so you could take the job. Yeah, and I guess you could say that came pretty close to a miracle. Me, an ex-con. But... Never mind the buts. Frank's promised to do everything he can for you. Or for you. Oh, what do you mean, for me? He's in love with you, Kim. Always has been, you know that. Oh, don't be silly. Frank stopped carrying a torch for me the day I married you. Now, I'll tell one. You'd better get moving, or you'll be late. Uh, who could that be? Yeah? You Rocky Stark? Yeah. Lieutenant Chambers, my sidekick, Detective Rollins. Well, well, what, what do you want? Yeah, what do you want? You're under arrest. <gasps> oh. Oh. Under arrest? For what? Suspicion of murder. Murder? Who's murdered? A guy named Johnny Mallory. Johnny Mallory. Rocky? Hello, Frank. Thanks for coming. Your lawyer will be here in half an hour or so. My lawyer? I haven't got a lawyer. You have now. Gar McMillan. Gar McMillan? Well, he's the best. What, what, what is he going to cost? No, 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 never mind that. Now, you need the best, and that's all that counts right now. Why'd you do it, Rocky? Are you crazy or something? I didn't kill Johnny Mallory. And they say you did. They'll have to prove that. They can. What? The bullets that killed Mallory were fired from your gun. Well, that's impossible. That's impossible. That 38 of mine has never left my hand since the day you got me the permit for it. Now, look, Rocky. They, they picked you up last night when Manny Ravel told Manny. them... Manny? ...told them about the fight you had with Mallory in Manny's office and the threats you made. A ballistics checked the bullets that killed Mallory with the bullet fired from your gun. The markings are identical. They can't be. They are. Now, tell me. Did you threaten Mallory? No, I never even saw Johnny Mallory. When you went to see Manny... That's you... all I saw, Manny. Rocky, where were you yesterday afternoon between three and six? Why? That's when Mallory was murdered. They found the body in his car parked in a lonely spot out near Warehouse Point. Now, he'd been killed with two bullets through the head. Bullets they dug out of the back seat cushion and compared with one fired from your thirty-eight. Now, 
Where, where were you between three and six? In Bayside Park. What, what were you doing there? Kim works in a restaurant near there. I was killing time, waiting for her to finish so as I could walk home with her. You were waiting for three hours on a cold, rainy day in the park for three hours? <sighs> Sounds kind of out of space, doesn't it? <laughs> it certainly does. Well, maybe I am spaced out, Frank. I, I can't get out of my mind what I've done to Kim. I've wrecked her life. She's the greatest. You know that. You know that. And I, I want to give her the sun, the moon, the stars. But what have I given her? A roach trap and a condemned tenement. I get to thinking like that alone in a place and I have to get out. So I go to the park. Rain or shine. At least that's free in this crummy world. It may cost you more than you bargained for. Without an alibi, though, what alibi you could have... Uh, your gun killed him. Now, my gun. Nobody has touched that gun except me. Well, how can you be so sure of that? How? I'll tell you how. You stuck your neck out. You stuck your neck way out to get me that permit. And you had to have a gun to get the job. And you got it for me. So was I going to take a chance on some gun so stealing it? Not me. I owed you that at least. So when I tell you... That that thirty-eight never left my hands, it never did. In fact, Frank, I even slept with the damn thing. Slept with it? Strapped to my side. I wasn't taking any chances. So I don't care what they came up with in ballistics, they're wrong. Uh, the comparison microscope doesn't lie. Cops are people, and people make mistakes. Not this time. How do you know? I asked to see for myself, and they showed me. Well, then... I don't get it, Frank. Why the look? You think I did it, huh? It doesn't matter what I think. It's what the facts prove. Now, you and Johnny Mallory were enemies for years. Now, that's for openers. Johnny stepped into your shoes when he became Manny Ravel's partner. Now, according to Ravel, you threatened Johnny. And Johnny was killed with your gun. No. It doesn't matter what I think. What matters is... Yeah... What a jury will think, Rocky. Just a minute. What do you want? Now, is that a way to greet an old friend, Kim? Did you say friend, Manny? Rocky's in a mess. I want to help if I can. Okay to come in? <sighs> come in. Whatever you have to say, Manny. Say it and get out. I guess I already said it. I want to help any way I can. Rocky's going to need a lawyer. He's got one. His brother took care of lawyers that. Lawyers cost. He'll need money. Not from you. Not after what you did to him. Me? I did something to Rocky? He took a rap for you. And you sold him out. Took a rap for... Now, what are you talking about? Oh, I see. That's the little fairy tale he told you, is that it? No fairy tale. The truth. And I sold him out. Uh, now, how'd I do that? Mallory took Johnny's place, didn't he? Temporarily, sure. Temporarily. Who runs a night spot as big as the golden calf without help? When they put Rocky away, I needed help. I hired Johnny Mallory. He was your partner. Who said? Rocky told me. Oh, I see, I see. More fairy tales, eh? Kim, let me give it to you straight. Rocky never took any rap from me. They nailed him with the goods. Then how come, when he went to see you after getting he out... He finds out Mallory's working with me and right away blows his wig. You know, his hair-trigger temper. He gets it into his head, Mallory's my partner, and starts sounding off. Never gives me a chance to straighten him out. You're lying, No, Manny. Kim, I'm telling you the truth. Hey, listen, you know how I feel about Rocky, and you at least know how I feel about you. <laughs> I ought to. You made enough passes while Rocky was in prison. <laughs> it's my fault you turned me on. If you were really Rocky's friend, you'd have turned yourself off. So I didn't. I'm sorry. But anyhow, I, I want to help if I can in any... Come in. Oh, Frank, uh, come in. 
What are you doing here, Ravel? I'm asking myself the same question, Stark. You know where I am, Kim, if you need me. Huh. What was that all about? Oh, never mind. Did you see Rocky? Uh, yes. How is he? He's okay. When can I see him? Well, as soon as Gar McMillan arranges things. Uh, maybe this afternoon. Gar McMillan? The famous Gar McMillan. Uh, yes, Rocky needs the best legal talent that can be had. Now, he's in real trouble. I know. The bullet match his gun. It's in the papers. <sighs> but he didn't murder Johnny Mallory. Frank, he didn't. No one else could have, Kim. Now, Rocky swears that gun has never left him since the day he and I went together to buy it. It never has. Well, then... A mistake's been made, that's all. No, no mistake. You believe he did it? Have I any choice? He's your brother. That's one reason I haven't had any choice. I know, Rocky. I know that temper of his. Oh, I'm sorry, Kim. But from where I sit, Rocky killed Johnny Mallory. No one else could have. Someone else did. The bullets. Proved the shots were fired from Rocky's gun. But it wasn't Rocky who pulled the trigger. It had to be. He swears the gun has never been out of his hands. Now, is that true? Yes. But he's never even fired it. Except on a practice range. Never. <sighs> Kim, the police have a strong case against Rocky. In fact, it's open and shut. I don't think even Gar McMillan can save him. Well, surely it is an open and shut case. There's no question at all about the bullets matching. Comparison microscopes don't lie. As for the gun having been used by someone else, personally, I believe Rocky's story that it has never been out of his possession. So, what possible answer can there be to the, well, the impossible? I'll return shortly for Act Two. What is fate? No, I don't know. I'm asking you. You have to wonder why an apparently nice guy like Rocky Stark, who is trying his best to repair broken dreams because he's deeply in love with his wife, Kim, and wants her to have everything the world can offer, you really have to wonder why life suddenly and for no discernible reason takes another hefty wallop at him. Visiting him in his cell, Kim puzzles over the same thing. It's too much. It isn't fair. Just when things were beginning to break for you, this... I wouldn't exactly say things were breaking for me, Kim. I had my uh, first talk with McMillan this morning. Gar McMillan? He was here? Yeah. And the way he acted, the way he talked, I... I don't know, Kim, it doesn't look good. But he's, he's the best defense lawyer in the country. A lawyer, not a magician. He tried to sound upbeat, but I could tell he wasn't exactly all choked up over my chances. Neither are you, Kim. Why, I... It was in your eyes when you walked in. There now, in your eyes. Even in the way you smile. I know you, honey. I can tell. Well, wouldn't it be foolish, pretending it's, it's going to be easy proving you were innocent? I suppose. Even if you believe I'm innocent. Do you? Rocky, I, I love you. I know, but that isn't what I asked you. Johnny Mallory was murdered with my gun. But, Kim, I swear to you, I didn't fire the shot. Sweetheart, that's impossible. Unless you're wrong about nobody else getting his hands on that gun. Nobody else did. Nobody could have. He didn't lend it to anyone. Good Lord, Kim. If I'd have done that, don't you think I'd be spilling it to everybody? Yes, yes, of course you would. Oh, time's up already. Give us another minute, Heidi. Look, sweetie, you take care of yourself. I will. I mean, okay? You got enough dough to get by like that? Mm-hmm, yeah. How about food stamps? We're running low. Oh, no, 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 I, I got enough. Yeah, especially with me in here, huh? <laughs> well, it's one bright side to all this. Anyhow, my three squares are free on the house. Food's not bad either. Oh, now I have got something to worry about. 
You'll be spoiled when you get home. My cooking won't be good enough for you anymore, and you'll... you'll... Oh, now, baby, baby. You're lucky. Hold, hold me tight. <laughs> Um, Mrs. Stark? Yes. My name is Spratt. Jack Spratt. I'm afraid I don't oh, know. Maybe the name Fats would mean more to you. Fats. Oh, yeah, Rocky. Rocky has mentioned that name. Yeah, well, everybody calls me Fats, you see. <laughs> oh, okay, if I come in. I'm, uh, I'm a friend of Rocky's. Well, well of course. C come in. Oh, thanks. Hey, hey. Smells good. What are you cooking? Spaghetti and meatballs. Sure smells good. Real good. Well, I I, I was just about to eat. Uh, w would you like some? <laughs> I, I sure would. Have you got enough? Oh, yeah, yeah. Plenty. J just sit down and I'll serve it. Ah, it's fine. Fine. <laughs> Hello. Now you know who I am, Mrs. Stark. Well, yes and no. I, I mean, Rocky has mentioned you. Well, I, uh, I operate a place called the Bullseye. It's a practice range where guys, they want to sharpen up their eye or keep it sharp. They practice. Oh, a, a shooting range. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. Hey, thanks. This looks good. <laughs> That's how I, I know Rocky, and he knows me, see? He done practicing at the place. Well, not much, and he kind of couldn't afford much, but, but some, and... And him and me, you know, we hit it off like... <laughs> hey, you, you didn't serve yourself yet. I, uh, I, I really don't feel hungry. <laughs> you don't feel... A dish that smells and tastes like this and you don't... Hey, be, be, hey wait a minute, wait a minute. Let me have a look in that pot. But please, just, just uh, tell me what you <laughs> You know, you shouldn't have done nothing like that, Mrs. Stark. You got just enough food for yourself and you give it to me. Now, that's no wonder, Rocky. He was always saying you belong on a pedestal. Yeah. Here, here. here you, you. No, here. no, no. No, no, no go on, go on. I'm, I'm, I'm not hungry. I just like to eat is all. I <laughs> see. <laughs> no, go on. You, you dig in while I tell you why I'm here. Okay. That's it. Now. See, uh, when I heard Rocky was accused of putting the bind on, on Johnny Mallory, I said to myself, that's a lot of bull. Rocky's no killer, no lone shark type either. Then you don't believe no, me. No, he took a bath for Manny Ravel. And when he got out, Manny shafted him. But Johnny Mallory was killed with Rocky's gun. Well, looks that way, yeah. But Rocky's convinced the gun has never been out of his hands. Now, see, that's what I wanted to ask you about, no... Me, I know how Rocky felt about that 38. Could he be wrong, maybe, about nobody else getting his hands on that gun? Like, for instance, did he actually sleep with it strapped to his side? Yes, he did. <laughs> Sounds silly. Oh, maybe, no, but... no, no. He wasn't taking no chances night or day. I just wanted to be sure of that before I go down to headquarters. Police headquarters? Yeah. Yeah. I got an idea that could save Rocky. If I'm right, that is. What idea? What? Now, look, don't go getting your hopes too high. I I could be wrong, too, but... I want to talk it over with a friend of mine in ballistics, a Lieutenant Chambers. But that's what is your idea? Well, it's just this. Somebody could have put the bind on Johnny Mallory with another gun... And made it look like Rocky's. But that's impossible. I, I mean, isn't it true that the bullets are as distinctive as fingerprints? That, that the markings on a bullet after it's been fired prove that it came from one gun and no other gun? Yes, right. Well, then how could Mallory have been killed with another gun if the bullets that killed him came from Rocky's? Well, how? Look, uh... It's better I don't tell you, Mrs. Stark. I don't want to take chances the wrong guy, and I, and I know what I know, or think I do. But I'll tell you this. If my idea is right, if it's a bullseye, Rocky will be a free man by tonight. <laughs> Kim 
him. It's crazy. I seem pretty sure it was right. How could he be? My gun killed Johnny Mallory. There just can't be any two ways about that. You didn't kill him. And nobody else but you had the gun. Yeah, yeah, that's oh, true. Sweetheart, if he's right, if his idea... Whatever it is, proves you're innocent. It shouldn't have come to you getting your hopes up. Getting yours up, too, if it comes to that. No, not me. Rocky? I had a, another talk with McMillan. And? He said he checked everything out, his staff, anyhow. The guys who do his investigating. And... <sighs> it's hopeless. No. Yep. He wants me to plead guilty. Guilty? With a plea for clemency on grounds of, I don't know, temporary insanity, something like that. Was he out of his mind? Funny, if there's anybody in this world who isn't out of his mind, it's Gar McMillan. Oh, Frank. Hello, Rocky. Kim? I brought the afternoon paper. Thanks. I, uh, I just come from seeing McMillan. He told me about the guilty plea. You going to ride with that? I don't know yet. You'd better. Why? Kim, I don't want to upset you. Why, Frank? If Rocky pleads innocent, the jury just plain won't believe him. Now, no jury in its right mind would. But, Frank, you don't understand. We've, we've got to face facts. Rocky's an ex-con. Listen to me, Frank. There's a man, a friend of Rocky's. They call him Fats. He came to see me earlier today, and... We... Frank, Wait will you Wait listen to me, please? He said he was sure Rocky was innocent, positive of it. And if an idea had worked out that Kim, he could prove another gun was used to kill Mallory. I told her Fats is talking blue sky. Fats is dead. What? Dead? He's a front page headline in the afternoon paper. There. See for yourself. Well, killing near police headquarters. The owner of a pistol shooting practice range, Fats Jack Spratt, was gunned down in cold blood this afternoon just a block from police headquarters. Oh, no. Decent guy like Fats. Why? Well, you've got me. But how did you happen to know him? I practiced at the range he owned when I could afford it. I liked him. He liked me. Ah... Uh, well, whatever idea he had, we'll never know what it was now. That depends. On what? On whether he was killed before he got to Lieutenant Chambers or after. <laughs> Lieutenant Chambers? Yes, come in, Mrs. Shaw. Come in and have a seat. Oh, uh, thank you. You're the wife of Rocky Stark, and you wanted to see me about Jack Spratt Fats? Yes. Fats he... was a good friend of mine. We've known each other for years. How'd you happen to know him, Mrs. Stark? Well, he came to see me about my husband. Three hours or so before he... Before he was m murdered. Oh? Why did Fats want to see you about your husband? He said he had an idea of how Johnny Mallory was killed. Well, I, uh... I guess we know how Mallory was killed, don't we? Do we? Oh, I'm sorry. Of course, you feel... I certainly do, Lieutenant. My husband is innocent. Well, he's, uh... He's yet to be proved guilty, that's for sure. Lieutenant, was Fats killed before he saw you or afterward? Before he saw me? I, I, I don't think I understand. When he left me, he was on his way here to see you. He had this idea he wanted to talk to you about. Oh? Well, he, he never got here. Come to think of it, he must have been on his way here when he was shot down. He was. Well, I'll be. Well, I, I guess that ends that. Well, thank you for your time. Oh, no, wait, wait, wait. Uh, sit down, Mrs. Stark. Tom, hold all my calls, okay? I, um, I think you and I ought to do some talking, Mrs. Stark. I don't know what about, Lieutenant. That's never told you. I was gunned down on his way to see me, which could mean somebody didn't want him to see me. Didn't want me to find out what idea Fats had in mind. I didn't think of that. Well, think of it now, Mrs. Stark. What idea did Fats have in mind? Exactly what idea? Of course, it goes without saying 
that the idea Fats had in mind stops this side of sanity. How could two bullets be fired from one gun but leave the markings on them of another gun? As any forensic expert will tell you, it's an impossibility. And yet, well, I promise we'll know the answer, and there is an answer, when I return for Act Three. When a certain Johnny Mallory was murdered with two bullets from a thirty-eight automatic... The bullets, dug from the back seat of the car in which Mallory was sitting, were traced to a gun owned by Rocky Stark. The murder bullets match exactly, precisely, a test bullet fired from Rocky's 38 automatic. Yet Rocky claims that although the gun has never left his possession, he did not murder Johnny Mallory. This, as Lieutenant Larry Chambers of Ballistics tells Rocky's devoted wife, Kim, is an absolute and utter impossibility. My husband didn't kill Johnny Mallory, Lieutenant. I know he didn't. Look, you're his wife. You love him. Naturally, you'd feel that way. But uh, assuming, for argument's sake, he didn't kill Mallory, then someone else killed him. And that someone else used, uh, had to use your husband's thirty-eight. That's impossible. Rocky got at that gun as if his life depended on it. Huh. <laughs> I wish he hadn't. I wish he could say someone might have stolen it. Uh, let, let's get back to Fat Jack Spratt. Uh, tell me again what he told you. He said he had an idea how somebody could have murdered Mallory with another gun and make it look like Rocky's. That was exactly what he told you? Our memories play tricks on us sometimes. He said someone else could have burned. Burned, that was the word he used, burned. Mallory with another gun and made it look like Rocky's. Now, those were his words exactly. Mm. Nobody could have pumped two bullets into Mallory with another gun and made it look like your husband's. No two guns make the same marks on a bullet. Still and all. Yes? Nobody in this town knew more about guns, especially small firearms, handguns, and fats. And if he had some idea of how it could have been done, then I'd say it could be done. Could be why he was killed. Somebody was scared he'd blow this whole puzzle wide open. But you can't. I, I mean, what Pat said doesn't add up for you. Uh-uh. But let me think about it for a while, and maybe it will. You don't sound very hopeful. Hey, you are, Lieutenant. Uh, let's see the tag on that gun. Yeah, it's Rocky Starks, all right. Okay, fire me a test bullet. My four. Here's a test bullet we use when we compare. I know the... that, Pete, but fire me another. Whatever you say, Luke. And just let me fit it in the test box here, so uh <coughs> I'll have it dug out of the cotton in a second. It <coughs> uh... <coughs> here Thanks. It is. Thanks. Now let's put it under the comparison microscope with one of the murder bullets. Okay. <coughs> now you're set up. Go on, have a look. Mm-hmm. They match, no doubt about that. Same grooves and scratches. Pit marks in the rim. Satisfied? Hmm? I guess so. Only... Uh, only what? I don't know. What about Fats? Why was he gunned down on his way to see me? Well, thanks for your trouble, Pete. My trouble. I enjoy shooting bullets into that box and finding them again. <laughs> Gives me a sense of accomplishment. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, sure. Send Mrs. Stark right in. <laughs> hey, come in, Kim, baby. Come in. Good to see you. Here, sit here, right here. How's about a drink, huh? No, thanks. You don't mind if I... Uh... Of course not. Well, it's a long time no see. More than a month. You said you wanted to see me about Rocky. You said you could help him. Yeah, well, we'll, we'll get to that. Let's get to it now. It's the only reason I'm here. <sighs> okay. Rocky goes to trial tomorrow and he hasn't got a prayer. You know it? I know it. In that case, how can you help him? Well, I figure he's worried about you, so, uh... 
How would you like a job here at the club? Hostess, uh, that kind of thing. A job? Here? Well, the pay'd be good. A lot better than you do as a waitress. Is this what you asked me here for? Is this your way of helping Rocky? Well, take a worry off his mind, wouldn't it? I mean, he'd know you have a good-paying job, that you were secure and safe. Safe? And, uh... Around you? I'd be safe in a snake pit. Now, wait a minute. Don't I go. Take your hands off me. Come Will on, it? baby. Will you? Come Let on. go of me. You oh, stop it. You're hurting. Ah, little pain never did any harm, dog. Ah, for the love of... What is it? Yeah. What's he want? I got a choice. Okay, send a bum in. I beat it, Bubby. Out this way. And what's wrong with the front door? Come on, do as I tell you. Out, out this way. <laughs> oh, time's for this guy to talk. Oh, heck, uh, Come on in. Come on in, Lieutenant... Uh, uh, what was it? Uh, Chambers. Yeah. You're Manny Ravel. Uh, what do you want, Lieutenant? I'm busy. So am I. Rocky Stark and you were partners in this nightclub a little more than two years ago. Is that right? Yeah, what of it? The two of you are accused of using the place as a front for a loan shark operation. Is that right? You know it is, so why bother asking? You also know that Rocky was operating behind my back. I was innocent and Rocky confessed. There's talk around that he took a fall for you. <laughs> so what else is new? That you and Johnny Mallory weren't hitting it off too well for quite a while before he took two slugs in the head... And that you've always had a yen for Rocky's wife. Come on, Lieutenant Spillett. What are you after? I think you killed Mallory. I think you need psychiatric help, Lieutenant. You had three solid motives. One, put Rocky away on ice and he'd never be able to tell what he knows. Two, get rid of Mallory by framing Rocky. And at the same time, three, satisfy that yen of yours for Rocky's wife. It adds up, Ravel. You know, I changed my mind. You don't need a psychiatrist. You need a computer. Mallory was killed with Rocky's gun, and that gun in his own statement was never out of his hands. On second thought, forget the computer. Even a computer won't help you add that up. It's bugging you. <laughs> You're bugging me. Pete, all I've asked for is the photographs of those bullets. For the hundredth time. What do you expect to come up with? Nothing. Nothing? It's hopeless. I know it's hopeless. And yet... I saw her this afternoon, Kim Stark. He goes to the gas chamber tonight, midnight. She looked like... She looked awful, Pete. Yeah, well... Yeah, well, it's rough, sure, but... One uh, thing that bugs me and keeps bugging me is the pit marks on the murder slugs. Yeah, I told you they were made with black powder. Now, black powder pits the rim deeper than smokeless. But why would he buy black powder bullets when he could buy smokeless? I told you that, too. They're cheaper. He was saving money. Black powder, smokeless powder. What's the difference? The marks on the murder slugs match the marks on the test bullet. And that cinches everything. Seems that way. Lieutenant, it is that way now. Once and for all, that's the way it is. Kim. Rocky. Hard things. <laughs> Silly question. No, no. I'm all right. Eight o'clock. Yeah. We always had supper around eight. Uh, have you eaten? You want something? No, I'm, I'm okay. I'll bring in a tray if you want. No, no thanks. There's something I want to say. I'll tell you. Yeah, Rocky. I I don't want you to. I I don't want. Listen. You've got your life ahead of you. You're young and you're pretty and you meet the right guy. You meet the right guy someday you marry. Him. Rocky, there's only one man in my life. And there'll never be any other. Now you listen. You listen. There's never been anybody like you. And there never will be. I never loved anyone the way I love you. And, 
And I never will again. We had love together, dreams together. Busted now. Oh, oh, busted. Kim, you can't live with busted dreams. You can repair them, maybe. And if you can't, well, if they were worth enough to you and they were, Rocky, you can live with the pieces. Oh, Kim. Kim. I, I love you. Lieutenant? Are you all alone? I thought there'd be others here. No. May I come in? I'd uh, rather you didn't. Well, I thought... Never mind. Just, just one thing. I'm sorry I couldn't do anything. I tried. Believe me, I tried. I believe you. And I, I thank you. you. You did everything anyway. Oh, come in. Oh, no, not if you prefer No, no, no. I, I'm acting the way Rocky wouldn't want me to act. Doing what he wouldn't want me to do. Cutting myself off, drowning in my own self-pity. Come in. Uh, there's, uh, there's coffee. Would you oh, like Sure, it? thanks. I don't know what I'd do without coffee. I know I drink too much of it, but... Well, what is it? This box of bullets. Here on the dresser. This box of bullets. What about it? They're made with smokeless powder. Rocky used bullets made with smokeless powder. What of it? What a fool I've been. What a stupid fool. That's it. That's what Fats wanted to tell me. It explains everything. It's the answer. The simple answer. So simple, I never saw it. The answer to the whole damn riddle. Well, but who are you calling? The DA, the governor, if I have to, to stop Rocky's execution. What? He's innocent, Kim. Rocky's innocent. <sighs> By heaven, now I can prove it. Lieutenant, I, I don't know how to thank you. I w what do you say to a guy when he saves your life and at the last minute? So... <laughs> you could ask why he wasn't smarter, quicker. It was staring me smack in the face all the time and I never saw it. The slugs that supposedly killed Johnny Mallory that were dug out of the back seat of the murder car were pitted with black powder. And the bullets I used were smokeless powder. Right. Even so, the bullets that came out of that back seat were fired from my thirty-eight automatic by me. But at Fat Jack's practice range, honey. Sure, sure. Ammunition that Fats let us use for practice because it was a lot cheaper than the smokeless stuff. And no trick at all for Manny Ravel to get all of a few slugs from the practice range. Bullets fired by your gun and stuffed them into the holes made by the bullets that killed Johnny Mallory. After removing the bullets that did kill him, of course. It all looked so impossible. Yet there was a simple answer all the time. The answer you came up with, Lieutenant. Almost too late, Rocky. Almost too late. But luckily, not too late. So, once again, friends, I brought you a mystery seemingly impossible of solution. And, once again, the answer was as plain to you as it was to Lieutenant Chambers, who saw it only in the nick of time. Did you see it before he did? You did? Well, you're a better detective than he is. Or I am. I didn't. I'll be back shortly. To save you the trouble of writing and asking, let me tell you that all is well today with Kim and Rocky. And their very close friend, Lieutenant Chambers. Rocky's doing pretty well with Fat's practice range. Mm -hmm. He took it over, not only as a going business, but in memory of his old friend. As for Kim, she's just very happy to, uh, as the song title has it, to have a man around the house. Her man. Our cast included Patricia Elliott, Mason Adams, George Petrie, Earl Hammond, and Ian Martin. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams.
Suspense. And the producer of radio's outstanding theater of thrills, the master of mystery and adventure, William N. Robeson. Tampering with time has been an ambition of man since he first realized how inexorably he is time's slave. At this time of the year, although we have even less time on our hands, time is much in our minds. We make a magic ritual of New Year's Eve when we suppose we can flush away all our past impurities and begin afresh at that magic hour of midnight on the 31st of December. But suppose we couldn't. Suppose the 31st of December were not the end. Listen. Listen, then, as Mr. Frank Lovejoy stars in the 32nd of December. And now, the 32nd of December, starring Mr. Frank Lovejoy... A tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. New Year's Eve. As far as I was concerned, when I got up the morning of December 31st, it could stay 1958 forever. The only trouble is time doesn't work that way. Time is a downhill ride in a car with no brakes. You can't stop it even if your life depends on it. And mine did. Joe, your breakfast is getting cold. I'm coming, I'm coming. All I have time for is a cup of coffee anyway. Uh, what is this, milk? Don't we ever have anything but milk to put in the coffee? You know we can't afford cream these days. We can hardly afford to eat. Molly, you'll be wearing mink yet. Just give me a little more time. Yeah, you've been saying that ever since you got married. Well, sooner or later, Molly, I'm going to make it. By the way, honey, uh, let me have your ring. Why? Well, you said the diamond's loose. I'll drop it to the jewelers on my way to the office. Oh, we can't afford to get it fixed now. Molly, that's an expensive ring. We can't afford not to take care of it. Joe, have you been gambling again? Oh, now, Molly, I told you, I'm all through with that. You told me the same thing just before you pawned your watch. And the cufflinks I gave you on our first anniversary. I'm and not the... going to pawn your engagement ring. Now, let me have it. I'll pick it up on my way home tonight. Well, all right, but Joe, what? remember, it's very precious, at least to me. Sure. Sure, I've been gambling again. I was in the whole bag. The boys wanted to pay off by midnight, and this time they weren't going to take no for an answer. If I couldn't raise the dough on Molly's ring, I didn't know what I'd do. The pawn shop was like any other pawn shop. Dirty and gloomy, full of junk, with clocks ticking all over the place. One thing caught my eye as soon as I came in. In the front case, a watch, curiously ornate, obviously very old. It sort of glowed in the case. I couldn't take my eyes off it. You like to look at the watch? Oh, uh, no. <laughs> no, it's very interesting, but... Uh, how much can I get on this ring? On this, I can lend you one hundred fifty dollars. One hundred and fifty? Uh, the guy I won it off claimed it was worth more than a thousand. One hundred fifty. I can probably get five hundred for it easy. Then you would be foolish to accept my offer. That's the best you can do. One hundred fifty. I'll take it. I will get the money. While I waited, I felt my eyes drawn to the antique watch again. I picked it up. It felt warm in my hand, almost as if it were alive. Its face was covered with all sorts of dials and figures. The date of the month, phase of the moon, even the signs of the zodiac. Some of the dials I couldn't read at all. They were inscribed with strange characters, like hieroglyphics or ancient Sanskrit. Suddenly, I felt I had to have that watch. One hundred, twenty, forty... Forty-five, one hundred fifty. Can you tell me what all these dials mean? I can tell you only that this watch controls many kinds of time. The fellow who pawned it claimed it could make time pass as slowly or as rapidly as he desired. <laughs> That's a pretty good trick. Mm -hmm. But only a trick. Time is different for each of us, is it not? What do you mean? To a man sitting on a hot stove... One second lasts forever. But to a man making love, forever is only a second. <laughs> yeah, I, I see what you mean. How much are you asking for the watch? One hundred fifty dollars. 
Excuse me. Hello. Yes, one moment, please. Is your name Joe Adcock? Yeah, why? Yes, Mr. Adcock is here. Who is it? Who is calling? Hello. Hello. Hmm. That is odd. Nobody knew I was coming here. Who was it? He did not identify himself. He just said, I would not believe him. Then he hung up. <laughs> it's funny. Say, uh, now what about the guy who pawned this watch? Any chance of him wanting it back? No, Mr. Adcock. He will not return for it. He has no further use for the watch. <laughs> okay. Well, then I'll take it. I don't know why, but I, I've got to have it. I had no business buying the watch. It was a crazy thing to do. I hadn't walked more than a few steps from the pawn shop when I learned just how crazy. Hold it, Adcock. Uh, well, who are you? Just one of the boys. What do you want? A little talk. Private. In the alley here. Yeah, but I don't have... In the alley. Ah, my arm. You got the grand, Adcock? I got until midnight to get it. Yeah, that's right. The boss just wants me to make sure you don't forget... Like last time. Oh, I, I won't forget, I promise. I'll be waiting for you at midnight, right here by the pawn shop. Oh, and one more thing. So what is it? This. Oh, it's... That's just to make sure you don't forget. If you don't show up with the dough, there ain't gonna be no New Year for you. You understand? Yes, I, I understand. Good. See you at midnight. I had to get back the 150. Maybe I could make a fast killing at the track with it, or, or, or something. I had to get it back. Oh, back so soon, Mr. Edcock? Yes, yes, I, uh, I made a mistake. Mm. We all make mistakes. That is life. Look, I've got to have that money back. Here's your watch. My watch, Mr. Edcock? This is your watch. You bought it. But, but I don't want it. I want the money. A deal is a deal. But you don't understand. Uh, I... It is you who do not understand, Mr. Edcock. To sell the watch, you must find a buyer. I am not buying. But look, you've got to help me. Well, will you take the watch in pawn? Of course. That is my business. Well, how much can I get for it? Five dollars. Five dollars? Just a few minutes ago, I paid a hundred and fifty for it. It is unfortunate that I do not value it so highly now. Five dollars? No, thanks. <laughs> Five dollars wouldn't help me. I had to have money, big money. My only chance now was to try to borrow it. I know you've had an account here for years, Mr. Adcock, and of course we like to do what we can for our regular customers, but unless you have some collateral... Well, what kind of collateral? Oh, stocks, bonds, real estate. Uh, if I had that kind of stuff, I wouldn't need the loan. Five hundred? Joe, you're crazy. Hey, bartender, another beer. All right, all right, Harry. Make it a C note, anything. Yeah, well, what about the C note you borrowed last August? Oh, I'll pay you back. Honest. Yeah, I heard that last August. Oh, Harry, how long have you known me? Mm, ten years, I guess. All right, ten years. Doesn't that count for anything? Not for a C note, it don't. Oh, but Harry... No! Not a dime. Not a lousy dime. Only one thing left to do. Central Flower Shop. Molly, uh, I want you to come home right now. Joe, aren't you at work? No, I'm home. Well, what's the matter? Are you sick? I'm all right. Just come home and hurry. Joe, what's wrong? We've got to get out of town. Fast. It took only a few minutes to throw everything Molly and I owned in the suitcases. I kept looking at the watch, wondering when Molly was going at to show up. At the signal, the correct time will be 2.30. 2.30? What's keeping her? Well, at least the watch is on time. I wonder when I ought to wind it. <laughs> Might as well do it right now. If I can figure out which one of these knobs to use. I'll try this one. 
What the devil? Where did the sun go? It was shining a minute ago. Now it's snowing. Oh, blasted, I did get the wrong knob. I moved it back to the 28th, so now I've got... Hey, wait a minute. The 28th was Sunday, the day we had the big snowstorm. Could the watch of... Ah, it's impossible. I set it back to the 31st, and I... What the... Now the sun is shining. Did the watch change the day, or am I losing my mind? Maybe I could set it again, test it. Let me see. I, uh, I was in that pawn shop just before 1 o'clock. I set the hour hand back to 12.45. There, now we'll see. Is this the 3rd Avenue Pawn Shop? Yes. Is, uh, is Joe Adcock there? One moment, please. Is your name Joe Adcock? Yeah, why? Yes, Mr. Adcock is here. Who is he? Who is calling? You wouldn't believe me if I told you. I could hardly believe it myself. But there was no question about it. The watch did control time. Once I'd grasped that fact, I began to realize its implications. For the first time in my life, I could have all the time I needed, all the time I wanted. Joe! Joe! Oh, Joe, what's wrong? Not a thing, Molly, not a thing. But you said we had to leave town. Oh, did I? Well, that's all over now. Joe, what are you talking about? I'll probably lose my job. Now, now, don't get excited. I... Well, I might as well tell you the whole story. I lied to you about the gambling, Molly. I'm $1,000 in debt. I've got to pay off by midnight, but... You pawned my ring, didn't you? But now, don't worry. I'll get it back. You lied to me. I said I'll get it back. You have no right to pawn it. It's mine. I want my ring, All right, I'll get it. Now, right now. I haven't got time now. I've got to get back to the bank before it closes. Get my ring, you promised. Will you quit nagging me about your blasted ring? Let me get back to the bank. We'll have enough money to buy you a dozen rings. Joe, what are you going to do? I'm going to rob the bank. What else? Watch figured out right. Robbing the bank would be as easy as taking pennies from a blind man. It was two minutes to three when I walked into the bank and headed for the vault. Oh, hello, Mr. Adcock. Back again, I see. Yeah, yeah, I've got to get into my safety deposit box. Certainly, go right ahead. Good. Nobody else in here. Now, I just turned the watch back to Sunday, the 28th. It worked. (laughs) I'm locked in the vault and it's Sunday. Now, let's see where they keep the ready cash. There it is. Stacks of it and all mine. Well, that's plenty for now. Enough to pay the mob and more. (laughs) There's always more where this comes from. Now, reset the watch to December 31st. Perfect. The perfect crime. All I have to do is get out of here without letting them see the money. Mr. Adcock. Yes? A happy and prosperous New Year to you, sir. Oh, thanks. Thanks a lot. Molly! Hey, Molly. Molly, it worked. We're rich. Have you been drinking? No, not a drop. Here, look at this. Go on. Take them up. They're real. Joe. These are $1,000 bills. Where did you get them? I robbed the bank. Oh, come on, Joe. I always told you I'd make it big someday. Well, today is the day. Now you go out and buy yourself a dress. We're going to celebrate New Year's Eve in style. Happy New Year, Joe. Happy New Year. Yeah, yeah. Come on. Let, let's get out of this crowd. It's almost midnight. I thought we were going to celebrate. You were going to take me to a nightclub. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But first, I I gotta meet a guy at midnight. Come on. Who? A guy. I gotta pay off that gambling debt. Well, where are you meeting him? It's just a block away, in front of the pawn shop. The pawn shop? 
My ring. Joe, you forgot my ring. Oh, for Pete's sake. I'll get your lousy ring back. Just give me a little time. Oh, a little time. That's the story of your life, isn't it, Joe? Just give me a little time. Well, all right. I'll give you all the time you want. All the rest of your life. I'm through with you, Joe. I just can't take it anymore. Molly. Don't leave me. Molly. Come back. Well, what happened? Molly just disappeared. The street is deserted. Molly! Hey, where is everybody? I wonder if this crazy watch had anything to do with... The 32nd? It should have clicked over to January 1st. Oh, no wonder everybody disappeared there. Isn't any 32nd of December. I'll just... I'll just reset it. It's stuck. It won't budge. Oh, it's got to move. It's just... Oh, no. It can't be broken. I can't stay in the 32nd of December forever. I've got to fix it. I've got to get the back off. I've got to get it to works. I... There. I... But there's nothing inside. It's the 32nd of December. And it will always be the 32nd of December. Suspense, in which Frank Lovejoy starred in William N. Robeson's production of The 32nd of December, written by Morris Lee Green and William Walker. Supporting Frank Lovejoy on the 32nd of December were Joan Banks, Barney Phillips, Sam Pierce, and Norm Alden. Listen. Listen again next week when we return with another tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. Tonight, Thrill with Gunsmoke on the CBS Radio Network. Presents Hollywood. The Lux Radio Theater brings you Joan Fontaine and Brian Ahern in Suspicion with Nigel Bruce. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. Cecil B. DeMille. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. We Americans are a nation of mystery lovers. The sliding panel, the creaking stair, bring a shiver of pleasure to a hundred million spines. We wait with bated breath for the next chapter to reveal who done it. And don't tell me there's nothing new in mysteries either. Because we have it here tonight, the RKO drama, Suspicion. It's the same gripping yarn that gave Joan Fontaine the part that won her an Academy Award. And tonight she co-stars with Brian Ahern. There are no sliding panels or creaking stairs in suspicion. But in just about three acts from now, I think you'll agree it's one of the most absorbing mysteries of the year. Two young people in love, 
with a strange threat hanging over them. These are the ingredients of suspicion. Shake well and you have an excellent spring tonic. And in the spring, a housewife's fancy usually turns to thoughts of house cleaning. But we got a different slant on the subject the other day from a listener in North Dakota. I don't believe anyone is happier to see spring come than we are up here, she writes. And so it seems like a good time to thank Lux Flakes for bringing us the Lux Radio Theater. It's our most valued entertainment all winter long. We aren't snowed in all the time, but we don't go very far when the sky is gray. The snow's gone now, and so is that supply of Lux Flakes we acquired last fall. Thanks again for making life on one North Dakota farm a little more cheerful in the months just past. To the lady from Dakota, our best wishes for a pleasant summer. She'll find that Lux Flakes, unlike snowflakes, will be just as welcome in the months to come. Now the curtain for suspicion. Starring Joan Fontaine as Lena and Brian Ahern as Johnny, with Nigel Bruce as Beaky. Let me go! Let me go! You little fool! What's the matter with you? Let me go! Hilltop overlooking the English countryside. The trees bend low before the moaning wind. Smoke gray clouds weave swiftly across a smoke gray sky. Against this sky are silhouetted the figures of a man and a woman. The man's arms are about her shoulders. She struggles wildly, fiercely, then breaks away. Again his arms reach out. Her hands are caught and held as in a vice. What did you think I was trying to do? Kill you? (laughs) Nothing less than murder could justify such a violent self-defense. Why, look at you. Let me go. Oh, I'm beginning to understand. You thought I was going to kiss you, didn't you? Weren't you? Well, of course not. I was merely reaching around you, trying to fix your hair. What's wrong with my hair? I'm glad you asked me that. It would have been extremely discourteous for me to bring the subject up. Are you serious? (laughs) Of course I'm serious. You... You always give me the feeling that you're laughing at me. No, no, I give you my word. Well, what's wrong with my hair? Let me show you. No, 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 no. Don't back away. I'm not going to hurt you. Now, let me see. Yes, yes, this will do it. (laughs) What are you thinking of? A week ago, I'd never even seen you. (laughs) And now, here we are on a Sunday morning, missing church, while I unbraid your hair. (laughs) I think you've done enough fooling with my hair. There we are. Have you got a mirror? You look splendid. I must be quite a novelty by contrast to the women you're photographed with Mm. in the newspapers. Oh. Well, well, how do you like your hair? Oh, Nan, don't screw up your face like that. You look like a monkey. (laughs) What does your family call you? Monkey face? I have to go now. I'll be late for luncheon. Anyway, if my father saw me come home both late and beautiful, he might have a stroke. Are you sure Miss Lena isn't in her room, Burton? I knocked, sir, just before I announced luncheon. She said she was going to church. Try again, Burton. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, what were you saying just before, my dear? About Lena. I do wish she'd get married, Stanley. Mm, I don't believe Lena will ever marry. She's not the marrying sort. Oh, I suppose you're right. She is rather spinsterish. What's wrong with that? The old maid's a respectable institution, and all women are not alike. Lena has intellect and a fine, solid character. Sorry I'm late. Oh, Lena, dear. Come and sit down. Uh, uh, Lena? What kept you so long at church, dear? I didn't go to church. I went for a walk. A walk? With a man. A man? Yes. His name's John Aysgarth. John Aysgarth? Is that Tom Aysgarth's boy? How did you meet him? Pity he's turned out so wild. Rough luck on Tom. What do you mean? Well, he was turned out of some club for cheating at cards, wasn't he? I don't know. I didn't ask him. What's he doing down here? Well, he's staying at Penn's Hayes. I, I shouldn't have thought Lord Middleham would have had him there if he'd ever been turned out of a club for cheating. Well, perhaps it wasn't God. May have been a woman. He was correspondent or something, I believe. Or ought to have been correspondent. Well, anyway, I'm going to see him again this afternoon. He's calling for me at three. Miss Lena, you're wanted on the telephone. Oh, oh thank you, Burton. Stanley, she seems quite excited. Do you suppose... Hello? Hello? Oh, hello, Johnny. What? <laughs> yes, a long time ago. Oh, when are you coming... Oh, Oh, you can't. Yes, of course I understand. Yes, please write and thank you for calling. Goodbye. Hello? Yes, this is Miss McNaid Law. A telegram? Will you read it, please? I will see you, yes. 
Thursday, yes. At Beecham Hunt Ball. Sign Johnny. Yes, I have it. Oh, Johnny. <laughs> I believe this is our dance, isn't it? <laughs> Hello, monkey face. <laughs> Hello. Hello, monkey face. Hello, Johnny. <laughs> come on, come on. We're getting out of here. <laughs> oh, but we can't. Oh, of course we can. This way, monkey but, face. Uh, Johnny, where are we going? Now then, which is your car? Oh, but this is ridiculous. It's uh, um, over there. Good. Come on. Tell me. Have you ever been kissed in a car before? Ah, uh, Johnny. Johnny what? Well, you mustn't joke with me. I'm no good at joking. I, I don't know how to flirt. Well, I'm not joking. I'm serious. Have you ever been kissed in a car? No. Mm hmm. Would you like to be? Yes. Well, you're the first woman I've ever met who says yes when she meant yes. What do the others say? Oh, hanged if I know. Anything but yes. <laughs> but they kiss you. Well, usually. Um, have there been... Have there been what, monkey face? <laughs> well, uh, have there been many? I'm afraid so. Quite a few. Are you always frank with them like this? No, no, not particularly. Well, then why are you frank with me? Because I'm, I'm different? Oh, no, it isn't that. I'm honest with you because, uh, well, because I think it's the best way to get results. Johnny, I hope I'm not saying the wrong thing. But I love you. No. Now, you haven't said the wrong thing, monkey face. I think I'm falling in love with you, too. That's why I stayed away for a week. I was afraid of you. I never thought it would happen like this. Oh, neither did I. Dear mother and father, Johnny and I were married last night. Married? We're off for a month's honeymoon on the continent. Please forgive me. I love him very much. Well, just put those grips there. Thank you. Uh, the trunk goes up on the landing. Well, darling, how do you like your new house? Oh, darling. Because if you don't like it, just blame it all on Mr. Bailey here. He rented the house while we were on our honeymoon. <laughs> yes, sir. Why, he even decorated the place. <laughs> oh, I do. Uh, Mr. Aysgarth, I shall have to be getting along now, so uh, what shall I do about the bill? Oh, uh, just drop it on that pretty little table on your way out, old boy. Oh, yes, thank you, Mr. Aysgarth. Thank you, Mr. Bailey. <laughs> Johnny, I never dreamt I'd ever have such a gorgeous place. Are you sure you can afford it? Yeah, yeah, look, just press that button there on the phonograph. There we are. Oh. I dance, I believe. Oh, yes. <laughs> where are we? At the Hunt Ball. And where else? In Venice. And? And Naples and Capri and Monte Carlo and Nice. And? And Paris. Paris. I beg your pardon, sir. Yes? Oh, oh, darling. This is, um... I'm so sorry, I've forgotten your name. Ethel, sir. Oh, yes. Well, Ethel, what is it? A telegram for you, oh, sir. thank you, Ethel. Yes, sir. What do you think of Ethel? Oh, she seems perfect. Oh, hmm. Oh, it isn't bad news, is it, dear? No, oh, no, no. It, it's from an old friend of mine. Stupid fella. He wants a thousand pounds. You couldn't spare a thousand, could you? A thousand? What does he want it for? Oh, hanged if I know. <laughs> Probably because I borrowed it from him. You borrowed it? Why? Because I was going on a honeymoon with the loveliest girl in the world. And I wanted her to be happy. D d didn't you have any money of your own? Well, no, not a shilling. But I, I thought I, I had the impression... Johnny, are you... Are, are you broke? Monkey face, I've been broke all my life. Why didn't you tell me and... What, whatever made you take this extravagant house? Well, I didn't want you to live in a shack. <laughs> Why, a girl like you who's going to come into plenty of money someday? Oh, wait a minute. I, I can't quite get this into my head. Were you thinking of my inheritance? Oh, I, oh, I don't know what to say. Oh, now, darling, really? Isn't it silly to spend the best years of our lives waiting? Why not be comfortable now? Johnny, I'm just beginning to understand you. You're a baby. Oh, I know you didn't marry me for my money, but... My income will never pay for all this, never. But what about your father? Well, I couldn't possibly ask my father or even mother. Anyway, you wouldn't actually want to live on your wife's allowance, would you? Of course not, darling. Well, then. Well? Well, I suppose if the worst comes to the worst and there were no other way out of it, well, I suppose I'd have to... What? Well, 
Borrow some more. I haven't touched old Middleham yet. Why, he ought to be good for a month or two's housekeeping. I think you must be mad. Oh, darling, Johnny, let's not... Johnny, listen to me. Well? There's going to be no more borrowing. Well, what else is there to do? You've got to go to work. Work? Yes, work. What, you mean put on old clothes and, and go out with a shovel? <laughs> Don't be flippant. Well, what do you mean? Well, do you realize that in order to be a plumber or a carpenter or an electrician... Oh, darling, you just haven't been around. There are all sorts of jobs, Johnny. Well, I'm broad-minded. Let's have some tea and talk it over. We can make out a list of jobs. Why, it might be fun. <laughs> well, who's that, I wonder? There it is, right behind you, darling. Hello? Oh, hello, Mother. Oh, yes, yes, it, it, it's wonderful. A most beautiful house. And, uh, oh, would you tell Father how badly I felt? And, oh, is he? Oh, oh, wait, wait a minute, and I'll tell Johnny. Johnny! Huh? Father is sending us a wedding present. No! Oh, I can't tell you how much this means to me. Oh, me too. Yes, Father, yes? Go on, go on, ask him when he's sending Shh, it. Shh, it's coming over right away by well, messenger. Well, well, invite them over for dinner. And if you can slip it in, just say that we were in the throes of job hunting when he telephoned. Johnny, really, you are the limit. What, Father? Oh, oh yes, uh, Johnny and I were just discussing that very subject, and he has several interesting ideas of the kind of job he'd like to do with. Oh, Mr. Aesgarth, there's a messenger from General McLeodlaw. Oh, it's just come, Father. Hold on. Bring it in, Ethel. Yes, ma'am. Oh, I think I know what it is, and... Oh, Johnny, you'll be thrilled. In here, please. Oh, it is... Oh, how wonderful, Johnny, look! What the... Yeah, well, what, what is that thing? It's a chair, darling, a Queen Anne chair. Ah. Here's another one, ma'am. Yeah, how many more, for heaven's sake? Just these two, sir. Oh, he sent us both of them. Oh, Johnny, these are our first he heirlooms to be handed down to our children and, and then to their children. Ah, that's the thing to do with them, all right. Oh, well, I must tell him. Oh, Father, <laughs> you're, you're so good to me that it, it makes me want to cry. You, you've made me so very happy, and, and you've made Johnny very happy, too. Oh, yes. Uh, wait a minute, Father. He wants to say something what? to you. No, him. no, no, I don't. Say something no. very nice. These chairs yeah. really belong in a museum. Now, go on. Hello, General. Yes. Oh, but really, sir, shouldn't you have sent them to a museum? <laughs> oh, but of course we're thrilled, yes. Uh, what? A job. Oh, yes, 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 yes. Lena and I were just going into that... Well, I, I have several excellent opportunities. I've just had a letter from my cousin, Captain Melbeck. He uh, he wants somebody to manage his estate for him, you know. I, I thought I'd take the job. Yes, well, I'm glad you approve, sir. Yes. Well, we'll get together soon. Goodbye, sir. That was a fib about Captain Melbeck, wasn't it? Was it? Listen to this letter. We'll give your idea the fullest consideration. Let me know if you would like to take the job. Yours sincerely, George Melbeck. Did you have this letter all the time? I did. Why didn't you tell me? Because, dear, I never dreamed I'd be using it. Any more than I ever dreamed we'd be receiving these two beautiful chairs. Oh, good afternoon, ma'am. Hello, Ethel. Is Mr. Aysgarth at home yet? No, ma'am. There's a gentleman waiting for him in the drawing room. Oh, oh thank you. Hello. I say, a nice place old Johnny's got here. Oh, yes, I'm... I'm Beaky Thwaite. You must be old Johnny's wife. Yes, I am. Well, didn't, didn't he ever tell you about me? Beaky... Oh, you're Beaky! <laughs> <laughs> That's what they used to score, call me at school. I haven't been driving by. I thought I'd just pop in for a cup of tea. Oh, I've heard so much about you, Mr. Thwaite. Yes, Johnny told me about you, too. I ran into him at Newbury Races last week. The races? Oh, oh. Put my foot in it as usual, have I? I mean, didn't he... Didn't he tell you? Johnny has a job. He, he couldn't be at the races. Besides, he's, he's given up betting. Oh, yes, has he? Well, don't you believe it. Not Johnny. He's a great lad, he is. You mustn't mind Johnny cutting up. That's what makes him Johnny. Besides, he thinks you're a topper. Won't you sit down, Mr. Thwaite? Oh, I don't see why not. Oh, well, I'm sure Johnny... W oh. Something wrong? Yes, there... There were two chairs here this morning before I left. Chairs? Disappeared ever? Yes, apparently. Were they, uh, were they expensive? Yes, they were. They were museum pieces. Queen Anne. <laughs> that Johnny, you'd be the death of me. <laughs> don't, don't you understand? No, I don't. I'll bet you 20 to 1 that old Johnny sold them. Sold them? What for? For money, of course. Fellow's got to pay his racing debts, hasn't he? 
<laughs> you know, those bookie fellas, they don't trust a chap for long. Not a chap like Johnny, that is. I don't believe you. I don't believe a word you're saying. Oh, put my foot in the gear now, huh? Oh, he, he couldn't have sold them. He wouldn't, without asking me. Mrs. Ace, Yes, sir. Here he comes. I don't tell him I've said a word. If you want to see Johnny, it is very best. You just say something about chairs. Beaky! <laughs> Johnny! <laughs> oh, you're being fine. Well, 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 what are you doing here? I just popped in to see you, boy. Good. Well, how's my little monkey face? Hmm? I don't know. What's the matter, darling? Nothing. Are what? you sure? Your, um, your wife seems to be missing some chairs, old boy. Beaky, uh, your pipe's not lit. Here, let me give you a match. Oh, thanks, old boy. About those chairs, old bean. Huh? The, uh, the missing chairs, old man. Uh, what? Oh, oh, yes. yes. Oh, the chairs, yes. Oh, I suppose that American must have come for them this morning. What American? Oh, didn't I tell you, darling? Stupid of me. Well, he, uh, he dropped by about a week ago. A friend of Melbeck's. Gone, old boy? Well, anyway, he admired the chairs and offered a hundred apiece for them. <laughs> Anyone would take that. I wouldn't. Oh, wouldn't you really, dear? Oh, well, I'm sorry. That never occurred to me. <laughs> Why, why didn't you mention it? Well, I'm sorry, darling. I thought I did. Oh, well, <laughs> that's all right. If they're gone, they're gone. Yeah, they're gone all right. Shall we change for dinner? Oh, you're an angel. Yeah, hold on a minute. You say that he offered you a hundred apiece for him? That's right. Well, let's have a look at the check. Oh, he'll send it along. I'll bet you ten pounds to a shilling you wouldn't dare let your wife pick up the telephone and, and ask old Melbick, or whatever his name is, if he ever saw this American... Are you implying that my husband is, is a liar, Mr. Thwaites? Oh, now, monkey face, don't mind Beaky. He's only joking. Well, I prefer jokes on other subjects. Um, are you staying for dinner, Mr. Thwaites? Dinner? I'm spending the weekend, and, unless you throw me out. Johnny's friends are always welcome, as long as they remain Johnny's friends. <laughs> Mr. DeMille presents Act Two of Suspicion, starring Joan Fontaine, Brian Ahern, and Nigel Bruce, in just a moment. Now, here's a last-time announcement about the Lux Flakes Garden Club. Yes, this is the last time we can tell you on the air about our wonderful flower bargain. Three hardy, vitamin-treated chrysanthemum plants, a whole dollar's worth, for only ten cents and the opening tab from a large box of Lux Flakes. Single and double chrysanthemums, pom-pom and button types in all their full range of glorious color, are included in our offer. Some will grow as big as three or four inches across. Plant them now, and from early next fall right up until killing frost time, you'll have armloads of blossoms, dozens from each plant, to cut and arrange indoors at a cost of almost nothing. These Lux Mom plants are all first-quality, well-rooted, field-grown plants. They'll bloom year after year, and one in each set of three, the feature mum, Blooms in a soft, glowing shell pink color that's specially lovely indoors under artificial light. And an extra special feature of our offer, every one of our plants has been given a special vitamin treatment with transplantone to strengthen the roots and produce earlier and more perfect blossoms. Now, even though you haven't a garden, you can still enjoy the luxury of fresh flowers for your home. For these Lux chrysanthemum plants will thrive in flower pots or window boxes in any Sunday window. Order as many sets of three plants as you want, but order them promptly. Don't forget, this is the last time you will hear this premium offer. So get your order in the mail right away. If not tonight, then tomorrow, if you possibly can do so. But by all means, send it not later than next Sunday, May 10th, as this radio offer expires on that date, May 10th. Because of the tremendous rush of orders, we ask you to allow at least two weeks for your plants to reach you. Now, here's what you do. Write your name and address on a piece of paper or on the handy order blank which your dealer has. Mail it with ten cents in coin. No stamps, please. Ten cents in coin and the opening tab from a large box of Lux Flakes to Lux Garden Club, Hollywood, California. With your chrysanthemum plants, we'll send you a leaflet of planting instructions and another leaflet telling you how you can get several other flower bargains. Remember, for each set of three plants you order, send ten cents in coin and the opening tab from a large box of Lux Flakes to Lux Garden Club, Hollywood, California. Be sure to include your own name and address, of course. The offer is good only in the United States. Now, our producer, Mr. DeMille. Act Two of Suspicion, starring Joan Fontaine as Lena and Brian Ahern as Johnny, with Nigel Bruce as Beaky. A 
a week has passed. But in Lena's mind, there's still a dim shadow of doubt. A faint, indefinable fear. The dawning of suspicion. Now in a, the quiet main street of the town, she meets the local celebrity, a writer of mystery stories. Lena, dear. Oh, hello, Isabel. I've just been admiring your display in the bookshop. Murder on the footbridge. Yes, they're doing very nicely by it. How's Johnny? Oh, he's fine. He's an ardent admirer of yours. I don't believe there's one of your stories he hasn't read. Splendid. By the way, have you seen Telbrook's window? The antique shop? No, not lately. Well, my dear, they've got the most beautiful things. Two lovely old Queen Anne chairs. I'd give my soul to own them. Chairs? Lovely. Well, goodbye, my dear. See you for dinner soon. Yes, of course. I'll phone you, Lena. The chairs. He said he sold them to an American. He lied to me. Why? Why did he lie to me? <laughs> Hello, old girl. Back so soon? Vicky, I owe you an apology. Good. I mean, uh, what for? Well, I'll explain to you later. I say, you seem to be a little hot under the collar. Must be about old Johnny. Would you excuse me? My dear, you you mustn't be angry with Johnny. It's a waste of time. Now, if you want to get sore with me, it's a different thing altogether. I annoy everybody who always did. Lena! Vicky! Vicky! Where are you? Where are you? <laughs> oh, hello, hello, hello. Now then, don't move either one of you. Just stay like that. <laughs> I must watch the expressions on your faces. I say, what have you got in those packages, old oh, You'll find out soon enough. Oh, Beaky, this is a red letter day. Lena, Lena, look. Do you remember that little necklace you admired in the shop window in Regent Street? Yeah. I say. <laughs> Beaky, here's a little present for you. Old what man. is it, Obie? Oh, oh, stick. Thanks, Obie. Darling, do you remember this fur coat? I saw the hungry eye you gave it the last time we were up in London. <laughs> well, it's yours. What do you say? Johnny, I, I don't understand what made you do all this. Oh, now, dear, don't be angry. Well, Johnny, I want to know what this is all about. Yes, what is it all about, Obin? Well, my friends, I have the pleasure of announcing that the Goodwood Cup was run today, and I happen to have backed the winner. A ten-to-one shot, ladies and gentlemen, and I had 200 pounds on him. 200 <laughs> pounds at ten-to-one? Well, that's 2,000 quid. Darling, what's happened to your tongue? Oh, come on, darling, smile. Johnny... Where did you get the 200 pounds? I say, old girl, that's not a very tactful question. Where did you get it? Oh, you know very well there was no American. I got it for the chairs, of course. You sold the chairs to gamble all your money on a horse? Well, not exactly. I owed the bookies some money, but uh, then along came this hot tip. Oh, darling, come on, give us a smile. Yes, oh. come on, old girl, come. Oh, I know. What? You tickle a chin, I'll make a noise like a duck. <laughs> <laughs> come on, old man, more duck, more duck. More duck, Hobby. <laughs> Oh, no, it's no good, Beaky. No. Oh, oh, I forgot something. Darling, look at this. It's a receipt from a certain antique shop. Paid in full for a certain pair of chairs. They'll deliver within the hour. Johnny. There, there, you see? She's smiling. Hi, Julia, so she is. Oh, Johnny, darling. <laughs> well done, old Beaky. I say, what about celebrating? Oh, trust old Beaky to say the right thing at the right time. <laughs> Come on, darling, look at me. Are you happy? Yes. Of course she is. Here, here you are, Lena. This, this is yours, old girl. Thank you, Beaky. And, and here's yours, old Bean. Ah. And, uh, and now for a, for a toast. Yeah, wait a minute, Beaky. What are you drinking? Brandy? Oh, just, just this once, old Bean. Now, you know that's not good for you. All right. Oh, well, maybe just this once. Oh, thanks, Obin. Monkey face, I drink to the last bet that will ever be made by Johnny Aesgar. The last bet, Obin. Well, bottoms up. <coughs> Mickey. What's the matter with him? Sit down, Mickey. sit down. Here. John, Johnny, get some water quick. It won't help. I've seen this happen before. There's nothing much you can do about it. Open his collar, he can't breathe. That's no use, darling. It'll either kill him or it'll go away by itself. Sorry, Obin. One of these days, it'll kill him. Oh, good afternoon, Mrs. Aysgar. Good afternoon. Is my husband in his office? Mr. Aysgar? Why, no. When do you expect him? Well, I, I really couldn't say. Perhaps you'd like to talk to Captain Melbeck. Yes, I would. Very much, please. This way. Mrs. Aysgar to see you, sir. Oh, come in. Mrs. Aysgarth, what a pleasure to see you. Good afternoon, Captain Melbourne. Well, do sit down. Well, I, I don't want to impose upon you, but you're Johnny's cousin as well as his employer, and I, well, I thought I'd come and see you. Well, of course. 
I've been feeling pretty badly about Johnny ever since I had to discharge him. Discharge? Well, don't worry, Mrs. Aysgarth. I told him I wouldn't prosecute. I, I, I don't understand. I told him I wouldn't prosecute. What on earth are you talking about? When did you discharge him? Oh, six weeks ago. We had an unexpected audit, and the accounts showed a deficit of £2,000. When I looked into Johnny's records... Well, I'm terribly sorry, Mrs. Aysgarth. He should have told you. Johnny, I am leaving you. It is very important that we never see each other again. Lena. Yes? Oh, Ethel told me she'd packed your grips. Uh, yes. Oh, then, uh, then you've heard, eh? Yes, I've heard. I'm so sorry, darling. I'm terribly sorry. This telegram just came from the doctor. It tells how it happened. Telegram? There aren't many details. I deeply regret your father died early this morning from heart failure. Your mother wishes you to come at once. <laughs> Lena. <laughs> Tired, darling? Mm, a little. It's been a nasty week for you. I'll be glad to get you home. Lena, do you ever have any regrets that you married me? Why do you ask that? Seems pretty obvious that your father would have left you a lot more than his portrait if you'd been anybody else but Mrs. John Aysgar. Oh, is, is that what you meant? You haven't answered my question. What about you? Have you any regrets? Monkey face... Marrying you is the one thing I've never changed my mind about. Do you really mean that, John? Yes, I really mean that. What about you? Oh, I... Oh, I couldn't stop loving you if I tried. Have you tried? Yes, once. When? When I found out you'd lost your job with Captain Melby. How long have you known? Since last Friday. Who told you? Captain Melbeck. I, I met him. Did he tell you why? No. Suppose you tell me why. Oh. Oh, well, we, uh, we just didn't get along. Say, it's quite nice here. Shall we stop and have a look at the sea? Pretty, isn't it? Gee, it'd be quite a drop off this cliff, wouldn't it? Why didn't you get along with Captain Melby? Oh, I don't know. He's a bit of an old fogey, you know. Monkey face, the way to make money is to think in a big way. Now, 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 now look at all this land, for instance. Look at the view from these cliffs. Now, why isn't something done about it? You know, if I had 10,000 pounds, or still better, 20,000, I, I could start a development here. All you need is 20,000 pounds. 20,000 pounds, that's all I'd need. 20,000 pounds, eh? You think we could swing it for that, Obi? Well, of course. Now, you see, Beaky, this is the ground plan. That's wonderful, Obi, and then we could put the large hotel up here on the cliff, eh? That's the idea. <laughs> hello, hello. What's going on in here, hmm? Oh, oh, monkey face. Uh, we're, um, we're organizing a real estate company. We're about to buy a very beautiful piece of land right by the sea. What a view. What sun. What air. And then we sell part of it at a profit. Oh, I see. But you'll need financing for all this. Of course. Have you found someone to put up the money? Of course. Who? Me? Oh, I see. Well, the, uh, the idea's mine, but the, uh, the money's Beaky's. <laughs> and the corporation, well, uh, Beaky's going to borrow against some securities he has in Paris. Yes, but... It... Oh, look, darling, let me show you how simple it is. Does Beaky understand it? Oh, perfectly. I think. I beg your pardon, Mr. Aysgarth. Yes, Ethel? You're wanted on the phone, sir. Oh, thank you. Oh, excuse me. Being... Yes, right over. Now, Beaky, please explain it to me, will you? Well, you see, my dear girl, well, well you see, uh, we, uh, we buy up this land and then we sell part of it. That gives us a 100% profit in no time. Then, then on the other part, we... Uh, well, we, we, we build something, rather. Oh, yes, but from whom do you buy the land? To whom do you sell it? Well, that shouldn't be difficult, do you think? Beaky, isn't it about time you grew up? I say, old girl, you're, you're scolding me. Yes, you need a scolding. Shall I go and stand in the corner? Oh, Beaky, you're not being fair to Johnny. I say, old girl, that's a bit thick. Why, he's president of the whole bag of thing, which he gets a salary, writes his own checks. Yes, that's what I mean. Oh, well, what's wrong with that? Yes, what is wrong with it? Well, Lena? I said, oh, Lena's telling me that you're a bit soft in the head. Is that it? Sounded like that to me. Yeah, hadn't you better be changing for dinner? Oh, right over. I shan't be a jiffy. What right have you to interfere in my affairs? 
But I, I wasn't really. I was only... You were only what? Well, I, I was only trying to tell Biggie that he shouldn't leave everything to you. It's, it, it's not as if you were both experienced businessmen. What the devil do you know about business? Oh, very little. Suppose Biggie had taken you seriously. You, you'd have ruined the whole scheme. Do you realize that? Yes, but if it weren't good... That's my business, not yours. If I say it's good, it's good. And I don't want any interference from you or anybody else. Is that clear? Yes, that's clear. <laughs> Yes, who is it? Yes, darling? Oh, I, uh, I thought you might like to know. I, I'm uh, calling off that real estate plan. Why? What happened? Oh, I don't know. Perhaps the land isn't any good, or perhaps I don't like the idea of risking Beaky's money, or, or perhaps it's a stiff job, and, and I'm just too lazy. I don't know what it is, but... Every time I play anagrams, I, I can only make three-letter words. D-O-U-B. D-O-U-B is no such word. <laughs> Try this. D-O-U-B-T. Doubt. Oh, thanks, old go. I said, Johnny, I don't see why you want to call off this real estate business. It's no good. But the corporation's formed already. The money's been put up in your name, old boy. The deal is off, Beaky. Uh, well, why do we have to drive all the way up there to, to look at it? I won't be responsible for calling the scheme off without first proving to you that it's no good. So we're going up to the cliffs early tomorrow morning and take a look. Well, why are you so insistent? Because, as I told you, I won't be responsible. Oh, all right, old boy. I say, what's that you got there, Lena? M-U-D-D-E-R? <laughs> it's no such word, is it? Try the R in, instead of the D. M-U-R-D-E-R. Murder. <laughs> That's more like it. Murder. Okay, Johnny, I don't like going up there in, in the morning. Well, why do we have to go up so early? Now, Beaky. Murder. Oh, well, if we have to, well, let's get on with the game. It's your turn, old girl. The money in his name. Murder. The cliffs overlooking the sea. I say, Lena. The edge of the cliff. Stay away, Beaky. Lena, I say. You push him off, you kill you. Murder, murder. Murder. Lena, what's the matter? Lena. Here, give me a hand here, Beaky. She's fainted. <laughs> What time did Mr. Aysgarth leave? Why, about seven, ma'am. And Mr. Thwaite went with him? Yes, ma'am. Well, why didn't you wake me? Well, Mr. Aysgarth said not to disturb you. What car did they use? Well, ma'am, I... What I car? Which one? Listen. Oh, that's Mr. Aysgarth now, ma'am. He's back. He's come back. Hello, hello. Oh, morning, Lena. Johnny. You feeling better? Oh, what's the matter? You're as white as a sheet. Where? Where's Beaky? What? Hello, old girl. How are you feeling? Oh. Any better? Oh, Lena, what is it? Oh, Johnny. Oh, darling, I'm so glad I... Oh, well, 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 well. What is all this? Why, well, I've only been away a few hours. It seems like a thousand years. Yeah, it seems like that to me, too. Oh, shut up, Beaky. It was nothing. Nothing? I came very near to losing my life. <laughs> Do you call that nothing? You nearly lost your life. Came very close to it. Oh, let's drop the subject. No, go on, Beaky. I, w I want to hear about it. Well... There we were on the top of the cliff. I was trying to turn my car near the edge. Was Johnny in the car? No, 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 no. He was a few feet away. Go on. Well, I didn't realize that I was backing the car right towards the edge, but I was. And if old Johnny hadn't taken a flying leap and grabbed the brake, I should have been in kingdom come by now. Johnny saved your life. Johnny. Oh, I, I can never tell you how much this means to me. To you, darling. Yes, it means a good bit to me, too. I mean. The old fellow deserves a reward, I say. How about, how about a night out? A spot of celebrating on me, Orbean? Oh, very kind of you, Beaky, but don't you have to go to Paris? Paris? Oh, yes, yes, of course, so I do. My security's over there. I've got to go over and cancel the arrangements for them. I say, why don't you come over with me? <laughs> Why, well, the cad seems to forget that I'm a married man. <laughs> I'll tell you what I might do, Beaky. I might drive up to London with you. Hey, how about that monkey face? Yes, monkey, I mean, Lena, do, do let him come. Well, it seems to me... Yes, I know. It seems to you that I should be looking for a job. Well, it seems to me I'll have much more chance of getting a job in London than I would anywhere around yes, here. Yes, of course he would. I say, do let him come, Lena. Well, I don't see very well how I can stop him. Good day! Hey! Hey! <laughs> Mrs. Aysgar. Yes, Ethel? There's an Inspector Hodgson in the hall, ma'am. He wants to speak to Mr. Aysgarth. Show him in, Ethel. 
Very good, ma'am. Will you come this way, please, sir? Thank you. Mrs. Aysgarth? Yes? My name's Hodgson, Inspector Hodgson from the county police. Oh, how do you do? I understand your husband's not in, ma'am. Uh, no, he's been in, up in London for two days. Well, perhaps you might be able to help us. Yes, of course. I believe you know a Mr. Thwaite. Yes, he's a close friend of my husband's. Well, I don't know how to put it quite. Perhaps it would be easier if I showed you this in this afternoon's paper. Right here, ma'am. Englishman found dead. An Englishman met with a mysterious death in a house in Paris. He's believed to be Mr. Gordon Cochrane Thwaite of... Beaky. I'm sorry to have to do this, ma'am, but we're making inquiries on behalf of the Paris police. They found some papers on Mr. Thwaite's person which indicated he just formed a corporation with your husband. What... what do the French police think caused the death? Well, this is a copy of a telegram that we received from Paris. Thwaite visited the place in the company of another Englishman. On arrival, Thwaite ordered a bottle of brandy. Brandy? According to the statement of one of the waiters, Thwaites' companion asked for the brandy to be served in large beakers. Apparently, as a result of a bet between the two men, Thwaite filled one of these beakers to the brim and drank it all. The other man was not present when the actual tragedy happened. I'm sorry to upset you, ma'am, but do you or your husband happen to know of any friend of Mr. Thwaites who might have been there with him? No. Then perhaps you could enlighten us about this corporation? Yes, I believe I can, my husband had planned a real estate development with him and Mr. Thwaite had gone to Paris to dissolve the corporation. Thank you, ma'am. That's all. Good day. Good day. He didn't go to Paris. He's in London. John is in London. He's at the club. He's got to be at the club. He didn't go to Paris. He didn't. Hello? Hogarth Club? May I... May I speak to Mr. Aysgarth, please? He left? Left when? Yesterday morning. No, no, it doesn't matter, thank you. Murder. Murder! We pause now for station identification. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. After a brief intermission, Mr. DeMille returns with John Fontaine and Brian Ahern for the third act of Suspicion. Meantime... Hey, Mr. Ruick, do you know how Mother Goose did her dishwashing? Well, it sounds like a gag to me, Sally, but go ahead. Well, it was very easy. She made everyone eat with a spoon. And when they were all through eating, why... Why, the dish ran away with the spoon. <laughs> now, Sally... <laughs> why, it was a wonderful system. Quick, easy, no dishpan hands. But you couldn't exactly call it thrifty, Sally. There's no record that the dishes and spoons ever ran back again. Now, I can tell you a way to wash dishes that saves you from dishpan hands and is thrifty, too. The Lux Flakes way. You're right, Mr. Ruick. Scores of tests have proved how gentle Lux is, have shown that hands, reddened and roughened by strong soaps in the dishpan, grew lovely again after changing to Lux Flakes. Yes, simply changing to Lux took away that red, rough look without the use of any creams or lotions. And New Quick Lux goes further, gives you more suds, ounce for ounce, even in hard water, than any of ten other soaps tested. It's very thrifty. So you needn't have red dishpan hands. You save your hands when you wash dishes the thrifty Lux soap way. Get the generous big box first thing tomorrow morning and use it for your dishes every day. One big box of New Quick Lux will do dishes for about 45 meals. Now, Mr. DeMille returns to the microphone. The curtain rises on the third act of Suspicion, starring Joan Fontaine and Brian Ahern. In Lena's mind, the sharp sting of suspicion has given way to the dull, sickening ache of certainty. Certainty that her husband is a murderer. Returning to the house, he stands framed in the doorway, looking at her. She turns toward him with fear in her eyes. You've read about Beaky, have you? 
I was terribly fond of Beaky. Were you? Yes, I loved that silly, generous, good-hearted fool. Did you? Of course I did. Next to you, I loved him more than anybody in the world. Next to me? Oh, oh, poor monkey face. Here I am thinking only of myself and forgetting about you. You liked him too, didn't you? I liked him very much. The police were here. The police? What did they want? They wanted you to help them. It seems there was an Englishman who made a... a a bet. Yes, I know. The whole story was in the late edition. What else? The inspector wants you to phone him. He... He thought perhaps you could help identify this Englishman. What did you tell them? Did you mention the corporation? Naturally, I I told them Beaky was planning to dissolve it. I wish you'd left all that to me. Hello. Uh, Wickstead Police Station, please. What else did you tell them? That's about all. Hello. Uh, hello, Inspector. This is Mr. John Aysgarth. Yes, uh, yes. Well, I drove up to London with him on Tuesday evening and we dined at the Savoy. Yes. Well, then I saw him off at Croydon Airport. Oh, no, no. I stayed in London until this afternoon. At my club. Lena, how nice to see you. I don't see half as much as you as I'd like. Well, that's sweet of you, Isabel. You know, I couldn't put my light out until three this morning. I was so interested in your last book, and I I had to come over and talk to you about it. That's the most thrilling compliment I ever got. I was completely fascinated by the way your villain enticed his victim across the footbridge, knowing that the bridge had been sawn through. And he also knew his victim couldn't swim. Don't forget that. Well, what I want to know is this. Uh, Would you call that an actual murder? Well, from the moral standpoint, there's no question at all. It is murder. I suppose it is. What does Johnny think? Johnny? Oh, I I haven't discussed it with him. I should think he'd be interested. The same situation with this friend of his in Paris. The same? Well, that brandy business is just like my footbridge. By the way, this brandy thing isn't new at all, you know. Oh, it's been done before? Oh, yes. And in real life, too. I have it here. A book called The Trial of Richard Palmer. Now, what is that book? Trial of Richard Palmer, The Trial of... Oh, I remember where it is. It's in your house. My house? Yes. Johnny borrowed it a week ago. Hello? Hello. Uh, may I speak to Mr. Aysgarth, please? Uh, he isn't in. This is Mrs. Aysgarth speaking. Oh, uh, well, this is the Garantors Life Insurance Company. Yes? Would you tell Mr. Aysgarth that there's been a slight delay in replying to his inquiry? But we've written him fully on the matter, and he should get our letter by first post in the morning. Dear sir, replying to your inquiry regarding a loan of £5,000 against your wife's insurance policy, we regret to state that such a loan cannot be granted. According to the terms of the policy, payment can only be made in the event of your wife's death. If you... Morning, dear. Any letters for me? Oh, what's the matter? Nothing. Darling, you're not shivering, are you? I, I, I have a bit of a chill. Cold in all this sunshine? <laughs> My poor little shivering baby. Oh, um, what are we doing tonight? Uh, we're going to Isabel's to dine. Oh, what a bore. <laughs> Well, let's get back to that new book of yours, Isabel. You mean to tell me that a fellow comes into a room, sits down and starts to strum on the piano, and uh, and two seconds later he's shot? Is that the idea? Yes. A certain note on the piano was wired to a revolver concealed in the wall panelling. Oh, I don't care much for that, Isabel. You're slipping, old girl. What's wrong with it? Oh, it's too complicated. If you're going gil- to kill somebody, just uh, do it simply. How would you do it simply, Johnny? Oh, I don't know, dear. Just use the most obvious method. For instance... Well, for instance, poison, say, uh, arsenic. Arsenic can be traced in the body, of course. But it isn't always. Hmm, no. This very minute, there are probably hundreds of murderers walking about. Thousands. Johnny, do you suppose those murderers are happy? Oh, I don't know. Why shouldn't they be? Uh, anyway, Isabel, it seems to me that by now, somebody would have discovered a poison that can't be traced. What's that? What about it? Isn't there... An un- 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 untraceable poison? Nonsense. There's no such thing. Isabel, you're hiding something from me. (laughs) Johnny, you're locking up. What about Ethel? 
Well, it's Ethel's night off. She won't be back till morning. What about Cook? Have you forgotten? Cook's away on holiday. Oh. My darling, you're shivering again. Do you suppose you're catching cold? Yes, I, I think that's what it must be. Oh, well, we'll have to tuck you into bed and get you nice and warm. Come along. No, Johnny, please. Please don't. What's the trouble? Johnny, I, I'm in a state tonight. I, I don't know why, but I'd like to be alone. Would you mind sleeping in your dressing room? Well, of course I'd mind. Please, Johnny, I haven't been sleeping. Oh, I understand. You used to sleep badly when I wasn't here, and now you... Well, all right, if that's the way you feel about it. Good night. Arsenic. Poison. Untraceable. In the event of your wife's death. Poison. In the event of your wife's death. Your wife's death. Your wife's death. Come on, Lena. Wake up, dear. You feeling better? Uh, yes, I... Uh... Hello, darling. I Isabel, I came over this morning. We were quite worried about you, Lena. This morning? Have I been sleeping all day? The doctor gave you a pill, darling. That's all you needed. Rest. Here, yeah, I'll run down and tell Ethel to fix something for supper. I'll be right back. He's one in a million, that Johnny of yours. Uh, isn't it? I warn you, you'd better get well, because if you leave me alone much longer with him, my career will soon be over. He flirted with you, I suppose. Flirted? <laughs> Worse than that. He's worming all my secrets out of me. Did you tell him anything today? <laughs> Did I? Now, <laughs> honestly, have you ever been able to deny Johnny anything? It was about that poison, wasn't it? Yes, it was. And if he writes a story on that one before I do... Lena, I imagine. A substance in daily use everywhere. Anyone can lay his hands on it. And within a minute after taking, the victim's beautifully out of the way. And mind you, it's undetectable after death. Is whatever it is painful? Not in the least. In fact, I should think it would be a most pleasant death. Lena, are you awake? Yes. Oh, I've brought you a glass of milk. Here, darling, I'll put it here. Drink it before you go to sleep. Good night, darling. Why don't you let me help you pack? But well, there's no need to, I... What's the matter with you this morning? You're still annoyed with me, aren't you? No, Johnny, really, I still don't feel well, that's all. And a few days at your mother's will do you more good than staying at home. Oh, not exactly that. Dear mother, telephone she me. She got on that phone awfully early, it seems well, to me. Well, mother gets up early. I, I happened to mention that I, I was a bit nervy, and before I knew it, I'd, I'd agreed to spend a few days with her. Oh, all right. I'll run down and get the car ready. Oh, no, please, I'll drive myself. I prefer to drive you. <laughs> You're going so fast, Johnny. You want to get there, don't you? Well, did you did you have to go by this oh, road? Why not? It's the shortest way, isn't it? Ha! There's the hotel site. That's another thing I failed at. The cliffs. He's going to kill me. That door is open. He's going to kill me. The cab up there. The door was swinging. He's going to push me out and down, down, over, over, down, down, over, down. Oh, no! Look out! Ah! Get your hand off that door. Lena! Let me go, let me go! Lena, Lena, come back! No, no! Lena! Let me Lena, go! Lena, what's got into you? Oh, let me alone. Stop it, stop it, you little fool, stop it! I've had enough. How much do you think a man can bear? Listen, listen to me. You turn me out of your room, you go running away to your mother's, and now you shrink away from me as though you hated me. You're my wife, Lena! But I, I thought... Why, you almost killed us both back there. Because you had to pull away even when I was reaching over to save you from falling out of the car. Well, you don't have to put up with me anymore. Johnny, wait. Where are you going? First, I'm taking you on to your mother's. And then what? Oh, don't you worry. I won't bother you again. Johnny, you mean you're... Go Johnny, why were you asking Isabel about that poison? What were you planning to do with it? Johnny, you were going to kill yourself. Oh, my darling. Yes. But I saw that was a cheap way out. 
So I'm going back to see it through. Prison term and everything. Prison? You mean no back? That money you... I can't pay it back. I made the last attempt to raise the money when I went away with Beaky. To Paris. Paris? I didn't go to Paris. I went to Liverpool. I tried to borrow on your insurance. But it didn't work. You mean you were in Liverpool when Beaky... Then you didn't go to Paris. Well, of course not. Do you think I'd have let some idiot give poor old Beaky that brandy if I had? Oh, Johnny. If only I'd known. I was thinking only of myself, not of what you were going through. Oh, if I'd been really close to you, you, you could have confided in me, but you were ashamed to. Oh, if I'd only understood. Oh, Johnny, it will be different now. We'll make it different. People don't change overnight, Lena. I'm no good. Oh, let's turn back, Johnny. Let's go home and see it through together. No, it won't work. Oh, it will work. I know it will. Johnny, please, you can't shut me out. Turn the car around and let's go home. Please, Johnny. Get in the car. Johnny, where are we going? We're turning back. We're going home. Our stars will return to the microphone in just a moment for a curtain call. Meantime, some news of interest to women about the new rayon stockings that stores are featuring today. You know, these new rayons have greater elasticity and greater strength than earlier ones. New finishes make them more beautiful, too. Of course, you'll need to give these new rayons the right care for best results. Rayon is temporarily weak in water, so handle it gently. Don't rub. Don't use strong wash day soaps. Just squeeze lukewarm Lux suds through the stockings, then rinse, just as you do with silk and nylon. Roll the stockings for a moment in a Turkish towel to press out the moisture. Then unroll them at once and hang them over a smooth rod. Always be sure you get rayon stockings really dry before you wear them again. Let them dry from 24 to 48 hours. This is important because even though the stockings may feel dry before this time, the inside of the rayon threads may still be damp and rayon regains its natural strength only when thoroughly dry. You'll find this easy Lux way pays big dividends in cutting down runs and giving you long wear from these lovely new stockings. Now, here's Mr. DeMille with our stars. It's no secret to most of you that in private life, our stars are Mr. and Mrs. Brian Ahern. And it's no secret to any of you that they gave a fine performance tonight in Suspicion. Oh, thank you very much, C.B., Joan has been looking forward to weeks to her first visit to the Lux Radio Theatre. And to playing opposite Brian, too, Mr. DeMille. Well, sounds as though she married you because she admired your acting, Brian. <laughs> well, that's the best of you I've had yet, C.B. <laughs> Confidentially, though, I married Joan for her Academy Award. <laughs> I had a suspicion she had win it. Ooh. <laughs> I think you'd better buy an extra war bond this week, Brian, for a pun like that. <laughs> Definitely. What's the news on the front of on Hollywood's all-out battle of bonds, Mr. DeMille? I was talking with headquarters just today, John. And the noon communique is, we're advancing on all fronts. The goal for the entire industry, you know, is 10% or more of everyone's income for war bonds. That should buy a lot of tanks and planes, CB. About $300,000 worth a week, Brian. Perhaps 100 bombers a year will be paid for by bonds Hollywood will buy through our voluntary payroll savings plan. And that doesn't count our regular cash sales of bonds, either. It sounds like a system that every business might adopt, Mr. DeMille. How is it organized? The Motion Picture Committee for Hollywood was formed at the request of the Treasury Department to represent every part of the motion picture industry, labor, management, and creative branches. The producer with four telephones and three secretaries is no more important than the carpenter who builds the set or the electrician who lights it. We need everybody. You know, at a meeting the other day, the two best suggestions were made by a lovely extra girl who just come from the set in makeup and a man who just come from the same set in overalls. In other words, Hollywood's payroll savings plan is democracy at work to sell war bonds. Like that carpenter I was talking about, Brian, you hit the nail on the head. 
In a few weeks, we expect to tell the Treasury Department that every actor, stenographer, writer, musician, makeup man, costumer, hairdresser, executive, business manager, agent, cameraman, sound technician, director, carpenter, clerk, electrician, and set dresser has signed up. That every man and woman who works in motion pictures and the allied branches of the industry is in the payroll savings plan and is voluntarily putting at least 10% of his or her salary in United States war bonds. Not just this week or this month, but every payday for the duration of the war. And it's one production with the starring part for everyone. Well, who's starring here in the Lux Radio Theater next week, C.B.? First, let me tell you the play, Brian. It's Frederick Lonsdale's famous comedy, The Last of Mrs. Cheney. And our stars will be Norma Shearer, Walter Pidgeon, and Adolph Manjo. The Last of Mr. Ch- Mrs. Cheney ran a whole season on Broadway and twice made a hit in motion pictures. I fully expect it to keep up that brilliant record here next Monday night with a cast like Norma Shearer, Walter Pidgeon, and Adolph Manjo. Well, that play is one of my favorites, C.B. <laughs> Thank you and good night. Good night, Mr. DeMille. Good night. Good night. Remember, a bond every payday keeps the access away. Our sponsors, the makers of Lux Flakes, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday night when the Lux Radio Theater presents Norma Shearer, Walter Pigeon, and Adolf Manjou in The Last of Mrs. Cheney. This is Cecil B. DeMille saying good night to you from Hollywood. Ladies and gentlemen, modern medical science can cure cancer if the disease is discovered early. The Women's Field Army of the American Society for the Control of Cancer deserves your support in its campaign to spread knowledge of cancer control. Joan Fontaine appeared tonight through the courtesy of David O. Selznick and will soon be seen in the title role of the David O. Selznick production, Jane Eyre. Brian Ahern, star of Columbia Pictures, will be seen in their production of Salute to Sahara. Nigel Bruce appeared through the courtesy of Universal Pictures. His next picture is Universal's Sherlock Holmes Saves London. Heard in tonight's play were Jill Esmond as Isabel, Vernon Steele as General McLaidlaw, Gloria Gordon as Mrs. McLaidlaw, John Abbott as Melvick, and Eric Snowden, Claire Verdera, and Pax Walter. The Lux Radio Theater is shortwave to American armed forces throughout the world. Tune in next Monday night to hear Norma Shearer, Walter Pigeon, and Adolf Manjou in The Last of Mrs. Cheney. Our music was conducted by Louis Silvers, and your announcer has been Melville Ruick. Listen while the makers of Rexall drug products and 10,000 independent Rexall family druggists bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, private detective. Good evening. This is your Rexall family druggist, speaking to you for the 10,000 independent druggists who have made the word Rexall part of our own store names, and who recommend and sell the 2,000 or more drug products made by the Rexall Drug Company. Like MI-31, for example, Rexall's popular mouthwash, gargle, and breath deodorant. Full-strength MI-31 kills contacted germs in seconds. Its zippy, tangy quality leaves a happy aftertaste. For a reliable yet refreshing mouthwash, use Rexall MI-31. And remember, you can depend on any drug product that bears the name Rexall. Good health to all from Rexall. Now your Rexall family druggist brings you a transcribed half hour with Richard Diamond, private detective, starring Dick Powell. Dick's special guest star tonight is... is, uh... Uh, what was your name again? I'm sorry, but I really can't tell you. 
You can't tell me. <clears throat> well, Rexall brings you Richard Diamond, starring Dick Powell. Morning, Mr. Diamond. Morning, Charlie. Now, uh, fix me something, will you? Like that, huh? You look pretty good. Oh, you should have seen me when I got up. Both my heads were hissing each other. I'll fix you my special. You snap right out of it. Well, take it easy. I tried snapping out of it this morning and scattered myself all over the room. You relax for a minute. Just getting to work? Yeah. Helen gave a party last night. I think it turned out to be the finals of the roller derby. Have a swallow a roller skate, Charlie. Once on a dare, a mouse. Oh. Sorry. Charlie! Gotta mix it. Oh, that's a horrible machine to have in a bar. Some poor guy's liable to end up with shell shock. Here, hold your breath so you don't change your mind. What's in it? In your condition, that is a very touchy question. You just drink it, you'll feel better. Okay. Uh, 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 uh. No fudging all the way. Charlie! Uh, all the way? What are you, chicken? Oh. Oh, I knew it. I knew it. You snitched this stuff from a fire extinguisher. Tastes terrible, don't it? What are you going to thaw me out with, a chisel? Now I know it ain't that bad. No? A mortician would pay good money for the formula. Wow. Well, look what came in the front door. Hmm? Oh, yes, sir. Pardon me, but I'm looking for someone. There's nobody here but me and Mr. Diamond. Here's a picture of him. Has he been in here? Oh, lady, a lot of people come in here. No, I mean this morning. Mr. Diamond's my first customer. Oh. Uh, something wrong, miss? I've just got to find him. I don't know where to look. Well, what made you think he'd be in here? I'm trying every place that's open. I lost him in this block someplace. Lost him? Well, he... Well, he just disappeared. Uh, who is he? My husband. Oh. I stopped to look at some hats in a window. I started talking about how pretty they were, and the next thing I turned around and he was gone. You called home? We're living at a hotel. He hasn't shown up there. I, I've called everyone I know in New York. You're from out of town? Yes. Oh, I'm so worried. Well, honey, from this picture, your husband looks old enough to find his way around. Why don't you go on back to the hotel and... You the... don't understand. My husband had quite a shock earlier this morning, and he was acting strangely. So you figure he might have gone looking for a drink? I don't know what I thought. It isn't like him to wander off like that. I'm so worried. Well, if you're that upset, why don't you go to the law? Missing persons. Oh, I thought about that, but I can't. You can't go to the police? I can't explain why. It, it just wouldn't be good. Would you mind a completely new remark? What? Haven't I seen you before, Miss... Uh... No... Mm, nice name. Mr. Diamond sees a lot of people. Used to be a cop himself. Oh. Private detective now. Private detective? Seems to me I've seen your husband someplace before, too. Is this an old picture? Yes, I carry it around in my wallet. Are you really a private detective, Mr. Uh... Diamond, miss. Like Sam Spade? Well, no, no. Sam drinks and runs around with women. I lead a rather sheltered life. <coughs> Steady, Charlie. Mr. Diamond, I'm really frightened. I'm sure something awful's happened to my husband. Will you help me? I might, if you tell me two things. What are they? Why you can't go to the police, and if you can afford a hundred a day in expenses. Oh, I can afford the money. You should have answered the first question first. Now I'm almost tempted to forget the last one. But I can't go to the police. Uh, dear. Dear, when people can't go to the police, it worries me. Your old man got a record or something? A record? Well, I've seen both of you someplace. You sure you aren't working some kind of a racket? Oh. Oh, 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 oh now, now, lady, take it easy. I lose my husband. I come in here for help, and you think I'm some sort of a criminal or something. Look, dear, I... I don't know what to do. I don't know where to go. I don't want to go to the police, and it has nothing to do with breaking the law. Shame on you, Diamond. Here, lady, here's a handkerchief. Thank you. Look, uh, I'm sorry. No, you're not. You're terrible. Oh, please, please. Look, I I'm in pretty bad shape myself. <laughs> okay, okay, I'll help you. Wonderful, Mr. Diamond. Where can we talk? Hey, she turns them off like a hydrant. You'll help me? Oh, yes. A uh, hundred a day in expenses. Certainly. Get her. Yeah. 
You sure you didn't dip into one of Charlie's specials? I don't drink. This isn't drinking. It's like diving into an active volcano. Where can we talk? Uh, one of the booths. Good. I don't want anyone else to know about this. You mean after this build-up, I ain't gonna, even going to hear what it's all about? Come on, dear. Oh. Uh, relax, Charlie. Have one of your specials. Who knows? You may be the first one to reach the moon. Is this booth all right, Mr. Diamond? Uh, just fine. Now sit down, dear, and tell me all about it. Well, there's really not much to tell. I took my husband to the... Well, to an appointment this morning. What kind of an appointment? I can't tell you. And you can't tell me your husband's name? No. Not even his first name? Well, I... I guess I could tell you his first name. It's Richard. Richard? Yes. You can't tell me anymore? No. You want me to find him and you want me to trust you? If you will. Will you trust me? Yes. Then I'll try and find Richard, but I'll need some help. I'll try. No, 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 please. I'll need some outside help. Who? A policeman. Oh, no, I told you. And I told you. You want me to trust you? Okay, that's what I'm going to do, but you've got to trust me, too. But the police... If you and your husband aren't in trouble with the police, you've got nothing to worry about. But the police... Not the police. A policeman. One man. But he'll find out why Richard disappeared. Well, don't you want to know why? I know why, but I don't want anyone else to know why. You don't want anyone else... You know why, but you... Oh, don't let me do this to myself. I just want to find him. Okay, okay. I promise the policeman won't say anything. I'm trusting that you have a good reason for not telling me any more than you have, but to find a man, this man in the picture, and an old photograph at that, to find this man needs a lot of doing. Checking hospitals. Hospitals? Now, don't start crying. Oh, I'm sorry. Go on. When you've got to check hospitals, morgue... Morgue! Look, 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 dear. You wait here. <gasps> no, I'm going with you. Good girl. Charlie! Thank you for being so patient. A pleasure, miss. Shall we go, Mr. Diamond? Yeah, yeah. And Charlie. Yeah? I'd like to thank you, too. Anytime. Your hospitality and good manners are only equaled by your loyalty and perspicacity. Huh? All in all, you've been a living doll. Being a person who lives out in left field most of the time myself, I realize that these little disturbances in my life were pretty average. So with cute little anonymous tagging along behind, I left Charlie's fancy bistro and headed for the 5th Precinct Police Station and the good Lieutenant Levinson. When we walked into the squad room, we bumped right into the one thing that science had been working 24 hours a day to find a cure for. Well, good afternoon, Sergeant Otis. Oh, how are you, Diamond? Hey. Oh, unpucker, Otis. Mrs. X will think the Lieutenant uses you to unstop sinks. Mrs. X? What kind of a name is that? You want to meet the lady? That's the name. Mrs. X? How do you do, Sergeant? Oh. <laughs> hey, uh, ain't I seen you someplace before? Otis, haven't I seen you someplace before? Now, what are you talking about, Chama? Sure you've seen me before. Um, Mr. Diamond. Yeah, but this is nothing. Stick around him for a whole day sometime. Come on, let's see the lieutenant. Uh... I'll see you later, Mrs. Oh, uh, uh, yes, Sergeant. It's been a pleasure. Otis. Yeah? Your eyes are hanging out so far they cover your badge. Oh. Hello, Walt. Hi, Rick. I'm... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this is Mrs. X, Walt. Dear, this is the mighty arm of the law, Lieutenant Levinson. How do you do, Lieutenant? How do you do, Mrs. Uh... Mrs. X. Oh, let's not go into this thing again. The young lady prefers to be known as Mrs. X. Now, all I want you to do me a favor. Yeah, a uh, young lady. Uh, haven't I seen you someplace, someplace before? before? Yeah, Walt. Even Otis is with us on that one. I said the same thing when she found me in Charlie's bar. Now, the young lady's lost her husband, and I'm going to help her find him. Here's his picture. See if you got anything. Oh, yeah. Uh, are you sure I haven't seen you? Walt, we'll solve that one later. The picture. Go make like a policeman. Okay. She got a record. Lieutenant. Oh, uh, well, I, uh, I never forget her face. He's been trying to ever since he got Otis. Now, come on, Walt. Get a report from missing persons. Check the hospitals and the morgue. The morgue? Oh! Uh, uh, lady, lady, lady. <laughs> it's a habit. Uh, honey, we got to do these things just in case. <laughs> but you think he's... Uh... Give me that picture. Lady, lady, please. Now, now, now. What's your husband's name? Uh, she can't tell you that, Walt. What do you mean she can't tell me that? I can't. 
Now you look, Diamond. If this is one His of your... His first name is Richard. Richard what? That's something I really can't tell you. I wouldn't have told Mr. Diamond the Richard part, but it just sort of slipped out. Now, wait. What are you two trying to do to me? You come in here and ask me to locate this guy in the picture, and you won't even tell me his last name? Look, Walt, I promised you'd do me the favor without the questions. The young lady seems to have a very good reason for not wanting to give her name or her husband's. Now, all I want you to do is check the morgues. Uh... What's the matter with her? She wants her husband. Yes, I want my husband. Before we continue with the adventures of Richard Diamond, private detective, here's your Rexall family druggist. It's always a pleasure when a customer herself tells you why she likes your product. And last week one said to me... You know why I really prefer Rexall Milk of Magnesia? It's because one bottle won't be so thick I can't even pour it, and then the next one thin and watery. Somehow Rexall Milk of Magnesia always seems to be just right. Well, ma'am, that's because every bottle of Rexall Milk of Magnesia has to meet an exacting standard of viscosity. Or it can't wear the Rexall label. What do you mean by viscosity? It's the degree of thickness or pourability in a liquid. Rexall conducts scientifically precise tests on every batch of Rexall Milk of Magnesia to be sure it meets this constant standard of viscosity. And that's not done just to please you with its consistency. What's much more important... It means you'll always get uniform dosage from every bottle of Rexall Milk of Magnesia. And I thought it was all an accident. Oh, no, ma'am. There are no accidents behind the fact. You can depend on any drug product that bears the name Rexall. And now back to tonight's adventure with Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Well, I checked, and no no one that looks like this guy is in any of the more, uh, usual places. Well, that's fine. Now let's start looking for him where I lost him, Mr. Diamond. Oh, swell. Well, Walt, we really just stopped by to say hello. Killing time, you know. Sure. I appreciate everything you've done, Captain. Lieutenant. Of course. Thank you very much. But now Mr. Diamond and I have to go and find my husband. Richard. Yes. I think you'd better wait a few minutes. What for? Yes, we've got to hurry. I've got to find my husband before the 8 o'clock plane leaves this evening. You're leaving tonight? You didn't tell me that. Well, Richard has to be in California by tomorrow morning. Got a little job to do? A very big job, Captain. Lieutenant. Well, what do you want us to wait for? Because I've got Otis checking on this girl, this Mrs. X. Oh, no. Walt, you promised. I promised nothing. You assumed. Oh, you're a fine buddy. Buddy schmuddy. You might be taken in by her sweet innocence, but not me. You double cross Mr. Diamond, you promised. But I didn't, lady. I just checked the morgues. Uh... Oh, now you shut up, Walt. Well, I never. I've seen this girl someplace, Rick, and I've got a sneaking suspicion she's wanted. Wanted? You can't cross me like this, Fatty. Wanted? Won't tell me her name, huh? No. Won't tell me her husband's name, huh? No. Then you're hiding something. Yes. Yes? Why, yes, meaning of course. Now you stop that, Rick. Rick. Is your name Richard, too, Mr. Diamond? No, my friends call me Rick. You ever in Chicago, lady? Of course. Of course? O-F-C-O-U-R-S-E. You meaning... stay out of this. You run around with Tony Capone when you were in Chicago? You talking to me? I'm talking to her. Well, I'm glad. Tony never gave me back my elk's tooth. Well, I don't know why you're talking to me, Captain. I never gave Mr. Capone an elk's oh. tooth. Oh. It's Lieutenant, dear. You gotta stop promoting him. You'll get a swell head. Oh, you rat! You call me Lieutenant? No! I... Well, gee, don't scare me like that. I got something on this picture you gave me. Her husband? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Hello, Mrs. X. Hello, Corporal. <laughs> All this. Uh, oh, oh, yeah. Uh, you won't like it, Lieutenant. I won't like what? What I got on this picture. Something's happened to Richard. Now, take it easy. Well, what did you find out? I'll tell you whether I like it or not. Well, I sent it down to the boys in the morning. No, no. Uh... Look what you've done, you mallet head. Well, gee, what did I say? You yes, said more. Oh, no, 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 no. Now, honey, honey, listen. This morgue is where they keep photographs. Oh. Uh, well, 
What did they come up with, Sergeant? Well, she sure looks pretty when she cries like that. Otis. Uh, oh, oh, uh, well, I shall quote from the report. <clears throat> uh, person in said photograph resembles one Richard Diamond private detective. What did you say? Come to think of it, you do, Mr. Diamond. I shall continue. Member of the New York police force for seven years. Height six feet one. One hundred and ninety. Eighty. Uh, the general confirmation of the head. Note. Right ear... Order, oh, shut up! Oh, it gets real interesting. You didn't tell me about getting mixed up with that fan dancer back in 39, Diamond. I was simply interested in starting an ostrich farm. Otis. Uh, yeah? Do you think that picture looks like Mr. Diamond? Oh, uh, kind of. Thank you, Patrolman Lovelo. <laughs> About your own, man. Yes, and if I ever catch you wearing a sergeant's stripes again, I'll put you on a beach so far out that I'll have to fly food into you. Now get out of here. Sergeant Levinson. Lady, please, it's Lieutenant. Well, I don't care what it is. I think you were just horrible to that nice little policeman. Is that right? It certainly is. And I'm going to write a letter to the governor about you. Now, wait a and minute. And what's more, I'm going to tell him what a horrible, mean, impolite person you are. But... I come in here with Mr. Diamond, and simply because I won't tell you my name, you accuse me of being a mop. Mop? Yes, mop. One of those gangsters' girls. Mop. Yes. And just because everyone thinks they've seen me before, I'm accused of all sorts of things. But lady, I... No telling what's happened to my poor, wonderful husband. Oh, 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 oh lady, please, lady. I... <laughs> you big bully. Yes. Well, uh, okay, I'm sorry. I, I apologize. Can Sergeant Loveloon have his stripes back? Yes. No, thank you very much. Come on, Mr. Diamond. We've got to find Richard. Goodbye, Major. Well, I was in it up to my neck. Any other time, a client like Mrs. X would have scared me right into four months of hibernation. But she was such a cute little screwball that I just had to go along with it. We took the picture that looked something like yours truly and started making the rounds. Starting with the last place, Mrs. X had seen her husband... We showed the picture to every shop owner within a four-block circle, but no one had seen him. Mrs. X kept uh, checking with the hotel, making me stay at a good distance so I couldn't hear the conversation. But no one had seen her husband. We ended up right back where I first ran into her, Charlie's. Well, find him? No. Uh, Look, dear, why don't you check again with this place that you and your husband went to this morning for his business appointment? Maybe you went back there. Well, I guess I could try it again. Phone in the back on the wall. Thanks. I'll call him. No luck, uh, Diamond? No. How do I get into these things, Charlie? When someone wants to give you a hundred a day in expenses, you get into them. Phone. Brilliant deduction. Hello? A little lady will get it. Mm. Mr. Diamond? Yeah? It's for you. Captain Levinson. You've been promoted? Several times in the last hour. You think he's heard something about Richard? Might be. Yeah, what is it, Fatty? I thought you might be there. What made you think of Charlie's? Well, it's pretty obvious you had a hangover. Well, maybe I stuck a bicycle pump in my nose and pumped up my head just to get a laugh out of Otis. You'll have to do better than that. You told me you met the girl at Charlie's. Shrewd, shrewd. Is it something important? Honey, just relax. I'm getting to it. But if it's about Richard... The girl there? Yeah. What's on your mind? Well, I don't know if it means anything. We just got a report from the Johnson Sanatorium. Johnson Sanatorium? Never heard of it. Over on 84th Street. The missing husband? I don't know. The report fitted his description, but who knows from that old photograph. Well, it's worth checking. What's the address? 644 East 84th Street. Seems they found this guy wandering around the streets. Johnson Sanatorium, 644 East 84th Street, huh? Did he give his name? Uh, Amnesia. Loss of memory. Seemed to be suffering from shock. Thought I'd let you get there first. I'm kind of sorry for the girl when I realized the story might be kosher. Okay, Walt, I'll check it, thanks. Meet you there. Well, honey, that might be... Hey. Hey. Charlie. Yeah? Mrs. X, where'd she go? Took out of here like she was shot out of a gun. Something wrong? When are you going to stop asking stupid questions? Well, that tore it. Mrs. X was probably on her way over to the Johnson Sanatorium and with a good head start. So I went out and grabbed a cab for 84th Street and kicked myself a dozen times for getting mixed up in a situation like that. Why not forget the whole thing and get some rest until my head returned to a normal circumference? Answer. 
because I'd wasted a whole afternoon looking for the missing husband and hadn't even got a retainer. Yes, sir. Is something I can do for you, Prince? I'm looking for the man you reported. As Hello, Rick. Be... Oh, Walt. Have you seen Mrs. X? I just this minute got her. She's been and gone. What about the guy you got the report on? Took him with her. Uh, the young lady came in, took a look at the man, claimed it was her husband, paid his bill and left. And you let him go like that? I thought the man had amnesia. Well, yes, he was suffering from some kind of shock and had temporarily lost his memory. But you just let him walk out of here well, with... Rick, Rick, let him finish your story. Hmm. Uh, the, the minute the man saw the young lady, he snapped right out of it. She said they had to hurry to catch a plane or something. had a lot of packing to do. Did she uh, give her name? Yes, sir, he signed the release. Uh, here, let me see it. And now, uh, take it easy, Rick. It's signed, Mrs. Richard Diamond. She used my name? Is that your name? You're darn right it is. You leave any address? Phony, I checked. Oh, swell. I'll come to the airports if it'll make you happy. Oh, it'll make me very happy. She did nothing for my hangover. She didn't pay me one red cent for my trouble. And I think I may be getting hives. Oh, I'm going over to Helen's and have a complete nervous breakdown. How do you feel now? Oh, I'm all right, Helen, dear, but my ulcer's just had a parade. Any word from Walt? No. Miss Helen? Yes, what is it, Francis? A young lady at the door for Mr. Diamond. I'll get it. I'll bet you will. Wow. Hello, Mr. Diamond. Now, look, I've got something to say to you. I can't stop to talk. My husband's waiting in the car and we have to catch a plane. Now, you look, I... I want to thank you very much for all you've done and I want to apologize for running out on you. But your husband... He's fine, thank you. He just lost his memory for a while. Now, I'm not... I haven't got time to tell you anymore. We've got to catch a plane. But you... Oh, I said that. Here's an envelope. But I... It explains everything and there's something in it for you. But you can't... And here's something else because you've been so wonderful. But... Hmm... I hope if you ever get to California, you'll look us up. Goodbye, and thank you again for everything. You're wonderful. Bye. Well. Hmm? All right, Blue Eyes. What was that all about? Hmm? Oh. No, that was her. Oh, she. Uh, the girl. The girl. Uh, uh, Mrs. X. What's that? Hmm? Oh, it's an envelope. Said it would explain everything. I hope it does. Especially that fond farewell. Oh, that. She was just being grateful. Yeah. Go on, open the envelope. Uh, pardon, Miss Helen. Now it's the phone. Lieutenant Levinson for Mr. Diamond. I better tell him about the girl. You'd better read what's in that envelope. Hello, Walt. A uh, wreck. That dame phoned on us. Asked where she could find you. Oh, that's how she's found the place. Yeah, the melon had told her you might be over at Helen's. Gave her... She's been there? Uh, just left. And she left an envelope that she said would explain everything. Well, what did it say? I haven't read it. Well, read it. I want to know what this is all about. So does Helen. Well? Well? Five hundred bucks. The explanation? What about the letter? Well, it says, uh, uh, Dear Mr. Diamond, I know that I've caused you a great deal of trouble. So I wish to take this opportunity to... To thank you for your patience and understanding. As for an explanation, well, here it is. But I count on your discretion and hope that you will keep my secret. This morning, my husband and I went to a doctor because I hadn't been feeling well. We discovered and were overjoyed to find out that I was going to have a baby. Immediately, I informed my husband that I had decided to give up working until after I had the baby. The realization that I wasn't going to make any more money for the rest of the year was too much for him. The shock made him lose his mind, and he, well, he just wandered off. Although he has recovered his memory, the thought of having to support us both for the rest of the year has left him nervous and despondent. So I'm taking him back to the coast of the family psychiatrist. I wish to thank you from the bottom of my heart for all your kindness and help. Signed, Oh. Signed, Oh. Rick! Helen, Helen, what's wrong? He's fainted. What? He looked at the signature on the letter and just flopped over. Well, what about the signature? It's signed... June Allison. Again, here's your Rexall family druggist. Whenever you have a headache, remember this about Rexall aspirin. 
When taken with water, the five full grains of pure aspirin in every Rexall tablet are ready to go to work for you even before they reach your stomach. Yes, whenever you have a headache, remember that about Rexall aspirin. Ask for it at Rexall drugstores everywhere. And remember always, you can depend on any drug product that bears the name Rexall. Good health to all from Rexall. Richard Diamond, Private Detective, stars Dick Powell in the title role and is written by Blake Edwards with music composed and conducted by Frank Worth. June Allison appears through the courtesy of Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer and will soon be seen co-starring with Dick Powell in the MGM motion picture, Right Cross. Featured in tonight's cast were Virginia Gregg, Ted DeCorsia, Wilms Herbert, and Bob Sweeney. Richard Diamond, Private Detective, was transcribed in Hollywood by Jaime Del Valle. This is Bill Foreman inviting you to be with us next Wednesday at this time when we will again bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Hiya, beautiful. Get lost, Bristlepuss. You need a shave. But I have shaved. What else do you want me to do? Silly boy, she wants you to go stag. Go stag? But why? Because stag is Rexall's exclusive line of men's good grooming aids. Like stag brushless shave cream. No fuss, no massage, just smooth it on and presto, you get a clean, close shave. Your face stays smooth and whiskerless all day long. I'll do it, I'll do it, I'll go stag. That's it. Join the stag line now at Rexall drugstores everywhere. Yes, to make girls care. Go stag. Bill Bendix leads the life of Riley again Friday on NBC. Directors Playhouse stars Cary Grant, Betsy Drake, production Shadow of a Doubt, director Alfred Hitchcock. This is the Screen Directors Playhouse, the Thursday night feature on NBC's five show festival of comedy, music, mystery, and drama. Brought to you five nights a week by RCA Victor, world leader in radio, first in recorded music, first in television, and by the makers of Anison for fast relief from pain of headache, neuritis, and neuralgia. Ladies and gentlemen, on this first hour-long program of a new Screen Director's Playhouse series, we once again applaud the art and artistry of the screen director. In this case, Mr. Alfred Hitchcock. In many excellent creations for the screen, he has earned the title of Master of Suspense. May we again prove his mastery tonight as we present our adaptation of Mr. Hitchcock's Shadow of a Doubt, starring Cary Grant as Uncle Charlie and Betsy Drake as Charlie. Somebody hear me. I'm suffocating. Oh, please. Please. Mother. Father. <coughs> In the garage. Uncle Charlie. <coughs> oh, please help me. Somebody. I'm in my own garage, please, in my I'm own home, in Santa Rosa. 
And I think perhaps I'm going to die. Oh, please. The blue poison gas is coming out of the exhaust of the automobile. The doors of the the car are locked. And I can't turn the motor off. Help me, please. And the doors of the garage are jammed shut. Uncle Charlie. And I think... Uncle Charlie, let me out. I'm going to die. Dickory, dickory, dock. The mouse ran up the clock. The clock struck one. And down he ran. Oh, Charlie, that's not right. Yes, it is. Oh, that's and down he run. Oh, and down he run. Hickory, dickory, dock. Uncle Charlie, I'm glad you're my uncle. Are you, Charlie? Are you? Hickory, dickory. Hickory, dickory. Hickory, dickory. When I was a little girl, we talked like that. Uncle Charlie and I. Uncle Charlie. I'm his namesake, Charlotte. Charlie. I think I loved him more than anyone. Now I'm in here and I'll die here. And he's outside and he's smiling and handsome. Just like when he came to visit us. Just a little while ago. Uncle Charlie. Pops, I'm so excited. So is your mother, Charlie. You'd think I was waiting for my fiancé or something. And? Yeah? Don't you think it's time to stop reading that book? No. But he's almost here. That's all right. I've got my reading schedule. Uncle Charlie will understand. He'll understand you're a spoiled brat. Ha ha. Mother says he was spoiled himself. Mother says he was the youngest, like me. Look, Pops, the train stopped. There he is. Uncle Charlie! Well, Charlie! My, my, you're a beauty. Charles. Well, Joe, how are you? Where's Emmy? Fixing dinner, but Anne's here. Hi, Uncle Charlie. Oh, hi. I bet you don't even remember me. Mm, sort of. Do you read much? I used to. I read on a schedule. Two books a week. Uncle Charlie, are you all right? I certainly fit as a fiddle, that's me. Oh, well, when you got off the train, the way the porter helped you, I thought you might be sick or something. Do I look sick? You look wonderful. Well, let's go. Emmy's waiting. Here, I'll take this bag. Just follow Ann and me to the car. I'll take this bag. No, you don't. That's the heaviest. That's why I want to carry it for you. You know what you are, Uncle Charlie. What am I, Charlie? A miracle. Me? Whose miracle? Mine. The way you came to visit us. It's as if you knew how much I needed you. Uh, Perhaps I needed you too, Charlie. The day we got your wire, I was thinking what a rut our family was in. Ah, but Charlie, it's good to have a family again. You don't know how good. It's good to have an uncle again. Uncle Charlie. Charles, this will be your room. Oh, that bag was kind of heavy. Emmy, it looks wonderful. Mm, my baby brother, rich and handsome. That's my uncle. Oh, quiet, you. Now, I'd better get settled here. Oh, Charles, don't Hmm? put your hat on the bed. Oh, I'm superstitious? No, but, well, there's no use inviting trouble, is there? There's no trouble here. Nothing can touch me here in Santa Rosa. Why, what an odd thing to say. Is it, Charlie? Mm, It's a very odd world outside. Not sweet and fine like here. You don't know how lucky you are. Charles... It's, it's beautiful. I just opened the package. What package, dear? A wristwatch. Oh. Charles brought me a wristwatch. Well, I'm glad you oh. liked that. <laughs> just a few presents, Anne. There's one for you downstairs, oh. and one for Anne, too. Charles, you shouldn't have. But I'm dying to see what it is. Come here. I've got something for you, too, Charlie. Oh, I don't want anything. Really, I mean that. But I want you to have it. You made us all happy. All of us, all at the same time. Me most of all. That's enough. I am. To Charlie from Uncle Charlie. Please take it. I'm so glad Mom named me after you. She thinks we're alike, you know. Now, 
if you gave me anything, that would spoil it. Mm, then I'll have to open the box for you. We're not just uncle and niece. We're something special. Yeah, give me a hand, Charlie. It's as if we were sort of like twins. I know you. I know there's something inside of you nobody knows. Something nobody knows? There's something that's oh so secret and wonderful. I'll find it, too. Oh. Uh, here's a gift, Charlie. Look at your hand now. Oh, it's beautiful. Oh, it's a good emerald. A real one. Here. I'll take the ring off. Just this once. I want to hold it against the light. You've had something engraved on it. What? What did you say? There's letters. It's awfully faint. To T.S. from B.R. Uh, Charlie, let me have that. No, I said I'd take it off just this once. Must be somebody's initials. Made somebody else happy, too. The jeweler cheated me. It doesn't matter. I like it this way. Just the way I like you. Thank you. Thank you so very much. I hope it makes you happy. Even happier than the person who wore it before you. Whoever she was. Now, uh, isn't dinner ready yet? <laughs> Well fed, Uncle Charlie? Fed to the gunnels. Then you just sit here. Here's Father's paper. He just went out for some tobacco. Now, I've got to help Mother with the dishes. Come on, Anne. Wait till I finish this chapter. Oh, never mind. She never takes her nose out of that book. <laughs> Uncle Charlie, do you expect me to make conversation? Oh, oh, not as long as there's an evening paper to read. I'm glad to see you're a reader. It keeps your brain from getting fat. Here, Uncle Charlie... To settle your dinner. Mm. Mm. Smells alcoholic. Thank you. Just some wine. Well, thank you so much. You're welcome. Well, you go ahead and read your paper. If you'd care to have a discussion afterwards, I'll be glad to... Uncle Charlie, you spilled your drink. Uncle Charlie. Mm. Oh, what? Oh, oh, the wine. Are you all right? You don't look good. It's nothing. I just had an accident. Here. Some of it got on your paper. I'll take Leave it Leave the out. paper alone. Well, I was oh, just was trying to something help. crash? Oh, Charlie, yeah, yeah. I, I was very clumsy, the glass. Now, oh. don't go getting all embarrassed. Uh-oh, it's on Father's paper. Oh, it's just this one page. I'll tear it out. Oh, page nine. He probably won't even know the difference. Here. I'll throw this part away. Gee, Charlie. Did he ever get sore? Help me pick up this glass. He was sore, all right. But maybe he was scared. That's what it's like in books. When people get scared, they usually get sore, too. It's me, Charlie. I brought you some water for your night table. Oh, come in. Ah, I was just looking out the window. It's very peaceful, your town. I'll put it here. Thank you, Charlie. Pleasant dreams. Uncle Charlie. Hmm? I know a secret about you. You do? And you don't know I know. What do you mean? I know there was something in the evening paper about you. Go on. You tore it out when you spilled the wine on it, but you didn't throw it away. Charlie, that wasn't about me. Oh, I'll bet you're just being modest. But I'll find out. It's still in your pocket, right here. Take your hand oh, away. I just want to... Take your hand away. Uncle Charlie... You're hurting me. Oh, Charlie. Charlie, forgive me. I... I was just fooling. It's nothing. It's just some ugly gossip about a friend. Not for you to read. I was pretty silly, I guess. The paper... It was still wet with the wine. It's on my hand. Oh, I am sorry, Charlie. Forgive me. Of course. Good night, Uncle Charlie.
And so ends the first act of our Screen Director's Playhouse production of Shadow of a Doubt, starring Betsy Drake and Cary Grant. It's been called everything from the world's best babysitter to a magic carpet. It can turn a furnished room into a palace, a house into a home. You think that's exaggerated talk about television? Well, you ought to see the thousands of fan letters sent in by RCA Victor owners. So many, so very many of them telling how much television itself has meant to them personally, as well as how much they like their RCA Victor sets. I don't know why we waited so long. If we'd only known what we were missing, we'd have bought our set long ago. Why not tune yourself and your family into this great new entertainment? Stop in at your RCA Victor dealers tomorrow and get the details. And you may very well find that it will cost you a lot less than you think to own one of the 18 beautiful new RCA Victor television receivers. But tomorrow's the day to do it. Never has any home appliance been in greater demand. And never before such demand for one brand, RCA Victor. Now, back to the second act of the Screen Director's Playhouse production of Shadow of a Doubt, starring Cary Grant and Betsy Drake. My own voice isn't a part of me anymore. It's in the Please. middle of a vast space, sobbing and Can't screaming. Can't somebody hear me? My lungs are sucking at the carbon monoxide. In the garage. And a nursery rhyme makes a crazy Lord. little song. I'm suffocating. I think of Uncle Charlie and oh, his hand please, hard oh, on my wrist, oh, hurting me. You shouldn't be shouting. Uncle Charlie's still asleep. Well, I was so excited, I forgot. We're celebrities, Charlie. Are we? Why? Well, I'm not quite sure myself. But the young man from the survey is in the front room. Mother, what young man? What survey? Well, he's being sent around the country by some kind of um, institute or committee. And he has to pick out average families and ask them questions. Excuse me for interrupting, but I couldn't help overhearing. This is my daughter, Charlie. Charlie? For Charlotte. Oh, Oh, my name is Jack Gray. I'm Miss Newton. I'm with the National Public Survey. And I assure you, it's perfectly legitimate. And I, I asked your mother if we could make an analysis of your family. You know, pictures and a few thousand questions. It's all very scientific. Charlie, dear, don't frown like that. Well... I, I promise, Miss Newton, cross my heart, I'll be hardly any bother. Oh, Charlie, it's 10.30. I promised your uncle we'd wake him. I'll do it, Mom. Oh, and nice to have met you, Mr. Graham. Welcome to our household. Well, thanks, Miss Newton. Come in. Oh, good morning, Charlie. Good morning, Uncle Charlie. You know what? What? We're going to be interviewed. Charlie, uh, I hate newspaper reporters. Not by a newspaper. It's for a survey. Survey? What are those things where somebody asks you a lot of questions? What, what kind of questions? I don't know. M Mr. Graham knows all about it, though. Graham? Who's Graham? The survey man. Do you know him, Charlie? No, he's from out of town. Why? Oh, Charlie, now why do you let strangers into your home like this? They're probably picking your family for the all-American sucker list. You mean our family? It's perfectly all right. Survey. Charlie, I, I wonder why he picked this family. Just too average for words, I guess. Can't you get rid of him? Why? He's rather good looking. Well, he's going to ask us a lot of stupid questions. He can leave me out of it. Oh, all right, Grumpy. We'll ignore you. Oh, I'll have to put some makeup on. He's going to take pictures. Pictures? Here? Yes, he's... Charlie, get that man out of this house. Well, Uncle Charlie, there's nothing no, to get excited about. I've never about. been photographed in my life, and I don't want to be. Oh, yes, you have. Never, Charlie. Don't you remember? I've got the picture here. It's somewhere in my drawer. Oh, here it is. Now, do you remember? Let me see that. I was just a youngster. 
morning, Charles. Mom, I was just showing Uncle Charlie his picture. Well, let me see it, dear. Oh, I remember that. It was taken the Christmas you got your bicycle, Charles, just before your accident. What accident? Your Uncle Charles didn't know how to work the bicycle very well, and he skidded into a streetcar. Oh, dear. His skull was fractured. We thought he was going to die. I'm glad he didn't. He was laid up for so long. And then afterwards, there was no holding him. Just as if he'd used up all the rest he'd ever need. He was always in mischief after that. Does it ever bother you, Uncle Charlie? Well, he used to have terrible headaches. Do you still have them? Sometimes, Charlie. Sometimes there's a... (sighs) What's the use of looking backwards? It's today I worry about. Well, if it's today you're worried about, you'd better be having your breakfast. Right. I want to get the house straightened away for that, Mr. Graham. I guess Charlie told you about him. Yes, she did. Well, Anne, this is the first time I've seen you without a book. That's because I'm meditating. Mm -hmm. The front porch is a fine place to meditate. I guess you've been all over the world, haven't you, Uncle Charlie? Most of it, Anne. But this is best of all. Here comes Charlie from the marketing. Mm. Who's that with her? Mrs. Potter. She's a widow. Hi, Uncle Charlie. I want you to meet a neighbor. Mrs. Potter, this is that man I'm always talking about, Mr. Oakley. Uh, How do you do, Miss Potter? Oh, it's Mrs. Mr. Oakley. (laughs) Can I help you with those packages? Oh, would you? I don't use the car since my dear husband went to his reward. A young woman like you should drive a car, Mrs. Potter. Perhaps I can teach you. Oh, would you, Mr. Oakley? I'd be so grateful. Where do you live, Mrs. Oh, it's just down the street. Okay? Well, I better get these packages into the house. Charlie, don't go in yet. Here comes that man again. Hello there. Oh, hello, Mr. Graham. I see you have your camera. Yeah, ready for work. Here, Anne, take these bundles. Oops. I got them. Uh, now, let's see, Miss Newton, there are uh, five in your family. Four. But your mother said five. Well, she counted my Uncle Charlie. He's just visiting. Oh, well, where's he from? The East. Is he in business? Yes. May I ask what kind? I don't know, just business. He's pretty well off. Uh, will I be able to talk to him? I don't think so. He's not interested in the survey, and he doesn't like to have his picture taken. Charlie, is that Mr. Graham? Oh, yes, it is. Well, please come in. Well, now, how do we begin? Uh, with a few pictures, I think. We're doing some research on kitchen organization. Oh, my goodness. I was just baking a cake. Our kitchen's a mess. Well, that's all right with me. Well, not with me. I won't have a bunch of total strangers accuse me of having a messy kitchen. I'll clean up first. You know, Mr. Graham, you're picking us as an average family. I'm not sure I like that. Why not? I'm from a pretty average family myself. As average as ours? Averager. <laughs> well... I still don't think I like being an average girl. I don't think you're average at all. Why, thank you, Mr. Graham. I'm glad you didn't see me the day before yesterday. I was way down in the dumps. And then Uncle Charlie came. Oh, is that him coming up the walk now? That's him. All sunburned and nice. Please, Miss Newton, if you'll just step away from the camera. You're not going to take a picture of him. Just this once, Miss Newton. I'm sure he won't mind. Hello, Charlie. I don't like to be photographed. I'm afraid I'll have to ask you for that plate. I told him, Uncle Charlie. Um, this is Mr. Graham from the survey. I assume that. The plate, please, Mr. Graham. Here it is. Thank you. No hard feelings, I hope, Mr. Graham. No hard feelings. Mr. Graham, I'm ready for you now. Oh, uh, Mrs. Newton, I'm sorry, but I just remembered I have an appointment with the mayor. The research business. But I have a favor to ask you before I call again. Why, of course, Mr. Graham. Uh, Could I borrow your daughter for this evening uh, just to show me around town? Well, which one? Charlie or Anne? Uh, I mean, uh, Charlie. (laughs) Well, if Charlie doesn't mind. Does Charlie mind? No, Charlie doesn't mind. (laughs) Fine. Pick you up at 6.30? If you're through talking to the mayor by then. Uh, Yeah, I'll be through. it. The 
grand tour. Oh, it's a delightful town. But my feet are tired. They call this park the square. Then why is it built like a circle? Oh, well, I've tried. Come on, Charlie, let's, uh, let's sit down. Once upon a time, Charlie, I'll bet you smiled. Don't you like to smile anymore? Jack, when we started out tonight, I hoped you'd tell me. Tell you what? This is a small town, small enough so that a lot of us know the mayor. That's nice. There was a little ache in the back of my mind about this survey business of yours. My Uncle Charlie thought it was strange. I see. So when you said you had an appointment with the mayor, I phoned his office. Never heard of me. No. So you were lying. I don't like lies. Well, I'm found out. Why did you do it? What do you want from us? I had my reasons. Perhaps the police would be interested in your reasons. I, I, I wouldn't go to the police if I were you, Charlie. Why not? Because I'm a policeman. You? But for heaven's sakes, what do you want at our house? Charlie, I came here from the east to find a man. He's very dangerous. Well, what has that got to do with us? Think, Charlie. How much do you know about your uncle Charlie? He's my mother's brother. He... Well, what's he got to do with this? He might be the man we're looking for. Uncle Charlie? Well, I never heard of anything so ridiculous. It's not ridiculous. It's a strong possibility. There's another fellow in the East, another suspect. The police are hunting for him now. He might be the guy. And then again, it might be your uncle. How can you say a thing like that? What reason do you have? I followed your uncle out here. I followed him for... Followed him? Do you know what kind of a man he is? How can you possibly suspect him I of anything? I suspect him. I have my reasons. For your sake, I hope I'm wrong. I could be. I don't even know what the man I'm searching for looks like. As far as we know, he's never had a photograph taken. There's a chance your uncle is our man, Charlie. A good chance. If... If it were true, he'd be arrested. Yes, he would. My mother. It would kill her. No, it can't be. There must be some mistake. No mistake, Charlie. And I promise you this. If your Uncle Charlie is the guilty man, I'll get him out of town quietly. He isn't guilty. I know he isn't. But you'll have to help me. Give me your word you'll help me get him out of town, Charlie. It's going to be so funny when you find out that you're wrong. Charlie. Charlie, come back. Why, Charlie. Mrs. Potter. Do you have last night's newspaper? Why, uh, yeah, yes, of course. May I see it, please? Oh, of course. Can I get you some tea? No, nothing. Just the paper. Well, it's right over here, dear, on the couch. Oh, it was so gracious of your uncle to help me today. My, but he's a The character. paper, Mrs. Potter. Oh, oh yes, here, here you are, dear. You know, I don't believe a single man has been in this house for years. Oh, and charming. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> I wasn't hearing Mrs. Potter anymore, and my own voice was echoing in my mind, echoing cold and lonely and afraid. Killer escapes. Nationwide search underway for Strangler, of three rich women. The whereabouts of the so-called Merry Widow murderer is still unknown today. Escaping from a police net drawn tightly about the northeastern states, the killer is still at large. The most recent of his three victims, all of them wealthy widows, was Mrs. Bruce Rogers, the former Thelma Shenley. Charlie, what is it? Thelma Shenley. Bruce Rogers. To T.S. From B.R. The Ring. The Ring. Ha, ha, ha. Hickory, dickory, dock. Charlie, I'm glad you're my uncle. Are you, Charlie? Are you? third act of the screen director's playhouse presentation of Shadow of a Doubt continues in just a minute. Here is something you should know if you ever suffer from the pain of headache, neuritis, or neuralgia. 
It's an incredibly fast way to ease the pain. It's anison, a way countless numbers of people have found superior. Anison acts so promptly to relieve pain. Anison is like a doctor's prescription. That is, anison contains not just one, but a combination of medically proven active ingredients in convenient tablet form. Thousands of persons have been introduced to anison through their own physicians or dentists. But today these tablets are in such widespread use that all drug counters have them and everyone can have the benefit of their incredibly fast action. So if you want to relieve the pains of a headache, neuritis, or neuralgia, by all means try anison. On this guarantee, if the first few anison tablets do not give you all the relief you want as fast as you want it, return the unused portion and your money will be refunded. I'll spell the name for you. A-N-A... C-I-N. Easy to take Anison tablets come in handy boxes of 12 and 30 and economical family size bottles of 50 and 100. Ask for Anison at your druggists today. Listening to the Screen Director's Playhouse, one of five great radio shows that are brought to you five nights a week by RCA Victor, world leader in radio, first in recorded music, first in television, and by the Whitehall Pharmacal Company, makers of Anison, Kalinos, Bicidol, and other fine drug products. The Screen Director's Playhouse presentation of Shadow of a Doubt, starring Betsy Drake and Cary Grant, will continue after a short pause for station identification. Stay tuned to your local station on NBC. for the third act of the Screen Director's Playhouse production of Shadow of a Doubt, starring Cary Grant as Uncle Charlie and Betsy Drake as Charlie. I know that this garage will be my place of dying. I can't hear the cries for help anymore or the pounding on the door. And that's because I, Charlie Newton, have ceased to move. The gas, the exhaust poison from the automobile, is heavy and warm. There are two pains. One is in my right ankle, a hot pain, and I know I must have sprained it in my struggle for escape. The other pain is here, inside me. It's the pain that comes when love goes away. Dickory, Dickory, Doc. It was the second night of Uncle Charlie's visit when I read the newspaper story. The Merry Widow Murderer, the three-time slayer of women, Uncle Charlie. You'd think I wouldn't be able to sleep that night, but I did sleep. A drug flight into fantasy, and I slept through the night and throughout most of the next day. Slept and dreamed. always been my favorite, you know. That's why Mother gave me your name. Why, you're just a little girl again. No, I'm not. I'm grown. I'm grown up and I know who you are. I liked you better as a little girl, Charlie. Hickory dickory dock. The mouse ran up the clock. There was blood on your hand. It was only wine. Blood. From the newspaper. Blood. The clock struck one. And down he run. Hickory dickory. You killed them, Uncle Charlie. Just a mouse. Three women. It was only a mouse. I loved you and you're a murderer. Oh, you mustn't, Charlie. You mustn't. Please, Charlie. <laughs> you mustn't. Charlie, don't cry. Wake up. Charlie. What? Who is it? It's Uncle Charlie. I heard you crying. Oh. Oh, are you having a nightmare? Yes. 
Did I say anything? No, just cried. Your forehead is damp. Please, don't touch me. Why, what's wrong? It's... it's nothing. But you act as if you're afraid of me. Why should you be afraid? It was... it was the dream. You shouldn't have bad dreams. Not you, Charlie. Not you, of all people. I'll be all right now. Will you? Yes. I'll be all right. Then good night, young Charlie. Good night. Charlie. Charlie. Hmm? Oh, good morning, Pops. It's not morning. It's dinner time. You slept all through the day. Your mother told me to wake you up. Tell her I'll be right down. Can I have some more old feet, Pops? And you consume more energy reading books than anybody I ever knew. Here. You aren't eating, Charlie. Not hungry? I guess it's just too much sleep. And dreaming a perfect nightmare. Why, what about, dear? Uncle Charlie. It was all mixed up with blood and killing. Charlotte! You were on a train, Uncle Charlie. And I felt you were running away from something. Charlotte, I insist that you... When I saw you on the train, I felt terribly happy and... Go on. That's all. Just imagine such nightmares about your uncle. How could you feel happy with him going away? I was just telling you the dream, Mother. I don't want you to leave ever, Charles. This is your home. I want it to be your home. You were gone for so many years. Now that we're together again, I don't want you to leave ever. Please, Charles. Please don't go away. You won't, will you? Do you want me to stay, Charlie? I want my family to be happy. Then I won't go. Not for a while. If it's all right with you, Joe. Of course it is. (sighs) Thank you, Charles. Thank you. Uh, Drink your milk, Anne. Oh. You heard your mother. Oh, Charles, I almost forgot. I promised our women's club that you'd talk to the ladies. You Mm. know, just a little speech at our meeting tomorrow night. Really? What What am I going to talk about? You know so many things, Uncle Charlie. So many strange things. That shouldn't be hard. What sort of an audience would they be, Emmy? Oh. Women like myself, busy with our homes. Yes. Women keep busy in towns like this. In the cities, it's different. Cities are full of women. Idle, middle-aged widows. Husbands dead. Husbands who spent their lives making money to give to their useless wives. Uncle Charlie. And then the husbands die. And then what do they do, these useless women? You see them in the hotels... The best hotels. Drinking the money, eating the money, smelling of money. Horrible, fat, faded, greedy women. Useless, pointless. They shouldn't even be allowed to exist. They give nothing and they take everything. But they're alive. They're human beings. Are they, Charlie? Are they human or just fat, wheezing animals? And what happens to animals when they get too fat and too old? For heaven's sake, Charles. Don't go talking like that in front of the women's club. Well, the idea. <laughs> They'd run us out of town. Yeah. Well, we couldn't have that, could we? Oh, Charles, that nice Mrs. Potter is going to be there, too. She was asking me about you, you know. That nice Mrs. Potter. Mm-hmm. Why, Charlie. I'm sorry, Mother. Father. I'm going outside. I can't stand it in here. What's wrong with her? Maybe she's in love with that Mr. Graham, the survey man. Anne, and you go after her. No, no, I'll go. You finish your dinner. Charlie? Charlie? I want to talk to you. You're hurting my arm. I said I want to talk to you. You go in here. No. It's just a cocktail bar. Sit down here. Ginger ale and a brandy, please. Why did you bring me here? Oh, now, Charlie. 
What's wrong? What's come between us? Look, we're not just uncle and niece. You said so yourself. We're more like twins. Charlie, that man, that Jack Graham, what did he tell you? He's got nothing to do with it. He didn't tell me anything. And I told him nothing. What could you have told him? What you are. Uncle Charlie, how could you? How could you do things like that? Like what? You're my mother's brother. I loved you because I thought you were more worthy of love than anybody in the whole world. Charlie, what do you know? Take your ring back. To T.S. from B.R. To Thelma Shenley from Bruce Rogers. I'm sorry it ever touched my skin. Oh, sit down. Sit down, Charlie. You want to run home. Run to your safe little nest. Run away from me and everything I stand for. Well... What do I stand for? Do you want me to tell you? Do you want me to say the word? You can't. Because you don't understand. You don't know. There's so much you don't know. You think you're the clever little girl. But you're an ordinary little girl in an ordinary little town. You're safe and secure from everything except stupid dreams. And I brought you those, didn't I? I didn't even know there were men like you in the world. How do you know what the world is like? Do you know that the world is a foul sty? Do you know if you ripped the fronts off houses, you'd find swine? The world is a hell. What does it matter? What happens in it? You're sick, Uncle Charlie. You're really sick. Wake up, Charlie. Use your wits. Learn something. I've learned enough to... If my mother knew, it would kill her. Then if you love your mother... Let's go, Charlie. <laughs> Charlie, it's been a shock. Let it wear off. Here's the house. I want to go in now. Uh, just a minute. Listen, Charlie. The same blood flows through our veins, yours and mine. You've got to understand. Before I came here, I was the end of my rope. Yet you came here to this house reeking... Oh, don't say that, Charlie. You'll do it again. That Mrs. Potter. I know what you've been No, thinking. never again. Oh. Oh, I'm so tired. There's an end to the running a man can do. You'll never know what it's like to be so tired. I hope I never do. This is my last chance, Charlie. Give it to me. Graham doesn't know. Not for sure. There's a man in the East. If they get him, I'll... I'll be able to forget. Just get out of our house. I will. Only give me a few days. Think of your mother. She's the only one I am thinking of. Take you a few days. Take them and then get out. All right. No matter what I've done, you know yourself, we're something special. Thank you, Charlie. Hey there, Charlie. Who is it? Oh, Jack. You're still angry with me? No. Oh, you've been crying. No, it's just... No. Like to go for a ride with a cop, Charlie? I... Yes, thank you. Yeah. Still broken up about last night? You don't get over it fast. Not a thing like that. Is there anything you can tell me? Anything about your uncle? No. Have you found out anything else? No, they're still working in the East on the other suspect. But you've got to understand, Charlie, you may be living in the same house with a killer, a ruthless murderer. Uncle Charlie. I'm sorry, really sorry. Jack, I... I'm trying to do what you said. About getting him out of town? Oh, that, that's the best way. Then you can be sure. I think he's going to leave. You'll let me know when? Yes, I'll let you know. That's our bargain, isn't it? I'll let you know and you won't arrest him here. It has to be that way, Charlie. Until we know for sure, you won't be safe. Not you or any of your family. My mother... She won't know why he's leaving. She wants him to stay more than anything else in the world. This way, she'll never know. Wouldn't you want it like that? Yes. It's so strange. From the time you're a little girl, you love somebody. And then 
sudden. Sudden. Oh, Charlie. Charlie. Come here. I loved it. I loved him so much. Charlie, you you seem pretty sure he's the man we want. No. I'm just scared, that's all. I'm scared. If he gets away from us, he'll go on. Jack, please. I'm sorry, but my job. I know. I'm so tired. I slept for almost 24 hours, but I'm so tired. Shall I take you home now? Yes, please. Take me home, Jack. To my home. I'm in the kitchen, Mom, doing the dishes. Charlie, that young man, Mr. Graham, he's on the porch. Is he? Awfully early to come calling. But I guess he wants to ask you some questions in connection with the survey. All right, Mom. Oh, look at that. Your uncle didn't even finish his orange juice. Don't you go bothering him now. He's preparing his speech for tonight. Oh, that woman's club. My, they'll be so impressed. Charlie! What do you want? I was up early this morning. I listened to the news on the radio. I'm sorry, I'm not interested. Good news, Charlie. You're a young man. I expect he's waiting out there to tell you about it. Leave me alone. Oh, oh, oh. nothing to worry about, Charlie. Charlie, I've got something to tell you. About him? Uh, where can we be alone? Oh, the garage is all right. What is it? I'm going away. I'm leaving Santa Rosa. Does that mean... It means I've been taken off the job. Your uncle is clear. How does that sound? Clear? The other man, the one in the east. It's already in the news. They got him, the merry widow murderer. Did he... Did he confess? He's dead. Oh. Look out for your clothes. There's a lot of grease in the garage. Charlie, you... You're taking it mighty calmly. Sometimes I'm like that. Well, I'm surprised. It happened in Maine, at Portland. He was running away from the police at the airport. He ran into the propeller of an airplane and cut him to pieces. Dreadful. Dreadful? A murderer is dead. He won't kill anymore. As long as he was free, he'd have killed again and again. That's the kind of person he was. I haven't told you about him, Charlie, because... Well, I wanted to spare you that when your uncle was a suspect... But he married women for their money, old women, widows. And then he murdered them. He... It's done with, Jack. Don't talk about it. Charlie, if you knew, if you knew for sure it was your uncle, what would you have done? I think... I think I would have tried to keep it a secret from everyone. Even from you, Jack. I would have forced him to go away. Well, then it's a good thing your uncle isn't the merry widow murderer. If you had done that, threatened him, he probably would have killed you too, you know. No. I don't think so. Why not? Because I don't think he'd do that. We've... we've been too close to each other. He would have gone away. Oh, well, it's all ended happily, hasn't it? Except that I'm the one who's going away. Will it be soon? Yeah, right now, right away. I just stopped off to see you. Do you think you'll be coming back? I hope so. So do I. Oh, look. There's Mother's glove on the garage floor. She's always losing something. And someday she'll be losing you. You'll be getting married to a clerk or a doctor or a policeman. Funny. I hadn't thought about getting married. What's that? Oh, that's the garage door. Guess there's a breeze. Uh, I'm glad we met, Charlie. And I'm sorry it was like this with fear and worry. It's all over now. I suppose it couldn't ever really happen that someday you'd uh, tell your father, you know, about marrying someone. The detective, I mean. I don't know. I just don't know, Jack. I love you, Charlie. I know it's no time to tell you now. Do you mind? I don't mind. And you? I'd like us to be friends. We are friends. 
Nothing more? Maybe. I need time to think. Shall I come back, Charlie? Oh, yes. Please come back. Look, Charlie, think about it. Perhaps, perhaps it won't take you too long. I'm stopping in San Francisco for a few days. I'll be at the St. Francis. If you want the me to... The St. Francis, I'll remember. Oh, that darn garage door. It's always slamming shut. I can't open it. Well, here. Let me try. There. Well, well, what are you two look at locking yourselves in the g- garage for? Hello, <laughs> Mr. Oakley. I was just saying goodbye to your niece. Uh, leaving us? Yes, I'm all finished here, so I'll uh, say goodbye to you, too. Well, let's do it right here on the lawn. No use taking chances on the garage again, huh? <laughs> right. But I'll be back. Not uh, business, but I'll be back. Oh? Oh, Charlie, is it? She's a fine girl, this one. The thing I love most in all the world. Are you driving, Jack? Oh, yes. Uh, I'd better get started. Still no hard feelings about the picture. Forgotten. Good. Rights of man, you know. Freedom. Uh, we'll have a talk about freedom someday, Mr. Oakley. Don't forget me, Charlie. I won't. Goodbye. Goodbye. Jack! He can't hear you, Charlie. When are you leaving? Oh, Charlie. That other business is all over. I asked when you were leaving. Oh, I'd like to forget all that. We're happy here. You can't stay. But I'm going to, you see. I like it here. This is what I want. A new life. People who know me and respect me. I can be so very happy here, Charlie. Uh, I'll expose you if you try to stay. No, Charlie. What would, what would that do to your mother? No. And who'd believe you? A silly little girl babbling about a newspaper clipping in a ring you don't even have anymore. You have it. Me? I gave it to you. I've got to stay. Understand that, Charlie. I'm going to stay. I don't want you here, Uncle Charlie. I'm warning you. Go away, or I'll kill you myself. Think I'll pass muster at the women's club? Huh? Oh, you look very handsome, mm. Charles. And so does Joe. Emmy, I'll never know why you have to soak my handkerchiefs in lavender. Oh. I'll be waiting outside, Mommy. All right, dear. Oh, I'm so proud of my two men. Oh, here you are, Charlie. I'm ready, Mother. Do you have your speech, Charles? Yep, polished to perfection. Oh, then we're all ready. But I don't know how we'll manage in the coupe. Oh, now don't you worry about that. I've already phoned for a taxi. Charlie and I can go in your car, and the rest of you take the cab. Now, Charles. Oh, it's all arranged. Right, Charlie? Why don't you go in the cab? Well, I'd like you to hear my speech. Don't you want to help? Mother, I want you to come with us in the car. But, Charlie... Why don't you go out and start the car, Charlie? Please, Mother, I want you to come in the car. the garage and opened the doors. The car motor was running and the exhaust was a strangling cloud. I tried to turn the motor off, but the car doors were locked. I began to cough, and as I turned to leave the garage, the doors slammed tight. Please! (coughs) Can somebody hear me? Suffocating. Oh, please, please. <coughs> Mother. Mother. Uncle Charlie, Uncle Charlie. Dickory, Dickory, Doc. And now I'm dying. It's like a deep, smooth syrup all around me. The concrete floor of the garage isn't hard anymore. It's soft. Soft. Like a bed. 
like my bed. Charlie. Charlie. Mom? Oh, thank God. Thank God. Joe. Charles. She's conscious. She's all right. Charlie. We were so frightened. Oh, yes, young Charlie. You couldn't leave us, could you? My room. I was in the garage. I I couldn't get out. The door was jammed, dear. Your Uncle Charlie opened it. Uncle Charlie? Did he hear me in there? No, dear. I did. You're lucky your father had such sharp ears. Get away from me. We haven't even had time to call Dr. Phillips. I'm going to... No, Mother. I'm all right. I'll get up. I... Oh. What is it, Charlie? My ankle. I, I must have sprained it trying to get out of the garage. Your mother will call Dr. Phillips and he'll... No, over. Pops. My, my ankle will be all right tomorrow. And now, I, I'm just tired. I want to rest. Besides, you've still got the woman's club. We couldn't leave you now, dear. Of course not, Charlie. I insist it'll mean so much to Mother. I'm all right now. Honest, I am. I don't know. Is that what you want, Charlie? That's what I want. Please, please, hurry, oh, please. Yes? Miss Newton? Yes, this is Miss Newton. On your call to the St. Francis in San Francisco, Mr. Jack Graham is not in the hotel. It is known when he'll return. Don't they have any idea? I'm sorry, miss. Well, please leave a message for him to phone Miss Charlotte Newton in Santa Rosa. It's very important. Very well. Thank you. Too bad, Charlie. Uncle Charlie. Oh, he isn't in, is he? What are you doing here? You should be at the... The woman's club? Well, the family's there. But I forgot the notes for my speech. Take them and leave me alone. No, Charlie. I won't leave you alone. Oh, no, I can't. Not with you knowing what you know. You see, I've got to stay here, Charlie. Everything I want is right here. But I can't stay, can I, as long as you want me to leave... You threatened me and forced me, and I can't have that, Charlie. Huh? Not, don't try to run away. You can't, your ankle. Uh, no, don't scream. I don't want you to scream. Not my Charlie. I want you to understand. You're a smart girl, Charlie. The garage this afternoon, well, that failed, and now we have to do it this way. Oh, I, I've suffered so much, Charlie. That's why I can't bear to hear you cry. You won't cry, will you? Because there won't be anybody to hear you. And all the neighbors are at the women's club. Now, Charlie, let me lift you up. What? What are you going to do? You must understand something. You see, I love you. You were my delight, Charlie. My favorite niece, and I was proud of you. Now I have to do this, and I... I want to hold you gently so I won't hurt you. You weigh hardly anything. Uncle Charlie, please, see, please. See, no, no. Look, we're at the top of the stairs. I'll drop you over the railing. And if you're not dead, Charlie, I'll do it again. And again until you are dead. And then I can stay here. And you won't be able to hurt me anymore. I never wanted to hurt you, Charlie, never. No, no, I won't. Let oh, don't go. fight, Charlie. Oh, please, oh, don't struggle. There. Don't. Oh, my eyes. Your fingers are eyes. Get off me. Jack? Yes, did you call me? What is it? What's wrong, Charlie? Please, come back. I need you. Is it your uncle? He's dead. I think he's dead. He was... He was the one. How did it happen? Is your mother there? No. She doesn't know. She'll never know. She'll think it was all an accident. 
Please, Jack. Hurry. Charlie? Charlie? Mother, a terrible thing has happened. A terrible thing. So ends our screen director's playhouse presentation of Shadow of a Doubt and two fine performances by Betsy Drake and Cary Grant. Next week, the screen director's playhouse is privileged to adapt a motion picture distinguished by one of the rare screen performances of a most unusual actress. The story for the first time on the air is Alfred Hitchcock's remarkable Lifeboat. And recreating her original role will be Taluda Bankhead. And co-starring with her will be one of Hollywood's most swiftly rising young stars, the popular Jeff Chandler. International Pictures, now releasing The Milkman, starring Donald O'Connor and Jimmy Durante. Betsy Drake may currently be seen in the Warner Brothers comedy Pretty Baby. Included in tonight's cast were High Averback, Lois Corbett, Ann Whitfield, Gail Bonney, and Earl Ross. Shadow of a Doubt was adapted for radio by Richard Allen Simmons. The screen director's playhouse is directed by Bill Karn and produced by Howard Wiley. This is James Wallington speaking and inviting you to listen again next Thursday night when we present Screen Director's Playhouse, stars Tallulah Bankhead, Jeff Chandler, production Lifeboat, director Alfred Hitchcock. Listen again next week to Screen Director's Playhouse, the Thursday night feature on NBC's five-show festival of comedy, music, mystery, and drama. Listen tomorrow evening to the one and only Duffy Savage, the Friday night feature of the five-show festival. That wonderful show, Duffy's Tavern, returns tomorrow on NBC. This is Hollywood and CBS presenting forecast number four. Herbert Marshall, directed by Alfred Hitchcock in the first program of a proposed new series entitled Suspense. Tonight's forecast program, ladies and gentlemen, represents the ideal form of collaboration. Mr. Alfred Hitchcock, brilliant English director of such outstanding motion pictures as The 39 Steps, Rebecca, and Foreign Correspondent, was eager to create a very special type of radio drama, The Suspense Story. As narrator and star for his production, he thought at once of the distinguished actor with whom he had been associated in countless British film successes, Herbert Marshall. Mr. Marshall suggested that they dramatize a certain favorite story of his. And that story happened to be the very one Mr. Hitchcock had had in mind. Mrs. Bella Clown's classic in Chills, The Lodger. The Lodger is a work of fiction which springs from recorded fact. A story which begins in the year 1888 in London. A London terrorized by the fifth in a succession of recent murders. It was believed that these deeds were the work of one person, a tall, gaunt figure in a black Inverness cape, carrying a small, narrow bag. That meager description, provided by a highly unnerved witness, 
was the sum total of all that was known of the murderer. It was enough, however, to keep alive and alert the interest of all London, of all those in fine quarters, and all those in small, grimy houses, as, for example, Ellen Bunting. Ellen was no different from all the other middle-aged housewives dwelling in the great city's squalid Whitechapel district. She knew all the known facts of the case. As Herbert Marshall will tell you, Ellen knew it was quite proper to refer to this wielder of the knife as... The Avenger. Of course, Ellen Bunting was far more concerned with her personal problems than with thoughts of the Avenger. Yet the case of that strange, elusive killer quite often forced all other matters from her mind. There was that mad, meaningless scheme he seemed to follow. All his victims, for example, had been women. All had been young, attractive, and, oddly enough, blonde. But Ellen could no more understand the motive for his brutal slashings than could the police. This night, she and her husband, Robert Bunting, sat before their fireplace reading the newspaper account of the latest murder. The Avenger had struck again. As Ellen expressed it, he might be anybody. He might be the fellow you pass on the street. It's a terrible thought. Yes. If only the police had something to go on. It looks like that Avenger's just too quick for him. Look, it says here that this girl he got last night was like all the others. Hmm. Pretty, blonde, and, uh, let's see, described by her friends as a very light-hearted girl. What a pity. Did you ever stop to think who fits that to a T? In fact, fits all those girls? Why? Why, my own Daisy. Oh, that's a horrible thought. Well, maybe it's a good thing she's with her aunt, then, instead of here. Mm. London ain't a safe place for any girl right now. Ah, just the same. I can't help thinking how fine it'll be to have her back, Ellen. Now, Bunting, you know that Daisy seems just as much my own daughter as she is yours. Mm -hmm. But I'm telling you, there's no sense even thinking about having her back right now. We just can't afford it. Oh, I know that, Ellen. Only, well, well maybe we could manage it some way. How? And... Haven't I scrimped myself half crazy trying to keep us going? But you don't care about that, do you? No, your daisy's more important to you than I am. No, 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 Ellen, Ellen, that don't sound like oh, you. Oh, I can't but... help if it don't. What are we going to do? Tell me that. We'll get along, dear. Something will turn up. Oh, we'll... we haven't had a lodger for months. Nobody even comes to look at the room anymore. Yes, but things will work out, Ellen. Oh, they the... ain't never going to work out. So we won't even have a roof over our heads and... Oh? Oh, oh I'm sorry, Robbie, I... I didn't mean to take on oh, so... Oh, I know, dear, I know. It's all right. Oh, I, I didn't think it. It's just that I, I've been so worried. Well, don't you go worrying another second, old girl. Why, first thing you know, you won't be pretty anymore. You'll have your face all wrinkled now, and... Now, see Now, here, come on, now, let's see a smile. Come on, just have one oh, smile. Oh, leave me, me alone, one I smile won't. Like you used I'll to, eh? <laughs> 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 well, who do you suppose that could be? Oh, for late for visitors, I... Bunting. Do you think it could be somebody looking for rooms? Well, it might be. You want me to go to the door? No, I'll go. Oh. You just stay here. Yes, all right. Now, be sure you get a good look at Louise before you let them in, dear. Oh, I'm coming. Oh, I do hope it's... <clears throat> yes, sir? Is it not true that you let lodgings? Yes, sir. Uh, uh, won't you come in, sir? Thank you. Uh, could I, uh, could I take your cape, sir? There's no need. No, I, um, uh, I'm looking for a quiet room. It must be quiet. Oh, we have that, sir. Above all, our, our house is quiet. Uh, your bag, sir, may I take it? No, I'll hold it. It'll be so good as to show me the room, please. Oh, yes, yes, sir. It's right up these stairs, sir. Uh, this way. Thank you. Uh, you see, sir, uh, there's just my husband and me here, and we're ever so quiet, and... And I'm sure you'll find this room to your liking, sir. Here we are. Now I'll, I'll just light the gas. There. Mm-hmm. Very good. It is pleasant, isn't it, sir? And, and there's not many rooms with such pretty pictures, are there now? We've had them in the family for years, sir, and... Pictures interest me very little. You see, what really impresses me about the room is the very simplicity of it, the... Um... The bareness. Uh, yes, sir. It's not at all crowded, is it? It will be quite suitable, Mrs... Um, uh, Bunting, Mrs. Sir. Bunting. You see, I do a great deal of studying in my book here. The Holy Bible. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, please, sir, uh, let me help with your luggage. No, don't I... touch it. Oh, but I, I only wish to... Oh, you only wish to help, of course. You must forgive me, Mrs. Uh, Bunting. It's just that I... 
I'm so very weary. Of course, sir. He bringeth them to their desired haven. Beautiful words, Mrs. Bunting. Indeed they are, sir. And now at last I have found my haven of rest. Yes, sir. Then, then you'll be taking the room. Let us see now. Uh, what are you going to charge me? With attendance, mind. I shall be staying in most of the time and I shall be wanting meals. Oh, we can see to that, then sir. Then does um, 30 shillings a week suit you? 30? Uh, why, why, yes, sir. Yes, sir, that will be quite all right. Good, and I shall pay you in advance. My name is Sleuth. Mrs. Bunting? Mr. Sleuth. S-L-E-U-T-H. Think of a hound, Mrs. Bunting, and you'll never forget my name. Twenty-three, four, thirty, thirty shillings. Thank you, sir. And I think I should enjoy a little light supper now, Mrs. Bunting. Bread and butter, perhaps. Could you arrange that? Oh, certainly, sir. I I'll do that now. And uh, if you'd be requiring any beer or spirits... Certainly or... not. Oh, sir... What, what did I say? I thought you understood me, Mrs. Bunting, and I had hoped that you and your husband were abstainers. But we are, sir. We don't keep nothing about. I would have had to go out and... Of course, of course. Oh, I'm sorry, Mrs. Bunting. I fear I spoke sharply. I don't wish you to think me rude. After all, you, you've you been so kind. Consider it. I hope I know a gentleman when I see one. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, I'll just hurry with your supper. Take the room. No, don't bother me now. I have to get him some supper. What do you mean? Uh, come to the kitchen where he won't hear us. He took it, Ellen? Yes, He took the room? Yes. We're all right now. Oh. Look. Oh. 30 shillings. Oh. A week in advance. Oh, it's wonderful. Wonderful. And Ellen, do you see what this means? Yes, you can have Daisy now. Yes. Uh, here, Bunting. Warm that teapot and put some tea leaves in right it. Right-o, right-o. Yeah, do you know something, old girl? We're not going to worry too much about Daisy being in danger of that Avenger fella. Whatever do you mean, Robbie? Well, she's not a girl who takes a drink, you know. Um, what's that to do with it, please? Oh, something I read in the paper while he was upstairs with the gentleman. They just found out that every one of the Avenger's victims had been drinking. They figured he must be some kind of a rabid abstainer. What a peculiar chap. Oh. Now hurry, Bunting, please. Yeah. Two thoughts. Two thoughts only governed Ellen's mind. The lodger's light supper and her own good fortune at having such a lodger. Mr. Sleuth was an eccentric sort, but then he was such a gentleman, so quiet, so very religiously inclined. She started up the staircase to Mr. Sleuth's room, her husband at her side. It won't do no harm to be safe, though, once Daisy's is back in London, eh? We'll see if she stays closer than the earth, hmm? Well, I'll be downstairs. Hurry up with his supper, old girl. She has passed down many wounded from her. Yea, many strong men have been slain by her. Come in. And to know the wickedness of folly. Why, Mr. S yes? What is it? Those pictures. Those pretty girls. You've turned all their faces to the wall. And that maneuver, that strange action, was the beginning of Ellen's concern. Soon there came to her a recollection of the black Inverness cape, the small narrow bag, the urgent matter of alcoholic drink. And these details began to shape themselves into a pattern which grew more disturbing with each passing hour. The day following, the lodger did not leave the upstairs room once, nor did he leave the next day. And the oddness of this took its place in the pattern. Then, too, the approaching arrival of Daisy, her stepdaughter, added to her concern. On the second night, her sleep was restless with vague, horrifying images. And so when she heard the first stealthy footsteps outside her bedroom, she was instantly awake. Oh. Tensely, she followed those steps down the stairs, down the hallway. She heard the front door open and then click shut. Utter stillness fell upon the house. And outside the streets were so silent she could hear distinctly the clock from a church tower a mile away told the hour. In her troubled frenzy, she pictured a lone figure plodding through the deep fog, moving quietly, stealthily, stalking, searching, finding. When, soon after she heard the lodger return, she sought to quiet the horrible dread which had possessed her. She assured herself that Daisy's arrival that day was no cause for alarm. Now she reasoned, how could there be anything really evil about so religious a gentleman as Mr. Sleuth? 
But for her, there was no more sleep. Merely a tormented state of half-consciousness. A state which suddenly dropped from her shortly after daybreak. <laughs> Horrible murder. That was the piercing scream of a newsboy far down the street. The Avenger strikes during night! Erin Bunting heard the boy cry out the Avenger's latest stroke, made during the night. Ellen's first glimpse that morning of the grey-faced lodger brought the sleepless night's warm terror full to the surface. But on the next instant, she saw the pitiable, helpless weariness in his eyes, and curiously, the terror began to pass. She found that she was hoping desperately that her fears were unfounded. Earlier, she had determined to tell Bunting of the awful convictions in her mind. Now, however, she felt she must be certain, certain before she spoke to a soul. She knew there was one thing she must examine. That was the lodger's single piece of luggage. She'd thought of it often. What could it hold? Not much in the way of clothing, surely. It was too small, too, too narrow. It was more like a case. A case for a knife. It was along toward noon that Ellen found her opportunity to search the lodger's room. Soon after Bunting left to meet Daisy, Mr. Sleuth himself walked from the house. Ellen watched the tall, thin figure in the black Inverness cape disappear down the street, and then she rushed upstairs into the room. Quickly, she moved to the closet. It was no different from what it had always been, utterly empty. She found nothing under the bed. She went then to the chest of drawers against the wall. She opened the top drawer and found inside nothing but a frayed shirt, two handkerchiefs, the next drawer under clothes, socks, the next empty. There remained then only one possible place for the small, narrow bag, the bottom drawer, and it was locked. Tugging at the drawer, she heard suddenly the opening of the front door downstairs. Panic stricken, she rushed out of the room and down the hall to the head of the stairs. Upstairs, Ellen. Ellen, Daisy's here. Oh, Mother Ellen, it's so good to see you. And oh, whatever's the matter? Yes, you've gone quite white. Oh, well, I, I'm all right. I, I wasn't expecting you so soon. Oh, you don't know how fine it is to be back, Mother Ellen. Oh, the country's all right in its way, but there's nothing like London now, is there? No, no, there isn't. But as long as that adventure's about, I can see we're going to have to do something about these blonde locks, say, Ellen. Oh, don't worry about that. I'll dye them, maybe, or, or just pin them under my hat. <laughs> <laughs> Daisy, I, I might as well get you settled. Oh, now, Father, isn't that just like her? She's straight to the point, and no fuss. Well, I'll bet a sixpence she'll have a dust cloth in your hand before you've got your coat off. <laughs> 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 Mr. Sleuth... Mrs. Bunting, I see my door is open. Oh, we, we were just leaving, so we... Does this mean that all of you have been in my room? Oh, not at all, sir. I... What must I do? Keep it locked? But you see, sir, I was just tidying up a bit, and, and Mr. Bunting, he brought his daughter up, sir. She, she just arrived. This is Daisy, sir. Pleased to meet you, sir. Uh, she, she, she's been away for quite a long while, you see, Mr. Sleuth, and that's, that, that's, that's why we're a bit excited, you might <laughs> Yes, be. you must have been surprised when you came in, hearing us laughing and carrying on that way. Yes. Yes, I must say I was. However, Miss uh, Daisy, there are all types of joy, are there not? Yes, I'm sure there are. The despicable evil joy of the abandoned and the divine happiness of the blessed. A vast difference, that. You do understand me, don't you? Uh, yes, sir. Yes, Mr. Slew. I devoutly hope so, Miss Daisy. Nowadays, there are so very few young women like yourself who do. In fact, I, I all but despaired ever of finding one. If... If you'll excuse us now, sir, we'll, we'll be getting Daisy's things put away. Of course, Mrs. Bunting, and I must be getting to my room. Believe me, Miss Daisy, it's been a revelation to meet you. Oh, thank you, sir. I'm sure we shall have much to discuss. <laughs> You're a queer one, all right. But such a gentleman, isn't he? <laughs> At that moment... Ellen had been determined to pour out her terrible knowledge, and then the moment passed by. She told herself that perhaps the past few days had been nothing more than a grim illusion, a tormenting play of imagination. 
She would wait then until she had attended the coroner's inquest into the last Avenger murder. There, perhaps, she could hear evidence to disprove all her fears, to assure her there was no earthly harm in Daisy being so near the lodger. This was her gravest concern now, for on the next day, Mr. Sleuth made it a point to see the girl more than once. And fearfully, Ellen saw that Daisy welcomed his visits. As Ellen was preparing to step out to the inquest, she heard once more the voices of her stepdaughter and the lodger coming to her through the kitchen door. She hesitated before entering. <laughs> Tense. Strangely apprehensive. I do believe, Mrs. Luther, I've never known a gentleman with such funny ideas. <laughs> oh, Mother Ellen, you should hear what Mr. Sleuth was just saying. Perhaps, Daisy, you would excuse yourself. And... <laughs> he thinks people, and especially girls, should spend all their time praying. I sought to explain, Mrs. Bunting, that all women are placed on this earth filled with evil. They therefore must struggle constantly to find the paths of righteousness. Why, Mr. Sleuth, you mean a girl's not to enjoy life at all? Not to have fun? Frivolity, my child, is the devil's breeding ground. And all his implements are there. Temptation, pleasure, wine. Oh, that's crazy. <laughs> well, there's nothing I like better than a glass of wine. And I'm not... You drink. She didn't know what she was saying, Mr. Sleuth. Just a child, and Daisy, you'd better go now. But I didn't say nothing wrong. What's the harm in a glass of wine? She lieth in wait as for a prey. And increaseth the transgressors among men. Oh, I don't know what you mean. I never heard such nonsense. You call Holy Scripture nonsense? So what I prayed against is true. You are beyond salvation. That's not so. I'm a good girl, I am, and I won't have you saying Daddy, that. Daddy, Daddy, go into the front room. It's quite all right, Mrs. Bunting. I must be going upstairs anyway. I'm used to being misunderstood, you know. People never realize that my efforts are simply for the greater good of humanity. Of course, sir. And that the power on high will direct my hand toward the expulsion of all evil. Daisy. Daisy, listen to me. Yes? I've got to tell you about... About... About what, Mother Ellen? Nothing. I've got to go out for a while now. I'll be back. The moment to reveal the secret horror had come again and passed. Ellen's sudden recollection of Mr. Sleuth as he stood in the doorway had overwhelmed her. She must give him this last chance, this last frantic search for disproving evidence, this trip to the inquest. If that chance should fail, then she would tell Bunting or the police. So with the knowledge that Bunting was left in the house to look after Daisy, she boarded the underground train bound for the coroner's court. But as the train pulled away from the station, a new torture came to her began to mount in her mind. It was the sudden realization that provided Sleuth was the murderer, she was equally responsible for his crimes. She had been giving him protection. Protection, 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 protection. If anything should happen to Daisy, she would be equally guilty. Guilty, 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 guilty. Fully as guilty as... The Avenger. Avenger, 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 Avenger. Ellen? seated at the rear of the small but crowded inquest room, listened to each of the witnesses as they were called. And from one of them, she found the first hope she had known for many days. This witness lived next to the alley in which the Avenger had committed his crime that night. She had seen him from her window, and the man she described in no way resembled Ellen's lodger. But in another moment, Ellen's hope was swept away. It was pointed out that the fog had been so heavy that night that the witness could not possibly have seen the murderer from her window. She left the stand, replaced by a Mr... Cannot. This elderly gentleman was certain that he had not only seen, but talked with the Avenger. It was in Regent's Park, he testified, only a few moments before... A few moments before the murder, Mr. Coroner, when I saw him, he was quite a tall man, very gaunt-looking, and carrying a handbag. A handbag, you say? Yes, a small, narrow one. Just such a bag, I might add, as might contain a knife. <laughs> As Ellen heard these words, the tension which had been mounting up within her became almost unbearable. Rigid with horror, she gripped the arms of her chair. She heard the coroner. 
I shall have to ask for more order in the court. And now, Mr. Cannot, I understand you heard this man speak. Oh, yes. He had a rather high, hesitating voice. An educated man, I would judge, but quite mad. What do you mean by that? Well, as he emerged from the fog, he was talking aloud to himself. Believe me, sir, he was reciting scriptures from the Bible. Scriptures from the Bible. Horrified, Ellen rose from her seat, only half hearing the confusion about her. Are you asking us to believe? I would say, Mr. Cannot, that the man we are looking for would be least of all a religious man. And that's where you're in error, Mr. Coroner. The religious note is the very key to the case. Very interesting. That'll be all, Mr. Cannon. Uh, just a moment, sir. Don't you understand? The man you're after must be a religious maniac. That's the only explanation possible. You will please stand down. The court was dismissing the very truth. Ellen knew that now. She could no longer keep silent. Her hand shot forth and she screamed. I, I want to say... Ellen Bunting, on the verge of speaking, had fainted. And then, when she was revived a few moments later, she said nothing. Her brain was in too great a turmoil, her nerves too shocked. Like one in a dream, she allowed herself to be led from the courtroom. The voices of spectators were only vague sounds to her. I thought she was going to say something. Yes, it was hysterics, eh? Yeah, that bit about the knife. Yeah, yeah. The, the knife. knife. The knife. The knife. The knife. As Ellen Bunting proceeded home with the remarks from the spectators remained in her mind, she heard them over and over. See, that bit about the knife. The knife. And just such a bag as might contain a knife. A knife. We'll see she stays close in the house, eh? No harm in being safe. Direct my hand toward the expulsion of all evil. Expulsion of all evil. What's the harm in a glass of wine? I didn't say nothing wrong. As Ellen neared her neighborhood, her dread increased. With each moving footstep, the grip of terror grew tighter, tighter about her. She moved faster, faster. If only she were in time. She was two streets away from the house. Then one. Then... Then she saw Bunting. Sharply, like the thrust of a knife, she realized what this meant. Daisy was left alone with the lodger. Bunting! Bunting! Yes, yes, Ellen. What is it? Oh, Bunting, tell me, Bunting. Where's Daisy? Where is she? I say, where? Why, at home. What? Oh, listen to me. Try to understand. Sleuth is the Avenger. What are you saying? Oh, Lodger. He is the Avenger, Bunting. Oh, but there's no time for that. Daisy's in danger. Hurry. Hurry. Yes. Daisy. <laughs> Daisy. Here we are, Bunting. Here we are. Daisy. Oh, Daisy. Daisy, Daisy where are you? I look in the kitchen, Bunting. You try the sitting room. <laughs> She's not here. What about the dining room? Oh, look, she's not there. She's not downstairs. Then there's just his room. Go on. Open the door. Cut. What's the idea, Hitch? I've a few more lines to do. As Mr. Marshall, the narrator, you have. Not as Mr. Sleuth, the well, lodger. Hitch, Hitch, you can't stop the playwright here. It isn't fair, you know. Why isn't it, Bart? What more is there to say? But Mr. Hitchcock, won't well, people want to know what Bunting and me found in the room? All right, Ellen. What precisely did you find? Well, uh, nothing, sir. There. You see? Nothing. No lodger, no Bible. And that locked dresser drawer. What about that? We unlocked it, sir. And what was in it? Nothing, sir. You are certain, Mrs. Bunting? Oh, 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 oh you gave me quite a turn, Mr. Slu... Uh, I mean, Mr. Marshall. Uh, yes, sir, I'm sure, sir. There was nothing. Well, begging your pardon, Mr. Hitchcock, but don't you think we'd better just mention about Daisy? I don't know, Bunting. What do you think we ought to say? Oh, just that the reason she wasn't in the house when Ellen and me got there was... Well, she'd gone out for a walk, that's all. Did she enjoy it? Oh, very much, sir. Made it to King's Cross and back in just under an hour, sir. Splendid time, Bunting. Well, there you are, Bart. There's the story. Now, wait a minute, Mr. Hitchcock. You can't do that. 
That's not the story. Of course it's not. Now, look here, Hitch. Here's the fellow who composed and conducted all our music, Wilbur Hatch. He wants to know about this, too. Everybody does. All right, Bart. What is it they want to know? What became of Mr. Sleuth? Oh, him. Why, he left that afternoon. They never saw him again. And now I think we ought to say something about the Columbia forecast Mr. show for... Mr. will you please... Stop him, uh... Mr. Marshall. Hitch, listen to me. Yes? What is it? They want to know when the Avenger finally was caught. Oh, well, let me ask you something, Bart. Are you acquainted with Loretta Young? Yes, what's that got to do with it? Well, in next week's Columbia preview series, Miss Young will take the starring role in the drama of an American Red Cross nurse. That's good news, isn't it? Oh, that's great. But now listen, Hitch... You've just got to tell that audience exactly when and how Mr. Sleuth was caught. Caught? Why on earth should he be caught? Why? Well, he was the Avenger, wasn't he? Was he? Your guess, gentle listener, is as good as ours. Even Mrs. Bella Glans, who wrote the novel, isn't entirely sure. For his masterful direction, our thanks to Alfred Hitchcock, whose latest pictures are David O. Selznick's Rebecca and Walter Wanger's Foreign Correspondent. For his superb characterization of Mr. Sleuth, our thanks to Herbert Marshall. And our thanks to the outstanding British character actor who tonight portrayed the role of Bunting, Edmund Gwen. If you liked tonight's program and want to hear more in the same highly original Hitchcock vein, radio versions of The Lady Vanishes and The 39 Steps, for example, write to CBS and tell us so. Your interest will help bring suspense to the air as a weekly feature. <laughs> Forecast next week presents from Hollywood, Loretta Young in Angel, first of a proposed series based on the adventures and the romance of a typical Red Cross nurse. From New York, a new sort of comedy show, Ed Gardner as Archie in Duffy's Tavern, with Gertrude Neeson, Colonel Stoopnagel, Larry Adler, and John Kirby's orchestra. Don't miss Forecast at this hour next week. <laughs> Thomas Freebanth was speaking. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Hello, Yukon 28209. Yes, this is Candy Matson. Keep that baby on the tree. Uh, fix those dolly tracks. And look out for that cable, it's hot. Mallard, what in the name of the San Francisco Police Department are you doing up here on Telegraph Hill? Working, Candy, in the name of the San Francisco Police Department. Here? With these people who are making the movie? Yeah. How about that? Me, a lieutenant in homicide, and I'm assigned to riding herd on these Hollywood characters. Oh, it's better than murder. I'll take murder any day. <laughs> what are you doing around here? I did some shopping at Speedy's this morning while I was pinching the avocados. They told me that there was a Hollywood gang over by Coit Tower shooting some scenes for a movie with a San Francisco background. They might just as well have stayed in the studio. They brought their own lawns, prop trees, fake bushes, the works. <laughs> if it ever snowed up here on Telegraph Hill, they'd have brought some of that along, too. <laughs> <laughs> You've never worked in Hollywood, Mallard. Only God can make a tree, but Hollywood presumes to improve on them. <laughs> what are they doing now? Uh, just getting ready to shoot a scene, I think. Oh. They've been rehearsing it all morning. Mm -hmm. What's it all about, you know? As far as I can figure, it's a story about San Francisco right after the gold rush. Look at all the costumes. Very authentic. Looks like they'd been shipped around the horn. <laughs> By the way, Mallard, do you know who's in the picture? Some lush tomato named Cherry Dana and a Colorado boy, Buff Arnold. Arnold? D did you say Buff Arnold? That's right. Why? Oh, forgive me, Mallard, dear. I, I knew Buff Arnold when he didn't have a place to house in. He professed to carry a very warm torch for me. 
Aha. Uh -huh. hmm. So that's why you so casually dropped by. Oh. An old flame, huh? Don't be ridiculous. I didn't even know the guy was here, let alone still in pictures. A likely story. <laughs> All right, quiet, please. Let's have quiet. Quiet. This is a take. All set, Mr. Dix. We're ready. <laughs> Good. Okay, Cherry, we'll roll this one. Take a chance on it. Just remember to keep up against those trees. We don't want any shots of those modern buildings below the hill. Oh, remember, Red. Where is my old pal, Buff Arnold Mark Mallard, do you? By me. Judging by what's been going on, he's not in this particular scene. Mm -hmm. All right, stand by. Roll him. Scene 47, take 10. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Cut, cut. Oh, where's that coming from? Out on the bay, Mr. Dix. Uh, a fine thing, a present-day steamer whistle in an 1850 picture. Hold it. Ames. Yes? Let me know when the fool ship is tied up. We won't shoot the scene until it's docked. Yes, sir. Oh, darn it. I was hoping I'd see some action. Well, I'll give you some action. Come on, walk around with me, can't you? I'll show you all the sights. Sights like what, for instance, Mallory? Oh, all the lights they brought up here. They must have a thousand of them. Undoubtedly to wash out the wrinkles on the leading lady's face. And talk about props. It must have taken a whole freight train to get them up here. Well, I have to have them. Uh, uh, for instance, look, uh, right up there. Hmm? Where, Mallory? Uh, up, up there, above. In that tree, hanging by their necks. <gasps> oh, Mallory! <laughs> Don't jump like that, Cupcake. Oh. They're only dummies hanging from those ropes. Three of them, they, they look so realistic. Well, I must admit, they really do. I understand they use them in a scene where they recreate a lynching in Portsmouth Square. Recreate, did you say? Yeah. Maybe you're right. Take another look, honey, by a good look at the one in the middle. What are you trying to... Fry me for lard. That one in the middle is no dummy. You're no dummy either, boy of mine. How many times have you looked up there? Well, just a couple of times, but the last time I looked, the one in the middle wasn't an ex-human being. With that, I tossed the whole thing in your lap, Mallard. I promote you back to homicide. Oh, why didn't these characters stay in Hollywood? It is a bit of a shame, isn't it? Cluttering up our lovely Telegraph Hill trees with gently swaying corpses. Come on, Mallard. Let's give the director a slight touch of apoplexy. <laughs> The National Broadcasting Company presents Candy Matson, Yukon 2, 8209. It's funny how sometimes when you're lazy and want to do nothing except live the good, pure life, trouble, trouble comes up and belts you over the head with a vengeance. Well, that's the way it happened to me. I'd just finished a deal that took me three weeks to crack. I made some good money out of it, banked it, and sat back to relax. When I heard about the movie company on location on the other side of the hill, my curiosity got the better of me. As of that moment, my contemplated relaxation was at an end. Period. Paragraph. I literally walked right into trouble because there was Mallard and cut down. Okay, Mr. Dix, take a good look at him. You recognize the gent? I recognize him, yes, but I don't know him. He was one of the extras we used in a scene yesterday. Did he come up from Hollywood with you? I'm pretty sure he didn't. I think he was hired here locally. Uh, wait a minute. Who's this young lady? I don't want any outsiders in on this. Oh, no, fret your little head, Mr. Dix. Aside from being a material witness, she's a well-known private investigator. Ah, excuse me. I didn't know. That's all right. No need to apologize. Some of my best friends are movie directors. Uh, who would keep the roster on your personnel? My assistant, Bill Ames. Is he around? Well, I'm right here, Lieutenant. Oh, good. Can you give us any dope on this fellow? Oh, golly, uh, I'm afraid not. I've seen him, but I wouldn't know his name from Adam. How about the payroll? When do you pay off the extras? Ah, that's a thought. We pay off at 5 o'clock tonight. Why don't we come back then, Mellard? We can check off the names against the pay vouchers. There's one thing extras like to do, and that's get paid. The name that doesn't show up is our friend the corpse. Okay, we'll let it go like that. Where do you pay off? Room 873, Montfair Hotel. Make sure everybody's there, unless they want a little trouble thrown at them. Uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Dix. You can go on with your shooting now. Uh, no, no more today. It's too unnerving. Ames, knock it off. Call will be for 8 o'clock tomorrow morning sharp. Right, Chief. Uh, break it up, everybody. 8 o'clock tomorrow morning in costumes. And that means 8 o'clock, understand? Good morning. You mind waiting here for a moment, Candy? I want to put in a call to the coroner's office for a wagon. Sure, that's all right. Go ahead. Good. It'll only be a few minutes. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Dix, pardon me. Yes? 
Can you tell me where Buff Arnold is staying? What, uh, what do you want with Buff Arnold, young lady? I used to know him when he was playing bit parts in Hollywood. Oh. Did you, uh, work in Hollywood? I did a little time down there, sitting around in agents' offices. You know, uh, you're a sharp little cookie. <laughs> Say, all of a sudden, I've got an idea. I'll bet. <laughs> no, no. On the level, believe me. I have a small part coming up that'd fit you to a T. Good-looking gal, wise, supposed to work in her father's store selling supplies to the miners. Can you, uh, act at all? I used to shoot a fairly sharp mess of dialogue. Do you live close by? Right over there. One block. Penthouse on the top. Hmm, all the better. As soon as your policeman friend removes the deceased there, uh... Why don't we go over to your place and uh, look at the script? You know something? I've got an idea. That's the idea you had the idea about. Okay, I'll look at the script. But for your information, Mr. Dix, I'm interested only in playing a part in your pictures. <laughs> Mallard came back and I told him what had developed with Dix. He shot me a look that had more question marks in it than a government income tax form. I assured him I could handle the situation, and he left with the body, still clad in its 49er prospector's outfit. Dix issued some final orders, took me by the arm, and we strolled over to my place. Ah, charming, but positively charming. Thank you. What a gorgeous view. How long have you lived here, Miss... <laughs> oh, now, isn't that silly? I don't even know your name. Matson, Candy Matson. Candy Matson. Never have I heard a name match a personality so completely. <laughs> I'm Reginald Dix. Uh, just call me Reg. As you say, Reg. Uh, would you like a drink? Oh, splendid. Soda highball? I think I can scrape one together. <sighs> this is absolutely enchanting. I'm going to ask to make all my pictures in San Francisco from now on. I don't think you'd go wrong. Uh, of course, it'd be a little rough if you were making a picture with an Indian background and needed shots of the Taj Mahal and the Himalayas. Oh, simple. I'd change it to the Ferry Building and Twin Peaks. <laughs> Very good. Here you are, Reg. <sighs> Thank you. I can use this after that messy discovery up there on that tree. Well, here's to crime. Uh, that's a charming toast. Now then, about this part you were speaking of, I don't even belong to the Screen Actors Guild anymore. Oh, mere detail. I'll call the studio tonight and have them arrange your membership. As simple as that. You know, I think if some of your bright boys got together, you could win the war in Korea without half trying. Oh, let's not be snide, my dear. Mm -hmm. oh, excuse me a moment. Someone at the door. Uh, certainly. Whoever it is, though, uh, send them away. Yes, master. Hi. Hi. But now that we've established our highs, is there something I can do for you? I'm Cherry Dana. Is Mr. Dix here? Oh, why, yes. Uh, would you wait here, please? I will not wait here. I want in. Now, just a minute. There you are, Ed. You have a short memory, haven't you? Cherry, what are you doing here? Uh, I'm having a conference. So I see. I hate to mention it, but this happens to be a private home, Miss Dana. I'll have to ask you to leave. Don't be boring. You lured my director up here, and I'm going to see that some little local wench doesn't put the squeeze play on him. Why, you pampered brat, get out of here right now, or I'll show you how a local wench can back up words with action. Oh, now hold on here, both of you. Um, Cherry, I resent this intrusion just as much as Miss Matson does, I'm sure. I'll bet. What about me? You said you were going to drive me back to the hotel. Oh, very well, it slipped my mind. Oh, I'm sorry, Candy. I dislike scenes of this sort. We'll discuss... Our business, uh, later. Good. Huh. I find now that I'm extremely interested. Good afternoon, Miss Dana. I'll see you later. <laughs> I was so mad I was boiling. If I'd been a thermometer, Quicksilver would have been streaming out of my ears. I did the most natural thing, took a shower, and little by little I simmered down. Actors and actresses are like anybody else. Most of them are darn nice people just trying to make a living, but one ham, like Cherry Dana, can ruin the picture. Just as I was getting dressed, the ferry building siren blew its top, indicating 4.30. I had to step on it if I was going to be at the Mont Fair at 5 in time for the payroll sequence with the extras. So I stepped on it and found myself in a minor mob scene outside room 873 at the Mont Fair Hotel. Mallard spotted me, grabbed me by the arm, and took me inside the room. I really didn't expect to see you, Candy. Hmm? 
Why not? I thought perhaps you were discussing contract terms with Dex by now. Big Hollywood star and all that. Oh, Mallard, cut it out. All right, ladies and gentlemen, as I call out your names, step up fast and sign the voucher. Anderson, Robert, Apperson, Lou, Bennett, Bert, Beverly... I studied the faces as they stepped by the cashier's table set up in the room. They were all types. Anyone could have been a a villain, a dance hall girl, a hero, an ingenue, or just plain extra. The roll call droned on in the background. The whole thing took about ten minutes. And suddenly we were alone. Ames, the assistant director, the girl who had done the actual pain, Mallard, and myself. Well, that's it. Who's missing, Ames? You're in for a bit of a shock. How do you mean? Nobody's missing. Everybody listed on our payroll, checked in, and was paid off. What? That's right. Did you recognize every person who had been paid off? I'm pretty sure I did. Well, this is a fine kettle of nothing. We have an extra who's working in the picture, and yet he isn't. So he ends up hanging by his neck from a tree on Telegraph Hill. Who was the Joker? The Joker, the one you can play wild. Are you sure they're all paid? Well, positive. Double-checked with their guild cards and signatures. Well, isn't this cute? Oh, excuse me, please. Hello? Yes, this is Ames. Oh, 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 yes, Cherry. What? He's what? Great Scott. What's the matter, Ames? What is it? You're white as a sheet. Dix. He's just been found shot to death in his room. From San Francisco, the National Broadcasting Company is presenting Candy Matson, Yukon 28209. Reginald Dix, well known Hollywood director, shot dead in his hotel room. We were looking for developments. We got them, but not the kind we expected. Mallard led the way up to the suite that Dix had been occupying on the top floor. There was a mob around the door, and my boy Mallard soon dispersed them and instituted some semblance of order. Dix was sprawled out on the balcony overlooking the bay, and an ever-widening pool of blood showed that he'd been hit in the chest. Cherry Dana was pacing the room, smoking a cigarette. Ames stood in the middle with his jaw flapping. And who should be in the room, too, but my old pal from my days in Hollywood, Buff Arnold. Candy. Candy Matson. What a place for a reunion. Yes, isn't it? How are you, Buff? Ill. Terribly ill. If I have to step into the other room, I hope you'll understand. Reg was a great friend of mine. Sure. Sure, let's go in the bedroom. Uh, You look sort of green. Mm. Besides, I have a few questions I'd like to ask you, Buff. It's a deal. Anything to get out of here, let's go. Wait a minute, Candy. Who is this guy? Buff Arnold Mallard, the fellow I was speaking about. Where were you going? In there. He doesn't feel too good. The closest he's ever been to blood is a bottle of ketchup in color. Okay. Don't let him out of your sight. I have a flock of questions and need a flock of answers. As you say, Miller, dear. And don't get carried away yourself. This the bedroom? Yeah. Well, Buff, you seem to be doing all right. Mm, a lot different than when I knew you in Hollywood, Candy. You look swell, Buff. Too darn swell. Hmm? What do you mean? You bring back too many memories. You look mighty good yourself, Candy. You're no longer a plump little kid just out of high school. You're downright pretty, gal. In the good old days, I'd have jumped through hoops to hear you say that. Got any hoops handy? I'll say it again. No soap. Maybe we could revive some of those memories, Candy. Not a chance, Buff Boy. Things have changed. Hollywood and everyone in it, including you, are a part of a dim, sad past. And instead of just plain Buff, that's a rebuff. Very cute. I haven't heard the gag pulled since yesterday. Mm-hmm. Uh, tell me, did you hear about the body that was found on Telegraph Hill this morning? I sure did. Now, poor Reg. I told him this picture had a jinx on it before we left the studio. Little things have happened right from the start. Like what? Well, in the first place, I wasn't even supposed to be in the picture. They were going to give it to some new kid as a build-up. A week before the first day of shooting, he up and disappeared. He hasn't been heard from since. When they shoved me into the breach. 
Then the assistant director tripped and fell off a catwalk, broke both legs. He had to be replaced. Anything else, Buck? Yeah. About that time, Jerry Dana whipped herself into a batch of temperament and walked off the lot. Held up production a week. Then the luggage for San Francisco was rerouted somewhere else. Never has caught up with us. Now the body this morning and Dick's just now. Certainly sounds like a jinx. By the way, how do you and the great Cherry get along, Buck? Hmm? Fine, fine. I try not to see her except on the set. Come here, Candy. Just let me hold you in my arms once, just once. I want the feel of someone who's truly genuine. You're still just a little boy, aren't you, Buck? Okay, Arnold, I'd like to, uh... Well, pardon me. I hate to break this up, uh, but I want to talk to you, Mr. Arnold. That was a fine time Mallard picked to walk in. And then I got to thinking, maybe it was a fine time. He was due to have a little fire set under him. As I walked out into the other room, the boys in blue had arrived and they were swarming all over the place. Ames was no longer present, neither was Cherry Dana. I wasn't going to give Mallard the satisfaction of an explanation, so I eased out the door and went down to the lobby. I asked where Ames was staying and went back up to his room, 672. A knock on the door produced results. Just a moment. Oh, Miss Matson. Um, something you wanted? Yes. May I come in? Why, I... Yes? I was just lying down. This thing about Reg has knocked me for a complete loop. It seems to be quite a shock to everybody. You've been with Reginald Dix for a long time, haven't you, Ames? Well, off and on, yes. A good number of years. How about La Dana? Cherry? Mm -hmm. Well, I've known her extremely well, even before she became a top-flight star. Can you give me any idea who might have had it in for Dix? If you can, you better spill. The truth will come out sooner or later, Ames. It always does and things of this sort. I've only one little thing I can tell. I've already told it to your lieutenant friend. Oh? And what's that? As I got back from Telegraph Hill, I dropped by Reg's suite. Wanted to talk about tomorrow's shooting. As I drew near his door, I heard loud arguing. Arguing? Who were the opponents? Reg and Cherry Dana. Mm-hmm. And what were they arguing about, Ames? You. So that's it. Tell me, is Cherry the kind of woman who would turn killer on an impulse? It's hard to say. She has a terrible temper. Mm -hmm. Does Buff Arnold fit into the picture in any way? I don't know. He's a sly one, that Arnold. He plays his cards in strictly a commercial manner. May fit into the picture. He and Reg were never too friendly. I see. Oh, thanks, Amesy. I'll leave now. And you'd better lock your door. The way things are going, you might wake up to find yourself dead. <laughs> I went up to Cherry Dana's suite, but I drew a blank there and no answer. So I went back to the scene of the murder, Dix's rooms on the top floor. Mallard was just leaving. He shot me a look that would have knocked out a North Korean tank at a thousand yards and started to brush on by me, but I would have none of it. Now, just a moment, boy blue. Come on back to that over-21 level. Just because Buff had his arms around me is no sign we were playing a scene from Romeo and Juliet. I don't think I've seen that close a grip even in professional wrestling. Oh, cut it out. What'd you turn up in there? Anything at all? No, not a thing. Can't even find the murder weapon. Got any ideas? Lots of them. We've already taken Miss Dana into custody. Mm, I had a hunch it was leading in that direction. Uh, uh, incidentally, did you ever hear of a Christopher Seema? He's been a bookie around town here for several years. Christopher Seema? No, can't say I have. Why? Uh, he was the boy who was hanging from the tree. Oh. According to our files, he dabbled in everything from gambling to blackmail. Seema... Seema, that, that name rings bell somehow, Mallard. Uh, one other thing. This isn't personal, you understand. Yeah. But stay away from Buff Arnold. We've got our eye on him, too. Little things were suddenly clicking way back in my mind. Awfully vague, but the old processes from years before were coming to life ever so slowly. 
Mallard had work to do, plenty of it, down at the Hall of Justice, work in which I was included out. I went outside on California Street, watched him get into a squad car with two of his men, and I waved him a goodbye. That was when I had another idea. Vix's suite. Cops were through with it. The body had been removed. But I had a hunch that was the key to the situation. Knowing the manager of the Montfair, it was no trouble at all to get a key to Reg's suite, and that's where I headed, up to the top floor. I let myself into the darkened room, closed the door behind me. And with the lights of the city way below seeping through the balcony window, I found a place in the back of the settee and sat down to wait and think. The balcony window being opened, the roar of the city traffic underneath came gently through and helped my thinking. And that's when it hit me. Seema. Several years before I had served my term in Hollywood, there was an actress named Vivian Seema. The same face as that of Cherry Dana. Now the clouds were beginning to lift... And at the same time, the door opened in the suite and the silhouetted figure of a man entered the room. Blast the luck. Okay, Buff. Relax. What the... This is Candy. Come on over here by the settee. Hurry. I'm expecting company. What are you doing here, Candy? You've got the wrong page of the script. That's my line. What are you doing here, Buff? Honestly, you've got to believe me. I, I left my lighter here this afternoon. I was afraid the police would find it. Naturally, I can't afford any bad publicity. It ruined my career. I believe you, Buff. You always were fond of that career, weren't you? Don't answer. Just keep quiet. What's up? A guy named Seema, if I'm right. Shh. Who's this? Reginald Dixton and Michael. Wait a minute. I think I hear someone coming along the hall. <laughs> the door slowly opened and closed again. The dim light from the hall showed the form of another man. Then the dark figure moved slowly but surely across the room. It stopped for a second or two, as though listening for something. Then moved again to the balcony, out onto the balcony, and whoever it was grabbed the ledge above, hoisted his feet up under the iron grill work, and hung over the city. That's when I acted. Okay, Ames, stay right where you are, in that position. What? You think I'm a fool? Candy's out on that ledge. He's ducked around the outside on that ledge. I'm a fool. Quick, Buff, go down the hall and get out on the fire escape. Cut him off. Okay, what are you going to do? Go out on that ledge after him. You better come back, Ames. You're cut off at both ends. Oh, no, I'm not. Not with this gun I've got. That's the same gun you killed Dix with, isn't it? Very clever, hiding it up on this ledge out here. No wonder Mallard and his boys didn't find it. Look out there on the city, Ames. One misstep and you go off into space. Think it over. You better come back. Not on your life. I'm coming after you. I'm down at the other end, Candy. Good. Now we've got him. Yes. Yes, you have. Obviously, this is the end. Perhaps you don't know what it is to love. Perhaps you don't know what it is to be scorned. I do, painfully so. This is the end. But I'm not going to go alone. You're going with me, Miss Matson, like this. No! No, the recoil. It'll knock you right out of the Oh! Just a matter of jealousy. Is that right, Candy? That's right, Mallard, dear. The same thing you developed when you walked in on Buff Arnold and me. Okay, okay, so I was burned up. Tell me more. It was the name Seema that did it, Mallard. Uh, do you know what that is? All right, I'll play quizzies with you. What's the name Seema? Seema is Ames, spelled backwards. Uh-oh. You see, that was Ames' real name. At, at one time, he had married Cherry Dana under the name of Seema. When she began to be big in pictures, she divorced him. But he carried the eternal torch. Silly, she wasn't worth it. Of course not. Because she collected men. Reginald Dix, not because she loved him, but because she was fading in pictures and because Dix was the only one who could keep her in front of the public. Logical. But what about the Seema hung up in the tree on Telegraph Hill? Uh-huh. There we have the plot. The Seema up in the tree was Ames's brother, a ne'er-do-well. The night that Ames arrived in town here, he looked up his brother, got a bit tight, and told him what he'd done. 
caused the original leading man to disappear, shoved the original assistant director off a platform, breaking his legs, in general did everything he could to sabotage the picture. Then he pulled the strings to get himself named as assistant director so he could be near Cherry. Love and jealousy. Mallard, I'll get to that in time. Cherry had vaguely promised that she'd remarry Ames. When he saw his own brother was going to blackmail him, he went crazy. That's when he strung him up with the dummies in the trees. From there, it was just a step to knock off Reginald Dix and have a clear track for himself. I'll go back to what I said to begin with. Why did these characters from Hollywood have to come up here to San Francisco and louse up our scenery, as well as our police department? Oh, to heck with your police department. That's the last time I'm going to climb around a ledge hundreds of feet in the air. Not so strange. Buff Arnold was out on that ledge, too, wasn't he? Oh, Mallard, sometimes you make me... So... That reminds me, I have a date tomorrow night. Sure, with Buff Arnold. No, no, that's tomorrow morning. I'm driving him down to the railroad station. Date for tomorrow night? With you, Mallard, dear. We're going to see a Roy Acuff movie. Oh, Candy. Roy Acuff. Monarch of all the cowboys. Yeah, monarch of all the cowboys. I'll see him with you. And if that isn't love, I don't know what is. Listen again next week at this same time. For excitement and adventure, just dial... Candy Matson, Yukon 2, late 209. Heard tonight for Hal Burdick as Reginald Dix, John Grover as Ames, the assistant director, Mary Milford as Cherry Dana, Kurt Martell as Buff Arnold, and included in the cast was Ken Langley. Henry Left plays the part of Lieutenant Ray Mallard. The program stars Natalie Masters as Candy and is written and directed by Monty Masters. Sound effects are created by Bill Brownell and Eloise Rowan is heard at the organ. The characters in tonight's play were entirely fictitious. Any resemblance to actual people is purely coincidental. Tonight's engineer was Clarence Stevens. The program came to you from San Francisco. Dudley Manlove speaking. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. The National Broadcasting Company invites you by transcription to join The Chase. In the animal world, there is the hunter and the hunted, hound and fox, hawk and sparrow, chicken and worm. We in the topmost species have also joined the hunt. But who is to judge precisely which of us are hounds or foxes as we enter the chase? You're a bum. You heard me. You're a bum. This is Charlie Morgan telling it right to you in your own dictaphone, Potter. Because of your pig-headedness, you missed the biggest news beat since the atom bomb, and I'm laughing at you, Potter, right up my sleeve. I only wish the joke was really funny. But it's, it's sad, Potter. It's downright pitiful. Remember the day you canned me, Mr. Editor? Remember the day you bounced me off the staff? Big wheel, sitting on a rubber inner tube behind your lousy desk, fat, complacent, smug. A law unto yourself down here in South America. Top foot kisser for the continental press. Yeah, I can still see you wiggle that fat cigar around your greasy mouth and hear you tell me. Morgan, you're fired. I, I'm what? Fired. Five letter word. Look it up. Synonym for bounce, can, withhold salary from... And dismissed without notice. Well, 
Why? Why what? Am I fired? Oh, several reasons. I won't list them all, just two of them. A, you drink too much. B, you're a rotten reporter. No, wait a minute, No part in arguing, Charlie. As a newspaper man, you're through. Particularly here in South America. And you know it. Yeah, I guess I do. The AP fired you first, and you lost your berth with UP. I gave you a berth here on Continental because I felt sorry for you. If you didn't appreciate it. I don't want to lecture, Potter. Too much vino, Charlie. Too many senoritas. This is a newspaper office. Not Hollywood's version of what a newspaper office ought to be like. Days are gone when reporters wore their hats on the backs of their heads and scooped the town while having a quick one at Harry Speak. You gotta work for a living if you want to keep a job, Johnny. Yeah, I guess you're right. Well, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll stake you to the tourist plane fare back to New York. It's 5,500 miles due north, Charlie, and I don't expect you to walk. Keep your stake, Potter. Oh? I'll get along. Maybe you were right about the hooch and the dames. But when you call me a rotten reporter, I should have kicked your teeth Don't in. try any rough stuff, Morgan. Blind drunk, I'm better than you'll ever be, and I'll prove it. How? I... I'll... I'll let you know. Right after I wind up cockeyed. <laughs> You were half right anyway, Potter. I couldn't hold the job. That's why I came down to S.A. in the first place. My rep in the States was getting too bad. But the atmosphere south of the Amazon didn't change me, Potter. And I knew it when I wandered into that tourist-ridden cocktail lounge at the El Canto Hotel and found a place for myself at the bar. Un scotch, chico. Pronto. Un martini muy seco, por favor. Dispense usted, señor. You are an American reporter, are you not? I was. You do not remember me? No. The name is Gonzalez. We met in Rio two years ago. I worked for a magazine at that time, El Estilo. So what? I have something to offer you, senor, for a little money. No, thanks. But you do not even know what it is I have for Whatever sale. it is, I'm not interested. Go peddle it somewhere else. If that is how you feel about the most astounding piece of news since Hiroshima? What are you gassing about? I am taking a big risk by talking to you this way, senor. More than one man has been thrown into the river for the piranha fish to feast on. Within minutes, they can strip onto the bone so that nothing is left. You're a cheerful character. But for a sum, senor, a small sum, I will give you the news beat of the century. You better try drinking your martinis through a straw. You're loaded. Don't be a fool. Won't you even listen to me? I'm listening, but you don't say anything. What's this big news scoop all about? I can only tell you at this time that it concerns a missing person. A man the world thought was dead who has suddenly reappeared. How oh, big deal. It is a big deal, senor. And since you are so stubborn about it... Uh, wait, wait, wait a minute. Well? All right. You've got a beat. I'll buy it if it's right. But, uh, what is it? Will you pay $500? Hmm, maybe. Do you have $500 in American money? I can get it. Very well, senor. In that case, we are being watched, senor. Watched. Do not look around. I am in the hotel, room 413. Meet me there in exactly one hour. 413. Leave the hotel first and then return. Make sure you are not followed, senor. Your life may depend on it. He turned and slunk out of the bar like an animal, afraid of being cornered. I waited ten minutes, then walked through the lobby and left the hotel. I strolled up the avenue to kill a little time, then crossed the plaza and started to circle back. It was at that point that I first had the feeling of being shadowed. Twenty minutes later, I was standing in front of room 413. I rapped once and waited, and then rapped again. Then I tried the door and found it open. The room seemed empty at first, but when I crossed to the window, I saw an arm sticking out from behind the couch. There was a body attached to the arm, Potter. Gonzalez's body. And as I lifted his head, I saw the bullet hole in his chest. Gonzalez. Senor. He, Morgan. Who plugged you, Gonzalez? Tell me. They know about you, Senor. And you will be next. Run. Run, Senor. For your life. <laughs> The 
next thing I heard was a death rattle, and I lowered what was left of Gonzalez to the floor. My first impulse was to get out of there fast, but as I started for the door, I noticed a photograph standing near the bed. It was a picture of a woman, and I grabbed it on a hunch and yanked it out of the frame. That was when they made attempt number one, Potter, to shut me up. The shots came from the window, and they missed me by a hair. I bounded out into the car and started racing down the hall when I heard footsteps behind me, and I knew I was being chased. I could almost hear the next two bullets whistle past my ear, and it was no time to stand on ceremony. I grabbed the nearest doorknob with a prayer that was answered when the door pushed open, and I slammed in and locked it behind me as I staggered into somebody's room. I beg your pardon? I, oh, I, excuse me. I, well, may I ask who you are? Ten more seconds, and it would have been who I was. What are you doing in my room? I'm running, mister. Running? Yeah, from a gun. Somebody out in that car that thinks there's an open season on Americans. <laughs> Is this some kind of practical joke? Didn't you hear the shots? No. Well, I heard them, mister, and they were meant for me. Just a moment, my uh, friend. Don't open that door. Please. Well? All is empty. You're sure? Look for yourself. And the guy who was chasing me must have taken a powder, which suits me fine. Please, um, exactly what is this all about? Man's been murdered in room 413. On this floor? Let me see. Now, wait a minute, mister. They've had five tries at me up to now, and I don't want number six to hit the jackpot. I tell you there's no one here in the corridor, my friend. Now, uh... Show me the corpse. This way. Incidentally, um, who are you? Charlie Morgan's my name. Well, mine is Stuben, Kurt Stuben. And, uh, uh, Charlie, do you mind if I suggest that you have uh, liquor on your breath? Okay, okay, so I had a quick one. One, mind you, that's not enough to dream up a yarn like this, is it? This, uh, this is the room. Very well. The room is empty, my friend. Empty? Quite. But, but he was lying over there near the couch. <laughs> Perhaps your corpse strolled down to the bar for a beer, huh? Oh, these boys work fast. They got him out of here while I was ducking slugs in the hall. Oh, I'm sure now that Gonzalez had a story. And what a story. If it's hot enough to kill for, it must be blazing. What kind of a story are you referring to? A missing man. Must be a big shot. I guess he turned up somewhere. But, but who? Where? I... What are you smiling at? Was I smiling? You think I'm off my conk? No, not exactly. Perhaps you did run into something important, and the man was killed because of it. Wouldn't it be wiser to forget? Is that a suggestion or a threat? A threat? <laughs> Why should I threaten you? Look, I've got part of a front-page banner headline in my pocket, Bob, and if a certain fat-headed editor will give me five minutes, you can read all about it in the next edition. He smiled again, then stuck a monocle in the corner of his eye and looked me over like I was some kind of bug under glass. He was still gawking at me with all his molars showing when I left the room. As soon as I stepped out into the street from the hotel lobby, I knew I'd made another mistake. I should have called your potter from a phone booth inside, but it was too late now. Right behind me, blocking the doorway, was a guy with a chest like a barrel and a face like an ape's. He was watching me with an ugly scowl. One of his mitts was inside his pocket, wrapped around a gun. I began to walk, and so did he. And then I started to run. I tried to lose myself in the narrow streets, but he stuck to me like glue, and any second I expected to hear his revolver crack and feel the lead burn through my spine. Then, just as I thought my legs would give out, I spotted a shopping arcade, and I ducked inside with the crowd. A few seconds later, I looked behind me, and... He was gone. I ducked into a phone booth. Charlie Morgan, Potter. Well, Charlie? Listen, I'm calling from a phone booth near the avenue of Rio Carter. I just got a tip. It's a hot one. What kind of a tip? A guy's been missing. He's supposed to be dead, but he's shown up again. What guy? Uh, well, I don't know yet. Oh, 
brother. Oh, now, now listen to me, Potter. What kind of a pitch are you trying to hand me, Morgan? You drunk again? Don't be a chump. A man's been murdered because of this thing. I saw his body. Where? The El Cato Hotel. Did you notify the police? I... Well, no, I... Well, why not? Because his body disappeared. Along with the pink elephant? Oh, for the love of Mike, stop baiting me, will you? This is on the level, Potter. I swear it. I've got a photograph. Some dame. She might be his lady friend. If I can find out who she all is... All right, all right. Come up to the office. Let's see what goes. Do I get my job back if this thing hooks up? If it doesn't, I'll have you thrown in the river. Let the piranha fishes each get alive. Yeah, <laughs> I'm on my way, Potter. Just sit tight. <laughs> But I wasn't on my way, at least not yet, because I suddenly spotted the gorilla who'd been chasing me coming through the arcade. I ducked out of the phone booth just as he caught my eye, and we both started moving together. He was big, but I was fast. And ten seconds later, I tumbled into a cab that was parked in front of the arcade and yelled, Cali Matez! Uno, dos, cinco! Pronto, hombre! I looked back through the window and saw him standing on the curb. The sun was down, the streets were getting dark, but I could have sworn I saw a smile on his face as my cab jumped away. Five minutes later, I knew the joke was on me. Driver. Hombre. You call, senor? Where are you going? Calle Marte, senor. This isn't the way to the Calle Martes. You're going north. Si, senor. Como? A shortcut, senor. Esta usted bien seguro? Pues sí, señor. Hey, wait a minute. Stop the car. I'm getting out here. Did you hear me, hombre? Stop this jalopy, you stupid-looking crumb, before Be I... Be quiet, señor. And enjoy the ride. I saw it when I leaned over. A German Luger, as big as a cannon, that was strapped to his gear shift. And he had one hand on the wheel and the other on the gun butt. We drove for 20 minutes more in silence while I weighed the odds against trying to take him from behind. He was doing 50 by that time, and we were on the open road at least five miles from town. But gun or no gun, I wasn't going to let him waltz me around again, Willie. So I moved up suddenly and grabbed his throat while his hand shot up and pressed the Luger muzzle against my cheek. God, I'm going to stop this car. Let go. I shoot. Go ahead, and I'll twist this wheel right off the road. I swear I shoot. Let go. Hey, look out. We hit a tree head-on and the car was a wreck. I got out of it lucky with a twisted shoulder and a cut on my cheek while the driver's head smacked into the dashboard and knocked him cold. Hey, hombre. Wake up. Hombre. ¿Qué es eso? Take it easy, hombre. Now I've got the Luger. Can you stand? No puedo andar. Try it. Come on, get on your feet. Caramba. That's better. Now, let's keep it in English. You were pretty good at it before. What's the deal? Senor. Who paid you to take me for a ride? I do not remember. Will you remember better if I massage your skull with this Luger? Senor, por favor. I'm a poor man. For a few pesos, I do someone a favor. A few pesos? I'm not worth much, am I? It was not to hurt you, senor. Just to drive you to the house. What house? It is near here. Okay, let's go. Senor? I said let's go to that house, hombre. He took me through the woods about a half a mile until we reached a broken-down shack with a car parked in front of it. It was a big job, European, a Mercedes, and it looked incongruous standing in front of that hovel. I nudged the guy with my gun, and we stopped for a minute while I took stock of the surroundings. This the joint? Si. Who owns that car? I don't know, senor. Who lives in the shack? I don't know, senor. Do you know you're alive? Si, senor. Congratulations. Come on, we're moving up to that busted window to see who's inside. We approached the window slowly, bent half over, and when we reached the house wall, I raised my head inch by inch until I could peer through the broken glass. The first guy I noticed was the hatchet man who'd chased me through the streets, and then I spotted the guy who called himself Kurt Steuben. Between them was another character with his back to me and his head hunched over, almost hidden by an upturned coat collar. This was the missing man, the guy Gonzalez told me about. But before I could get a good look at his face, his sidekick spotted me, raised his hand, and fired point blank through the window. I felt a stab of pain in my right wrist and I dropped the gun. Then everything happened at once. The driver lunged, the shack door opened, the air was filled with oaths, orders, and whistling. 
How I got back to town, Potter, I don't know. I remember how dark it was as I tore through the woods and the way my spine crawled every time I heard a noise behind me and thought they were closing in. But I found the highway at last and bummed a ride back into the city on a banana cart. That was when you came into the picture again, you great, big, lovable slob. Morgan. Yeah, Morgan. What's happened to you? You're... You're a mess. I'll tell you what happened to me, Potter. I've been conned, chased, mauled, and shot at. I played tag with a gunman and wound up crawling out of a car wreck with a radiator cap in my teeth. Well, your wrist. Ah, it's just a little flesh wound. Forget it. Listen, I'm convinced I walked into the biggest rhubarb since Lincoln's assassination. Somebody big's on the loose, Potter. Someone so hot his pals go in for mass murder just to keep it quiet. I'll wait just a minute, Charlie. Oh, you wait. How do you think I got into this condition, playing jacks? I tell you, there's something tremendous going on, Potter. Bigger than anything I've ever handled in my life. Look, look at, look at this picture. It's the one I took from Gonzalez's room. She must have been his girlfriend, and he knew all the answers. And if he knew who this mystery character is, she will. But she doesn't. If I can find her. What did you say? I said she doesn't. And the whole thing's a tempest in a teapot. No, that's an original expression. How can you tell what this dame knows? Because she's inside my private office. She, she's what? They found Gonzalez's body half an hour ago. She came in to give me the story. Gonzalez was mixed up with a small-time heister, a crook who broke out of jail. A crook who... And you believe that yarn? Why not? Look at me! That's why not! Would a small-time crook have an organization so slick I can't move down the street without being tailed by a walking arsenal? Oh, now take it easy, Charlie. Here she comes. I... I'm going now, Mr. Potter. Well, thank you for coming in to see us. Oh, uh, this is Mr. Morgan. He was the man who found your fiancé's body. Miss Friar Talon, uh, Charlie. It must have been terrible. I warned him, begged him to change his ways. He wouldn't listen to me. Then when he tried to tell you where Rivera was hiding out, he was murdered. I found his body in the woods, outside of the city. Who's Rivera? The Khan who escaped. They got an alarm out for him. You're an American, Miss Talon? I was educated in Chicago. Why do you ask? Gonzalez was Spanish. Of course. I was uh, just wondering uh, where you met him. Here. I knew him for the past two years. He wasn't a criminal. He was a well-educated man. Met the wrong companions. I loved him. Very much. Goodbye, Mr. Potter. You've been very kind. Goodbye, Miss Talon. Mr. Morgan. Goodbye. So long. I wish I could help you both. The police both. Bye. She's lying, Potter. What? They set this up to put us off the scent. They'll probably knock off this escape con themselves so he can take the rap for killing Gonzalez. But I'm not going to let it go at that. What are you going to do? They've been on my tail for the past eight hours. Now it's my turn. I'm going to chase Miss Friar Talon. I saw her enter a cab as I hit the street, and I climbed into another one and followed. We drove up the main drag to the center of town, and her taxi stopped in front of one of the plushier joints, a big white stone affair that looked like an embassy. She walked inside, and I went around to the back and let myself in through the service entrance. I passed through a butler's pantry, then a hall, and found her in a reception room, just taking off her hat. Hello again. You? Mm, Me. You followed me? Sure. Why? Because you lied before. Gonzalez wasn't mixed up with a small-time gangster. This rhubarb is bigger. (laughs) You're very rash. My good-looking friend. Uh Uh-uh. The word is stubborn. As long as you're here, sit down, relax. I'll get you a drink. No, don't bother. And stay away from that desk drawer. What are you looking for? A gun? I'm becoming a very cautious guy, lady. (laughs) Don't be silly. You've changed a little in the last half hour, baby. Have I? Mm -hmm. In Potter's office, you gave a pretty good imitation of the bereft sweetheart. Well, since you were astute enough to see through my story, why bother to play act anymore? Who's the man with the upturned coat collar? I beg your pardon? I saw his back in that hovel outside of town. He's the one who's supposed to be dead, isn't he? I thought you already knew all the answers. What's his name, honey? I haven't the slightest idea. 
You sure you won't have a drink? And have you flavor it with cyanide? No, thanks. <laughs> you don't mind if I have one, then? So you were uh, educated in the States, huh? I was. Where were you born? In a hospital. Ha, ah, ah, ha, very funny. You got me in stitches. You're such a nice-looking boy. Why do you want to bring trouble on yourself? I like trouble. It agrees with my appetite. Be careful of your choice of food. I wouldn't want you to upset your stomach. As soon as uh, you finish that drink, sweetie, you can get your hat. Oh, we going somewhere? Policia, senorita. <laughs> You're not serious. Do I look like I'm laughing? <laughs> you couldn't possibly take me to the police, darling. No? Why not? Because that gun you were looking for is in someone else's hand. And he's standing right behind you. Good evening. Herr Steuben, I presume. Looks like we're back where we started. I was running, wasn't I? And one of your goons was on my tail. But the chase ends here. Friar. Yes? Bring the car onto the back. Then call Bauer. What shall I tell him? Say, the fox is cornered. We will dispose of the pelt on the bridge. Do you want me to drive you there? Yeah, schnell. Are we, uh, uh, taking a little ride? Exactly. <laughs> is this trip necessary? <laughs> <laughs> you are a warm one, mein Herr, but we will cool you off. You will walk out of this house and into the car with both your hands in your pockets. You will be careful not to utter a sound. Make myself clear? Very. Good. And let me warn you, my friend. One false move, and I shoot to kill. We drove in silence until we left the city limits, and any bright ideas I had about making a break were dampened slightly by the rod he was pressing against my ribs. I didn't know where we were going, and I didn't bother to ask, because I had a funny feeling I wasn't coming back. Stay on this road, fire. I know the way, Kurt. Are you uh, comfortable, my friend? Oh, extremely. Good. Look, as long as my future doesn't look very promising, you might, uh, you might ease that gnawing sense of curiosity that's been burning me up for the past 12 hours. And for which you are paying a stiff price. Who is he? Who's this mystery guy who's so hot you've got to keep him under wraps by leaving a trail of stiffs from here to the Amazon? You will know who he is very shortly, my friend. You mean I'm going to see him? Yes. When? As soon as we reach the bridge. And uh, what happens after that? Oh, I prefer not to discuss that. It's a very distressing subject. Especially for me. You see, it is very important that your body is not found. It would create a greater disturbance than Gonzalez merely because you're a newspaper man. Oh, you flatter me. So we will leave it to the piranha fish to dispose of you? Have you seen them operate? Once. They attack in schools. Give them ten minutes and they can do away with anything alive that happens to drop into the water. I just can't wait. Good. The bridge. Yeah, I see the car is there already. Stop here, fire. The bridge was a wobbly affair, made of wood, suspended across the river below. A car was parked in the center. The Mercedes I saw before. And the guy behind the wheel must have been the gorilla who chased me in the arcade. But it was the second man I was interested in, the one with the upturned collar. And he was standing just outside the car in the center of the bridge, watching us. You asked to have your curiosity satisfied, my friend. Look for yourself. Uh, who is he? Well, you cannot see. Now he's in the shadows and his collar's still turned up around his head. Friar. Yes? Drive on across the bridge. I will take care of this one here. You are honored, my friend. He has come down himself to see that we dispose of you properly. But who is he? I, I can't see him. What, what's his name? His name, my hey, friend, hey, is... the bridge is cracking! Uh, 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 the bridge was weak and it couldn't hold the weight of those two heavy cars. Just as it buckled, I leaped free to the bank, but Steuben went down with the others. 
As the cars bubble underwater, I saw the surface suddenly come alive with piranha fish as they moved in for the kill. The next thing I knew, a head bobbed up in the water, gasping for air. It was the mystery man with the upturned coat collar, and just before the fish pulled him under, I caught a glimpse of a trick mustache and heard him scream. <laughs> Well, Potter, you know what piranha fish can do. I searched the riverbank for an hour or two, but all I found was part of an overcoat, the coat the trick mustache was wearing. Inside, I found a billfold, Potter, and in the billfold, a water-soaked card. It looked like some kind of a political party identification tag. Only the ink had run, and I could hardly read what it said. But I was able to make out two things on the card, Potter. One was a crossed symbol in the form of a swastika on the upper right-hand corner, and the other was what was left of a name on the bottom. A first name, Potter. Adolf. The Chase was created and written for the National Broadcasting Company by Lawrence Klee. Featured in tonight's cast was Vinton Hayworth. Others were Doris Dalton, Stefan Schnabel, Wendell Holmes, and Louis Van Ruten. The Chase was directed and transcribed by Walter McGraw. Next week, another exciting script involves a search for gold and sudden death when you follow The Chase. It's First Nighter on NBC. National Broadcasting Company invites you by transcription to join the chase. There is always the hunter and the hunted, the pursuer and the pursued. It may be the voice of authority or a race with death and destruction, the most relentless of the hunters. There are times when laughter is heard as counterpoint and moments when sheer terror is the theme. Always there is the chase. Listen, doll. I've been in show business for 15 years, but I never seen the likes of what I just went through. Brutal. That's what it was, brutal. I'll need four weeks in Palm Springs to get over it. You must have heard of the firm, Leo Busby and Company. That's me, Hollywood agents with offices in New York, Chicago, and L.A. Well, we're big, doll. Maybe not as big as outfits like Fitz and Fitz or Frank Cooper Associates, but big enough to make a happy nickel. All right, so we're 10 percenters. But that 10 percent looks big, doll, when it comes off a movie star's salary. We only deal in super personalities. Like I was telling Mona Carr in my office that day. I was saying, Mona... It's no use. What's no use? I tried every studio in town. There's nothing open at the moment. What do you mean there's nothing open? Every studio's in production. Supreme Pictures is doing an Italian opus about Catherine de' Medici. Catherine de who? What's the matter with me for the lead? No leads, Mon. What? Now listen, doll, be reasonable. Drake Productions has gone into production in a week with a big number about Amazons. It's going to be absolutely dynamic. All women with spears. 
Now, there might be a little supporting role. Supporting role? Me? Mona Carr? If you weren't such a runt, I'd slap you down for even making this suggestion. Oh, relax, Mona. You listen to me, Leo Busby. I've been making pictures for 20 years, since I was a 10-year-old kid. How old? All right, 12. And shut your mouth. I've been playing supporting roles for other stars long enough. It's about time I had my own name above the title. Oh, one day, Mona, one not day. Not one day, you skinny little worm. Now. Well, let's not get into personalities, now, Mona. Now, do you hear me? Uh, now. Oh, my time, Mona. You're ruining the initials. Excuse me. Hello? Busby? Yeah? Come over to my office immediately. Your office? Who am I talking to? You've been dealing with Supreme Pictures long enough to recognize my voice, Fusby. Oh, Miss Harrison. Well, I'll be over in 20 minutes, H.R.H. 20 minutes? Do you think I've got all day to wait for you? I want you immediately. And don't you say anything about this call to anyone, do you hear? What I have to tell you is tremendously important. Top secret. Right, H.R.H. I'm practically there right now. Huh, I gotta go, Doc. You are not leaving here until you promise me a starring part. How can I promise you something like that? Who am I, vice president in charge of production? That was Henry Harrison who just called you president of Supreme. Oh, I gotta meet him right away, Mona. It's important. You not only meet him, but you give him a pitch for me. Now, Mona. I warn you, Leo, I am not accepting any brush-offs. You will either talk him into giving me a contract or else. Listen, Mona, I'm in this to make a buck like anybody else. I'd love to get you what you want, but it's impossible. Is it? That's the honest truth. Starring roles are out for you. If you want me to be brutally frank... Well? Well, there just isn't anything open. All right. All right what? We let it go at that. Now you're being sensible, Mona. Sure. I'm being sensible. I'm being very sensible. In fact, brother, you have no idea how sensible I can really be when I get started. Well, doll, knowing Mona like I do, that last crack she made should have put me on my guard. But my thoughts were on H.R. Harrison and his phone call. And in my mind, two things can't occupy the same place at the same time. H.R.H. is Mr. Hollywood himself, doll. His picture's gross like crazy. He's made more stars than the New York Planetarium. When H.R.H. calls, mine is not to reason why, like the poem says. Mine is but to run in and say... Here I am, H.R.H., at your service. Sit down, Leo. Sure. What I have to tell you now will make history. I'm all agog, H.R.H. First, let me ask you something. Was Valentino great? Yes, H.R.H. John Gilbert, Wallace Reed, were they great? Yes, H.R.H. And Gable, Power, Grant, and Douglas, are they great? Yes, H.R.H. Well, Leo, I have found the greatest of them all. Who? Ah, that is the question. What? Let me see if this door is locked. Even the walls have ears. Now, Leo, we must be careful. If another studio steals my find from under my nose, I'll kill myself. Oh, no, H.R.H. I told you over the phone that this was top secret. Well, I was wrong. This is top, top secret. I call it Operation Star. Three days ago, I took my small son, Harold, to a parade. Well, what's that got to do with the star? Don't interrupt. I am coming to that. Oh, excuse me, H.R.H. Harold, who is a budding genius took some snapshots at the parade, and one of them had part of the watching crowd in the background. Maybe 30 people. Do I make myself clear? I like Crystal, H.R.H. I happened to look at Sonny's pictures after they were developed to give him some technical advice. Although he's so brilliant, I'm the only one who can teach him anything. Oh, naturally. That's when I saw the crowd picture and the star of the century. Here. Look at this, Busby. The picture? Yes. Mm hmm? Mm hmm? What? Well, which one's the star, H.R.H.? All I see are bunch of people lined the sidewalk. Of course, that's all you see. That's all anyone sees. What's on the surface? It takes a man of vision to see below. A man of vision, Leo, who also uses a magnifying glass. Now look at the tall young man over here, through this glass. Say. Handsome. He sure is. Did you ever see such features, such poise, such eclat? I tell you, he's going to be the greatest thing in pictures since they invented actors. Well, what's his name, H.R.H.? Who is he? That's exactly what I want to find out. You don't know? Of course I don't know. All I have is that picture. It's up to you to track him down. Track him down? I'm sending you on a hunt, Leo. A chase to find the biggest moneymaker Supreme Pictures ever had. This will really make Supreme Supreme. Now that I think of it, we'll call this uh, Operation Chase, not Operation Star. 
It has a more important ring to it. Well, H.R.H. Yes. Wherever that Adonis is now, I want to find him. Money's no object, Leo. Spare no expense. But just make certain you don't spend more than 50 a day. Incidentally, this entire thing must be done on the QT. We got to look for him in secret? No newspaper advertising for him. No radio contests and so on. No one in Hollywood must know who we're after. Or we may be scooped by sincere productions or, or some other outfit of that ilk. You mean you want me to find one man out of I don't know how many in L.A. without even letting anyone know I'm doing it? That's impossible, H.R.H. Impossible is a word no one uses in my presence, Busby. Oh, don't get me wrong, H.R.H. I'm willing to give this a try, a big try. But you'll admit it's going to be kind of hard to see where to begin. I'll leave the entire hunt up to you, Leo. You'll be master of your own destiny. And incidentally, that destiny will include a very fat contract for this young man with you as his representative. How much will you start him off with? Leo. Leo, I'm surprised at you. My chagrin is boundless. How can you talk of money at a time like this? Well, if he's going to be my client... First, we must find him. And then we can proceed to the more sordid details. Can I take the picture with me? Yes. But guard it well, my boy. Guard it well. Good luck to you, Leo. I give you my blessing... On Operation Chase. Well, doll, saying no to H.R. Harrison would have been like filing a petition of bankruptcy. So there was nothing I could do but follow orders. All I had was a snapshot. A rotten one at that. I didn't know how to start or where. <laughs> the guy might not even be in L.A. anymore for all I knew. As long as HRH made me keep it so secret, I couldn't even blow up the picture and put it in the papers. What I figured I needed was a detective, a private eye. So I looked up one near Vine and Sunset, dropped into his office. Yeah? Where's uh, Mervyn Ogilvy? You're looking at him now. Ah, my name is Busby. Got a case for you. Divorce evidence? No, nothing like that. Lose a relative? Uh, not exactly, but I am trying to locate somebody. Who? I don't know. Why? Well, I don't know his name, but I got a photograph. Yeah. How many people are you searching for? There's a mob in this picture. Well, just one. Uh, you look at the picture through this magnifying glass here. Uh, you, you see that uh, tall, handsome guy there in the, in the middle? Yeah. Well, that's him. Where was this picture taken? At a parade in downtown L.A. last week. Can you find him for me? What do you think I am, a magician? I've got to have some leads to go by. I don't have any leads. You're a detective, aren't you? Go ahead and detect. Okay. I'll see what I can do. Oh, what's your fee? Fifty a day in expenses. Well, that's kind of high. If you're looking for charity, try somewhere else. All right, all right. It's a deal. When will I hear from you? As soon as I got news. Now, when will that be? Maybe tomorrow. Maybe never. When you're chasing a shadow, you never know. Well, there's only one hitch. Yeah, what? This has got to be kept a secret. No publicity, you understand? That's important. You got any other ways of making it harder for me? Uh, here's my card. I'll be waiting for your call. <laughs> well, Don, five days went by, and I didn't hear a word from Murph. By this time, HRH is getting jumpy, and I'm keeping busy trying to calm him down. What do you mean you've got no use? Well, a thing like this takes time, H.R.H. Well, I'm getting impatient. Yeah, I know, I know. And I want results. Well, I'll find him, H.R.H. I'll find him if, if I have to crawl all over L.A. on my hands and knees. Just go along with me for a while. See that you get in touch with me immediately when you do. Carry on, Busby, with Operation Chase. Oh. Mona. Good morning, Leo, darling. Uh, Mona, I'm busy now. Oh, I, I... not too busy to talk to me. Well, listen, I got big things in the fire. Come in some other time like a good doll, huh? So you got big things on the fire, have you? What big things, Leo? A handsome, blonde, young giant, for instance, who was photographed at a parade? How'd you know about him? I know a lot more than you think I do. Sweetness. Well, keep it quiet, will you, Mona? Uh, at least he's found. He has been found. What? I repeat, you nauseating little man, he has been found. You're kidding. Remember Mervyn Ogilby, the private detective you went to? You know about him, too. Hmm. Mervyn got me the evidence for my last three divorces. And he's crazy about me. He found your man. But he's not turning him over to you without my permission. I don't believe it. Get me Mervyn Ogilby's office, quick. 
You can save yourself a dime on that phone call, my precious little drip. I'm giving you facts. I've got the boy HRH is panting to put under contract, and I am not producing the gent until I get what I want. Hello? Mervyn Ogilvy Associates. Ogilvy speaks. Oh, uh, this is Leo Busby. Greeting. Did you find my man? Natch, I always break my cases, Mr. Busby. Well, why didn't you call me? Sorry. No could do. Where is he? The fellow you're looking for? Oh, he's in a good place. Well, bring him over to my office. I can't, Mr. Busby. Why not? Didn't you talk to Mona Carr yet? What's she got to do with it? I promised her I wouldn't turn him over without her okay. Hey, who are you working for, Mona Carr or me? Who's paying you anyway? I'll give you my fee back if you want it. But no boy until Mona says so. This is blackmail, Ogilvy. With me, it's love. Hello? 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 I told you not to waste your time, shrimp. All right, Mona. What do you want? The handsome? What do you think? I warn you, Mona, you can ruin yourself in the business if you try to hijack HRA. And I can make a deal with another studio by turning Handsome over. He's quite a looker from what I've heard. All right, Mona, you win. What's the proposition? Suppose we go over to HRH's office, so I won't have to repeat myself. Give him a ring, Peanut, and tell him we're on our way. <laughs> Well, doll, 20 minutes later, Mona was putting the burning cigarette butts to HRH's bare feet. When it came to turning on the heat, the dame was an old pro. And no matter how HRH squirmed, he couldn't get out of her stranglehold. This is outrageous. Well, now, take it easy, HRH. Remember your liver. Never mind my liver. This woman is trying to blackmail me. Don't be silly, Mr. Harrison. I'm giving you something for nothing. Not only do you get the woman's home companion under contract, but you also get me. And you know what my name will mean at the box office. I certainly do. Well, take it or leave it. Star billing in your new opus or no handsome Harry for Supreme Pictures. All right. You can have your contract. But on one condition. What's that? We get this boy signed up first. And what's going to prevent you from handing me the well-known double cross? Henry Harrison's word is as good as his bond. Well, I... I'd still like to see it on paper. Oh, Mona, you can trust HRH. I'm a witness to deal. You're safe enough. Well, all right. But if anything goes wrong, you little weasel, I will have your head on a platter with an apple in your mouth. Where is he? Your new find? Mervyn's got him in a small hotel downtown. Is he as handsome as he looks? Even handsomer. Mervyn doesn't know much about pictures, but when I asked him a few questions... He said this guy he located couldn't walk down the street without having strange women try to tear chunks out of his hair. Just as I thought. The attraction of the century. The ladies will be fighting like cats to get into the theaters just to look at him. Leo, Leo, go down to this Mervyn Ogilvy's office and arrange to pick the boy up immediately. Right, H.R.A. Wait, we still have to maintain secrecy. Operation Chase isn't finished until I have his name on a contract. Maybe you'd better get a police escort. Oh, you think that's necessary? Who knows? If one of the other studio heads lays eyes on him, they might kidnap him. Yeah, they might. Wait, I've got a great idea. Yes, HRH? We'll bring him over in an ambulance. An ambulance? I'll hire a private one. Then no one will even suspect him. Oh, but HRH... You've got your orders, Busby. Carry them out. Our next stop was Mervyn Ogilvy's office. And from there, we drove to a third-rate hotel near Oliveira Street. Mervyn led us up a flight of dingy stairs to a room on the second floor rear, where my new million-dollar client was waiting. Well, how did you locate him so fast, Mr. Ogilvy? Trade secret. But I'll give you a hint. If you look real close at that photograph he gave me, you'd have seen that the boy you were after was leaning on some kind of a sign. I had the photo blown up to 20 times its size, and I saw it was a sandwich sign. A sandwich sign? Sure. With an ad on it. He was carrying around uh, for a couple of bucks a day, and he just took it off for a minute to relax and watch the parade. I checked with the firm who had the ad on the sign, and they told me where he was living. Can you imagine carrying a sandwich sign around for cakes and coffee and uh, not knowing he's slated to be the biggest box office draw since bingo? Oh, it's a small world, hmm? Did you talk to him, Mr. Ogilvy? No. You didn't? 
I checked with the room clerk downstairs and told him to uh, let me know if the kid made a move to leave the joint. I also waited in the lobby for a couple of hours to get a look at him, make sure it was the right cook. And you saw him? Much. Here's his room. No answer. He must be in. The clerk downstairs said he saw him come in half an hour ago. Try it again. Maybe the door's open. Yeah, it is. Hey, look. The room's empty. The bureau drawers are open. He must have packed and left. And he's a deadbeat. The clerk doesn't know he's gone. I'll call down a check. Oh, wouldn't that kill you? Now we have to look for him all over again. Oh, but he's a fat head. He should have grabbed him and held on to him as soon as he was found. Hey, what's all this green stuff on the floor? Green stuff? Yeah, it looks like soup greens. No, the carrot tops. You mean he's been eating carrot tops in here? Oh, the poor kid. He's probably okay. starving and down to his last dime. He skipped all right. Clerk downstairs and he had a fit. Must have got out of, by the way, of the fire escape over there. Well, what do we do now, Sherlock Holmes? We'll have to advertise, that's all. I told you we got to keep this under wraps. Then you'll never find him again. Now, listen, we can put a subtle ad in all the newspapers. He likes to be a sandwich man, doesn't he? Okay, we'll advertise for a sandwich man. Give his description. We'll get results, I tell you. I'll have you. to get HRH's permission first. Then you better go over and talk to him now. And don't forget to remind him that our bargain still stands. Mervyn's still working on the case, and I want my contract if he's found. Say, we don't even know what his name is. I asked the clerk yesterday. It's Jack Dorr. Luke Jackdaw. Jackdaw? Don't ask me why I'm not his godfather. Okay. I'll go over and spill the bad news to HRH. If he doesn't murder me outright, I'll call your office in an hour. I can't believe it. I, who have lived such a decent, upstanding, honest life. I should be persecuted in this fashion. Oh, nobody's persecuting you, H.R.A. Right? No, then what do you call it? I give you a simple assignment, and you louse it up at the last oh, minute. If you'd only let us advertise. Advertise? Why not? What difference does it make now? You mean we can put an end to papers for it? An hour ago, I discovered that the news had leaked out. Every studio in Hollywood's got spies out looking for him now. Spies, do you hear? How'd they find out about him? How? Because they have brains working for them, not imbeciles, that's how. When I heard, they knew I didn't care. I thought you had him safely under wraps by then. Now you come and tell me he escaped. Well, it's every studio for itself, H.R.H., so we may as well use everything we got. We'll find him, I promise you. You'd better. Because if you don't, Busby, you've collected your last 10%. Well, we really poured it on, doll. Personals and all the papers, radio announcements. <laughs> we even stuck his picture up in the post office and offered a reward. But nothing happened. He disappeared into thin air, like they say. We never got a nibble. And to make things worse, by this time, all the other studios were spreading the net, too. It began to look as though even if he was found, we might not get him. But there was one thing I still couldn't figure. I had a hunch it might be an important clue. Those carrot tops in his hotel room. Carrot tops all over the floor. You want to drive through Beverly Hills again? Now we can cover downtown L.A. once we'll more. We'll never find him on the street, Mr. Oglesby. You can't tell. I'll turn left here. Carrot tops. What tops? Carrot tops. What would a guy be doing... Eating all those carrots. Maybe he was hungry. What is he, a rabbit? When a man's hungry, he buys a sandwich. Carrots are cheaper than a sandwich. That can't be the only reason. All right. Maybe he likes carrots. Oh, sure he likes carrots. Everybody likes carrots, but that don't mean they eat them by the bushel. Wait, wait. Hey, Mr. Ogilvy. Stop the car, quick! Uh, what's the matter? That's him! Standing over there by that bus stop. Look! He's getting into the bus. We'll head it off two blocks up. Fast Traffic's getting heavy. We're almost bottled up. Oh, so is the bus. Come on, we'll, we'll park here and make a run for it. We can catch it before the light changes. Okay. Come on, Mr. Alby. 
Wait! Mm-hmm. Hey, you boss! Wait for us! We can just make it. Open up! Open up! Here, here, I got the pair. See if you can see. It must be on the other side of the crowd. Ah, oh, the front end. Come on. Here, what are push you through. Oh, hey, excuse me. Excuse me. Excuse me, lady. Oh, will you pardon me, please? I'm sorry. It's a big pardon. I mean, I, a lady. Excuse me. There he is. Up front. He's getting off. Hey, wait. Keep those doors open. No, we want to get out. Leave us out. Get off here! This is an emergency! I'm a private cop! Open that door! Quick, Mr. Oldenby! What happened to him? We got off in the middle of the block. He's gone again. He can't be far away. He must have gone into one of those houses. Come on! We're going to case some more. Well, Dom, for an hour, we went through every house on the block. Most of them were furnished room joints, the kind of places a carrot eater might hide out in. But we didn't have no luck until we hit the next to last place on the street. Small stone dump with a room stilet sign in a window. Yeah? Oh, you the landlady? Who wants to know? We're looking for someone. Yeah? Who? A fellow named Jack Door, Mother. There's no one here with that name, and I ain't your mother. Well, I guess this one isn't it either. Hey, Mr. Ogilby, look. Huh? Inside near the door, a carrot top. You must be here. Oh, I told that young squirt not to bring his vegetables in. What's his name? What's whose name? The guy who likes the vegetables. He calls himself Lucas. What's he look like? Well, he's rather good looking, I'd a say. A big blonde Apollo. A big blonde what? Well, a very handsome character. He's blonde, all right. Where is he? He's out now. Oh, he can't be. We, he we might just... have walked back out while we were inside one of the other houses, Mr. Busby. Say, who are you fellas anyway? What do you want with Lucas? It's very important that we locate him. I'm a private detective, see? A I... detective? You mean he's done something? Oh, no, he didn't do anything. This is strictly business. I'm a movie agent, see? We, we want him for pictures. A movie agent? Well, I always wondered how a body got herself a screen test. You want a screen test? <laughs> how do you think I'd make out, huh? Well, look, you help us get Lucas and you're in. Where'd he go? Oh, he just went out to mosey around for a while, but he'll be back. How soon? Can't say. Well, can one of us stay in his room when he returns? Well, that's kind of irregular, but uh, seeing it's you... Well, you wait here, Marvin. When you grab him, don't let him go. I'll go back and tell HRH the good news. As soon as Lucas or Jack or whatever he calls himself gets back, escort him to HRH's office in style. <laughs> Well, Dal, he was our boy, all right. I found out later his real name was Lucas Jackdaw. The landlady got a little mixed up. Why don't you see him in pictures? <laughs> to answer that question, I got to tell you what happened in HRH's office about an hour after I left Mervyn Ogilvy. You did a great job, Leo, a great job. You'll always have the undying admiration of Supreme Pictures for your work today. What about me? Oh, you. Yes, me. My contract still stands, doesn't it? It stands all right. Just as soon as I make sure some other studio hasn't already got Jackdaw signed up. Oh, you don't have to worry about that, H.R.H. Ogilby will be here any minute now. I'm sure this guy hadn't spoken to anybody else. Maybe that's Ogilby. Uh, Come in, come in. Well, he's here. Fine. Bring him in. Inside, Lucas. What's that he's eating? Carrots. Carrots? Uh, uh, Mr. Jackdaw, let me congratulate you. We're going to give you a screen contact. What's a screen contract? I beg... I beg your pardon? You fellas must be pulling my leg. What's all the fuss about? Oh. Oh, no, that voice. 
No, not a voice like that. With such a face. He's a hillbilly. Oh. oh. H.R.H. He's fainted. Well, Dar, that's how it goes. With a voice like that, we should have found Lucas Jackdaw before they invented sound. As it was a cinch, we couldn't use him now. Mona didn't get a contract. I didn't get my client. And Lucas went back to the hills to eat more carrots. It just goes to show you... Ah, huh, excuse me. Leo Busby and company. Busby, HRH here. Are you alone? Yes, HRH. Make sure, because this is top secret. Super top secret. Come over to my office right away. My wife, who happens to be the smartest woman in Hollywood, was walking through the five and ten the other day when she discovered a real find. Keep this under your hat, Busby. We'll call it unbreakable. In the animal world, there is the hunter and the hunted, hound and fox, hawk and sparrow, chicken and worm. But who is to judge precisely which is the pursuer or the pursued as we enter the chase? The Chase was created for the National Broadcasting Company by Lawrence Clee. Heard in the cast were Kermit Murdoch, Leslie Woods, Ed Jerome, Abby Lewis, and Ralph Bell. The Chase is directed and transcribed by Fred Way. Fred Collins speaking. Next week, circumstantial evidence gets a stranglehold on an innocent man accused of murder in The Chase. This evening, it's Counter Spy on NBC. National Broadcasting Company invites you by transcription to join the chase. There is always the hunter and the hunted, the pursuer and the pursued. It may be the voice of authority or a race with death and destruction, the most relentless of the hunters. There are times when laughter is heard as counterpoint and moments when sheer terror is the theme. But always there is the chase. What do you have, chum? A beer? Coming right at you. Yeah, well, things is quiet today, chum, but I ain't kicking. I had more excitement lately than I had since I've been tending bar, and that's more than 15 years. What's that, chum? The bottle behind the bar? What bottle? Oh, that one. Oh, well, uh, they call that stuff Tiger Lily, and don't ask me why. Comes from India. Here, here, take a good look. I'll tell you a yarn about it that'll curl your eyebrows. You know, tendon bar's a funny business, chum. You not only gotta mix drinks, you also gotta have what's known as a sympathetic ear, you know. You gotta listen to everybody's troubles, chum, and make with good advice. And with every sidecar comes philosophy, and you have to have a smile with every beer. Hello, Fletcher's Brewery? Uh, This is the Wharf Street Bar, Harry Pop speaking. Yeah, look, I want to add to that order I gave you yesterday. Yeah, make it 50 cases instead of 40, huh? And look, how about delivering on time for a change? Yeah. Okay, okay, that's it. Well, what'll it be, mister? Um, what do you serve? Well, anything you want. Scotch, rye, martini, Manhattan beer, name your poison... Uh, I think I'll have a cup of tea. You'll have a what? Tea. With lemon. Well, I'm sorry, mister. This ain't no tea room. 
Oh, you don't serve tea? We don't serve tea. What about coffee? I'll drink coffee if it's not brewed too strong. Are you sure you could take it? What? Now, forget it, forget it, mister. I'll see if I can wrestle you up a cup of java. You, uh, you look like you need it. He not only needed that cup of java, chum, but he also looked like he could use a blood transfusion. Well, you should have seen the size of him. Maybe five foot five with wedgies on, and to weigh 110, he'd need rocks in his pocket. Yeah, but... It was his face, it was his face that got me, chum. Honest, you never saw such a sorrowful puss in all your life. Why, he looked like an alley cat with a can tied to his tail. Well, uh, here's your job, mister. Thank you. You feel all right? I think so. You look a little seedy. Oh, do I? Hmm? I forgot to take my vitamin pill today. Maybe that would account for it. What time is it? A uh, quarter after four. Oh, I better hurry. I'm supposed to have gone on an errand for Mr. Fincher, but I thought I'd have a little pick-me-up before I went back to the office. A pick-me... Uh, yeah. <clears throat> who's uh, who's uh, Mr. Fincher? My employer. I've been working for Mr. Fincher for 18 years. Never given me a raise. Well, what kind of a stinker is he? Oh, uh, he's all right at times. Well, did you ever ask him for a raise? Oh, no. Why not? My goodness, he might fire me. Well, the rights, he'd get another job. And I'd be a afraid to face Agnes if Mr. Finch had dismissed me. Yeah, now, don't tell me who Agnes is. Uh, she's your wife. How did you know? Oh, brother. Uh-oh. Uh, stay put, chum. I got a little business. Uh, hello. Uh, hello, Mr. Morgan. Uh, nice day, ain't it? What's nice about it? Well, it ain't raining. Huh? <laughs> Listen, bum. Yeah, I'm listening, Mr. Morgan. One of my boys told me you didn't come through with your dues this week. Yeah, well, I, I, I was a little short, Mr. Morgan. We, we didn't take in much cash. That ain't my worry, Jughead. No? It's yours. Oh. I want 150 bucks on the line inside of 12 hours. You put up or go out of business for good. Savvy creep? Yeah, I savvy, Mr. Morgan. Okay. I'll be back. Oh, boy. Who was that? Don't you read the papers, mister? Why, that's Artie Morgan, the toughest hood in town. What's a hood? A gorilla, a clop man. Why, nobody knows how many guys he's laid away for saying no to him. You mean he's the gangster? Well, sh oh, now look, friend, he ain't none of your concern. Make believe you've never seen him, huh? It's healthier all around. A gangster? A real gangster. I bet everybody's afraid of him. Well, those that ain't get buried. I wonder what it feels like to bully people. Yeah, look, yeah, you better finish your job and, and then go back to the office, huh? Oh, oh, so there you are, Lester Brill. Oh, oh, hello, Mr. Fincher. I thought I saw you through the window as I passed by. So, so this is how you spend the company's time, swilling liquor in a bar. Oh, oh, no, uh, no. That's not uh, so, Mr. Fincher. You, you, you know I never took a drink in my life. Now, don't you lie to me, you, you barfly. I've got eyes, haven't I? Now, look here. I'm going to the barber's for a shave. And if you're not back at your desk, cold sober, when I return to the office, I'll fire you. Do you understand? I'll throw you out bodily. Yes, Mr. Fincher. Just wait till your wife hears about this. Well, that was Mr. Fincher. Well, how come you took all that guff from him? Well, why didn't you spit in his eye? Why didn't you expect to rate Mr. Morgan's eye? Oh, well, yeah. well, that was different. I ain't crazy. Morgan carries a gun. Mr. Fincher carries my life in his hands. He said I was drunk. He ought to know I never drink. But do you know what? What? I've got half a mind to take a drink right now. No. Yes. And I'll show Mr. Fincher and I'll show my wife. What does liquor taste like? I think you better stick to coffee. No. I want a drink. Uh, give me something from the bottle on the shelf over there. Uh, which bottle? The purple one with the funny shape. 
What, the tiger lily? Oh, is that what you call it? Well, that bottle's just here for show, mister. Some salesman brought it in for a gag. But it's such a lovely color, and the bottle is so pretty. Yeah, now look, look, mister. I don't even know what that stuff tastes like or what it does to you. I, I told you it comes from India. It might be dynamite. Well, just one drink won't hurt. Please. Mm, okay. Just one. <laughs> Well, don't ask me why I let him have it. Maybe I was kind of curious about that tiger lily myself. And maybe I just wanted to see what happened when this bird had a shot inside him. So I poured him a hooker and watched him sip it slowly. Life is difficult, isn't it? It ain't so bad when you get used to it. Never been good for me. I can't remember when I haven't been running from someone or something. I can't remember when I haven't been afraid. Do you know what it's like to be chased by a man? Chased by what? Fear. Your own personality. The world in general. I am afraid of everything, but I can't escape. I can't escape. All right, all right. Take it easy, mister, and finish that drink. It might make you feel better, huh? Well, <clears throat> how'd it taste? Hey, your eyes are popping like marbles. Now, don't you pass out on me, mister. Don't... Oh, it's your boss. He's back again. Still here, are you? You ungrateful little wretch. Disobeying my orders completely. Listen, bum. I... What? Take your hat off when you talk to me. Savvy creep. <laughs> What's that you're saying? You stupid-looking clown. I got half a mind to bust your molars. Now, now, take your hands off of me. Let go of my coat lapels. Now, this man is crazy. Oh, crazy. I'll kick the little... No, 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 don't, don't touch me. You're, well, you're, you're out of your mind. Wow. What you looking at, Jughead? Give me another hooker. You, uh, want one more? You got ears, ain't you? What else do you want? A slab and a mug? Pour me three fingers, Jake, and pour it fast. It's hard to believe, ain't it? One shot of that Indian red eye and this mouse turns into a lion. So help me, so help me, he sounded even tougher than Artie Morgan. And, and when he asked me for another shot, I didn't stop to argue. I pour him another, and he downs it fast, and he turns and swaggers out like he's running every racket in town. But uh, early the next day, he comes back, chum, and it's a different story. Well, hello, Mr. Brill. How do you know my name? Well, you was in here yesterday. Oh, was I? You don't recall? I, uh, I don't remember anything about yesterday. All I know is that I woke up on a park bench this morning and went to the office. Mr. Fincher acted peculiar for a minute, as if he was afraid of me. And then he fired me. And you don't know why, huh? Uh-uh. Agnes is looking for me, and I'm frightened. She called Mr. Fincher when I didn't come home last night and said she'd find me if it's the last thing she did. Agnes mustn't find me. I've got to keep away from her until she calms down. Now, you better stay away from the tiger lily. The tiger lily? Mm-hmm. That stuff you drunk yesterday over there on the shelf, it changed you into a wild man. It did? Yeah, I don't know what's in it, but, brother, it sure works fast. Let me see. No, no, no. Now, wait a minute. Oh, I, I don't want to drink it. I, I just want to look at the label. Yeah, all right, but no touch, huh? <laughs> yeah. Uh-oh. Here comes trouble. Uh, hello, Mr. Morgan. Where is it? Sir? Where's your doze, you chicken-headed bum? Oh, well, I uh, couldn't pick it up yet, Mr. Morgan. I'll have a little one. It'll make me feel better. All right. So that's how you like it. Uh, no, no, please. Sir. I'm going to start marking you up like a backyard fence right now. I'm going to teach you how much it costs to cross the mark. No, 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 no. Give me a break, Mr. Morgan. Give me another chance, huh? Give him a break, buster. Why? You hide me, you lousy crumb. 
take your paws off him. Why, I'll uh, give you... <laughs> Pour me one more, Jughead. I get thirsty whenever I swat a fly. It all happened so fast I hardly saw it. The little guy took a drink of Tiger Lily just as Morgan was going to rub me down, see? And the first thing you know, the little guy's laying a beer bottle over Morgan's skull. And Morgan is out for the count. Well, two minutes later, Lester is walking out the door like he's got nothing on his mind, and I'm trying to bring Morgan around. And it took me half an hour. And when I finally got him to his feet, his eyes were still smoky like he's walking on his heels. So I lead him out of the door before he knows what happened. And, uh, well, then I come back and start making plans to take care of the little guy's funeral. But the next day... Good morning. You still alive? I beg your pardon? I'm surprised to see you breathing. What do you mean? Well, you don't remember what happened yesterday? No. Well, you only crowned the toughest guy in town with a beer bottle, that's all. I did what? Artie Morgan, the biggest and hardest hood who ever lived. Why, I bet you he's got two of his torpedoes looking for you right now. You mean killers? Well, you're in trouble, friend. You're on the hook. I can't understand it. How, how could I have... <gasps> that man. That man I thought was following me. He was following me. You mean, you mean somebody was after you? There, there, there was one man who walked behind me down the street for over a mile, a terrible-looking fellow with a scar on his face. That was the gasher. Oh, the gasher. And then, then when I thought he turned away, another man started to follow me. He, he had pock marks all over his skin, and he kept picking his teeth with his knife. That was Jip. Who the Jip? Morgan's hatchet, man. You better get out of town fast, y mister. Oh, you, you, you think they want to kill me? Well, they don't want to give you no door prizes. Why, they're going... Do not turn around. Why? There's a dame staring in here through the window with blood in her eye. Well, what, what does she look like? Well, she got a hatchet face and a jaw like a fighter. Ooh, ooh, that's Agnes, my wife. For goodness sake, don't let her in. Well, it's too late now. Oh, here you are, you miserable worm. Hello, Agnes. Where have you been for the last two days? I, I don't remember. Have you gone crazy? What are you doing at a cheap gin mill like this? Oh, we've got a very good reputation. Shut up! Yes, ma'am. The idea, the very idea. You must be stark staring mad, Lester Brill, staying away from home like that and getting fired in the bargain. Yeah, but I, I didn't. Don't I didn't. interrupt me. No. I heard all about it from Mr. Fincher. He said he caught you in a bar swilling liquor like a drunken pirate, but I had to see it with my own eyes to believe it. Yeah, but I haven't. Don't been... contradict me. Take a shot, John. Don't you dare give me any of your lip. Heaven help you when I finally get you home. What are you doing with that bottle? How dare you take a drink right in front of me, you insect? How dare you? Drop dead, sister. <gasps> what? What did you say? He said, drop dead. Low. Take a powder. I'm getting tired of the yakety yak. Lester Brill, is, is that you speaking? You heard me, hatchet head. Get me saw and I'll slap you down. A maniac. An absolute maniac. Squam! You done it, mister. Pour me another drink. Anything, anything you say, champ. Hey. Hey. What's the matter? Outside. Nagasha and Chip. Morgan's boys. So what? So you got a ride, mister? I don't need a lot to handle them creeps. Close the door, knuckle brain. There's a draft to me back. Uh, hello, hello, Chip. I, I see you got the gasher outside, huh? You out for a little walk, you two? Where's the guy who conked Artie Morgan? He... He ain't around. He, uh... He's he, right here. Oh. Who... Wants him. You slugged Artie? He's lucky he still got his teeth to crumb. Want to make something out of it? Sure. You better call in that slob you got waiting outside. You're going to need help. I, uh, I want to make a deal, mister. A deal? Hey, you got a lot of moxie. 
And the gang could use a new chief. Get rid of Morgan for us. And you're in. I, uh, don't hear so good. Why, we got a big spread, mister. The take is over a million a year. And your end is 40%. If you're top banana... Uh, 40%. I'm beginning to hear better already. Well, how about it? Sure. You'll take care of Morgan for us? Any time. Hey, I got an idea. Morgan's been saying he's going to rub you out, see? All right. I'll tell Morgan you're in this saloon and you're plastered. He'll come down thinking you're a cinch. You let him have it, eh? Go ahead. Tell the bum I'm in here. Make sure you order up a hoist. You got a rod, ain't you? Nope. I don't need one. You better take mine. Here. What's that? A water pistol? <laughs> yeah, you, uh, you got a good sense of humor, mister, but you better take this Roscoe anyway. And what time you got, Harry? Uh, it's a uh, quarter past eleven. Don't let no customers in here except Morgan. I'll get him down at one o'clock sharp. Now, now, now listen, Chip. You ain't serious about this. I don't want my joint shut up. You want to get yourself embalmed before your time, Harry? No. Just try busting this up and calling the cops. No, no. Is, uh... Is one o'clock good enough for you, mister? Any time. Draw as soon as Morgan shows. He won't be looking for it. Well, <laughs> I'll see you later. Now, this saloon ain't no dueling grounds, Mr. Brill. Stop shaking and pour me another drink. But when Morgan walks in here... Turn that off, you hear? When Morgan walks in, he gets carried out. Give me the bottle. I'll have a little party at the table. All by myself. <laughs> See how it was, chum? If I called the coppers, the gasher would gash me. So all I can do is wait around until the fireworks start. Well, I locked the door, and I walked back to the bar, see? And I had myself a drink on the house. Lester is sitting at a corner table, heisting a glass. And the first thing I know, he's got his head on his arms, and he's snoring like a trooper. Well, that leaves me with nothing else to do but watch the clock go round and wait. And the first thing I know, it's five minutes to one. Mr. Brill, wake up. Mr. Brill. Uh, Why? Oh, 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 it's you, barman. Holy smoke, you're back to normal. I had the craziest dream. I dreamt I'd made a date to meet a gangster. It was absolutely terrifying. Yeah, well, that was no dream, mister. What did you say? It happened. Oh, no. Oh, yeah. Oh, where? Right here. You made a deal with one of Morgan's torpedoes to rub Morgan out, and Morgan's on his way over here right now. But that's ridiculous. Is it? Feel in your right-hand pocket. My right hand... What's this? Take it out and see. <laughs> My goodness, it's a revolver. They, they, they frightened me to death. I can't even bear to look at one. Well, you better pick that one up from the floor, mister, because you're going to need it. When Morgan walks in here, it's either him or you. But I, 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 I have nothing against this man, Morgan. Well, he's got a lot of complaints about you. You know, you stroked his toupee with a beer bottle yesterday, and he's coming back to return the compliment with a slug. The, the police. You, you, you've got to call the police. Yeah, well... Uh-oh. Police won't help you now, mister. There's Morgan's car pulling up to the curb. <laughs> What'll I do? Take a drink. Fast. A drink? Yeah, Tiger Lily from that bottle on the table. Uh, I don't know what's in it, but it makes you a regular Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Now, quick, pour yourself a hooker before Morgan comes in. Well, 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 what are you waiting for? The bottle. What's the matter with the bottle? It, it's, it's empty. Empty? Yeah, look for yourself. Holy cow, you must have finished it before when you passed out before. Yeah, you get me another one, quick. I ain't got another one. Oh, that's Artie Morgan with a heater in his hand. Open up in here. Where, where can I hide? Come on, come on, let's get out of here. Uh, no. All right, in here. Now, this 
Oh, it leads to an alley. And I, I got a jalopy parked there. Maybe we can make a run for it. How did I ever get into this mess? Never mind how you got in. The trick is getting out. Here, hit through this door. Yeah. All right, there's the car. Now you get in. behind us. Hang on to your hat. Well, chum, when I drove out of that alley, I turned left on two wheels and hot-footed it right down the avenue. I made two more left turns and then doubled back on my tracks. But just when I thought we gave Morgan the air, he turned the heat on. <sighs> I guess we're safe now. Are we? Take a look through the window in the back. Who? There's someone chasing us. Yeah, that's Morgan. I can recognize his car. It's a bulletproof job with a Tommy gun built right in. What do we do? You're asking me. Well, the best thing is to stick with the heavy traffic. He won't pull anything in front of this mob. Oh, he's, he's gaining on us. He's got a better car. Faster, Barman. I'm going as fast as I can, mister, but it looks like it ain't fast enough. Well, hang on now. I'm turning right. Oh, no. Uh, what's the matter? We're on a dead-end street. He, he's, he's coming up to us. He's coming alongside. <laughs> Let go of the wheel, <laughs> Mr. Don't touch that. Oh, God. Well, chum, don't ask me exactly what happened, but uh, as far as I know, when Lester got panicky and grabbed the wheel... We rammed Morgan's car, you see? The next minute, the street is crawling with coppers, and I'm pulling Lester Brill out of the overturned jalopy. Well, he didn't come to until he was in the hospital. Mm. How you doing, Mr. Brill? Mm. You, uh, you feel well enough to talk? Where am I? In the hospital. What happened? Plenty. You know, I, I came out of the crack up with a bang on the nose. They called what you got a slight concussion. Oh, what happened to Mr. Morgan? Oh, don't you worry about Morgan. He's cooling off in jail. You know, they told me the DA's been looking for Morgan for the last six months. And when, when they let him out of stir, he'll be tripping over his beard. Oh, well, then, then it's all over. Well, uh, almost. Almost? Yeah, you, uh, you got company outside. Who? Your boss, Mr. Fincher. And your wife. My wife? Mm -hmm. Maybe the doctor won't let me see. Them. No, the doctor said it was okay. Now, listen. Oh, no. Listen, listen, Mr. Brill. Things have changed a lot for you in the last couple of days. Now, if you play this right, you're going to be a happier guy. Now, you just be quiet, and you let me do most of the talking. Yeah. Oh, come in, folks. He's feeling much stronger. Oh, thank you. Lester. Lester, are you all right? Hello, Agnes. Oh, terrible, terrible. What's this town coming to anyway? Great Scott, when I heard about that gangster, I could hardly believe it. But uh, when the newspaper men came around and asked me for an interview, Lester, I gave them the facts. Yes, sir, I, I told them you'd been a man of iron as long as I've known you. And I was proud to have you as a member of our organization. You were proud to have Mr. me? Mr. Brill, uh, you're a hero in this town. You nabbed Morgan single-handed. I'm a hero. Oh, 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 Lester, darling. I should have known all along what a man you were. I've been so blind. Can you ever forgive me, sweet? But, uh... I, uh, uh, I have... I have a few apologies to make myself, Lester, and uh, I'm making them now. Oh, by the way, there'll be a surprise for you when you come back to the office. Oh, will there, Mr. Finch? Yes, indeed. You'll see your name on the door. I've had you promoted, my boy. You're due for your vice president stripes when you get back. Uh, uh, but, Lester... You must promise never to lose your temper again. You you frightened me so, darling, and you're so nice when you're your own sweet self. Yeah, yes, I am. Uh, well, uh, <clears throat> folks, I'll be on my way. I uh, I got to get back to the job, you know. Uh, anything more I can do for you, Mr. Brill? Uh, no, thank you, Harry. No, I'll be fine from now on. <laughs> Well, chum, as far as I know, Lester Brill's life changed from that day on. Yep, his boss don't kick him around no more, and his wife treats him like he was human. 
Oh, uh, yeah. I, uh, I might have had a little something to do with it when I told the police that Lester was chasing Morgan and not the other way around. And uh, when they picked up the jip, he told them the same story. So that made Lester a hero on all counts. But, uh, you know, I like to figure maybe the tiger lily was uh, really what made Lester Brill what he is today. Oh, uh, the bottle's empty now, uh... I, I just keep it around for a gag, but uh, you know what I've been thinking? When that salesman comes in, the one who'll give me the bottle in the first place, maybe I'll ask him for another one. Yeah, you know, uh, I've been having a little trouble with my own wife lately, uh, and, uh, well, you never know what Tiger Lily can cure. <laughs> In the animal world, there is the hunter and the hunted. Hound and fox, hawk and sparrow, chicken and worm. But who is to judge precisely which is the pursuer or the pursued as we enter the chase? The chase was created and written for the National Broadcasting Company by Lawrence Clee. Heard in the cast were Larry Haynes, Carl Swenson, and Petoniak... Leon Janney, and Ralph Bell. The chase is directed and transcribed by Fred Way. Fred Collins speaking. Next week, murder is in the offing when a man's personality changes and takes on all the characteristics of an evil puppet on The Chase. This afternoon, it's Adventure with Counter Spy on NBC. National Broadcasting Company invites you by transcription to join the chase. There is always the hunter and the hunted, the pursuer and the pursued. It may be the voice of authority or a race with death and destruction, the most relentless of the hunters. There are times when laughter is heard as counterpoint and moments when sheer terror is the theme. But always there is the chase. For some people, there is only one chase and no other exists. The chase to secure and hold money. Nothing, nothing else matters. There is no love except for pennies, dimes, and dollars, and only hate for those who would deprive them of it. Hear those footsteps? A man running down a street in a cheap section of a city just after nightfall. Watch him. He's leading us to just such people. He darts across a narrow street without looking. He comes to the intersection of a street and alley just as a car turns the corner. Hey, you hit him. How bad? He's dead. What are we going to do? Do? Get out of here. Drag him in that alley. Yeah, but he's dead. That's hit and run. We ought to do You some... hurt me. Drag him in that alley. Let's get out of here. Yes, the man lying dead in the alley marked the beginning of a story. A very important story to Mr. and Mrs. Crocky, Albert and Carolyn... Two lovely people who run a boarding house a few blocks away. It's a vital story to them because it involves money. And anything that involves money is more important than life itself to Mr. and Mrs. Crocky. And another thing, Albert. You've got to go up and see Mr. Sedgwick right this minute. 
because he ain't paid his rent for next week. He's a new boarder, and it's best that we show him right off that we ain't going to put up with back rent. Well, be a lot better if we get that Mr. Sedgwick out of here. I, I don't like the looks of him. Besides, he burns the electric a lot at night. Oh, it's getting so too honest people ain't able to run a decent, respectable place no more. Mm. Well, anyhow, you go right up and see that, Mr. Sedgwick. It ain't right. Uh, who's there? Your star boarder, Mr. Campion. Uh, all right. Good evening, Albert. Carolyn. You ain't to call us by our first names. I told you that. Oh, merely a friendly gesture on my part, Mr. Crockey. But I did not descend into these charming quarters of yours to discuss the amenities of nomenclature. Now, now, stop that fancy talk. And don't bring that cigarette in here. You ain't been smoking in bed. No, but, uh, it's an idea. At least the feeble glow would provide more light than the ceiling fixture. Oh, you complaining again? Now, you look here, Mr. Uppity Campion. You're getting a good room at a reasonable rent. There ain't many boarding houses in the city. No, where you could no, go and... no, 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 you're perfectly right. There aren't many boarding houses in the city where the boarders have to race home at night to make sure they can get their own evening paper. Or where the owners get up at four in the morning to steal the cream off the top of the milk. Are you calling us thieves? Mm, no, I don't think so, Mrs. Crockey. I'd have to qualify that. Sneak thieves, I should say. You... Oh, you... no, 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 stop it, stop it, stop it. Let's, let's, don't argue about it. Well, now, what about the hot plate in my room? What's the matter with it? Well, it belies its name, Mr. Crocky. It is no longer a hot plate. It has become a refrigerator. You broke it. In the passage of time, sweet Carolyn, mechanical and electrical appliances do get out of order. But we can't get parts, Mr. Campion. All right. Let's go on to something else. The, uh, the bedspread, for example. It's become one of the most exciting games I've ever played to find a spot in the spread free from holes. It embarrasses me when I have guests. Oh, we can't afford a new one, Mr. Campion. All right. We shall forget the bedspread and take up the subject of the ceiling fixture. Uh, that ain't broke. Well, no, no, not exactly. But it certainly is eccentric. It goes on and off, Mr. Crocky, like a lighthouse. No human hand touches it, and yet it flashes ambitiously, energetically. Ah, well, you keep finding fault with everything. Oh, but I'm not alone, friend Crocky. I am not alone. I heard Miss Barton complaining earlier tonight about her sink. It's her fault. She combs her hair over it, and the hair falls in and blocks the drain. Yes, but... Oh, <laughs> I give up. Such slippery and adroit excuse-making is beyond my power of refutation. Uh, what? Nothing, nothing at all. Well, now that I've registered my complaint, I shall retire to the damp chill of the crypt I occupy, and for which I pay $68 a month. If you don't like it, you can get out. Well, that, Mrs. Crocky, is a line which becomes you so well. Good night. Young puppy. For two cents, I... Uh, two cents? Such extravagance, Mr. Crocky, and from you, of all people. Good night. Well, I... Albert, as soon as we can. We'll put him out. No, 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 no. Carolyn, Carolyn. Uh, it might be hard to rent that room. Yeah, he does pay regular. Well... Hmm. Oh... Hmm? Mr. Sedgwick. Huh? You go right on up there and get the money for Mr. Sedgwick. Now, Carolyn, now maybe he'll bring it down. Night ain't over yet. You're scared of him. Well, I don't like to like the way he looks at me. We'll both go. Well, all right. <sighs> hmm. There goes that Miss Barton. Run the water again to wash her hair. Uh, oh, oh, oh. Miss Barton, you close off that water good. And don't use too much. <laughs> there. 
She knows all right. Her being a day behind with the rent. <laughs> Mr. Sedgwick? Mr. Sedgwick? Your lovely knuckles, Carolyn. You'll but... skin them. You shut up. Or wouldn't you rather I told you that Mr. Sedgwick went out? How do you know? I saw him leave his room and go out the front door some time ago. Now go away and stop pounding. I have work to do. I'd like to slap that smart alecky Mr. Campion's face for him. Uh, now, never mind, Carolyn. Let's go for our walk. Uh, yes, Mr. and Mrs. Crocky. You are a remarkable couple. You do take the cream from the milk, and you do read the newspapers before the boarders get home to save a couple of pennies. And now you go for your walk. Oh, not for exercise, though. It's to save electric light bills. Every night it's the same. Down the same street, past the warehouse, over to the brewery and along the street running through the wholesale district until you finally get sleepy and turn homeward. Uh, Albert, if that's smart, Mr. Campion tells you that he ain't using electric light in that lamp he bought? He's lying. If you could just catch him at it. He's got enough light in his room. He don't need no more lamps. It's costing us money to put up with him. That's right, Albert. Oh, oh, money, money. We always got troubles. Uh, wait, wait a minute. It's a man laying there. Yeah. Mm, drunk, most likely. That's right. Honest people have to slave for their money, and something no good like this drinks it up. I don't smell no liquor. <laughs> Maybe. I'm going to look closer. Keep away from him, Albert. Maybe it's a trap. He might be a hold-up man. Carolyn. It's Mr. Sedgwick. It is, Look. What's the matter with him? He, he's dead. Albert. Looks like maybe he got hit by an auto. He, he, What's that? His pocket. It's stuffed with money. And him owing oh, us rent. Hm. But look, look, Carolyn. It's it's so so, so, so much. Albert. What, what, what do you suppose? Shh. Ain't nobody in sight. It's, it's so much money. Like as not he come by it bad. I never did like the way he looked. Like, like one of them gangsters. Uh, he wouldn't do no good oh, with it. Oh, he owes us rent. It's his kind that would spend it on some chorus girl. Uh, you and me, we... Albert, Albert, you gonna do it? Or ain't you? No, well, there ain't nobody watching. Ain't nobody saw him before us either. Or there wouldn't be no money. Albert... No, Carolyn, come on, come on, I got it. So you've taken the money from Mr. Sedgwick, Albert and Carolyn. But look, isn't someone behind you? Faster. Walk faster. Just shadow, wasn't it? But you didn't know that, Mr. and Mrs. Crocky. That money is heavy in your pocket, isn't it, Albert? Faster now, both of you. Hurry home to hide the money in the mattress. Yes, in the mattress with the rest of your miser's hoard. But faster again. The memory of Mr. Sedgwick lying back there is pursuing you, and you've got to get away. Faster now. Faster. <sighs> Did you, Albert? No, no, I... I got it right here. Oh, got it. Get into our room now. Put it in the mattress. Well, well... Uh, Mr. Camp. Back early, aren't yeah. you? 
Were you expecting someone else? No, I wasn't. What have you been doing? Running? No. Why should we be running? Well, I don't know. You might have heard the Nikolai dropped upstairs and were chasing each other to see who'd get it. You... You ain't funny, Mr. Campion. I, I wasn't trying to be funny, Albert. Oh, you shut up. Well, what's the matter with you two? Mr. Crocky ain't feeling good. As a matter of fact, he does look a little pale around the gills. Someone's been chasing you. No, nobody chased Why us. Why did you ask that? Well, from the way you dashed in here, I thought perhaps you'd robbed a bank or something. We're honest people. To, uh, to a certain extent, yes. Are you calling us thieves again? I explained that once before tonight. But you two certainly do look excited. And the only thing that could bring a flush to your careworn cheeks would be money. Perhaps left by a rich uncle. We ain't got any uncle. And that ain't no way to talk, Mr. Campion. Okay. Okay, we'll forget it. I'm going for a walk. Uh, walk? Well, sure, sure. Why not? Ceiling fixture gave up the ghost altogether a few minutes ago. I can't work anymore. Which way are you walking? Well, does that make any difference? Of course not, uh, but uh, it's, uh, it's a damp out. <laughs> Might catch a chill. You know, your solicitude is amazing. Can this be the Crockies? The same people who all through the winter dole out heat by fractions of degrees? Um, uh, uh, Mr. Campion... <laughs> That ceiling fixture. Uh, I got some wire. Uh, maybe we could fix it. Tell me, is your name by any chance Scrooge? Who? What Marley's ghost accosted you along the way and forced you into a recognition of the error of your way? Huh? In other words, what the devil happened outside? Uh, nothing. Nothing. You want that light fixed, do you? Well, unless I'm to become a mole, light would be welcome, yes. Then you go right along with Mr. Crocky, Mr. Campion. Ah, uh -huh. what's the matter? I see. See what? Mr. Crocky has What have I got? The wire, the wire, the wire to fix the ceiling fixtures. And if I help him, it saves the electrician's fee for you. You're always poking fun at us. Oh, no, Mrs. Crocky. No, indeed. But, uh, come along, Albert. You and I shall play Steinmetz to the ceiling fixture. Oh, and Mrs. Crocky... Huh? I should still like to know what encounter brought you to home before sleep deadened your elfin steps and dulled those brilliant minds. Uh, you coming, Mr. Campion? Certainly, Mr. Crockett. Albert, hmm? you better leave that package with me. Oh, I, I forgot. Package? Albert, give it to me. I'm going to leave you alone with it. Now, uh, Mr. Campion. Yes, Albert. Um, there's wire and stuff in the cellar. Now, you get it yourself. Uh... uh here. Here's the key to the basement. Oh, no. Wonder of wonders. The key to the crocky cellar. And shall I find vintage 192? Or perhaps the skeletons of former boarders? You, uh, you fixed the light, Mr. Campion. If there's anything you need, you can buy it tomorrow. We'll pay you for it. Numb. Absolutely numb I am. This is the epitome of surprise. The key to the cellar, an offer of payment by the Crockies all in one evening. Oh, I shall certainly write this to Mr. Ripley. Nay, nay, I shall insist upon another time capsule sunk into the ground to record this event for posterity. You're going to fix it or not? Oh, certainly, certainly. Tomorrow I may see the Crockies back in usual form. Therefore, tonight I shall gather the golden fruits of whatever occasion this munificent behavior. Callan, you're a fool. You mentioned package, and it ain't in the package. I want to see how much is there. We could have counted it later. How do I know that you wouldn't have took some for yourself? Oh, you shut up. Come on. We'll count it in our room. So you count the money, Mr. and Mrs. Crocky. And how much is there? A hundred? Keep counting. Three hundred? Oh, much more. Five hundred, seven, a thousand. Keep counting. Perspiration is beating your foreheads. Your hands are damp. 
The bills stick to your fingers. Now you reach 2,000. They're all hundreds. One, zero, zero on each bill. 2,000, three, 3,500, and you're not through yet. Keep counting, counting. Your breath hot, your eyes glazed with greed. Ah, now you're finished counting. Five. Five thousand dollars. <laughs> we found it. We, we, we just found it. We went for a walk. We found it. Not so loud. You'll wake everybody. <laughs> We're rich. Cedric gets run over by a hit-and-run driver, and we get his money. Shh, shh, shh. We're rich. Uh, who's there? Uh, Campion. Is anything wrong? No, there's nothing the matter. But I thought I heard Mrs. Crocky. Uh, did, you, did you fix the light? Oh, yes, yes. Uh, wait a minute. I got the key to the cellar. Uh, put it under the door. Put it under the door. Quiet. Just shove it under. Okay, but are you sure there's nothing wrong? Now just go to bed. Well, I'm going out for a walk. If anyone calls, I'll be back in half an hour. Yeah, but he can't go. Maybe you go the way we did and you'll see him. Did you hear me? Sure, sure. Um, uh, uh, Mr. Campion. Yes? Uh, it's, um, it's awful chilly out. Well, if you'll observe closely, I'm the possessor of an overcoat and a rather serviceable Benny, which... Wouldn't you like a nice cup of tea? I beg your pardon. You, you like tea, don't you, Mr. Campion? I... I don't understand. And uh, tomorrow we can pick up a second-hand hot plate for you. Yeah, sure. We'll get you a new one. Mr. and Mrs. Crockett, please t- t- take a very close look at me. My name is Campion. I have been living here for six months, during which time you must have seen that I am not affluent in any way. I have no influence with the governor. I know no politicians. I know no statesmen. What little money I have, I spend for bare necessities. In short, Albert, Carolyn, why are you spreading this soft soap with such a lavish hand? Well, we're willing to let bygones be bygones. Oh? Well, thank you very much for the offer of tea, but I shall take a walk just the same. He'll go the way we did. I know he will. Forget it. Now close the door. And what if he does? All he'll see is that Sedgwick lay in the alley. We didn't kill him. Anybody could see it was an auto that done it. And Campion can't know about the money he had. Sedgwick was only here a few days. But but we got to hide it. In case. In the mattress with the rest. Oh, we ain't got time. Huh? What if Mr. Campion does know about the money? What if he sees Mr. Sedgwick and he comes back here? We ain't got time to open the mattress and close it again. The mattress is the best place. All our money has always been safe in the mattress. No, 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 no time. Put it in the fireplace until tomorrow morning. Then what? Well, uh, when the bank's open, you you go clear over to the other side of town. If it's a nice day, you can walk. Um, Change one of the big bills into little ones. You're crazy. What good's that going to do? You'll you'll see. Now, Now, listen. And then... Go to another bank and put the little bills in the bank account. Oh, we ain't got none. You can open one. Maybe do the same thing for a week until all the money is out of here. There ain't nobody knows us on the other side of town. Yeah. I see. <laughs> That's a good idea. <laughs> and then when we're good and sure that nobody else knows about the money. Uh-huh. We can take it out of the bank and bring it back here. <laughs> That's smart. Pretty smart, Carolyn. I bet even Mr. Smarty Pants Campion couldn't think of nothing like that. <laughs> <laughs> That's a splendid idea, Albert and Carolyn. You sigh with relief and settle to sleep, which you can't. Then it's morning. You leave the house, Albert, and your pocket is a hundred-dollar bill. You start for a bank across town, a bank where no one knows you. You reach the bank, give the bill to one of the tellers. He looks at you, hard. Is there some suspicion in his glances? Is there, Albert? But he changes the bill, and you hurry out. 
you start for another bank blocks away. But before you get there, a newspaper headline catches your eye. You can't read it all, but two words make you start and turn pale. Bank robbery. You read as much as you can, but your lifelong miserliness doesn't let you spend a nickel for that paper. One phrase strikes your eye, marked money. Now you hurry home, the other bank is forgotten. You should take a taxi, but you don't think of it even though fives and tens are clutched in your pocket, the dampness from your hand making them a pulpy mess. Now you're home, safe. Crocky! I, I can't stop now, Mr. Kemp. Okay, so you can't stop, but don't you don't you want to know why this policeman is here? P- policeman? Where? Using the phone down the hall. It seems our good friend, Mr. Sedgwick, has some shady dealings. Sedgwick? Well, well yes, you see that. I, I gotta go to Carolyn. I, I went out to get some medicine. No, no, well, the, the law will wait, Mr. Crocky. The law will wait. Carolyn! Carolyn! Is, is, is the policeman gone, Albert? No, he ain't. I saw him coming down the street while I was looking out the window for you. I didn't say nothing. Then I heard the policeman and Mr. Campion talking. Now, you tell me what they were saying. I couldn't hear it good. I put my ear up against the door. I I couldn't hear nothing but low talk. Money, that's what he's here for. That's what he's here for. Where's the rest of it? Still in the fireplace. I'll get it. Are they going to arrest us, Albert? Oh, are they going to arrest us for taking the money from Sedgwick? Newspaper said it was marked. The bandit took marked money from the bank. The serial numbers was all wrote down. That Mr. Sedgwick must have stolen it. Now we got it. Oh, we we got to give it back. Here, here, take it. You're crazy. Then we got to admit we took it off Sedgwick. Sedgwick, he was a crook. We got to get rid of this money. Albert, what are you doing? Burning it. Oh! Let go of my arm. Let go of my arm. The fellow at the bank, he looked funny at me. He must have called the police when I left the bank. You're burning it. You're burning it. It's all burning. Shut up. Albert, Albert, you didn't have to hit me. You didn't have to hit me. Shh, quiet. Now, that's a policeman. You keep him away. Money's nearly gone. Then he can come in. Go ahead. Now, don't stand there like a fish. Go ahead. Who? Who? Who is it? Campion with a stout minion of the law. Name of... Um, Sergeant McCarthy. He says his name is McCarthy. Right. Just a couple of seconds more. Just a couple of seconds. I, I ain't dressed. Oh, come, 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 Mrs. Crocky. It's after ten. You were up early this morning. I heard you. Uh, it's done, Karen. Now you can let him in. Well, Albert and Carolyn... Your chase is won, isn't it? You thought it was your lucky night that your good friend Mr. Sedgwick lying dead in the alley would turn out to be a profitable investment after all. You thought you'd be able to stuff his money into your mattress with the rest of your hoard, didn't you? But there were too many strings attached to that $5,000. That's why you're relieved now as you watch the last of it smolder in the grate as the door opens to admit Sergeant McCarthy and Mr. Campion. Well, what is it, officer? What about Mr. Sedgwick? Well, when we found his body lying there in the alley, we had to find out where he was staying. That's why I'm here. Now, you say he's been living here, eh? Only for two days. Mm -hmm. We didn't know nothing about him. Well, of course, honest folks wouldn't. Uh, I had a record a yard long and more aliases than you could shake a stick at. As soon as I read about the bank robbery, I said to Carolyn, that Sedgwick is the kind of man who looks like a robber. Sedgwick Mm -hmm. a bank robber? Is that right, Sergeant? Oh, Lord, no, Mr. Campion. Small stuff with Sedgwick's line. Sneak even. Why, he'd sneak little stuff out of hotel rooms in boarding houses. Say, is there anything missing from here? Trinkets or some cash, eh? No, nothing we know of. Ah, good, good. No, Sedgwick was no bank robber. Uh, Besides, the bank robbery you read about is all cleared up. All the money's recovered. No, that's not right. Well, it's all in the morning papers. Uh, But Crocky's never buy newspapers, Sergeant McCarthy. Papers cost a whole nickel. Sedgwick had $5,000. 5000 Well, how do you know? He had it, we know. Not a penny on him when we found him. You say that he robbed hotels and boarding houses? Yes. Albert, Carolyn, did you by any chance keep money in your room here? Well, now, did you? The mattress! Here, the mattress! It's been slid open. Our savings, our own money. It's gone. You, you burned.
burned our money. Oh, you fool, you burned our own money. Our own. Cedric stole our money. We got it back just by luck. But you burned it. You burned our own money. All our savings. All those years of scrimping and saving. And you burned it. Our own money. Oh. In the animal world, there is the hunter and the hunted. Hound and fox, hawk and sparrow... Chicken and worm. But who is to judge precisely which is the pursuer or the pursued as we enter the chase? The chase was created for the National Broadcasting Company by Lawrence Clee. This story was by Russell Hughes. Heard in the cast were Virginia Payne, Arnold Moss, Martin Rudy, and Louis Van Ruten. The Chase is directed and transcribed by Fred Way. Fred Collins speaking. Next week, greed and avarice join the pursuit for a hidden fortune when you listen to The Million Dollar Chase. Tonight, meet the Veep on NBC. Yes, Roma wines taste better because only Roma selects from the world's greatest wine reserves for your pleasure. And now, Roma Wines, R-O-M-A, Roma Wines, present Suspense. Tonight, Roma Wines bring you Mr. Van Heflin in Three Blind Mice, a suspense play produced, edited, and directed for Roma Wines by William Spear. Suspense. Radio's Outstanding Theater of Thrills is presented for your enjoyment by Roma Wines. That's R-O-M-A. Roma Wines. Those better-tasting California wines enjoyed by more Americans than any other wine. For friendly entertaining, for delightful dining. Yes, right now, a glass full would be very pleasant, as Roma Wines bring you Van Heflin in a remarkable tale of... Suspense! Lockwood, Bentley, and Walsh Publishing. It still said it on the big brass nameplate. Going down. Oh, good evening, Mr. Lockwood. Good evening. Sure, the elevator operators were nice to me. Most of the office boys remembered to knock on my door before they came in. And even some of the stenographers still spoke to me. But everybody else above the rank of junior story reader knew it was just a question of time before that big brass nameplate in the lobby came down and another one went up in its place. Bentley and Walsh Publishing. No more Lockwood. If ever a man hated his partners, I did. Main force, Well, I went out of the building and across the street to the Savoy for dinner. Even the head waiter must have heard the rumor. He gave me the dime-sized table over in the corner that's generally reserved for out-of-town ribbon clerks. It's all right, Bob. There'll be another day. I'd gotten to coffee and dessert when I saw Helen Conover. Well, that just about summed it up. There were two things that I wanted in this world. To get my hands back on that corporation and Helen Conover. Well, she saw me and I waved to her and she waved back and started over to my table. She was head of our promotion department. She was smart and ambitious. And she could have personally modeled for any pinup art that you ever saw. But she was reserving anything along that line for my partner, Dick Walsh. Okay, sister. There'll be another day. Hello, Arthur. Dining alone? Yes. Yeah, it's a habit. That I could break it under the right conditions. Oh, but you're all finished. That's all right. Sit down. Just a big book publisher, got nothing to do. Well, if it's not against office regulations to have dinner with the boss. Regulations? <laughs> well, they never bothered you, now, did they? Now, Arthur, let's keep this clean. Does Madame wish to order? Yes, uh, the steak dinner, please. No soup and no potatoes. Very good, madam. Working kind of late, aren't you? Not working. Dick wanted me to see him off on the train. 
Train? Where's he going? Chicago. What for? Business, I suppose. Didn't he tell you? <laughs> you know, they never tell me anything anymore. Well, it wasn't anything very important, I guess. Well, I'd know even less if it had been. Maybe you can tell me about Sam. About Sam? Ah, did he get his report from the doctor? Oh, well, yes, he did, as a matter of fact. Uh, how is it? I'm afraid it's pretty bad. How bad? Well, it's his heart, all right. They don't give him much more time. Oh? Uh-huh. Six months at the most. Well, that means they'll have to work fast. Or I will. What? Wouldn't you say so? Arthur, I don't understand you. I've, I've just told you that one of your partners has only six months to live, and you don't even seem to care. Now, look, let's be grown up about it, at least. Sam Bentley and Dick Walsh have been trying to ease me out of the firm for the last year. Now Sam's going to kick off. Why should I care? You really hate him, don't you? Me? I don't hate anybody. I just hope he kicks off tonight instead of waiting six months and the Dick Walsh's train runs into the Hudson River, that's all. I don't hate anybody. I just wish they were dead. Oh, Arthur, how can you? What's the matter with that? I wish my partners were out of the way and you wish... Well, I know what you wish, too, only I'm honest about it and you're not. This isn't a very pleasant conversation. There's always a better one. For instance, what are you doing tonight? <laughs> I'm going home and get a good night's sleep for a day. Oh, uh, by the way, uh, how long is Dick going to be away? About a week. You'll be kind of lonely, won't you? I don't see why I should. Well, that's what I was thinking. You know, I've always had a sort of a yen for you, Helen. Why, Mr. Lockwood, why don't people tell me these things? Well, people don't have to tell people like you those things. <laughs> now that you mention it, I do seem to have noticed a sort of a leer every so often. Uh, that wasn't any leer, baby. That was the real McCoy. Look, Arthur, this may sound kind of corny, but I'm in love with Dick, and he's in love with me. Oh, it does. What? Sound corny. Why doesn't he marry you? You know why? Sure, that wife that won't divorce him. You know, he's been using that one for the last ten years. Please, Arthur, I'd rather not talk about it. Okay, okay. Not to change the subject, but um, what do you expect to get out of it? Get out of what? The reorganization, the big day when they kick old Arthur out of the firm. You think maybe they'll make you a vice president? I really don't know what you're talking about, Arthur. Well, you ought to think about it. Because you can never tell, I might be able to make you an even better proposition. I'm afraid I'm not interested in your propositions, Arthur. Any of them. Okay, baby. There'll be another day. It was mostly bluff, and she knew it. But there was one thing that she didn't know. There was a chance that my smart partners had actually been holding out on me. And if they had, the way our incorporation papers were drawn, then I could really nail them. Well, I'd been snooping through the files at night lately, and I'd already dug up a couple of things. And this night, I went back at it again. I let myself in through the side door of the building and walked up the two flights to the office. Everything was dark and deserted. I could barely make out the long lines of desks. And then I saw the light under Sam's door. Well, I crossed the office very quietly and listened. Hmm, nothing. I tapped on the door. Still nothing. So I opened it. And there was Sam. There was Sam, leaning back in his chair and staring at me with those cold and slightly protruding blue eyes, much the way he always did. Except, uh, tonight... There was a small hole in the right side of his head. And Sam Bentley was dead. The gun was lying on the carpet where it had fallen out of his hand. It was his, all right. I recognized it. His other hand had fallen against an open drawer of the desk and his wristwatch was broken. It had stopped at five after eight. And I picked up the phone to call the police. And then... I noticed him letter on his desk. It was addressed to Richard Walsh. Well, I put up the phone and looked at that letter. Then I opened it. Well, it was about what I figured. The doctor's report on his heart, the usual all-around apology, and then a detailed explanation of how Dick Walsh could use the corporate insurance to pay off Sam's family for his share of the business and then take it over himself because Sam didn't want me to have any part of it. The signature was a little scrawly, but it was Sam's all right. So there it was, the double cross. And yet, it's funny, but almost before I got through reading it, I knew the answer. I looked at that broken wristwatch of his again. Five after eight, it said. An hour later, I was home in bed, sleeping like a baby. Knowing that Dick Walsh, too, was going to die. 
I strolled into the office the next morning about ten just to be on the safe side. But, of course, they'd already found him. All over the office, there were little huddles that broke up furtively at my approach. Well, I played it for what it was worth and headed for the largest and most important huddle, the executive huddle outside of Sam's door. They were all there, including Helen Conover. And she was looking pretty sick. Well, what uh, uh, what is all just this? Just a minute. Uh, who are you? Oh, I'm Arthur Lockwood, also. Well, what's, what's all this about? Oh, uh, just wait here, please, Mr. Lockwood. Hey, what's going on here, anyway? Somebody robbed the till? Arthur. What? Arthur, it's, it's Sam. What? His heart? No, he's... He was shot. Shot? Arthur, the police say it's murder. Will you come in, please, Mr. Lockwood? Yes, certainly. The captain would like to see you again, too, please, Miss Conover. Oh, y- yes, all right. Well, we went in. Sam was still there. But by this time, somebody had thrown a towel over his face. A big gangling guy came across the room toward me with his hand out. Miss Lockwood? Yes. Captain Gibbons, homicide. Is... is that Sam, Sam Bentley? Yes. You know, it must be something of a shock to you, sir, but uh, I'm afraid I'm going to have to ask you a few questions. Oh, yes, of course. Please go right ahead. Know anybody to want to kill your partner, Mr. Lockwood? Are you sure it was... I mean, I mean, well, couldn't it have been suicide? Why would he want to kill himself? Well, uh, he's been pretty depressed lately. His health has been bad. Only yesterday he got a report from his doctor that he probably wouldn't live more than six months. No, won't hold, Mr. Lockwood. Not unless you figure that Bentley shot himself and then carried the gun into your other partner's office. Uh, that's Mr. Walsh, isn't it? Mr. Walsh? Yes. Does that surprise you? Why... Yes, it... Do you mean that you found the gun in, in Mr. Walsh's office? In the wall safe. How many people have the combination of that safe, Mr. Lockwood? Why, just the three of us, I think. The three partners. Uh, we each have a safe, but uh, somebody else has to have the combination, too, just in case... Uh, well, you, you know... If, uh... mm-hmm. Did you trust your partners, Mr. Lockwood? <clears throat> well, Captain, I'll be frank with you. There hasn't been a great deal of love lost between us lately, but... Uh... Yes, we, we trusted each other in our own way. Where were you at ten after seven, Mr. Lockwood? Oh, I was having dinner at the Savoy across the street. You can prove that, I suppose? Yes, of course. As a matter of fact, Miss Conover here came over and later and joined me. Mm-hmm. I understand Miss Conover was seeing your other partner, Mr. Walsh, off on the 735 for Chicago. Yes, so she told me, yes. Mm-hmm. Yes. You're sure of the train time? Yes, of course. Well, it's the one Dick Walsh always takes to Chicago. Well, why this interest in time? Have you set the time of the uh, of, uh, of when it happened? Bentley's watch was broken. It stopped at ten after seven. Oh. oh. Uh, either of you see this before? What? Where, where did that come from? Recognize it? Yes, of course. That's uh, that's Mr. Walsh's watch charm. He keeps losing it. He loses it all the time. No, yeah, yes, he does. We found it in the chair behind Bentley's body. Behind? Oh, now, wait a minute, Captain. You don't seriously mean to suggest that... How does it add up to you? Well, I, I mean that, that watch charm doesn't mean anything. It's true that he did lose it all the time, but he could have lost it in here any time. Not in a chair, Mr. Lockwood. It wouldn't stay there very long, not without being found. Oh, Captain, there must be some mistake. There must be. Uh, You can go now, Miss Conover. Uh, But please. I said you could go now, Miss Conover. Come on in, Helen. I guess that's it, Harry. I guess it is. Better call Chicago and issue a warrant. Richard Leonard Walsh. Suspicion of murder. No! All right, all right. It's nothing now. She's just fainted. For suspense, Roma Wines are bringing you Van Heflin in Three Blind Mice. Roma Wines' presentation tonight in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. Between the acts of Suspense, this is Ken Niles for Roma Wines. Next time you have friends over in the evening, try this simple, gracious way to add warmth to their welcome. Serve delicious Roma California Sherry, Port, or Muscatel. Delightful with cheese, nuts, cake, or any tasty snack. You're sure to please every guest with better-tasting Roma wines. For Roma wines are favorites from coast to coast, enjoyed by more Americans than any other wine. The reason? Roma wines taste better, because Roma starts with choicest grapes. Because Roma, with patient skill and America's finest winemaking resources, 
guides these naturally finer grapes unhurriedly to tempting taste perfection. Because Roma then places this luscious grape treasure with Roma wines of years before to await selection from the world's greatest reserves of fine wines for your pleasure. So insist on Roma, R-O-M-A, Roma wines, made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. And now, Roma Wines bring back to our Hollywood soundstage Van Heflin as Arthur Lockwood, with Kathy Lewis as Helen Conover in Three Blind Mice, a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. The defendant will rise and face the court. Does uh, the defendant wish to make a statement before a sentence is passed? If not, we will proceed. Richard Leonard Walsh, having been tried and found guilty of the murder of Samuel Bentley in the first degree, you are hereby remanded to the custody of the warden of the state penitentiary, where at such time as the state shall deem appropriate, you will be executed in the manner prescribed by the law. It's a nice, easy way of mercy. getting along in the publishing business, if you're lucky. One of your partners commits suicide. You rig the evidence to frame the other partner for his murder. Net result, a new firm, Arthur Lockwood Incorporated. Arthur Lockwood being me. Of course, there were the usual appeals and the thing dragged on, but that didn't worry me. I had other things to think about. And number one on that list was Helen Conover. But there, I'll admit, I was surprised because Dick knew that he'd been framed and must have suspected me, and Helen was supposed to be in love with Dick. Well, I played it very carefully. The paternal approach, the sorrowing friend, dinner in the theater and stuff like that. But never a word, never a wrong word or gesture. And then one night, about a week before Dick Walsh was scheduled to be executed, I'd just brought Helen home from a sedate little tour of some of our most upper-crust hot boxes. And we were at her apartment. Oh, this swell evening, Arthur. You've been awfully sweet to me. Well, it's the least I can do, Helen. Oh, you mustn't feel that way, Arthur. What way? That you... That you sort of owe me something. Owe oh, you something? Well, why should I? It's just that I, I know how you feel. I wonder and, uh... if you do. Well, yes, I think so. You've been awfully brave about it, but I... I think I know. Arthur, once you said that something I said was corny. Remember? Yes, I remember. Well, it was. It wasn't even true. You weren't... You weren't in love with him? Afraid I'm a pretty heartless little girl, Arthur. I'm afraid I love myself too much to be really in love with anybody. Well, that's not heartless. That's just honest. You know that... That he's to be executed next week, don't you? Yes. Well, then he's not much good to me now, is he? Even if he did want to marry me. Oh. Now you know I'm heartless. And cold-blooded and cruel. I ought to. But I don't. No. No, I don't have to be that way. I can be other ways. What other ways? Like this. Helen. Helen. Well, that was that. I didn't care about anything after that, even marriage. We made a quick trip down to Virginia where names in the publishing business wouldn't mean a thing, even ours. And it was all very quiet. No publicity, no fuss, nothing. When we got back, we took a little place in the East Fifties. Although, of course, she kept her apartment, I kept mine. It had to be that way for a while, at least until after Dick's execution and the things had cooled down a bit. Well, I knocked off early at the office that day, for the looks of the thing. And Helen was already home when I got there. Oh, you're home early, aren't you, darling? Any particular reason? No, no, no particular reason. Penny, for your thoughts, darling. My thoughts? Oh, nothing special. I guess I was just thinking, I don't know. That I know. What? You were thinking about Dick. He's going to die tonight. Well, maybe I was, I don't know. Well, I'm glad you did come home anyway, darling, because I wanted to have a little talk with you. Sure, um, sure, about what? You really shouldn't let it bother you, you know. Let what bother me? The execution. Why should it bother me? He killed a man, didn't he? Why should I worry about what the law does to him? Are you so sure, Arthur? 
So sure of what? So sure that he did kill a man? Well, right then it hit me. That all the time I'd been thinking how slick everything was, something was wrong, terribly wrong. That all this time she'd been playing with me like a smart young cat with a silly, blind old mouse. Three mice, and one of them dead, and another with them as good as dead, and I was left. All the evidence and everything. Wasn't like Dick to do a thing like that. You, uh, you don't think he killed him? Arthur, do you remember, oh, it was a long time ago, you asked me what I expected to get out of it? If Sam and Dick squeezed you out of the firm. Yeah, I remember. And you said you might have a better proposition? Yeah. Well, I've decided what I want. Well, sure. You really want to be a vice president. We can fix that easy enough, although I, I sort of had the idea that you'd be pulling out after a while now that we're married. <laughs> You're priceless. <laughs> no, I'm afraid a vice presidency isn't at all what I have in mind. And I don't know where you got the idea that I'd be pulling out of the firm, ever. All right. What do you want? I want a full partnership, Arthur. A partnership? Yes. Is that so strange? Well, we are partners now, in a way. You're my wife. No. I mean a real partnership. A corporate partnership. Look, Helen, you're asking me out of a clear sky to give you a half a share in a million-dollar business. Yes. Well, I... Uh, that'll take some thinking about. Yes. I suppose it will. I was saying... It was strange about that evidence. For, for instance, there was the letter. What letter? The letter that was on Sam's desk when he killed himself. It disappeared. You must be crazy. Am I? Uh, what about the wristwatch? When he died, it said five after eight. But when they found him, it said ten after seven. And the gun. It was lying on the carpet by his hand, but somehow it got into Dick's wall safe. You knew all that, and you let an innocent man go to the chair? Oh, oh, really? Oh, Arthur, you are priceless. I let an innocent man go to the chair? You know, of course, that a wife can't testify against her husband. Oh, no. No, a wife can't be forced to testify against her husband, but she can if her conscience... Uh... All right. What do you want? I thought I'd mentioned it. The partnership. I see. Now, you're not going to be unreasonable about it, are you, darling? No, Helen. I'm not going to be unreasonable. You know, darling, I was thinking. We ought to rearrange the office space. She'd even turned her back on me now. Knock out those she was gazing out of the window, dreaming up the future. Her future, just the way she'd I planned it. I couldn't guess how she knew. She must have been hiding somewhere and seen me, but that didn't matter much now. I only knew that I was right back where I'd started from. The business slipping out of my hands and someday, no business and no Helen. I had to think fast and act fast. There was a bronze statuette on the end table. I picked it up and hefted it. It was just about right. So I stepped over behind her. Of the officers then will be just exactly the same. Except for that... Darling, you won't mind that, will you, darling? Uh -oh. I hit her hard, but not too hard. Because this was one suicide that was going to come off right. I carried her out to the kitchen and propped her up in the chair in front of the kitchen table. And then I went into the bathroom and got some towels. That wouldn't leave any marks. And I tied her hands and feet and gagged her. So that even if she did come to in a few minutes, it wouldn't matter. All I had to do was come back in a couple of hours and put the towels away and make everything look just as natural as I could. It was a risk those two hours, and I knew it. The whole thing was a risk. But it was the best I could do. I looked at her once more before I left. She hadn't moved a muscle. And then I turned on the gas. By the time I got back to my apartment, I was shaking all over. This time, I had really killed somebody. But why would anybody connect me with it, I told myself. Why would anybody think it was anything but suicide? She had the motive this day of all days. Everybody knew that she was in love with Walsh. And even if her marriage to me came out, 
the motive would still hold. And then the, the doorbell rang, and I jumped a foot. At first, I wasn't going to answer it, and then I, I thought I'd better. Whoever it was would establish that I was here at home and that I could brush them off before I had to leave. Hello, Mr. Lockwood. Busy? Why, uh, no, uh, Captain Gibbons. No, no, come right in. Thanks. Right in here, please. Have a seat. Uh-huh. Uh, cigar? Thanks. Hmm, pretty good cigar. You must be doing pretty well for yourself nowadays. <laughs> uh, <laughs> better let me light it myself. You, uh, seem kind of nervous. Well, you know how it is. I mean, um, today the... Oh, uh, you mean your partner Walsh going to the hot seat? I try not to think about it, but, uh, well... It... Yeah, he'll be sitting down there pretty soon now. Pretty soon. They say it doesn't hurt. I don't know. Do you ever see one? Look, do we have to talk about it? <laughs> Makes you feel kind of bad, eh? <laughs> I wouldn't wonder. Why did you do it, Lockwood? Do what? Frame him. I... I don't know what you're talking about. Sure you do. You changed the time, stashed the gun, tore up the suicide note. In fact, as I was saying, you framed him. No, Walt killed him. You you know he did. He was convicted of killing him. All the evidence was that he killed him. Oh, sure. Walt killed him, all right. What? Walt killed him. He told us he did. Just today. But it was... Uh... Say, look, what is this? Walsh killed him and framed it to look like suicide. Then you came along and pinned it back on Walsh where it belonged in the first place. He gave us a full confession just this afternoon. Then, uh, then you... So, I don't know whether we ought to thank you for making it easy for us or try to pin a rap on you. But the DA is willing to let it go, so it's all right with me. He, uh, wants a statement, though. Oh, sure. Sure, anything, anything you say. Uh, by the way, uh, what about that dame? <gasps> what? What dame? Well, the one in your office that was supposed to be sweet on Walsh. We want her the worst way. You... Why? Accessory to murder. She was in it up to her ears. Yeah. So that was it. Walsh spilled the whole That's thing. how she'd known, and I'd taken my life in my hand for something. nothing. She was up there dying right now. I was murdering her while Gibbons sat there risking my life to do something that the law would have done for me. Maybe it still wasn't too late, but Gibbons just sat there talking and talking and talking. Uh, well, you, uh, you just go down there to the DA's office and give him that statement, eh? Sure, sure. T uh, tomorrow, the very first thing. You know, uh, you sure are a heel, Lockwood. But you're a lucky heel. <laughs> Ten blocks away, I didn't dare take a cab. I didn't dare even run for fear that somebody would see me and remember in case it was too late. But by the time I got there, I was gasping for breath, so I'd, so I'd run every step. So I let myself in, the smell of gas hit me just like a brick wall. I put my handkerchief over my face and rushed into the kitchen. I threw open the window, shut off the gas. She was sitting there just as I left her. Well, I got her up on the table. And I, I dragged it over toward the window. I got the gag out of her mouth and I began working her arms. Artificial respiration. I knew that much. I worked over by that window until the sweat was running down my face. But I couldn't tell. I couldn't tell yet. The towels that I'd tied her feet with were still there, but I, I didn't bother with them or anything else. I just kept working over up and down, up and down, as though... Yes, as though my life depended on it. It did. I'm afraid you're too late, Lockwood. Huh? I'm afraid your wife is dead. He was a smart cop, that Gibbons. He knew a lot. He says now he's pretty sure it doesn't hurt. The electric chair, I mean. Well, tonight I'm going to find out. Suspense. Presented by Roma Wines, R-O-M-A, Roma, America's favorite wine. 
Well, this is Ken Niles bringing back to our microphone the distinguished star of tonight's suspense play, Van Heflin. Van, you played the part of a publisher tonight. How about publishing a few tips on Roma wines? Well, with wine like Roma, Ken, all you need to do is publish the facts. Well, uh, fact number one is that Roma, America's greatest vintner, has asked me to present you with this basket of Roma wines for your wonderful performance tonight. Well, that's a very good beginning, Ken. My... My thanks to you and to Roma. A fact number two, Van, is that your friends will enjoy the Roma California Sherry in your gift basket. For golden amber fragrant Roma Sherry with tempting nut-like taste is the perfect first call to dinner. The ideal wine for entertaining any time. Right, Ken. But tell the people why Roma Sherry is so good. Give them the facts, my boy, the facts. <laughs> all right, you are, Professor Heflin. Fact number three, Roma Sherry, like all Roma wines, begins with California's choicest grapes. Then Roma vintners, with America's finest winemaking resources, guide these select grapes unhurriedly to tempting taste perfection and place them with Roma wines of years before. Later, Roma selects from this vast taste treasure the world's greatest wine reserves for your pleasure. Ken, you're hired. Thank you, and good night. Van Heflin may currently be seen in Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer's Technicolor musical Till the Clouds Roll By with Van Johnson, Judy Garland, and Frank Sinatra. Tonight's suspense play was written by Kenneth Pettis and Robert Richards. Next Thursday, same time, you will hear Mr. Glenn Ford as star of Suspense. Produced and directed by William Spear for the Roma Wine Company of Fresno, California. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. National Broadcasting Company invites you by transcription to join the chase. There is always the hunter and the hunted, the pursuer and the pursued. It may be the voice of authority or a race with death and destruction, the most relentless of the hunters. There are times when laughter is heard as counterpoint and moments when sheer terror is the theme. But always there is the chase. Taxi, mister? Where to? 81 and 5th? Traffic's murder, ain't it? And New York ain't a town no more. It's an open-air garage. Being a hacky these days like running Wind Place and showing the rat race. Why do I do it? <laughs> he asked me why. I'm falling apart from trying to figure that one out for myself. He's asking me why. You don't know what I got to put up with sometimes, mister. You don't know what kind of screwball life this hack run can turn out to be. You want to hear a story, mister? A yarn you ain't going to believe? Started right here in this cab, so help me. Right where you're sitting now. I still shake like jelly when I think about it. The hairs on the back of my neck stick out like pins in the cushion. I was driving across town that afternoon between Park and Madison when I'm flagged by a dame who's loaded down with mink so deep she can hardly breathe. She got rocks on her fingers, rocks on her ears. But the biggest hunk eye she's wearing is a diamond and emerald bracelet that almost blinds me on the spot. She raises her arm to flag me down. Where to, lady? 1153-69. You're practically there right now. Well, she flounces back in the seat, mister, while I move in the gear. And a little later, as I stop for a light, I take a look see through my rearview mirror. She's a fancy dish. No getting away from it. Now, where's that mink and rock candy trimming? She looks like a Christmas tree with 50-carat lights. She's strictly from the upper crust, mister. But I ain't no snob. So I make a little conversation, past time of day, like I do with all my passengers. Nice day, ain't it, lady? Wonderful. It almost smells like spring. 
You know, it's days like this. That... Hey, where you think you're driving, stupid bum? I got half a mind to kick your jackass ears in. Are you old crumb bums ought to get your license provoked? Revoked. Uh, oh, yeah. I'm sorry I blew my top just now, lady. I forgot you was in the cab. It's quite all right. I think your outburst was rather colorful. Yeah? Uh, my house is just in the middle of this block, driver. The white stone townhouse on the left. Gotcha, lady. Now, wait till I stop, lady, before you start to get out. How much do I owe you? Uh, it's uh, 55 cents on the clock. Here's a dollar. Keep the change. Thanks, mm -hmm. lady. What a doll. That should only happen to me. Well, it's getting around to six, mister, so I pass up another fare and drive west to Mike's Super Diner. Put on a feed bag. Find myself a parking spot near eight. As I lock my ignition and start to slide out, there's something lying on the seat in the back. Hits me in the eye like a night beacon at LaGuardia. It's the emerald and diamond bracelet the mink coat was wearing. Looking even twice as big as it did on her arm. I jump in back and see that the catch is busted, so it must have slipped right off her wrist as she was getting out. Next thing you know, I'm driving back across town like crazy and drooling just a little maybe when I'm thinking of the fat reward. I find the house without no trouble. Joint was the size of a railroad station. And as I'm ringing the bell, I'm already spending the C note. She's sure to hand the ice man for bringing back the ice. Yes? I remember me, lady? No. Well, sure, you remember. I drove you home about half an hour ago. I'm not hacking... What do you want? Well, take it easy, lady. I got some good news for you. About your bracelet. My what? The rock she was wearing. <laughs> you lost it in my cab. Here. Look. What does the man want, Diana? Uh, I haven't the slightest idea. This is your bracelet, lady. Don't you recognize it? No. I never saw that bracelet before in all my life. Lady, listen. And that goes for you, too. Well, mister, you can imagine how I felt. When I showed her the bracelet, she looked at me like I was something that crawled out from under a stone. And she slams the door in my face without taking it from my hand. I meet lots of screwballs in this business, mister, but this was the dilly that took the cake. Well, I drive back west again. Slow this time. Trying to get the pebbles out of my brain. And I think I hit on an answer. The rocks are phony, Nadge. They ain't worth more than five bucks on the line. She don't want it back from me because she ain't parting with no rewards. Anyway, this is what I keep telling myself. Even though it don't sound right. So I walk into Mike's diner and find the seat next to Harry Potts. Another hacky, I know. Uh, and Adam and Eve on a raft, Mike, with Frenchies on the side. Uh, pass the ketchup, mister. Well, look who's here, Artie Spade in person. Hiya, Harry. Uh, uh, how goes it on the street? I took in enough to make a pay today. And I also met the daffiest dame in town. Oh, you got to prove them words, mister. But with the dizzy numbers, I get hooked up with all day long. Oh, this one was the topper. All dressed up in phony rocks, she leaves laying around in my cab. Uh, what kind of phony rocks? A cheap kind, jerk. Like this. Hey, let me see that. Wouldn't even take it back. And she gives me a song and dance, but... but well, what are you gaping at? You said these rocks were phony. I said. Well, you're off your nut. What? This bracelet's on the level, chump. How do you know, Harry? Wasn't I a jewelry salesman before I drove a hack? This chain ain't only legit, my friend, but it's worth at least a half a million bucks. You're kidding me. Do I look like I'm kidding? Well, don't con me, Harry. This might be serious. Who's laughing? She wouldn't take it back, I tell you. She wouldn't take it back? She just slammed the door in my kisser. If that thing was real, is that normal way to act? Definitely, positively, no. And what gives? Ready? Maybe it's hot. Hot? Maybe she's afraid to touch it because she lifted it somewheres. She might be one of those klepto, klepto, kleptocardiacs. It could be. In which case, there must be a reward. For me, sweetheart. Give me them rocks. What are you going to do with them? Take it to the cops? And let them get the reward? Well, they turn it over to me. Suppose they don't believe your story. I don't get you. Well, look at it this way. A hacky walks in with half a million in jewelry. 
Maybe he lifted it himself, then got worried about passing it to a fence. The loot's too big, see? He might get fingered. So he brings it back as if he found it to collect a reward, and they, they slap him in the cooler. And there's another angle. Yeah? Maybe the dame's a lush. She didn't look it, but maybe she was pie-eyed when I showed up at the door. And so she says the chain ain't hers, and later she sobers up and yells she's been robbed. You're in a pickle, pal. Well, what are you so happy about? Who's happy? My heart is bleeding for you. So what are you going to do? I'm taking it back to the dame. Again? I'm going to find out what gives if it's the last thing I do. Well, good luck, Hacky. Because <laughs> it might be. So off I go again, mister, back across town. Park my hack in front of the house once more. By this time it's dark, see, and the street is kind of quiet. Just as quiet as the house was when I walked up and pressed the bell. Oh, come on. I must have rung that bell till my finger wore out. But I got no answer. Then just as I'm about to turn around and take a chance with the nearest flat foot, I notice the door's open. Just an inch. So, like the fat head I am, I walk right in. First room is the size of Madison Square Garden with an extra row of seats. And I'm walking through what looks like the public library when something hits me hard. It's feeling I get that everything ain't copacetic in this joint. I better lay up fast. So I turn around and hurry out again to where my cab is parked in front of the door. But as I start to get inside, I see the Damon Mink is sitting in the back. Where'd you come from, lady? Well, what are you staring at me like that for? I come back here to show you that bracelet again, and I... Hey, lady. Her eyes were wide open like two wet oysters. For a second, she seemed to sway, and then she tumbled over to the floor of the cab. I saw the glint of a ten-inch knife sticking right out of her back. Lady! Holy smoke, she's been croaked. And maybe she ain't dead yet. Maybe I can get her to a hospital on time. If you ever drove, Artie, start driving now. Stop! W w w what's the idea, Miss? Don't move this car, you filthy, thieving murderer. Murderer? Oh, me? You killed my wife. Oh, stop pointing that gun at me, mister. Mike, go on. I'd like to finish you right here, but you're not worth the bullet. I'll turn you over to the police instead and let them give you the chair. Oh, wait a minute, mister. You got this all wrong. She was sitting inside my cab when I walked over here. I, I didn't touch her, so help me. No. What's this in your pocket? Hey, let go of me. Her bracelet, eh? So that's why you knifed a poor, defenseless woman for a fortune in gems. No, I found that bracelet. I, I was here before. you got to believe me, mister. I, I'm no crook. There's a police I... station four blocks west of here. You'll drive there directly, you understand, with me in the back. And if you make one false move, I'll... Come back here! Come back and I'll shoot! I jammed my foot on the gas and ducked my head as he took two pot shots... But I was around the corner and nothing flat. For a second, I felt so relieved it was like walking on a cloud. And my stomach went right down to my arches when I remembered that I was driving away with a stiff in my car. What's the matter? What's who's, who's at the door? Me, Harry. Artie Spade. Come in. Artie Spade. Well, for the love of Mike, a fine time. And I take a social call. Come in. All right, all right. Keep your shirt on. I'm coming. <laughs> what happened to you? Me? You look like a fugitive from a slab in a morgue. Shut the door and lock it. Huh? Shut the door. What gives with you, anyway? Harry, are you my friend? Oh, this is a fine time of night to ask oh, Answer that. me. Are you my pal or ain't you? Sure, sure. Any day in a week, Artie. And you got to help me. Help you what? Listen, you remember that bracelet? Remember it? Who can forget a haul like that? What do you mean, haul? You sound like I lifted it. I didn't say anything about lifting it. Well, what's your language? What's the matter with you? You got marbles in your skull or something? I took the bracelet back like I told you I wouldn't. You know what happened? What? 
I found a stiff in my car. Stiff? A dame with a knife in her back. No, 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 no. Wait a minute, Artie. You, 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 let's get this straight. What are you backing away like that for? You say you found a dame in your cab with a knife in it. What dame? The dame who owned the bracelet. Uh, where's the bracelet now? Her husband took it. Her uh, husband? He tried to hold me up and run me in for murder, but I got away. I'm half nuts now, Harry. This thing's driving me to knock my head against the wall. We got to do something. We? Sure, you and me. We're pals, ain't we? Yeah, yeah, we're pals. Look, the first thing I got to do is get rid of the evidence. Yeah, what evidence? The stiff. Where is she? Still in my cab. Where's your cab? It's parked in front of your door. Well, we'll go... My door? Well, don't you see, Harry? The, this guy, her husband, got me in a spot. Everything looks as if I conquer for the rocks. I gotta have time to clear myself. Oh. Well, I don't know, but I'll find a way. You sure her husband took that bracelet from you, Artie? I told you, didn't I? Stop wasting time. Get dressed. Let's get out of here. Where are we going? I've got to get rid of the cab with the dame in it. I'm supposed to help you do that? You said you would. You go back on your word oh, no, and no, I... no, no, don't get excited. No, no, Artie, I'll come through. Wait here. Where are you going? Thought I heard somebody listening at the door. You stay put. I'll have a look at the hall. I waited a couple of seconds, and, and I thought I heard the sound of dialing just outside. I remember there was a hall phone out there, so I walked over to the door, poked my head out carefully, and listened. Operator, get me the police, quick. It's an emergency. He was crossing me. I had to move fast. And there was a fire escape outside his bedroom window. Two minutes later, I was back in my hack on my way uptown. You know what it's like to drive a corpse around, mister? My skin still crawls when I think of it. I kept off the main streets while I tried to think of an angle. Then I got myself a brainstorm. I figured I'd park the cab in front of the city morgue and beat it. The street was empty when I stopped my cab. I was just about to get out and make a run for it. When I get myself a fare, I didn't ask for it. Frank Taxi! Uh-huh. What? Taxi! Yes, yes. Well, you're free, aren't you? <laughs> free as a breeze in the trees. No, not, not now, mister. Uh, not now? No. What's the matter now? It's now or never. Now. Let me see. Well, where's the one to go to? Oh, look. Why, why don't you go home? Uh, hey. That's it. That's exactly where I want to go, Hacky. Home, sweet home. Now, let me see. Where do I live? What for the don't love of Michael? Don't prompt me, I tell you. Don't prompt me. I, I'm going to remember in a minute. You watch. Park Avenue, huh? No. No, it ain't Park Avenue. I ain't rich enough for Park Avenue. How about it, uh, Lexington? Lexington sounds good. You take me to Lexington. Uh... Hey. Hey, you uh, you already got a fair. I you told know? you I was busy. Hey, what's, what's the matter with her? Is she drunk or something? Well, was she lying on the floor? Yeah, like? yeah, she's uh, drunk. She's drunk. Huh? You shouldn't drink if you can't hold your liquor. Yeah. Let me help the little lady to her. Face. Don't touch her. Hey, hey, this, this lady, she ain't drunk. <laughs> hey, she's dead. Police! Help! Ah, police! <laughs> Well, mister, by this time, I don't mind telling you, Artie Spade was just about through. I was going hot and cold all over. I felt like I had a fever of 105. But something held me together. Almost like it was in a dream, I found myself driving up the West Side Highway in a Henry Hudson onto the Merritt Parkway. Merritt Parkway? Holy smoke, what was I going to Connecticut for? A weekend? It was bad enough the New York cops was probably looking for my scalp that I have to bring in another state. So I turned around and started packing. As I hit the Hudson Parkway once more, I remembered I had a gas meter I forgot to look at. I was out of gas, mister. In the middle of nowhere. <laughs> Having a little trouble, chum? I, I, I'm just run out of gas. Oh, hop in. I'll give you a lift to the nearest station. Well, come on.
Uh, thanks. Happy, huh? Yeah. You guys kill me. Did you ever read your gas gauge? Uh, my uh, gauge was busted, mister. Uh, what's your name? Artie Sp uh, Smith. Oh, that's Gallagher. Glad to know you, Mr. Gallagher. Why? Oh, just as I'm... I don't pay any attention to me. It's my business got me loco. I'm a cop. You're a what? Private cop. A shamus, a private eye, a house stick with an overcoat. Don't you ever listen to the radio? Sure. Lots of times. Those guys kill me. Always running around solving murders. It's getting so I can't move out of my house without somebody coming up to me and asking, where's the corpse? Yeah. Must be tough. Yeah. You want to know something? Why? I never solved a murder in my life. No? And I never saw a corpse. No? Did you? No. You know what my specialty is? Why? Finding lost dogs. Yeah? You bet, buddy. And some of those Richie dames pay a fancy fee when Fido don't come home, you know. Oh, here's your gas station. Thanks. I, I'll get out now. Uh, wait a minute, wait a minute. It's closed for the night. Oh, I, I'd rather get out here if it's all the same to you. Why? Well, I, I just think that... Anyway, maybe... uh, heck, yeah, there isn't another station within six or eight miles, so you might as well come with me. Now, to get back to that uh, Shamus business, one of these days I'm going to meet a radio script writer and I'm going to bust every... He talked, mister. I listened. And the nearer we got to town, the more I started to sweat. We finally hit the West Side Drive again and... He turned off from Washington Heights. Then he stopped for a light on a corner. I started to get out. Where are you going? Oh, I'm getting out here, Mr. Gallagher. Why? Why? Yeah, why? There's no gas station. Close the door. Well, well I, I figured it maybe... Statewide manhunt for lady killer. Hey, boy, boy. Yeah, 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 Mr. Here's the time. Keep the chain. Well, thank you, sport. Extra, extra, extra. Hack driver. One is for me. Hack driver. Hack driver. Hey, what did you say your first name was? Uh, Herman. Herman, my foot. You said it was Artie, and the guy they're looking for is... Hey, come back here! Stop that man! Well, mister, how, how long can you run, huh? I felt like I'd been chased from pillar to post for as long as I could stand it. But every time I thought of the hot seat, I always found a little extra energy somewhere to keep me going. I wandered around till 3 a.m., keeping off the big streets and trying to work out a plan. But nothing come to me. Then I remembered I had 300 bucks stashed away in my furnished room. It was all the money I ever saved. But it was enough to get on a cattle boat or something and end up in Tibet. So I walked over to my house, sneaked carefully up the stairs, with an eye open for any cops who might be posted. You are the spade? Who are you? My name's Ethel LaFrance. My stage name, that is. How'd you get my room? I walked in. The door was open. Oh, don't worry. There ain't any cops around. They had one posted outside about an hour ago, but he was called off. And they figured you wouldn't come back home. You know all about me, then. I know you're in Dutch. And I want to help you. Why? Because you didn't kill my friend. Your friend? Diana Carlyle. We were in the chorus together a couple of years ago... Before she married Kirk Carlisle, a millionaire. A guy who tried to pull me in before. Listen, you're just a patsy in this setup. And I want to square accounts for Diana. She told me once that she was living on a volcano. And that if anything ever happened to her, I should look inside her jewel box, underneath the second layer. A jewel box? Look, I don't know any more than I'm telling you. All I know is that this whole bracelet business they're talking about in the papers is a phony. Diana was... Scared of her life long before she ever rode in your hat. Oh, lady, those words are the nicest I ever heard since my old lady told me I was the smartest kid in the block. Frankly, you look like a dope to me. Oh, but I want to see you get a break. Especially, I want the heel that killed poor Diana to, to get what's coming to him. You know, Diana might have left some evidence inside that jewel box. Find it. And maybe you'll have an out. Suppose we told that to the cops. Oh, not me, brother. Oh, I don't want to get mixed up in this thing, no how. Or I would have gone to them myself. And if you go to the cops, and if whatever's supposed to be in their jewel box don't happen to be there, you're a dead herring. That's right. Well, how am I going to find out? Well, I can tell you where she kept the box. 
It's in the lower bureau drawer in a bedroom. The first door on the left on the second story as you go up the stairs. Why, husband might be there. Well, that's your worry. But my guess is he wasn't home all night. The papers said he was combing the city with the cops looking for you. If I only had a house key. You may not need one. There's a door in the back, the service entrance. Might be open. Take a chance anyway. Sure. What have I got to lose? Lose? Nothing. But you got something to gain, mister. A slug in your head if her husband catches you. Well, I've done my bit. I'm going home and get some shut eye. So long, Artie. Don't take any wooden kimonos. Twenty minutes later, I was trying to back door to Miss Carlyle's house. I almost fainted with happiness when I found it was open. Walking like a cat, I went upstairs to the first floor on the left, the second story. I lit a match, found a bureau, then I opened up the bottom drawer, saw the box. I lifted the lid, pulled out the upper layer, saw some letters. Then my match went out. I felt inside the box again, grabbed the papers, stuffed them in my pocket. As I turned around to move out in a hurry, somebody switched the lights on. Welcome. Hello, Mr. Carlyle. So you had the temerity to come back. Why, well, I, I, I just... And for what? Another attempt at theft, eh? You've been at my wife's jewel box. No, I didn't take anything. You're going to turn me over to the police? The police? <laughs> Don't be ridiculous. What are you going to do? What does any self-respecting man do when he catches his wife's murderer inside his house? Don't you move. I still have my revolver, you see. Yeah, I see. <laughs> Killed in a second attempt to rifle his victim's home. That's what the headline will say. What could be neater? You mean you're going to shoot me? Yes. Uh, but before I do, however, I think there's something you ought to know, Hacky. What, Mr. Carlyle? I'm aware of the fact that you didn't kill my wife or even steal her bracelet. You are? You are completely innocent, you poor, misunderstood slob. And why are you going to kill me? For a very good reason. You see, I killed Diana myself. You say that again, mister. Only slower this time? I said I killed her myself. And do you know why? Why? You remember that bracelet she lost? Well, it was given to her by another man. That's why she refused to identify it when you brought it back. I was right there. Oh. Later, I killed her. That was just before you stupidly returned. I saw your cab parked outside, so I carried her body out, placed it in your hack, and waited for you. <laughs> Amusing, isn't it? Yeah, I'm laughing myself to death. Truer words were never spoken, my friend. And now I'll take care of you. Drop the heat, yeah, What? Drop it or I'll ventilate you. Mr. Gallagher. Huh? How do you like my dialogue, Artie? You think those radio guys are the only ones who can put words together? <laughs> I thought I'd do a little investigating on my own, Artie, just to see if I could crack a murder case. <laughs> For crying out loud, I did! Well, mister, that was all there was to it. What with Mr. Gallagher's spiel about what he heard Carlyle say and those letters in my pocket, I was a free man once again. Uh, the letters? Oh, they mentioned that Miss Carlyle was in love with another guy and that if something happened to either him or her, the cops should question her husband. Carlyle himself was tagged for a murder rap and... Oh, hey, here's your street, mister. 81 and 5th. That's a dollar by the clock. Hope you enjoyed the ride. Ah, oh, thanks, mister. Take it easy when you cross the streets now. Hey, uh, mister, did you take a good look at your seat before you left the cab? Make sure you got everything you stepped in with, mister? Because I don't want nobody, but nobody, leaving nothing behind. In the animal world, there is the hunter and the hunted. Hound and fox, hawk and sparrow, cat and mouse. But who is to judge precisely which is the pursuer or the pursued as we enter the chase? The 
Chase was created and written for the National Broadcasting Company by Lawrence Klee. Heard in the cast were Kermit Murdoch, Ellen Gerald, Chuck Webster, Stotts Cotsworth, Pauline Drake, and Ed Peck. The Chase is directed and transcribed by Ed King. Fred Collins speaking. Next week, a man tries to elude Cupid's deadly arrows aimed by a predatory female on the chase. This is Red Cross Month. Did you know that in the Far East alone, hundreds of experienced Red Cross workers are serving our fighting men in Korea and Japan? These skilled workers and the personal services they provide must continue. A generous check to your local Red Cross chapter is your contribution toward this great work. Answer the call today with your heart. invites you by transcription to join the chase. There's always the hunter and the hunted, the pursuer and the pursued. It may be the voice of authority or a race with death and destruction, the most relentless of the hunters. There are times when laughter is heard as counterpoint and moments when sheer terror is the theme. Always there is the chase. Attention, attention all patrols. Tri-State Penitentiary reports the escape of three convicts at 4.07 this morning. Description follows. John Partridge, alias Dippy Ridge. Six feet, three inches tall, weight 195 pounds, age 31, brown hair, blue eyes. Identifying marks, broken nose, three teeth missing from uptalks with slight lisp. Anthony Pike, alias the Angel, five feet, eight inches tall, weight 185 pounds, age 36, bald, gray eyes. Identifying marks, scar running from left cheekbone to jaw has tick in right eye. Michael Spade, 5 feet 10 inches tall, weight 165 pounds, age 38, black hair, brown eyes. Identifying marks, pock marks on face. Last seen in stolen police sedan on Route 12, heading east. Warning, these men are heavily armed and have kidnapped Ralph Barker, prison guard, as hostage. Extreme caution is necessary when... Nope. Take it easy on that wheel, Dippy. This ain't no souped-up stock job you're driving. Slow down. We're coming to the fork. There it is, Spade. Route 6 cuts through here. Stop the jalopy, Dippy. What do we do with the guard? Take his gag off. Uh, this is the end of the line, mister. You won't get away with this. You'll be back behind bars within 48 hours. You won't be there to say hello. What? Hand me that 45, Angel. Well, 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 what are you going to do? All right, Angel, open the door. No. No, not this way. Don't do it. If you've got one spark of mercy and you don't kill me, please, don't...
Push him out, Angel, and let's go. Attention, attention all patrols. The following orders have been issued by the commissioner. Cars number 6, 9, 17, and 4 will patrol Route 12. Numbers 1, 14, 8, and 3 will remain on Route 6. All police officers and deputies in five neighboring states have been alerted to use extreme caution. Tri-State Penitentiary has reported the escaped convicts to have taken one submachine gun, one sawed-off rifle, three 45 caliber revolvers from the arsenal. Emma! Three men will yes, Harriet? No Don't you ever quarters. get enough of that radio? <laughs> <laughs> I was just listening to the police reports on my shortwave band, Harriet. But if it bothers you... No, that's much better. Particularly on the ears. Feeling stronger this morning? Uh, not too. How'd you sleep last night? Bad, Harriet. You said you'd leave another one of them sleeping pills at my bedside. Now, Emma, you've been taking them too regular lately. You've got to get along without sometimes. But Dr. Horton said he that He said I... to take them if necessary, but last night it wasn't necessary. That cup of hot jasmine tea I made you should have done fine. I wish you'd let me handle my own sicknesses, Harriet. You've got too many to handle yourself, Emma. You need help. You think up more than a body can cope with. Nobody understands me. That's the trouble. Now, sister, you behave yourself. Here, now. Let me fluff up your pillow a bit. Now, mm -hmm. Harriet, ever feel lonesome? Lonesome? I mean, for company. We never see anyone or even go out. There's no place to go, Emma. Yes, there is. We've been living in this house alone now for over 30 years, just you and me. We hardly ever get up to the city anymore. You don't even seem to want to go to town, only seven miles away. I'm satisfied just being here with you, Emma. Taking care of my sister's a job I like, and I don't need anything else. But the world is so big, Harriet, and there's so much to see. We've got some money. We could take a trip, maybe on a boat. That's just foolishness. Oh, you always say that. All you care about is being cooped up in this house, miles away from neighbors even, with nothing to do but look out of the window and watch the waves come up from the bay. That's all I ever want to do, Emma. But why? Because... Because I'm afraid. Afraid? Of what? Everything. People. The world outside. But Harry... Now let's stop this silly talk. Tea will be ready in just a few minutes, and I... What's that? Sounds like an automobile. Wonder who it is. You think we got company, Harriet? Who do you see through the window? There's three men, Emma. They got dust all over their faces, and two of them are carrying guns. Hunters, maybe? The hunting season don't begin until November. Emma. Stay in your chair, Emma. Well, ain't you going to answer the door? Harriet, did you say three men? Let me do the talking now. One side, <gasps> sister. What, you... Shut what up, you move back. Anybody else in this house, outside of you two dames? No. We're alone. Bippy, tell Spade it's clear. Okay. Okay. Just keep quiet, the two of you. Speak when you're asked, and you won't get hurt. Just the two dolls? That's what they said. Too bad they ain't 40 years younger, huh, Spade? It's too bad Shut that they... Shut your trap, Dippy. Sure, Spade, sure. Angel. Yeah. Case the joint. Yes, Spade. Dippy. Yeah, boss? Wipe that silly grin off your puss and put the rod away. The rod? Douse it. You're scaring these little old dolls. Sure, Spade, sure. Now, look, ladies. If everybody keeps calm, nothing's going to happen. We don't want to hurt nobody, see? What do you want? I'll ask the questions, doll. You got a phone here? No. Where's your nearest neighbor? Seven miles away. How often do you see him? Never. Hey, this sounds like a perfect setup. We're just walking distance from the beach, Spade. When Harry gets here with a boat, we... Oh, Spade. One of these days you're going to talk yourself into trouble, Dippy. You yap too much. Oh, I didn't mean nothing. That a radio on the shelf, doll? I it's my radio. Looks like a short wave band on it. 
You, uh, get police calls, maybe? No, 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 we don't get... All right, Emma, let me handle this. Yes, we get police calls, and we know all about you. Yeah? You're three escaped criminals, murderers and thieves. You're being chased by the police in five states, and you'll be back behind bars where you belong before you know it. <laughs> You're all right, Dal. You don't scare easy. You want me to smash the radio sets, back? No, no, I like radios. Especially police reports. Maybe we'll want to listen to pass the time of day. Shut the door. Start pulling down all them shades. The joint's empty, all right, Spade. How many rooms? Look like eight. Got a cellar and an attic, that's all. All right, ladies. Now listen. My friends and me are going to be your guests for a couple of days until we keep an appointment with a pal. We'll pay for our room and board, and we'll expect cooperation. We'll pay. We ain't going to steal from two old dolls. But listen, ladies, and listen hard. I got a lot of respect for old timers like you, and I want to do the gentlemanly thing. Come to the point, Mister. Sure. Now we get along fine as long as nobody tries to leave, and nobody tries to tip off our hideout. But if you make just one phony move, ladies, we'll kill the two of you. That clear? Very clear. Good. What do you do? Sleep. We have a room upstairs. You got some rooms for us, I guess. They got plenty of space. And we'll make ourselves comfortable. Uh, what time do you serve dinner here, Dal? We, we usually eat at six. Oh, I'm starving, boss. My stomach feels like an empty beer barrel. We ain't that since the break. Any chance of getting some grub before six, Dal? What do you want? Got any apple pie? Maybe. Ah, you country gals always have apple pie handy. How about some bacon and eggs, hmm? Big pot of coffee, some of that pie? Come on, Emma. What are you doing? Helping my sister upstairs. She's too sick to move around much by herself. Dippy, what are you standing there like a jerk for? Don't you see the old lady needs some help? Where you manage, you crumb bum? Sure, boss, sure. I can do it myself, thank you. Come on, Emma. Go up with them anyways, Dippy, and make sure they ain't got any phones. Okay, boss. What's the matter? You think I'm a square? I check for phones all over. This place is as tight as a clam. I'm a cautious guy, Angel. I like to check twice. Come on over here to the window. Uh, we're about 500 yards from the beach. Harry picked the right spot to wait for him. Yeah, he said he cased this joint for a week. Nobody come in or go out. He didn't mention the dames. That's all right. They won't make any trouble. Let's see. He'll be able to get his motorboat up to about 10 or 15 yards from the beach. And we can wade out to it. When did he say he'd come? Tuesday at 11 p.m. Uh -huh. Well, this is Sunday. We got over two days to wait. Yeah. Meanwhile, every bull from here to St. Lee is chasing us. They're hunting us like weasels all along the line. So what? How do we know they won't close in? They won't. We're way off the road, and we got the car well hidden in that clump of trees. Suppose something happens. Suppose they find out where we are and surround the joint. Then we shoot it out. They got us on a murder rap, Angel, so we got nothing to lose. We shoot it out to the last man. Attention all patrols. The body of Ralph Barker, Tri-State Penitentiary Prison Guard, has just been located at the Williams Bridge Junction of Routes 12 and 6. All cars and vicinity report immediately for further orders. Attention. Get some music, Dippy. Sure, Spade, sure. That's better. Where's Angel? I don't know. He went out. Out? He said he wanted to get some air. Go find him. Now? Find him. Tell him I want him. Sure, boss. Hiya, Harry. Gonna do some knitting, doll? If you don't mind. I'll sit in this rocker. No, enjoy yourself. Thanks. I had enough of that music. You scared, doll? Scared? Of us? Do I look it? 
No, sir, that you don't. You got guts, though. Oh, excuse me. I mean, you got nerve. I like a gal with nerve. You're the one who should be scared. Me? What'll happen if they find you? Nothing much. No? They'll hang the three of us, that's all. And that doesn't worry you? In my business, you got no time to worry, doll. I guess you know they're closing in on you. Sure. You can't stay here forever. Sure. How long do you intend to stay? Till our appointment. You're expecting someone? Tend to your knitting, sister. It's safer. Where are you going? It's almost ten o'clock. I'm going to put my sister to sleep. What's that in your hand? Sleeping pills. She's supposed to take one when she's restless. Why don't you try three fingers of whiskey? If you don't mind, I'll leave now. Good night, doll. Pleasant dreams. Here's Angel, boss. Where you been? Out. Well, that's a real bright answer. Do I have to get your permission to even take a walk? Look, Angel, when we planned this break, we agreed that I was going to be the brains. I was given the orders until we were safe at sea. That right to be? Right, boss. I don't like taking orders, Spade. I had my own outfit back in Shy. I gave the orders there. You ain't in Chicago now, baby, and this ain't the north side. You're in the middle of a manhunt, Angel, and the loser gets a rope around his neck. Now, get this. You can either take your orders from me or get your thick neck out of that door right now and go it alone. Now, which is it going to be? I ain't moving, am I? That's more like it. All right. Now, here's the setup for tonight. One of us got to be awake all the time, so we'll take turns. Dippy, you take the first trick, 10 to 2 a.m. Sure, Space, sure. I'll take number two until six. You're on from six to ten in the morning, Angel. Okay. Keep your eyes open, Dippy. If anything moves outside, blow its head off. Let's get some shut-eye, Angel. Little man, tomorrow is a very busy day. Who's there? It's me. Ah, uh, hiya, Harriet. I couldn't sleep. Do you mind if I sit here in my rocking chair for a while? Well, it's a pleasure. I've been getting real itchy sitting here all by myself. Nice to have somebody to talk to. They call you Dippy, don't they? <laughs> yeah. I heard them talking about you upstairs. Talking about me? How old are you, Dippy? I'm uh, 31. Do you have a family? Family? No. My old lady kicked off when I was in rompers. My old man died in Stir. Stir? The hot house, a big hotel. You know, prison. Oh. Now, what was that you were saying a minute ago about Spade and Angel talking about me? They were saying something about a boat. Oh, uh -huh. Harry's boat. I think they mentioned there might only be room for three. Sure, Angel, Spade and me. What about Harry? You, uh, you never had much schooling, did you, Dippy? No, I ran away from school when I got to second grade. I can read a little and write my own name. I'm self-educated. The boat only holds three in a spade. Angel and me, what about Harry? He's got to be there, ain't he? He's going to drive the boat. Oh, he'll be there, all right. Uh, you mind if I put on the radio? That makes four... One too many. All patrols report directly to the commissioner's office. A black sedan resembling the stolen car has been sighted on Highway 6, eight miles south of Portsville. Cars number 3, 9, and 4 investigate. Attention, all patrols. The commissioner is authorized to shoot to kill if any resistance is offered by the fugitives. Protect yourselves at... I guess you don't want to hear any more of that, Dippy. Ah, oh, they won't get near us. We'll be out of here inside 24 hours. We? Sure, all three of us. They're planning to leave you behind, Dippy. You're kidding. I heard them say it. They can't do that, Harry. They're going to. There isn't enough room in the boat for four. You mean they double-cross a pal after all I've done for him? They have themselves to think about. They ain't throwing me at the dogs, not me. 
That boat only holds four. Angel can stay behind. It was Angel who talked Spade into it. Angel. I think he hates you. I knew it wasn't Spade. The boss is right, but Angel. Angel's a rat. He always hated me. That's what he said. He used to bait me in the prison yard. He said I was a dope and had it been led around like a dog on a leash. It was Spade who let me mooch in on the break. But it's Angel who's getting rid of you, dear. Yeah. Uh, we'll see. I ain't afraid of Angel. I ain't afraid of nobody. Somebody's coming, Dippy. Yelling about. You double crushing skunk, so you leave me behind, will you? You hate my guts, do you? I'll show you, I'll show you. Hey! What's up? You plugged Dippy. I, I had it. Crazy coot was waving us right in my face. What off his nut, I tell you. What happened here, Dow? Tell him. Tell him it was Dippy who started it. Yes, I. I, I saw the whole thing. He, he he couldn't help himself. Lug him down to the cellar. Never saw a guy who acted like that. For no reason at all. Lug him down and shut your trap. Okay. Okay. What were you doing down here in the first place, Dal? I couldn't sleep. Next time, stay in your room, Savvy. I'll beat it. Go on, get. Wait a minute. You sure that's the way it happened? Dippy started the fight. Good night, Mr. Spade. Is that you, Harriet? Yes, Emma. I heard a shot. What's happening? Be quiet. Everything is all right. I'm so scared, Harriet. Shh. Remember before they came, you said you were the one who was scared all the time, but it's me, Harriet. I I'm so frightened I could cry. I've got a plan, Emma. What kind of a plan? If I can turn them against themselves. No! Don't mix in this, Harriet. It's too dangerous. It's already worked once. Harriet, please, don't do a thing. They'll go away soon. They'll go away and leave us alone. They're like wild animals, and someone's got to see that they don't go loose. But not us. We're not the police. It's not our business, Harriet. I'm making it my business. Oh, I wish you wouldn't. I, I wish you'd leave well enough alone. They won't harm us if we mind our own affairs, Harriet. They got a boat coming, and if they reach that boat, the police will never get their hands on them. Maybe I can stop them from taking the boat. Harriet, please. Please don't do it. Now, 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 everything's going to be all right, Emma. Oh, why are you so sure? Those men are killers. They'll murder us both if we... Go to sleep, Emma. I need another pill. I'm too worried to sleep without... Who is it? Open up. Harriet, maybe he's come to kill us. Shh. Well? Thanks for backing me up with Spade. I had no choice. <laughs> You're right, sister. If you'd have lied, I'd have put a slug in your head right then and there. You're afraid of Spade, aren't you? Afraid? Me? I ain't afraid of nobody. I could tell. The way you looked at him. He worries you. Listen, sister, I'm Angel, see? And the Angel don't kowtow to no cheap hood. Is Mr. Spade downstairs? Yeah. Why? I thought I'd make him some coffee if he wanted it. Huh. Well, you can ask him. I'm going back to sleep. I'll put the light out, Emma. Where are you going, Harriet? I'm going downstairs to finish what I've started. along Route 6 to the beach. Cars number 859. What are you doing down here again, Dal? I couldn't sleep after what happened. I made you some coffee. Thanks, I could use some. Hmm. Oh, did I... Uh, did I hear something over the radio now about the beach? 
You hit too good, doll. It ain't healthy. So they're closing in on you at last. The chase is nearly finished. The big beach, doll. They got a lot of ground to cover. Anyways, we won't be around here when they come. Uh, Mr. Spade, there's, there's something I've got to tell you. It's about Angel. What about him? Coffee's pretty good. I lied to you before. You what? He killed that young man in cold blood for no reason. Why didn't you tell me that before? I was afraid to. I thought he'd shoot me if I didn't lie about it. Look, doll. You ain't got anything cooking in that great little head of yours, have you? What do you mean? Like trying to pull a fast one? There, there was a quarrel. Angel wanted to be the boss, and Dippy said he'd stick to you. Then they mentioned something about a boat. Keep talking. Angel said there wasn't room for all of you, and he, he told Dippy you'd be better off left behind. He said that to the Dip? Dippy had your name on his lips when he died, Mr. Spade. Sit down. What? Sit down. Very well. Angel! Angel! Come on down here. Now? Yeah, now. Let's see what Angel has to say, Don. Oh, he'll deny it. There's no question about it. He'll say there was... Seek you, Spade. The doll here just told me something. Yeah? Tell Angel what you just told me, Don. I'm afraid. He'll kill me if I do. While I'm still breathing, Don. What's the idea to ride, Spade? Maybe I'm going to need it. Figuring on some kind of a cross? Maybe you are. All right, Don, talk. I... I heard Angel ask Dippy to get rid the of you. The little... Stay put. Dippy was a good kid. He stuck by. Why'd you knock him off? I told you, Spade. Don't you face me, you creep. You hate my guts and you know it. Sure, I hate your guts. That don't mean I'd pull a cross at a time like this. I heard him, Mr. Spade. He said he wouldn't rest until you had a bullet in your head. I'll squeeze the liver. <laughs> Don't go near the crumb. He's dead. You had a right to... Harriet! Harriet, I heard another shot! Emma, you shouldn't have come downstairs oh, alone. I heard... oh, he... They're on the floor. Is he dead? Emma, please get back to bed. I told you. I told you not to try it. Now you kill us too. I told you not to get them to fight, Harriet. Emma! <laughs> So you were lying after all. No. You lied about the dip. And now about Angel. Harriet! Harriet, he's going to shoot! Be quiet, Emma. I took a chance and I lost. Of course he's going to shoot. But at least we can show this animal that we can die like human beings. Harriet. There's a difference between mad dogs and people, Emma. A big difference. Stand up, sister. And show him just what that difference is. You pull a fast one, doll. Real fast. Sure. Now comes the payoff. Now comes the... Oh. What's the matter with me? I feel punchy. I feel sleepy. I... I don't know what's the matter. Don't move. Don't move. Harriet. He's fainted. I'm surprised he lasted this long. I put 16 sleeping pills in his coffee. All you had left. Harriet. Put on a coat, Emma. We're going out to find the police. Mr. Spade will sleep until Kingdom Come with all them pills under his vest. All right, Harriet. And Emma. Yes, Harriet? We'll take that trip, maybe. The one you wanted so much. The one on the boat. We'll close up the house and make friends with the world again. You see, I'm not afraid, Emma. Anymore.
In the animal world, there is the hunter and the hunted. Hound and fox, hawk and sparrow, cat and mouse. We in the topmost species have also joined the hunt. But who is to judge precisely which of us are hounds or foxes as we enter the chase? The Chase was created and written for the National Broadcasting Company by Lawrence Klee. Featured in tonight's cast were Evelyn Varden, Mandel Kramer, Agnes Young, Ken Lynch, and Kermit Murdoch. The Chase is directed and transcribed by Edward King. Fred Collins speaking. Next week, aboard a European express train bound for the Iron Curtain, are a captive American correspondent and a top secret, both vitally involved in the chase. Tonight, enjoy Counter Spy and Barry Craig on NBC. Lux presents Hollywood. Lieber Brothers Company, the makers of Lux Toilet Soap, bring you the Lux Radio Theater. Starring Ray Milland, Ruth Roman, and Frank Lovejoy in Strangers on a Train. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. William Keeley. <laughs> Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. Travel by train, ship, or plane usually puts us in the mood to be kind to strangers. A question which would ordinarily receive a courteous but unencouraging answer is almost welcomed when we find ourselves in strange surroundings without the security of friendly conversation. It's a commendable custom, but at times may lead to unexpected and terrifying complications, as our stars tonight are about to portray. Ray Milland and Frank Lovejoy, who are the strangers on a train, and Ruth Roman, who recreates her starring role. Not only was this Warner Brothers picture directed by that noted master of suspense, Alfred Hitchcock, but one of the major roles was played by his daughter, Patricia Hitchcock. And we're happy that Patricia could appear tonight in her original part in Strangers on a Train. I'm sure there are no strangers in our audience to the improving qualities of Lux Toilet Soap as a beauty care. Because Lux facials are the daily companions of lovely ladies who know they can depend on Lux Soap for the complexion care that leaves their skin lovelier. Here's Strangers on a Train... Starring Ray Milland as Guy Haynes, Ruth Roman as Ann Morton, and Frank Lovejoy as Bruno Anthony, with Patricia Hitchcock as Barbara. A few moments ago, a northbound train left Washington, D.C. Among the passengers settling down in the club car are two young men. I beg your pardon. Hmm? Oh. I hate to interrupt your reading, but aren't you Guy Haynes? That's right. I'm quite a tennis fan. I saw your match last season in South Orange against Faraday. Well, that was one of my lucky days. I certainly admire people who do things. Uh, by the way, my name is Anthony, Bruno Anthony. How do you do? <sighs> well, I guess you want to get back to your book. You go ahead and read. Thanks. You know, it must be pretty exciting to be so important. What? Oh, tennis player isn't so important? Oh, but people who do things are important. Now, me, I, I never seem to do anything. <laughs> I suppose you're going to Southampton for the doubles, hmm? You certainly read the sport page, don't you? I wish I could be there to watch you, but I've got to be back in Washington tomorrow. Cigarette? No, not now, thanks. Uh, you don't happen to have a match? Yeah. Oh, oh, a lighter. Thank you. Oh, my, that's elegance and grave, too, from A to G. I bet I can guess who A is. Anne, Anne Morton. Oh, wait a minute. Oh, it's simple. See, sometimes I turn the sports page and look at the society section. The pictures, too. She's very beautiful, son of the Morton's daughter. You're quite a reader, Mr. Anthony. Yes, I am. 
You ask me anything, I've got the answer. Even about people I don't even know. Like, uh... Like who would like to marry whom when his wife gets a divorce. Maybe you read too much. Well, there I go again. I meet somebody I like and admire, and I, I say the wrong thing. Oh, forget it. I guess I'm just a little jittery. Oh, well, there's a cure for that. Uh, waiter. Scotch and plain water, please. <clears throat> a pair, doubles. <laughs> That's the only kind of doubles I play. Oh, I'm afraid you'll have to drink both of them. And I can do it. Uh, when's the wedding? What? Oh, you and Ann Morton. The wedding. It was in the papers. Well, it shouldn't have been unless they've legalized bigamy. It's wonderful, you know, having your company all the way to New York. Well, as a matter of fact, I'm getting off at Metcalf. Metcalf? Who would want to stop at Metcalf? It's my hometown. Oh. Oh, I get it. A little chat with your wife about the divorce. Well, here's luck, Mr. Haynes. Drink up, then we'll have lunch sent to my compartment. Thanks very much, but I think I'll go to the dining car. Oh, that's filled up. There's no seats for about 20 minutes. Well, uh, how about lunch in my compartment? Oh, I wouldn't think of that. Come along, Mr. Haynes. You know, this is a real pleasure. And all told, I went to three different colleges. I got kicked out each time. Drinking and gambling, not like you, a huh, guy? <laughs> all right, so I'm a bum. Who said you were? Well, my father, he hates me. With all the money he's got, he thinks I ought to punch a time clock somewhere and work my way up selling paint or something. Well, I think possibly he's... I hate him, too. I tell you, I get so sore at him sometimes, I... I want to kill him. You know, I don't think you know what you want. Well, I want to do something and everything. You know, I've got a theory you should do everything before you die. Have you ever driven a car blindfolded at 150 miles an hour? No, not lately. Well, I did. Flew a jet plane, too. Man, what a thrill. Almost blew the sawdust out of my head. Say, what are you trying to prove? Well, I'm not like you, Guy. You're lucky and you're smart. First of all, you're a wonderful tennis player. On top of that, you've got a swell job. Assistant to a United States senator. And on top of that, you're going to marry the boss's daughter. <laughs> Makes a nice shortcut to a career, doesn't it? Marrying the senator's daughter's got nothing to do with it. Oh, now take it easy, guy. I'm your friend. <clears throat> Remember, I like you. I'd do anything for you. Look, we'll be stopping soon, and I've got to change trains. Oh, yes, that's right, Metcalf. What did you say her name was? Your wife's? Miriam. Miriam. I suppose she played around a lot, huh? Skip it, Bruno. Okay. Say... <clears throat> Want to hear one of my ideas for a perfect murder? Murder? Look, I may be old-fashioned, but I thought it was still against the law. Well, what's a life or two? You know, some people are better off dead. Someone like your wife and my father, for instance. Now, let's say that you'd like to get rid of your wife. <laughs> you know, you've got quite a sense of humor, Bruno. No, 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 seriously. Let's say that you had a very good reason to want her dead. But you'd be afraid to kill her, and you know why? You'd be caught. What would trip you up? The motive. Now, here's my idea. I'm afraid I don't have time to listen. Oh, it's so simple, too. Two fellows meet accidentally, like you and me here on the train. No connection between them at all. They never even saw each other before. But now each one has somebody that he'd like to get rid of. So they, uh, they swap murders. Swap murders? Each fellow does the other fellow's murder. There's nothing to connect them. Each one has murdered a total stranger, like... You do my murder, and I do yours. You're coming into my station. For example, your wife and my father, crisscross. What? <laughs> yes, we do talk the same language, don't we? Thanks for the lunch, Bruno. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Think my theory's okay, huh, Guy? You like it? <laughs> sure. Sure. Got some great ideas. Nice meeting you. Good luck at Southampton, Guy. You bet I got some great... Oh, Guy, your lighter. You forgot your cigarette lighter. Huh. From A to G. I'll send it to him sometime. Yes, I must send it to him sometime. I hope...
hope you don't mind meeting you in the park, Guy. Uh, no, Miriam. No, this is fine. I couldn't very well meet you in the store, could I? I arranged to take my lunch hour later. You're looking well, Miriam? So are you. You got a nice tan playing tennis with all your rich friends. When can we see your lawyer? What's your hurry, Guy? You know, I think you're handsomer than ever. You know, I think it's pretty late to start flirting with a discarded husband. Now, let's see your lawyer and get this over with. Did you bring the money? Lawyers are expensive. It's in this envelope. Here. Thanks. You know, if I'd have known that you'd start doing so well, I wouldn't have run out on you. What are you trying to say, Miriam? I got a big surprise for you. I'm not getting a divorce. But it's what you've wanted. That's all you've been hopping about for more than a year. It's a woman's privilege to change her mind. Now I can buy some pretty clothes. I wouldn't want you to be ashamed of me in Washington. What's that supposed to mean? Don't look so mad, Guy. You always smile when you have your picture taken for the newspapers. Especially when Ann Morton's hanging on Let's your arm. Let's not talk about Ann Morton. Well, you can throw all your little dreams about her right in the ash can and make a real pretty story, wouldn't it? The senator's daughter all involved with a married man. What's happened, Miriam? Your boyfriend run out on you? No man runs out on me, Guy. Not even you. Just get one thing straight. I never want to see or hear of you again. I could be very pathetic in a courtroom, Guy. The poor, deserted little wife. Better think it over, honey. I'm warning you, Miriam. Either we go ahead with a divorce or I I'll... I wish I had time to listen to you, Guy, but I've got to get back to work. I'll see you in Washington in two weeks. <laughs> Hello? Hello, operator. I have your party now, sir. Go ahead, please. Hello? Guy, is that you? Anne? Hello, darling. Where are you? I'm in Metcalf. Oh, then you've seen Miriam. Guy, did, did everything go all right? No. Everything went all wrong. She doesn't want the divorce. Guy, it, it's unbelievable. I mean, after all these months, but what did she say? Does it make any difference what she said? Oh, I... Uh... I'm sorry, Anne. It's just that I yes, feel darling, so... Yes, darling, I know how you feel. But you sound so savage, Guy. I'd like to break her neck. I'd like to break her foul, useless little neck. Oh, there's no use talking like that, dear. I know. I suppose I'd try to see her again, but I've, I've got to get to Southampton. My train will be here in a moment. Then write me. Please write me. Sure, I'll write on the train. And don't worry, darling. We've waited this long. We can wait a little longer. I don't know what I'd do without you. I love you, Guy. Well, I've got a rush, dear. My train's coming. I'll see you on Thursday. Yeah, sure. Good luck, darling. Hello? Guy, this is Bruno. How are you, Guy? Who? Who'd you say this was? Bruno. Bruno Anthony. Don't you remember? On the train? Oh. Oh, yes. I would have called you sooner, but the operator had a little trouble finding you in Southampton. Look, would you mind telling me why you're phoning? How are the matches going, Guy? I don't play until the morning. Oh. Uh, Guy, about your visit in Metcalf. Are you getting a divorce? Oh, now, wait a minute, Bruno. She won't give it to you, right? Miriam won't give you a divorce? No. She double-crossed you. You gonna see her again? Now, look, Bruno, why don't you just... Well, I told you I liked you, Guy. I'm your friend. You should never forget that. You just leave Miriam to me. What are you talking about? You'll find out, Guy. Just be patient, that's all. You just be patient. I don't care what Bruno was doing. I said I wanted to talk to him. Well, if you're talking about me, Father, I had to call a friend of mine long distance. Really, Charles? Must you always take this tone with Bruno? Oh, it's all right, Mother. I'm used to his tone by now. You can wipe that injured look off your face right now. You were out last night, weren't you? Well, I'm a big boy, Father. I go out at night all the time. You had another accident. You hit another car. Charles, really? Now it's hit and run driving. And you knew about it all the time. But, dear, it was a parked car. No one was in it. Why don't you tell that to the police? Well, they... They won't do anything to Bruno. This was the last <laughs> time, Eunice. So help me, I'll never lift a finger for him again. It's all right, Mother. No, 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 dear. You know I can't stand to see you crying. Is there anything else you want to say to me, Father? Yes. Get out of my sight. Get out of my sight before I... I'll be back tomorrow, Mother. Uh, Bruno, where are you going? Oh, just a little trip, Mother. It's something for a friend of mine. Oh, you just don't understand him, Charles. You just don't understand him. What's he going to do next? Tell me, what's he going to do next? Well, nothing. Nothing at all. It's not normal. If it's the last thing I do, I'm going to have that boy taken care of. If necessary, put under restraint. I'll never permit it. Never. Never. It can't go on, Eunice. Things like this just can't go on.
Guy. Over here, Guy. Well, hello. Bruno? That's right, Guy. How are you? What are you doing here? Not this time of night. I was waiting for you to get back to Washington. I thought of meeting you at the station, but then I figured this might be better here in front of your apartment. Now, look, it's one o'clock in the morning well, you don't and I... seem very pleased to see me. Would you mind telling me what this is all about? Oh, I, uh... I just come back from Metcalf, Guy. I brought you a little present. See, it's a pair of glasses. You didn't tell me that Miriam wore glasses. You've seen Miriam? Oh, it was very quick, Guy. She wasn't hurt in any way. It was all over in no time. What are you trying to tell me? Huh. I knew you'd be surprised. Nothing for us to worry about either. Nobody saw me. Only Miriam. I was very careful, Guy. Even when I dropped your cigarette lighter, I went right back and picked it up. Cigarette light? Why, you maniac! Well, Guy, we planned it on the train together. You wanted it, you remember? Where are you going? Where do you think I'm going? I don't believe you, but I'm going to call the police just the same. Oh, you can't, Guy. We'd both be arrested for murder. You're just as much in it as I am. We planned it together, crisscross. Why, you crazy fool. Do you think you can get away with that? Oh, come now, Guy. Why should I go to Metcalf to kill a total stranger unless it was part of the plan and you were in on it? You're the one who benefits, Guy. I didn't even know the girl. But if you go to the police now, you'll just be turning yourself in as an accessory, you see. You had the motive. You crazy fool! I... Ah, uh, you must be tired. I, I know I am. I've had a strenuous evening. I got to talk to you about my father. I've done my part. Now you'll do yours. I Shut up! To... We have to arrange things. Get away from me before I. Oh, guy, you're not yourself. Now, when you think things over, you'll see that I'm right. Tomorrow we can. Talk... I don't know you. I never saw you before, and I never want to see you again. You're lighter, guy. The one that Anne gave you. You left it on the train. Don't you even miss it? Give it to me, Bruno. Give me that lighter. I don't have it, Guy. That is, I don't have it with me. <laughs> well, as I said, we can arrange everything tomorrow. Hello? Anne? Oh, I'm sorry, darling, but I just got in. Well, of course I'm all right, but you sound upset. Anything wrong? All right, darling. Yes, I'll come over right away. Thanks for coming over, darling. Anne. Anne, what is it? You're trembling. I wonder if you know how much I love you. Come along, Guy. Father and Barbara, they're, they're waiting in the library. I thought we might be alone, Guy, but Anne insisted, and so did Bob. Now, really, Daddy, if I'm going to be Guy's sister-in-law, the least I can do Just is sit stay. sit down and keep quiet. Guy, we, we wouldn't have called you at this hour if it weren't important. It, it's about your wife. Miriam? What about her, sir? I'm sorry to be the one to tell you she's been killed, Guy. Murdered. The police have been trying to locate you everywhere. You're to call headquarters in Metcalf. Miriam. Murdered. Tonight, about nine o'clock, she... she was strangled. In a few moments, we'll return with Act Two of Strangers on a Train. But now, here's our Hollywood reporter, Libby Collins, with the Lux Movie News of the Week. The big news here, John, is the premiere of Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer's Technicolor production of Quo Vadis. Most every celebrity in Hollywood was there. All Hollywood is still talking about it. And everyone thought Robert Taylor was magnificent as Marcus, the pagan Roman warrior. His love scenes with Deborah Carr playing Lydia, the gentle Christian hostage, provide some of the most compelling drama ever seen on the screen. And Leo Ginn as Petronius turns in a terrific performance. Every moment of Quo Vadis is really epic drama. The chariot races at the Colosseum, the spectacular burning of Rome, the martyred Christians that the mad tyrant Nero orders thrown to the lions. I understand that Metro Golden Mayor built an entire city outside of Rome for the picture. And spent two years filming it. Lovely Deborah Carr's costumes are certainly gorgeous, just right for her exciting kind of beauty. Her milk white skin against her copper colored hair is something. Well, John, Deborah Carr's complexion is something special. It's truly Lux Lovely. Yes, when you see a lovely complexion like hers, you realize why screen stars are devoted 
to the gentle, protecting care of Lux Toilet Soap. They know it's easy to be Lux Lovely, John. Daily Lux Beauty Facials do wonders for the skin. Really make it softer and smoother. Lux Soap has active lather that ensures gentle, thorough cleansing. Yes, you simply cream the rich lather well in. Rinse with warm water and follow with a cold splash. Then pat dry with a soft towel. This simple care does wonders. Leaves skin fresh as a flower. Yes, there's a reason why Lux is Hollywood's own beauty soap. If you haven't tried it, why not start your active lather facials tomorrow? Be Lux lovely, like nine out of ten screen stars who use fragrant white Lux toilet soap. Now our producer, Mr. William Keeley. Act two of Strangers on a Train, starring Ray Milland as Guy Haynes, Frank Lovejoy as Bruno Antony, and Ruth Roman as Ann Morton. Twenty minutes ago on a street corner, Guy Haynes listened to Bruno Antony tell an incredible story of how he had murdered Guy's wife. And now in Senator Morton's home, Guy learns that Bruno's fantastic report is completely true. It, it happened in an amusement park, Guy. Some sort of lover's lane, I believe. Terrible. Apparently she'd gone there with some other people. Two of the young men found her. It, it, it was done by someone else. They don't even have a suspect, Guy. Except you, probably. Barbara, I wish you'd keep quiet. But the police will say that Guy wanted Miriam out of the way so he could marry Anne. She's right, Senator. But if you have an alibi, you have nothing to worry about. You can tell them where you were at about 9 o'clock tonight. Well, uh, I was on my way here. I was on the train. Well, there you are. Who saw you? Did you speak to anyone? You need a witness. Yes. Yes, I did speak to someone. He was the only other passenger in the club car. Someone you know? No. No, he said his name was Collier or Collins or something. Said he was a professor at Delaware Tech. He'd been drinking. Drinking? Yeah, he'd been to some meeting, had a couple of drinks. But he was on the train. He saw you. Then everything's all right. He'll still have to answer some questions. It's a dreadful business. Dreadful. Poor, unfortunate girl. Miriam was rotten. She was a human being. Father, it's getting late and Guy looks so tired. Of course. Well, you two, now you can be married right away. Think of it. You're free. You won't forget to phone the Metcalf police, Guy. Captain Turley. Yes, sir. Good night, Senator. Good night, Barbara. I still think it'd be wonderful to have a man love you so much he'd kill for you. You know, I kept saying over and over again I was being silly, Guy. But there was one horrible moment tonight when the news came through. I, I kept remembering what you said on the phone for Metcalf after you'd seen her. That I could break her neck? No, no, don't even say it. Forget you ever said it. And there was something even more terrifying than the murder itself. The horrible thought that if you had anything to do with it, we'd... Anything to do with it? We'd have to be separated, perhaps forever. I, I couldn't stand that guy. I couldn't bear it. Anne! Anne, you don't think that I... Oh, no, darling, no, of course not. Just hold me, guy. Just hold me. Captain Turley, Mr. Haynes, it's good of you to come down here so quickly. Well, I'm just as anxious as you are, Captain. Well, we've managed to locate the gentleman you spoke with on the train. Well, Professor, this is Mr. Haynes. Well, I... I can't tell you how foolish I feel, Captain. I... I really don't remember meeting this gentleman. You don't remember? But you... you just you... a moment, Mr. Haynes. Unfortunately, I remember very little of my trip. You see, we... We had a little celebration. I'm not a drinking man, and... Well, just one or two drinks. But we I... were sitting opposite each other. You were going over some speech you made about calculus, mathematics or something. I'm very sorry, Mr. Haynes. <laughs> I certainly must have been celebrating. If you'll wait outside, Professor. Yes. Yes, of course. Is it so important whether he remembers me or not? Surely the important thing is that I've been able to name a man who was on the train with me. Now, you've been able to find him. Isn't that proof of where I was last night? Yes, I'd say you were in the clear, but uh, there is a little more checking I'd like to do. But if I'm in the clear... Take it easy, Mr. Haynes. You're free to go back to Washington right now. Thank you, Captain. Then the police verified his alibi, Father, and, and said he could go. Isn't that about it, dear? Except that... When an alibi is full of scotch, it casts a little doubt. Then the professor was boy. He didn't remember me. 
But he knew you were on the train. Wasn't that enough to prove that that's where you were? I wish I knew. For sure, I mean... Oh, everything's all right, Anne. The police are just being thorough. What's your next move, Guy? Well, whatever it is, the police will know about it. Take a look out the window. My guardian angel. Why, why Guy, you're being tailed. That's Detective Leslie Hennessy. He works 16 hours a day. Someone named Hammond takes over for the next eight. As a matter of fact, Hennessy seems like a pretty nice fellow. For your own peace of mind, Guy, perhaps... Well, perhaps if you worked here at the house for the next few days, well, it would be less embarrassing for it you. It would be less embarrassing for you, sir, if I resigned as your assistant. That's ridiculous. Of course it is. Besides, don't you have to play in the tennis tournament? I'm withdrawing. But wouldn't it look awkward if you suddenly cancelled all your plans? Father's right, Guy. You've got to go on as though nothing had happened. Escorted by Mr. Hennessy. I beg your pardon? What is it, Bessie? The telephone from Mr. Haynes, miss. They say it's urgent. Oh, you can take it right there, Guy. Huh? Oh, oh, yeah. Hello? Hello, Guy. This is Bruno. I was hoping you'd call me before I had... What's the matter? Must have been some mistake. It wasn't for me. I'm learning more and more things about you, Guy. I never dreamed you were so interested in painting. Well, I feel a very warm attachment for this art gallery. For the first time all week, we've actually been alone for an hour. <laughs> By the way, where's Hennessy? Waiting out front. Hadn't we better be leaving? I suppose so. I wonder if we'll ever... Uh, Guy! Have a minute, Guy? Come on, we'll find Hennessy and get a cab. But that man, he, he's calling you, Guy. Oh, excuse me, dear. I'll see what he wants. Oh, it's hard to have to follow you here, Guy. Will you stop pestering me? You never even answered my note. For the last time, Bruno. You're spoiling everything. You're making me come out in the open. Why didn't you call me? My father's leaving for Florida next week. There's not much time. The detective outside. He'll see us together. Isn't that Anne Morton that you're with? <laughs> Slight improvement over Miriam. Hey, Guy? I'm telling you to stay away from me. Who is he, Guy? Oh, just some tennis fan. Never saw him before. That's funny. Funny? I mean, uh, I saw him yesterday. Where? Well, he was at the tennis club watching you practice. Oh. He was sitting with Mr. and Mrs. Darville. He, he must be very amusing. He had them in stitches most of the time. Who were the Darvilles? Oh, he's connected with the French <clears throat> Ebbsy. You'll meet them tomorrow night, darling. They'll be at the party. Oh, yeah. Yes, the party. And do you really think I should be there? But I thought we settled that, dear. Of course you should be there. He's watching us, Guy, that man. Come along, dear. Let's go home. Is he, Barbara? That young Frenchman with the Davi. Oh, he's not French, Daddy. They just introduced me to him. His name's Anthony, Bruno Anthony. Doesn't he look interesting? Why is he looking at you? Daddy, not so loud. He's coming over here. Oh, oh, this is my father, Mr. Anthony. Well, I'm delighted to meet you, Senator. Uh, how, how do you do? Oh, it's a wonderful party, sir. You know, sometime I'd like to talk to you about my idea for harnessing the life force. It'll make atomic power look like the horse and buggy. Well, I'm sure I... am already developing my faculty for seeing millions of miles. Senator, can you imagine being able to smell a flower on the planet Mars? I'd like to have lunch with you someday soon, sir, and tell you more about it. I'll see you later, won't I? Uh, that, uh, that, that'll be fine. Uh, later, yes. I still don't remember inviting that young man. I told you, Daddy. The Darfields just brought him along. Uh, just a minute, Barbara. Where are your glasses? My, my glasses? You're supposed to wear glasses, Barbara. Oh, but, Daddy, even at parties... Not another word. Get your glasses and put them on. <laughs> what are you so concerned about, Guy? If the Darvilles brought him, well, what difference does it make? He shouldn't be here. But you said you don't even know him. Well, I, I just don't like his looks. I don't like the way he's been staring at Barbara. <laughs> well, I'm not so sure I blame him. Barbara's very cute, especially when she wears glasses. Besides, he, he seems to be talking to Judge Donahue right now. Judge Donahue. Oh, now, come on, let us, let's go to dinner. There's something else that I want to ask you, Judge Donahue. 
Uh, after you've sentenced a man to the chair, isn't it difficult to go out and eat your dinner after that? Really, young man. Well, when a murderer has been convicted, he must be sentenced. When he's sentenced to death, he must be executed. Oh, quite impersonal, isn't it? Besides, it doesn't happen every day. Yeah, so few murderers are caught. Uh, if you don't mind, I, I believe I'm being paged. Well, Mr. <coughs> Anthony, you seem very interested in the subject of murder. Well, no more than anyone else, madam. No more than you, for instance. Me? Mm -hmm. Oh, no, I'm not interested in murder. Oh, come now, everyone's interested. Surely you're not going to tell me there hasn't been a time that you didn't want to dispose of something. <laughs> Good heavens, no. <laughs> you mean to tell me there wasn't a tiny moment when you were made very angry? Well, I... What did you say? <laughs> well, there you are, you see? There you are. <laughs> now you've decided to commit a murder. How would you plan to do it? Uh, oh, I didn't get your name. Uh, Mrs. Cunningham. Well, Mrs. Cunningham, how will you do it? Well, uh, I suppose I'd have to get a gun from somewhere. Oh, no, Mrs. Cunningham. Bang, bang, bang all over the place and blood oh. everywhere. Well, uh, what's your idea, Mr. Anthony? Well, I have the best way and the best tools. Yes? My two hands. It's simple, oh. silent, and it's quick. Why, of course. Sure. <laughs> oh, you must be very strong, Mr. Anthony. <laughs> well, let me show you what I mean. Uh -huh. You don't mind if I borrow your neck for a moment, do you? <laughs> <laughs> That's so silly. Very well. Uh, go ahead. Are you? Now watch what I'm doing. Uh-huh. When I nod my head, you just try to cry out. Yes. I'll bet you won't be able to make a sound. <laughs> I'm ready. All right, now. Just wait till I nod my head. Father, Mrs. Anderson's with her and Judge Donahue. They're up in the bedroom. But, Mrs. Cunningham, what happened? How could he have choked her? Well, I, I don't know for sure. Mrs. Anderson thinks they were playing some, some sort of game. Then when Bessie screamed, he, he fainted. Where is he, Anne? Where's Aunt? Guy took him into the study. Then tell Guy to get him out of here as soon as he can. This is a nice item for the gossips. Well, I better get back to the guests. <laughs> Oh, Anne. Barbara, what's the matter? It was awful. I saw him. What was he trying to do to her? You saw him. I was standing in the doorway. His hands were on her throat, but he kept staring at me. And he was strangling me. What do you mean? He went into sort of a trance. Oh, it was horrible. He thought he was murdering me. But, but why, Anne? Why me? Don't be silly, dear. You're upset. That's all. Now go find Father. What happened, Guy? I fainted, didn't I? I started getting so dizzy. You mad, crazy maniac. You ought to be locked up. Will you get out of here now and let me alone? But, Guy, I like you. Now we've got to talk about my father. You promised to... You shouldn't have done that, guy. You shouldn't have hit me. Maybe that'll knock a little sense into you. Do you have a car here? Yes, it's outside. It's down the block. Come on, we go out the back way. Guy, did he leave? Anne? I didn't mean to startle you, dear. He has left. Yes. Anne, why'd you come out here? I had to talk to you. Yesterday at the art gallery, that wasn't the first time you met Bruno, was it? What makes you say that? I don't know. Guy, what did Miriam look like? But I... I've told you. I want you to tell me again. Well, she... she was dark, not too tall, sort of pretty. What else? What else is there? She wore glasses, didn't she? Yes. Barbara wears glasses, too. And Barbara looks something like Miriam, doesn't she? Doesn't she? No. No, no, not at all. How did you get him to do it, Guy? Get him to do it? He killed Miriam, didn't he? Tell me, didn't he? Yes. Yes, he's a maniac. I met him on the train going to Metcalf. He had some crazy scheme about exchanging murders. If I do his murder, he'd do mine. What do you mean, your murder? Well, he'd read about me in the papers. He knew about Miriam, about you. Well, you must have known he was talking nonsense. But he wasn't. 
And now a lunatic wants me to kill his father. It's too fantastic. You've known about Miriam all this time. Yes. Why don't you call the police? And have them say what you did? How did you get him to do it? If, if we could only talk to Father or, or someone about it. It's no good, Anne. I can't drag anyone else into this. Guy, what are we going to do? I don't know. I don't know. Bruno? Bruno, this is Guy. I've decided to do what you want about your father. Yes, I want to get it over with. Detective? Oh, don't worry about Hennessy. There's a way out across the roof here to the next apartment. Does anyone know you've come home? Then you'd better go out again and stay out until after daylight. I'll be there in 40 minutes. Before we return with Act Three of Strangers on a Train, I'm going to introduce my guest for tonight. She's very special, a blue-eyed blonde who's to be congratulated on playing the leading role in the very first picture she's made. And when I tell you her name, you'll know she sings, she dances like a dream. Here she is, Miss Aileen Stanley, Jr. Name for my aunt, Aileen Stanley, who starred in so many Broadway musical comedies. I only hope that... That you'll live up to the Aileen Stanley name? <laughs> You've certainly made a fine start. Well, I have Warner Brothers to thank for the opportunity and for casting me opposite a star like Gordon McRae. We'll all be watching for you, Aileen. Aren't you sorry you won't be in New York on Thursday for the world premiere of Warner Brothers' new musical? Oh, you mean, uh, I'll see you in my dream. That's it. That song is the title of their new picture, portraying the story of the famous songwriter, Gus Kahn. The cast has Danny Thomas playing Kahn... Frank Lovejoy is his collaborator, Walter Donaldson. And Doris Day is his wife, Grace Kahn, sings his wonderful songs, Making Whoopie, Pretty Baby, Nobody's Sweetheart. And there's something more to make, I'll See You in My Dreams, a picture to watch for. That's Patrice Wymore's Dancing. Patrice is lovely as the dancing star of a Ziegfeld musical that features Kahn songs. Patrice Wymore is always someone to see. She has that fresh, Lux lovely look. Mm, yes, she's a Lux girl, all right. In fact... Patrice tells me that after a day of strenuous dancing rehearsals, she really appreciates her Lux beauty bath. And I certainly agree. It's the most refreshing pickup I know. Yes, a daily Lux beauty bath is Hollywood's way to all over loveliness. Lux active lather makes your daily bath a real beauty bath. It leaves skin so soft and smooth. The delicate Lux fragrance really clings, makes you sure of skin that's sweet. Thank you, Aileen Stanley Jr., for coming here tonight. Now, here's a suggestion for lovely women everywhere. Tomorrow, get this generous, satin-smooth bath cake. You'll delight in the creamy, rich lather, abundant even in hardest water. It leaves your skin really fresh. Looks lovely all over. Nine out of ten screen stars use fragrant white Lux toilet soap. We pause now for station identification. This is the CBS Radio Network. <laughs> The curtain rises on Act Three of Strangers on a Train, starring Ray Milland as Guy Haynes, Ruth Roman as Ann Morton, and Frank Lovejoy as Bruno Anthony. <laughs> to Guy Haynes, there is only one way out. Now, in the quiet of the night, Guy has entered the Anthony home. With the key in the map of the house that Bruno sent him, Guy has no trouble finding Mr. Anthony's bedroom. Mr. Anthony? Mr. Anthony? Don't be alarmed. I, I must talk to you about your son. About Bruno, Mr. Anthony. Wouldn't you feel more at home with the light on, Guy? Bruno? My father isn't home. 
I was about to tell you that over the phone, but you made such a sudden decision. I, I wondered why. Well, I, I thought your father would be interested to know he has a lunatic son. Then you have no intention of going ahead with our little arrangement? I never had. Bruno, look. You're terribly sick. I don't know much about these things, but why don't you go where you can get some kind of treatment? Not only for your own sake, but you can't go on causing more and more. I don't more. like to be double-crossed, Guy. I have a murder on my conscience. I killed your wife. But it's not just my murder. It's yours, too, isn't it? I guess it's no use trying to talk to you, Bruno. I'll leave. Yes, that man from the police who's supposed to be watching you. You mustn't let him get suspicious, Guy. You can put that gun away, Bruno. Oh, don't worry. I'm not going to shoot you, Guy. It might disturb my mother. <laughs> I'm a very clever fellow. I'll think of something much better than that. Good night, Guy. <laughs> Hello? Uh, hello, I'd like to speak to Mrs. Antony, please. Bruno Antony's mother. This is Bruno's mother? I'm Ann Morton, Mrs. Antony. Senator Morton's daughter. Oh, Miss Morton, good morning. How nice of you to call. I'd like to see you, Mrs. Antony, just as quickly as possible. Why, that would be lovely. Do come over, do. Thank you, I'll leave right away. knows I'd come here, Mrs. Antony, but I simply had to tell you. Oh, Miss Morton, really. I know Bruno's been in some very awkward scrapes, but nothing so ridiculous as a murder. But you have to make him do something about this. Don't you see that just one word from him would get Guy out of a dreadful situation? Well, but how can you take this seriously? It's just some practical joke, dear. Bruno's so terribly irresponsible. Oh, he gets into all sorts of escapades. But you don't seem to understand. Your son's responsible for a woman's death. Did Bruno tell you this? Well, no, of course not. Well, there you are. <laughs> well, now, it was very nice of you to call, Miss Morton. Do come and see us again sometime, won't you? I'm afraid Mother wasn't very much help, was she? If you don't mind, I think I'd better leave. Mother hasn't been too well for some time. She's a little, well... Uh, how shall I say it? She's confused. You know, I'm very upset with Guy. He shouldn't have sent you. Guy doesn't know I'm here, Mr. Anthony. He's at the tennis club, isn't he? He will be. Oh, yes, he's playing Reynolds this afternoon. It's a very important match. He must be very desperate to try to involve me. Try to involve you? Well, I've been protecting Guy ever since he told me how much he hated his wife. Do you know, Miss Morton, that Guy tried to get me to go back to that amusement park some night after dark and look for his cigarette lighter? What's a cigarette lighter got to do with... Well, he dropped it there right after he... Well, uh, after that night. You see, all the police are waiting for is one piece of evidence to convict Guy for the murder. I can't tell you how worried I Please am. Please stop. Miss Morton, I do sympathize with you, but I just couldn't do what he asks. Why, that would make me an accessory. his house and came straight here to the club guy. You shouldn't have gone there, darling. Well, Bruno told me if the police ever found your lighter there, that's all they need. Something to prove you were there when she was murdered. Bruno has my lighter. I know, you told me. That lie about my wanting him to get it back. That means he's going back to Metcalf, back to the amusement park. He's going to drop it there, somewhere where they'll find it. Oh, guy, I wanted so to help, but I'm afraid all I did is make things worse. He said last night he'd think of something. Well, give him credit, he certainly has. Well, you've got to get to Metcalf before he does. You haven't time to play. You better tell them now. No. If I try to avoid this match, Hennessy's bound to get suspicious. I have him out of his sight all day. Then I'll go. There's a train and an You'll stay right here. I'll try to give Hennessy the slip right after the match. But, darling, that'll be too late. Didn't Bruno say I wanted him to go there some night after dark? Yes. Well, he won't expose himself in daylight. If I can finish off this match, I'll still have time. All ready, Guy. You go on in a few minutes. I'll be right out there. Now, look, Ann, here's what you better do. Get hold of Barbara, and just as soon as... Oh! Isn't he 
wonderful, Mr. Hennessy. Huh? Oh, uh, how are you, Barbara? Oh, uh, this here's Mr. Hammond. Mr. Hammond, this here's the senator's other daughter. Hi. Oh, yes, I've seen Mr. Hammond outside the house. He's a detective, too. You and he take turns, don't you? Uh, yeah, something like that. But if he's your relief man, why would the two of you be here together? Uh, look, you're I'm... a nice kid, Barbara. Now, watch him hit the little ball and don't ask him any questions. Oh! oh, oh. I've got it all arranged, Dan. The cab's outside waiting to take Guy to the station. I gave him $10. But what about those two detectives? They're still over there near the dressing rooms waiting for Guy to finish the match. Gosh, I've never seen Guy play so fast in my life. Well, he's got to get on that train. Barbara, now once again, as soon as the match is over, Guy's going to run out through the clubhouse. Just do your best to delay those detectives from coming after him. All Guy will need is a few seconds. Well, just leave it to me, Anne. Oh, I'm real good at getting in people's way. <laughs> Looks like we're out of luck, Hammond. Haynes beat us to it by about two minutes. The guy says he bought a ticket to Metcalf. Well, what are we waiting for? The train just pulled out. We can still have him flag it down before Ah, uh, relax. Up. Let him go to Metcalf. We'll phone Captain Turley and let them take over at that end. Uh, that nutty little thing. Ah, uh, Barbara's a nice kid. Maybe it was an accident. Pushing you in the fish pond? Just one thing that puzzles me. What's Haynes' big rush to get to Metcalf? What's he going back for? Come on, Hennessy. Let's phone Turley. Here you are, folks. Here you are. Get them while they're hot. They're fresh roasted. They're jumbos. Peanuts, Mr. What time does it get dark around here? <laughs> What's the hurry, Jack? Here you are, folks. Those fresh roasted peanuts. What time does it get dark, I said? Well, hang around, bud. Hang around. You'll find out. Get them right here, folks. Roasted peanuts. They're sure doing business down at this end of the park. Are they? Oh, day and night. Ever since that girl got murdered. People want to see the scene of the crime. Oh, uh, where did it happen? Right over there. Them picnic ground across the lagoon. Lover's Lane. Yes, sir. They sure been cleaning up. I don't think it's a very nice way to make money. Well, these folks got to eat, too, ain't they? For a while, the smoochers wouldn't go near the place. I'm afraid I don't know what a smoocher is. Okay. So I ain't educated. Wait a minute. Mister. you see, you got a match? No. Well, you got a lighter. Keep fooling with that lighter in your hand. Oh, it's just a... Here, buy yourself a box of matches. <laughs> characters. Places full of characters. Hello, this is Sergeant Adams. I'm phoning from the station. Is Put Captain Turley on the phone. This is Turley. Oh, uh, Haynes just got off the train, sir. He took a cab. He told the driver to take him to the amusement park. All right, good. Pick up your men and go to the park. I'll take a group from here. We'll be waiting for him. That's all, Adams. Hello, Bruno. I've been looking all over for you. You shouldn't have come here, Guy. This could be very dangerous for you. It would be more dangerous if I left you here alone, wouldn't it, Bruno? But this is where it happened, Guy. This is really where it happened. They try to make people believe it happened near the concessions. They figure it'll make more money that way. I came after my cigarette lighter. I want that lighter, Bruno. Don't be foolish, Guy. You're just proving a theory for them. Murderer returning to the scene of his... Give it to me. Give it to me before I... Stand where you are, Hayden. Stand where you are. I've got the man you want right here. He's... Stop him. Stop him, he'll get away! Don't make a move, Haynes, or we'll shoot! He's getting away! I can't let him get away! This way, Captain Turley! The roller coaster, they ran toward the roller coaster! All right, just watch your fire. There are too many people here. Keep those people back. The one we want. It's the other one, the one who ran. What do you mean it isn't Haynes? I remembered him. I seen him here that night when the girl was killed. Two young fellas was with her. And this one, he kept following. He kept looking at her. I remember real plain. You realize what you're saying? I was talking to him before. I asked him for a match. It's the same one. All right, two men, surround the area. Over here, Captain, the roller coaster. They're under the roller coaster, under the tracks. Well, shut it off. Turn off the roller coaster. Well, it's out of order. It's closed down. Who turned it on? He did. The one was running away. Turned the switch and kept the keys. That's one way of keeping us out of there. But the track is being repaired. When those cars come down there, they're scattered all over the place. All right, find the main switch and turn it off. Stay where 
where you are, guy. Don't come any closer. Well, you run to now, Bruno. They're all around here. The police, Bruno. They won't get me. Not alive. I've got a gun. That's not for you, Bruno. You're much too clever to use a gun. I'll kill you, and then I'll kill myself. I'll kill you first, and then I'll... <laughs> Better start talking, Haynes. What's this all about? Well, he, he had my cigarette lighter. He came back here tonight to, to plant it, to pin the whole thing on me. Cigarette lighter, huh? Let me talk to him, please. All right, take it easy now. Over here. He's in a pretty bad way, Captain. Can't you lift that stuff off him? Uh, we've done everything we can until the crane comes. Hello, guy. Who was that with you? This is Captain Turley, Bruno. Police. Oh, they got you at last, huh, guy? Tell him, Bruno. Tell him you have my lighter. But I haven't got it, Guy. It must still be over there where you dropped it that night. You dropped it, huh? I'm sorry, Guy. I want to help you. But I don't know what I can do. Captain Turley, may I go through his pockets? No, of course you can't. Besides, he says he hasn't got it. But if he dies before he... There's no more it. This man's dead, Captain. His hand. He's got something in his hand. See what it is, Mac. It's a lighter, Captain. A cigarette lighter. Yeah, let me see that. From A to G. From Anne to Guy. Well, looks like you were right, Haynes. Well, I better keep this for a while. How about staying in town overnight? I imagine there's a lot you may want to tell me. Yes, I imagine there is. Captain, may I use the telephone? Sure, go ahead. There's one up near the entrance. Say, who was he, mister? That guy. His name was Bruno Anthony. A very clever fellow. Yes, Guy. Yes, darling. Well, of course I'll be there. I'll leave right away. Father, Barbara, it was Guy. He's safe and he's free. Guy? Yes, dear? That man across the aisle, he keeps looking at you. Oh? He's a minister, I... I didn't know you knew any ministers. I beg your pardon, but aren't you Guy Haynes? I'm sorry, sir, but when I was a very little boy, my mother warned me never speak to strangers on a train. We want you to meet our stars in person, and Mr. Keeley will tell you about next week's show. In the meantime, here's a tip from lovely Maureen O'Hara. With her shining dark hair and flawless white skin, Maureen is a real Irish beauty. She says, yes, indeed, I'm a Lux girl. I've found regular Lux care does wonders for my complexion. Makes it softer, smoother, really lovelier. Why don't you take Maureen O'Hara's advice? Here's all you do. Simply work Lux Soap's rich, active lather well in. The lather's uh, so creamy it agrees with delicate skin. Then rinse with warm water, splash of cold. Right away, your skin looks fresher, prettier. So try Hollywood's own beauty soap tomorrow. You'll find it's easy to be Lux lovely. Nine out of ten screen stars are Lux girls. Now here's Mr. Keeley with our stars. And we call them back for another bow. Ray Milland, Frank Lovejoy, and Ruth Roman. Ray, what have you been doing since we worked together on our latest picture? Well, I liked it so well at Walters that I've just finished a Cagney production there called Bugles in the Afternoon. In the afternoon? I thought Bugles were for early morning. Well, Frank, stories about the U.S. Cavalry's continual fights with the Indians, which caused a great deal of bugle blowing back in the 1870s. <laughs> how, about, how about you, Ruth? What part of the Warner Brothers cast you in recently? A rather unusual role. I get play myself. <laughs> and so does Frank Lovejoy. The picture is called Starlift. Oh, of course, uh, based on the actual trips Hollywood stars make to the air base where the boys take off for Korea. Yes, that's right. Uh, we play two of the stars who go to the base to entertain the boys. They really should have called it the Lux Starlift, Bill, because the actresses who go in the Starlift are naturally Lux girls. Including, Including yourself. Including yourself, of course, says Ray. Certainly, I'm a Lux girl. It's my favorite beauty care. You know, by a happy coincidence, Ray is just about to leave on a star lift of his own, all the way to Alaska to entertain our troops for the holidays. Well, it's a privilege to do so, Bill. The only trouble is, what if they're expecting a Lux girl? Won't they? I'd be a bit of a disappointment. Well, you would be to me, Ray. <coughs> 
But remember, the boys are star for entertainment. They'll really appreciate you. And speaking of entertainment, <laughs> how about next week's show? Oh, it'll be great entertainment, Ruth. Oh, Starring on one of, our, uh, one of our most popular comedians, a fellow who also spends a great deal of his time entertaining the armed forces, Bob Hope. And as his co-star, glamorous Marilyn Maxwell. We will present them in the Paramount picture, Laugh Riot, The Lemon Drop Kid. I hate to miss that one, Bill. Good night. Good night. Good night, Good night and don't talk to any strangers. How would you like double the wear from every pair of stockings you own? Then take this tip from the people who make them. Always wash nylons in Lux. Yes, over 90% of the makers of stockings recommend Lux. Why? Because the Lux way makes stockings last twice as long. Strain tests prove it. No other soap, no suds of any kind, can make stockings last longer. And what's more, new Lux enriched with color freshener keeps colors clearer. Make stockings look sheerer than ever. It's the stocking care famous Hollywood screen stars insist on for their own glamorous nylons. Get a big box of new Lux with color freshener tomorrow. Give your stockings, all your lovely washables, that bright as new Lux look. <laughs> Brothers Company, the makers of Lux Toilet Soap, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday evening when the Lux Radio Theater presents Bob Hope and Marilyn Maxwell in The Lemon Drop Kid. This is William Keeley saying good night to you from Hollywood. Frank Lovejoy can soon be seen in the Milton Sperling production for Warner Brothers entitled Retreat Hell. Heard in our cast tonight were Patricia Hitchcock as Barbara, Ed Begley as father, Martha Wentworth as mother, and Jean Bates, Herb Butterfield, Norma Varden, Bill Conrad, Norman Field, Ted DeCorsia, Wally Mayer, Bill Johnstone, Olin Soule, Ralph Moody, Eddie Marr, Margie List, Brad Brown, and Alan Wood. Our play was adapted by S.H. Barnett, and our music was directed by Rudy Schrager. This is your announcer, John Milton Kennedy, Reminding you to join us again next Monday night to hear The Lemon Drop Kid, starring Bob Hope and Marilyn Maxwell. This is the CBS Radio Network. Listen while the makers of Rexall drug products and 10,000 independent Rexall family druggists bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, private detective. Good evening. This is your Rexall family druggist speaking to you for the 10,000 independent druggists who have made the word Rexall part of our own store names and who recommend and sell the 2,000 or more drug products made by the Rexall Drug Company. Like Rexall MI-31, for example, America's popular all-round mouthwash, gargle, and breath deodorant. Full-strength MI-31 kills contacted germs in a matter of seconds yet will not harm delicate membranes of the mouth and throat. What's more, Rexall gives you a full pint of MI-31 at the same price as smaller quantities of other leading brands. Ask for Rexall MI-31 at Rexall drugstores everywhere. And remember, you can depend on any drug product that bears the name Rexall. Good health to all from Rexall. Now your Rexall family druggist brings you transcribed another exciting half hour with Richard Diamond, private detective, starring Dick Powell. Diamond Detective Agency, if you have a little corpse in your home, swap it in for something useful. Mr. Diamond? Yes. I'd like to hire you, Mr. Diamond. Well, bless your little heart. One hundred a day in expenses. My name is Raymond R. Walter, an attorney at law. Would you mind coming right over to my office? Will you have a retainer ready? By the time you get here. Where is here? 758 East 45th Street. 
Just sign the check and I'll stamp in the amount with my track shoes. Then I can expect you. You can even clock me. Who knows? You may witness the first four-minute mile. I quickly bounded over to the sink, pulled out a bundle of soaking laundry, grabbed a straight razor that looked like it had been used to hack out shrapnel, applied the Brillo to my overnight beard, and 20 bloody strokes later, I observed myself in the mirror. Wounded, sire, but not dead. By 11 o'clock, I was standing in the reception office of Raymond R. Waldron, attorney at law. I looked for the secretary, but none was to be seen. Then the door of Mr. Waldron's inner office opened, and a man about six feet tall, sporting a heavy black beard and thick horn-rimmed glasses, stood facing me. I suppose you're Mr. Waldron? Yes. Uh, Take this chair, if you will. Thank you. Now, uh, what's your trouble? Oh, not mine. My client's. You see, I'm supposed to give you $100 as a retainer until you speak with my client this evening. Uh, before you wave the bills around, tell me something about your client. My ethics get so double-jointed when someone shows me money. My client is a she. Hmm. Well, you certainly present the beginning of an interesting argument. Her name is Miss Mary Bellman. Miss? 28, blonde, showgirl, very attractive. Hmm. Ah, so she killed 30 members of the volunteer fire department. I like tough cases. She's in fear of her life, Mr. Diamond, and since I'm her attorney, she called me and asked me to hire a good detective. You said Miss Bellum was in fear of her life. Uh, Somebody trying to kill her? I think it best to let Miss Bellman tell you. She has all the facts. Uh, Here's her address, and here's your retainer. She expects you at eight. It was close to 12 when I got back to the office and spotted my landlord nailing up my door. His eyes dropped blushingly down to his waist when he saw the two months back rent in my hand, and he hurriedly explained his carpenter work on my door as a delayed April 1st joke. I paid him off as the last board fell and then left the building and went to my flat on 53rd Street to take it easy until that evening. By 7.30, I was dressed in my best suit, the gray one that stands out from the rest because the rest are one brown gabardine that even a starving moth would gag on. Suddenly, I remembered my dinner date with Helen... So I put in a fast call and told her butler, Francis, that I'd be a little late. Then promptly at 8 o'clock, I walked up to the door of Miss Mary Bellman, prospective client. Yes? Who is it? Uh, Richard Diamond. Oh. Come in. Have you got it? Well, I don't know. Got what? Look, how about the envelope, huh? Envelope? Envelope? John said it would be in an envelope. But if you don't have it in an envelope, just kindly give it to me. Then I'll fix us a drink. Well, maybe you better fix the drink first. This is some kind of a joke. Oh. What's the matter? What are you doing here? Who? Oh! Everything happened so fast, I didn't even have time to guess what it was all about. Someone belted me with the Chrysler building, and I went down like a loose ski in the snow slide. As I hit the floor, I felt a pair of hands pull open my coat and relieve me of my thirty-eight. The floor fell away, and I dropped into a deep black pit that smelled something like a dirty carpet. When I finally came around, it was like squeezing myself out of a starch diving suit. I got my eyelids apart, and there, standing in front of me, were two very good reasons for wanting to go right back to sleep. Oh. Nice right, coming around, boss. Good. I want him to see it when I give it to him. Oh. Slap him around so he comes to in a hurry. Sure. Come on. Oh. Wake up. Wake well, up, you hear me? No, okay. Come on, oh. sit up. All right. Oh. Oh, my head. It's going to be your stomach in a minute. Full of slugs, you dirty, no good gumshoe. Oh, well. Oh, Louis Hall, huh? You slugged me, Louis? Why'd you kill her? Huh, Shamus? Why? Why? Uh, what? Mary. Look at us, Shamus. Oh, well, where? Oh, holy smoke. Yeah. My pretty Mary. Tell me why you shot her, huh? You think I shot her? You're going to die anyway, Diamond. In a minute, I'm going to kill you. But I got to know why you done it to Mary. What makes you think it was me? The shotgun, ain't it? You got an empty shoulder holster. Well, that's your gun, ain't it? Yeah. I... Sure. Well, this is a gun with shot Mary. One slug gone. See the slugs in her. Oh, you got the wrong boy, Hall. Oh, knock him off, boss. He's lying. He done it. Shut up. Oh, sure, sure. I killed the girl and slugged myself, hoping that someone would come in and pen it on me. Boss, I think you're the... Yeah. 
Anybody in there? What's that? The U.S. Marines. Keep it quiet. Okay, Otis, use your pass key. If that doesn't work, use your head. Okay, Lieutenant. Lieutenant, the cops... Come on, Tony, we're getting out of here. Great, but what about the shamus? I don't want to knock you off if you didn't do it, Diamond, but I'm going to find out. Then maybe we talk more. Let's go, let's go. Right, out the back way. You mallet head, you've tried everything but your button hook. Well, I guess maybe we better bust it in, huh? Okay, give me a hand. Put your shoulder against the door. Now, one, two... Hello, Walter. John, what are you doing here? I came to see a client. We got a report on the homicide. Where is it? Uh, in the other room. Take a look, Otis. Yes, sir. How did you get mixed up in this, Rick? That's a pretty good question. Lieutenant! Yeah? It's a dame! It's the dress in high heels. He spotted them right away. Who is she? Name's Mary Bellman. Hey, who called you to come over? I don't know, but we traced the call, and it came from a phone booth right next door to this building. How long ago? 8.15. Mm, right after I got slugged. You got slugged? Thoroughly. Otis, go call the coroner. Right. Let's see. One shot came right up between the shoulders. Yeah, when I came to, I could still smell cordite. Well, where's your gun, Rick? Well, right now, it's with Lewis Hall. Louis Hall, the gambler? Yeah, the guy who owns the Ace High Club. When I came to, Louis and one of his boys were getting ready to kill me for killing the girl. He waltzed out of here when you showed, took my gun with him. Maybe he knocked her off. Uh, maybe. Anyway, I think whoever did it used my gun. I still don't see how you figure in this deal. Well, a character by the name of Raymond R. Waldron, attorney at law, called and told me to come by and see my recently deceased client. Come on. Let's see what we can find out about a Mr. Raymond R. Waldron, attorney at law. <laughs> Well, I was in it up to my earlobes again. Walt had Otis put out a pickup on Lewis Hall and his torpedo. Then we climbed in the squad car and headed for the offices of Raymond Waldron. On the way over, I told Walt what had transpired since that morning. One, Waldron hiring me for Miss Bellman, saying he represented her. Two, seeing Mary Bellman in the strange way she had greeted me, as if she expected me to have an envelope for her. We got to the building, found the night watchman, went in, and in two minutes we were standing in front of the door marked 402. Isn't there usually a name on the door of an attorney's office? Uh, usually. Maybe that's why I saw it there this afternoon. Now, uh, let us in, will you, Pop? Hey, sure, boy, but there ain't nothing to see. We know Mr. Waldron's not in, but we want to look around. <laughs> sure, boy. <laughs> look as much as you like. Reception room, boy. Where's the furniture? <laughs> Pretty dull looking, have I? <laughs> uh, what about the inner office? Uh, no sense going in there. It's as naked as this. Well, it was all here this afternoon. Was there someone in this office this afternoon, Pop? <laughs> you think the boy's lying? <laughs> sure, like he said, some lawyer fella. Had all the furniture moved out, run out on a week's rent, too. Landlord's in an oxygen tent. <laughs> You're listening to Richard Diamond, Private Detective, brought to you by the makers of Rexall Drug Products and your Rexall Family Druggist. Right now, here's a lady with a problem for him. Every summer, it's the same thing. My children either eat their meals so fast or fill themselves with all kinds of cold drinks and hurry-up snacks. And then we have our usual siege of what I call summer stomachs. Well, ma'am, a lot of mothers have that same trouble. And a whole lot of them have solved it with Rexall Milk of Magnesia. Why, how's that? Well, it's a quick and effective way to neutralize excess acidity and a remarkably gentle laxative. What's more, because of its special formula and exceptional purity, Rexall milk of magnesia has almost none of that unpleasant, earthy taste. I would say the children will like that. And because it's Rexall, ma'am, you know it's laboratory tested. All you have to do is follow the tested instructions on the label. Well, from now on, I'm asking for Rexall Milk of Magnesia. At Rexall drugstores everywhere. And remember, you can depend on any drug product that bears the name Rexall. And now, back to tonight's adventure with Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Well, Mr. Raymond R. Waldron had skipped, furniture and all. We thanked Pop, went downstairs, climbed into the squad car, and Walt checked in with the precinct. 
He put a tracer out on Waldron and learned that Lewis Hall and his henchmen were yet to be found. The coroner's report of the dead girl, Mary Bellman, confirmed the obvious. Death by 38, the slug having been found in the wall. Ballistics had a full report and were waiting for the gun to show up. It was six to an even that Louis Hall still had it and that it was mine. On the way over to Hall's nightclub, Walt told me that Hall had been going with a girl named Willis, Jean Willis. And he was a little surprised when I told him of Hall's recent interest in the late Mary Bellman. It seemed that Jean Willis and Louis had been an item for nearly a year. In fact, she was working as a headliner in his nightclub. <laughs> What a dime. Yeah. Better not leave the doors open too long. The smoke will run out and the walls will fall down. I'm going to see what I can find out about Louis Hall, Rick. You want to try looking up Gene Willis? Meet you back at the bar. Rick, I'm on duty. Well, who said you got a drink? You've got on shoes, but you're not walking. Oh. Table, sir? No, thanks. Now, where can I find Gene Willis? Your friend? I might be. I'm afraid, Miss Willis. Oh, oh, my goodness. I dropped $10. So you did. Eh, uh, looks a little messy. I uh, hate to see you dirty your hands, sir, so I just keep it and you can go wash up. Huh? Uh, washroom's right next to Miss Willis' dressing room. Right down that hall. I'll see that you're decorated by the Department of Sanitation. Who is it? Hey, who are you? Name's Diamond, honey. I'm a private detective. Good for you. I hope you're happy in your work. Now beat it. I'm looking for Lewis Hall. He's out. Uh, down the street somewhere. Having your initials tattooed on the soles of his feet, no doubt. Look, Wiseacre. Blow or I'll yell and have a couple of boys show you the fastest way out of here. Honey, before you do, I think there's something you ought to know. Yeah? What? You open that pretty mouth of yours and you may end up swallowing a fist. Oh, yeah? You know a Mary Bellman... What? Know her? Yeah, she works here. Jane showed up tonight. Something happened to her? What makes you say that? Wishful thinking. Oh. You used to be Louis Hall's girl, didn't you? Yeah, until she came along. Now, look, what is this? What's going on? What do you want Louis for? You really don't like Mary Bellman much, do you? I... Yeah. She's all right. What would you say if I told you someone put a bullet in her tonight? What? Where's Louis, Jean? Somebody took care of the little... Well, what do you know? Good. If Louie did it, I'm real happy. Because he found out what kind of a... No. I don't know where Louie is, and if I did, I wouldn't tell you. Now, get out of here. Okay, okay. But the law may be around to see you. Dandy. Now, beat it. Do me just one favor, will you, Jenny? What is it? Don't move. I want to remember you just as you are. Why, you crummy... You moved. Well, I went back to the bar just in time to see Walt look around the room like a shoplift on bargain day. Then he slipped the bartender a bill and downed a stiff belt with the speed of an alcoholic 30 seconds before prohibition was to set in. Good evening, Lieutenant. <laughs> that was a dirty trick. <laughs> I just saw the girl got nothing but a fast shuffle. I couldn't find out anything about Hall or his boy either. Now, get your breath and let's get back down to the station and think about this thing. Let's go. Hiya, Lieutenant. Hello, pink eyes. Huh? Oh. Anything on the dead girl? Uh, here's the report. Thanks. How are you, Shamus? Fine, Otis, fine. Still under contract to the Museum of Natural History? That ain't very funny. Wait till they pick up your option and try to collect your head. Shut up, you two. Listen to this, Rick. This lab report says Mary Bellman was the one-time girlfriend of John Webb. Oh, the John Webb I sent up on an embezzlement rap eight years ago? The same. He got out a month ago. See, wasn't he suspected of being in on that Aetna payroll holdup? Yeah, thing? but we never could prove that one on him. Mm. The dole was never recovered either. No, but the roll of bills and the dead girl's pocketbook checked with the numbers and the bills from that holdup. Walt, I'm getting an idea. When I sent Webb up, he was pretty unhappy. Made a lot of threats to me. You got the serial numbers from that holdup? Here's the whole list. Well, check him with this money. Your own doll? 
Okay, but I don't get it. Otis, did you find out anything on Raymond R. Waldron? The, the guy that was supposed to be the attorney? Yep. Uh, he ain't no attorney. He ain't even with the state bar, and I can't even find a Raymond R. Waldron in the phone book. Rick, where'd you get these bells? Well, they check. You bet they do. Where'd you get them? Raymond R. Waldron. Gave them to me when he hired me. Otis, go get a picture of John Webb. Right. You think Waldron and Webb are one and the same? Waldron had a beard and wore glasses. It's been eight years since I've seen Webb. Hey, it fits. If Webb is Waldron, he's got a motive. For one thing, he'd love to frame you. Yeah, but we're going to have a hard time proving Waldron is Webb without fingerprints. Not only that, we're going to have a hard time just finding him. Uh, here you are, Diamond. Thanks, Otis. Uh, give me a heavy lead pencil, Waldron. Right here. Hmm? <laughs> Get him some artist. <laughs> oh, shut up, Otis, shut up. Now, let's see. There's a beard. Put some glasses on him. Uh-huh. There you are. Well, Raymond R. Waldron, or John Webb with glasses and a beard. I'll put out a gem. Now, wait a minute, wait a minute, Walter. Got an idea. Let's pull a real old stunt, huh? A real old stunt would be a cinch for us. Let the papers print a story that Mary Bellman is not dead. Webb must have made sure. Look, I didn't say that I was positive that Webb did the job. Louis Hall was standing with my gun in his hand. Gene Willis hated Mary Bellman for stealing her boy, Louis, and... Ah, we're loaded with suspects. Well, she did only have one bullet in her, and there is a possibility that she could have knocked herself off. Oh, stop sitting on your badge and call the papers. Say that Mary Bellman is in Bellevue in a serious condition. That due to an anonymous phone call, the police found her and rushed her to the hospital. I know, and she's expected to recover consciousness at any moment. Right. Uh, Otis, how would you look in a blonde wig? Huh? Come on, I'm going to put you to bed. Lieutenant! Walt called in the reporters on the police beat and gave them the story, then went over to Bellevue and set it up with the staff. All the rooms in one section of the second floor were emptied, and we took over 207. The boys came over from the station with the blonde wig, and Walt and I slapped it on Otis and tucked him away to go betty by. A screen was put up in the back of the room, and Walt and I sat down behind it to wait. I've got six of our boys dressed as interns on this floor and a policewoman on the switchboard. McCarthy is making like the night physician. If anyone tries to see Mary... Bless her little heart. He's to show them up. Tell them they can't stay long. The minute anyone shows, they'll call us on... Oh, that might be it. Yeah? A girl, Lieutenant. Nice looking. Wearing a big mink and carrying a handbag. Right. Girl. Jean Willis. Might be. Be here in a second. Keep well behind this screen. You can only stay a minute. I'll be outside. Thanks, Doctor. Mary? She's digging into her handbag. Let's take her. What? <laughs> Let's have the... <clears throat> take your hands off of me. Hang on, her, Walt. What's the meaning of this? Ah, you hey. always carry a gun, Jean. <laughs> she was going to kill me. Who's that? That ain't Mary. She was going to kill me, Lieutenant. Shut up, Otis, or I'll give her back the gun. You can't pin anything on me. I think we can, baby. Holy cow. More company. Yeah? You can't do this. Dear, shut up now. Yeah. Okay. More company? Yeah, all those gorillas. Said they were wrong. Louis. Oh, no. Honey, I no. warned you. Keep it down, no. lady. I won't let him get caught. I don't want him to get caught. Shut her up. I don't want him to get caught. Sorry, you. honey, but I, I have to. I don't want to. him to get caught. Okay, uh, lift her over behind the screen. All right. Yeah. There, there. All right, let me back there. Shh. Who's making noise? You can only stay a minute. Okay, Doc. You stay out here, Tony. Right, boy. Mary. <laughs> Mary, baby. I'll get the guy who done this. All right, Louie. Uh, Who's there? The police, and you're covered. Okay. Try anything, and the guy in the bed will start shooting. The guy in the... A frame. Give me your gun. Then, Mary, she's... She's... She's really dead, Louie. I guess maybe I wish too much. I ain't smart. Here's your gun, Shunks. You had the right gun, all right, but the wrong boy. Here, Walt, give it the ballistics. We got Jean Willis over behind that screen. She came up here with some crazy idea of protecting you. Janie, she think I done it. Yeah, the crazy kid, she ain't got no... It's getting crowded. Yeah? What's going on? Trying to run down a killer, Louie. 
Okay. A guy just came in. Mm, wearing a beard? No, he asked what room Mary Bellman was in and then left some flowers, walked out. Uh, oh. oh, we better get that girl out of here. Get her out in the hall. All right. Come on, honey. Aloy. Oh, yeah. Aloy, I didn't mean to. I'll give you a hand, Lieutenant. Hey, Lieutenant. The fire escape. Somebody out there. Oh, Louie, I only wanted to help you. I... Quiet. Don't move, anybody. Maybe you, without the light, he won't see us. Look out. He's going to shoot from there. Get that light. Who got him? I didn't even have it, time to get my gun out. I, I didn't. I was too scared. Well, I thought he'd at least get in the room. Lieutenant, you okay? Yeah. Keep everybody out of here. Where'd you get the other gun, Louie? I only give you yours. Remember, Shamus? Let's have that one, Louie. I done what I said I was going to do. I don't know who the guy is, but I guess he's the one to kill me. Can you see the guy, Rick? Is it Webb? Yep. Yeah. Alias Raymond R. Walton, attorney at law and very dead. Hmm. New outfit, Helen, baby? Uh Uh-huh. You like it? Make a silkworm lose his mind. (laughs) I fixed some sandwiches. Thought you could eat them in here in the study. Oh, beats a kitchen. How can I see what I'm eating? A moth would crack up if he had to land by one lousy candle. Thought it was kind of romantic. Soft lights, music. Oh, honey, honey, honey. My rear old stomach has been neglected all day. Food should make it happy. I hope so. Hard day? Yes. Mm. Mm, what's this? Mm. Oh, very toothy. Peanut butter and caviar. You, you make them? Of course. No. Yes? Walt, Helen, right there. Beating his face. Wait a minute, Walt. No. Here's the way it breaks down. Walter nor Webb decided to kill three birds with one stone. Oh, the big pig. He wanted you for sending him up. He wanted Mary Bellman because she was blackmailing him. Seems she threatened to tell the police that he was the one who got that payroll. Oh, that's why she asked for an envelope. She thought I was bringing the payoff. Yeah. Well, Louis Hall was the third bird... For stealing Webb's girl while he was doing time. That's it. You've been a living doll. What do you eat? I think this one's cheese and liverwurst. <laughs> How are you going to sing? I haven't thought about it. Me, 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 me. <laughs> You'll never make it. Don't bet on it. I will bet on it, a double sawbuck. I know you haven't got it, but you're on. hoop de doo hoop de doo I hear a polka and my troubles are through. Hoop de doo, hoop de dee. This kind of music is like heaven to me. Hoop de doo, hoop de doo. It's got me higher than a kite. Hand me down my soup and fish. I am gonna get my wish. Hoop de doo in it tonight. When there's a trombone playing, I get a thrill. I always will When there's a concertina I always smile Cause that's my style When there's a fiddle in the middle And it really is a riddle Plays the tune so sweet that I could die Lead me to the floor And hear me yell for more Cause I'm a hoop de doing kind of guy hoop de do hoop de do I hear a polka and my troubles are through. Hoop de do, hoop de dee. This kind of music is like heaven to me. Hoop de do, hoop de do. It's got me higher than a car. Hand me down my soup and fish. I am gonna get my wish. Hoop de do in it tonight. Now, oh, honey, do that phone. All right, Fatty. What do you got to say now? Didn't think I could sing with a mouthful of liverwurst. <laughs> it was worth the 20. I bet you feel awful. No, but I'm sure glad I wasn't eating spaghetti. Why? Well, I strained so much on that last note, I would have knitted a T-shirt for my tonsils. Dick Powell will be back in just a moment. And now, once more, here's your Rexall family druggist. It's the time of year for a friendly warning about sunburn. Remember that overexposure may cause serious and painful burns. But in case you do get a sunburn, 
I want you to know about Rexall Gypsy Cream. You'll actually be amazed at the immediate cooling, soothing relief you get with Rexall Gypsy Cream. And what's more, it's not a messy ointment, but a quick-drying, greaseless liquid, easy to apply, harmless to close. Ask for Rexall Gypsy Cream at Rexall drugstores everywhere. And remember, you can depend on any drug product that bears the name Rexall. Good health to all from Rexall. Ladies and gentlemen, last year, a great part of America's security went up in smoke. When traveling this summer, you can guard against forest fires by following these few simple rules. Crush out all cigarette, cigar, and pipe ashes. Break matches in two before throwing them away. Drown all campfires twice before leaving them. And always find out the law before using fire in wooded areas. Remember, only you can prevent forest fires. Good night, everyone. This program was transcribed. This is Bill Foreman inviting you to be with us next Wednesday at this same time when we will again bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. For the woman in ten with sensitive skin... There's Caranome hand cream. Statistics show that one woman in ten has an extra sensitive, extra tender skin. And for that woman... There's Caranome hand cream. For like all Caranome beauty aids, Caranome hand cream is hypoallergenic. Pure, mild, safe for most sensitive skins. It softens, beautifies, protects. Remember, for the woman in ten with sensitive skin... There's Caranome hand cream. Only one of Caranome's beauty aids designed especially for women with sensitive skin. Ask for Caranome at Rexall drugstores everywhere. Hear Juvenile Menace on Dragnet tomorrow night on NBC.